This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by A. R. Dobbs, San Francisco, California. Adam Bede by George Eliot. So that ye may have clear images before your gladdened eyes of nature's unambitious underwood and flowers that prosper in the shade. And when I speak of such among the flock as swerved or fell, those only shall be singled out upon whose lapse or error something more than brotherly forgiveness may attend. Wordsworth. Book One. Chapter One. The Workshop. With a single drop of ink for a mirror, the Egyptian sorcerer undertakes to reveal to any chance comer far-reaching visions of the past. This is what I undertake to do for you, reader. With this drop of ink at the end of my pen, I will show you the roomy workshop of Mr. Jonathan Burge, carpenter and builder in the village of Hayslope, as it appeared on the 18th of June, in the year of our Lord, 1799. The afternoon sun was warm on the five workmen there, busy upon doors and window frames and wainscoting. A scent of pine wood from a tent-like pile of planks outside the open door mingled itself with the scent of the elder bushes which were spreading their summer snow close to the open window opposite. The slanting sunbeams shone through the transparent shavings that flew before the steady plane and lit up the fine grain of the oak panelling which stood propped against the wall. On a heap of those soft shavings a rough grey shepherd dog had made himself a pleasant bed, and was lying with his nose between his four paws, occasionally wrinkling his brows to cast a glance at the tallest of the five workmen, who was carving a shield in the centre of a wooden mantelpiece. It was to this workman that the strong baritone belonged, which was heard above the sound of plane and hammer, singing— Awake, my soul, and with the sun Thy daily stage of duty run Shake off dull sloth Here some measurement was to be taken which required more concentrated attention, and the sonorous voice subsided into a low whistle, but it presently broke out again with renewed vigor. Let all thy converse be sincere, thy conscience as the noonday clear. Such a voice could only come from a broad chest, and the broad chest belonged to a large-boned, muscular man nearly six feet high, with a back so flat and a head so well poised that when he drew himself up to take a more distant survey of his work, he had the air of a soldier standing at ease. The sleeve rolled up above the elbow showed an arm that was likely to win the prize for feats of strength. Yet the long, supple hand, with its broad fingertips, looked ready for works of skill. In his tall stalwartness, Adam Bede was a Saxon, and justified his name. But the jet-black hair, made the more noticeable by its contrast with the light paper cap, and the keen glance of the dark eyes that shone from under strongly marked prominent and mobile eyebrows indicated a mixture of Celtic blood. The face was large and roughly hewn, and when in repose had no other beauty than such as belongs to an expression of good-humoured, honest intelligence. It is clear at a glance that the next workman is Adam's brother. He is nearly as tall, he has the same type of features, the same hue of hair and complexion. But the strength of the family likeness seems only to render more conspicuous the remarkable difference of expression both in form and face. Seth's broad shoulders have a slight stoop. His eyes are grey, his eyebrows have less prominence and more repose than his brother's. And his glance, instead of being keen, is confiding and benign. He has thrown off his paper cap, and you see that his hair is not thick and straight like Adam's, but thin and wavy, allowing you to discern the exact contour of a coronal arch that predominates very decidedly over the brow. The idle tramps always felt sure they could get a copper from Seth. They scarcely ever spoke to Adam. The concert of the tools and Adam's voice was at last broken by Seth, who, lifting the door at which he had been working intently, placed it against the wall, and said, "'There! I've finished my door to-day, anyhow.' The workmen all looked up, 
Jim Salt, a burly, red-haired man, known as Sandy Jim, paused from his planing, and Adam said to Seth, with a sharp glance of surprise, What? Dost think thee'st finished the door? Aye, sure, said Seth, with answering surprise. What's a wanting to it? A loud roar of laughter from the other three workmen made Seth look round confusedly. Adam did not join in the laughter, but there was a slight smile on his face, as he said in a gentler tone than before, Why, thee'st forgot the panels. The laughter burst out afresh as Seth clapped his hands to his head and coloured over brow and crown. "'Hooray!' shouted a small, lithe fellow called Wiry Ben, running forward and seizing the door. "'We'll hang up the door at the fur end of the shop and write on it, "'Seth B. the Methody, his work. "'Here, Jim, lend's hold of the red pot.' "'Nonsense,' said Adam. "'Let it alone, Ben Cranage. "'You'll mayhap be making such a slip yourself some day. "'You'll laugh at the other side of your mouth, then.' "'Catch me at it, Adam. "'It'll be a good while afore my head's full of the methodies,' said Ben. "'Nay, but it's often full of drink, and that's worse.' "'Ben, however, had now got the red pot in his hand, "'and was about to begin writing his inscription, "'making, by way of preliminary, an imaginary S in the air. "'Let it alone, will you?' Adam called out, laying down his tools, striding up to Ben, and seizing his right shoulder. "'Let it alone, or I'll shake the soul out with your body.' Ben shook in Adam's iron grasp, but, like a plucky small man as he was, he didn't mean to give in. With his left hand he snatched the brush from his powerless right, and made a movement as if he would perform the feat of writing with his left. In a moment Adam turned him round, seized his other shoulder— and pushing him along, pinned him against the wall. But now Seth spoke up. Let be, Addy, let be. Ben will be joking. Why, he's the right to laugh at me. I can help laughing at myself. I shan't lose him till he promises to let the door alone, said Adam. Come, Ben, lad, said Seth in a persuasive tone. Don't let's have a quarrel about it. You know Adam will have his way. You may as well try to turn a wagon in a narrow lane. Say you'll leave the door alone and make an end on it. I've been affrighted at Adam, said Ben, but I don't mind saying as I'll let alone at your asking, Seth. Come, that's wise of you, Ben, said Adam, laughing and relaxing his grasp. They all returned to their work now, but wiry Ben, having had the worst in the bodily contest, was bent on retrieving that humiliation by a success in sarcasm. "'Which was you thinking on, Seth?' he began. "'The pretty parson's face, or her sarment, when you forgot the panels?' "'Come and hear her, Ben,' said Seth good-humouredly. "'She's going to preach on the green tonight. "'Happen you'd get something to think on yourself, then, "'instead of those wicked songs you're so fond on.' "'You might get religion, and that'd be the best day's earnings you ever made.' "'All a good time for that, Seth. "'I'll think about that when I'm a-going to settle in life. "'Bachelors doesn't want such heavy earnings. "'Happen I'll do the courtin' and the religion both together, as ye do, Seth. "'But ye wouldna have me get converted and chop in atween ye and that pretty preacher and carry her aff. "'No fear of that, Ben. She's neither for you nor for me to win, I doubt. "'Only you come and hear her, and you won't speak lightly on her again.' "'Well, I'm a half a mind to have a look at her tonight, if there isn't good company at the holly bush. "'What'll she take for her text? "'Happen ye can tell me, Seth, if so be I shouldn't have come up a time for it. "'Will it be... what come ye out for to see? A prophetess?' "'Yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophetess, "'a uncommon pretty young woman.' "'Come, Ben,' said Adam rather sternly. "'You let the words of the Bible alone. "'You're going too far now.' "'What are ye a-turning round, Adam? "'I thought ye were dead again the woman preaching a while ago. "'Nay, I'm not turning no way. "'I said not about the women preaching. "'I said you let the Bible alone.' "'You've got a jest-book, hand you, as you're rare and proud on. "'Keep your dirty fingers to that.' "'Why, you're getting as big a saint as Seth. 
"'You're going to the preaching tonight, I should think. "'You'll do finely to lead the singing. "'But I don't know what Parson Irwin will say "'at his grand favorite Adam Bede, a turnin' Methody.' "'Never do you bother yourself about me, Ben. "'I'm not a-going to turn Methodist any more nor you are, "'though it's like enough you'll turn to something worse. "'Mester Irwin's got more sense nor to meddle with people's doin' as they like in religion. "'That's between themselves and God, as he says to me many a time. "'Ay, ay, but he's none so fond o' your dissenters for all that.' "'Maybe I'm none so fond o' Josh Todd's thick ale, "'but I don't hinder you from making a fool o' yourself wit.' "'There was a laugh at this thrust of Adam's, "'but Seth said very seriously, "'Nay, nay, Addy, thee must na say as anybody's religion's like thick ale. "'Thee dost na believe but what the dissenters and the Methodists "'have got the root of the matter as well as the church folks. "'Nay, Seth, lad, I'm not for laughing at no man's religion. "'Let em follow their consciences, that's all.' "'Only I think it'd be better if their consciences had let them stay quiet in the church. "'There's a deal to be learnt there. "'And there's such a thing as being over-spiritual. "'We must have something besides gospel of this world. "'Look at the canals, and the aqueducts, and the coal-pit engines, "'and Arkwright's mills there at Cromford. "'A man must learn summit beside gospel to make them things, I reckon. "'But to hear some of them preachers, you'd think... "'as a man must be doing nothing all his life "'but shutting his eyes and looking what's a-going on inside him. "'I know a man must have the love of God in his soul, "'and the Bible's God's word. "'But what does the Bible say? "'Why, it says as God put his spirit into the workman, "'as built the tabernacle, "'to make him do all the carved work "'and things as wanted a nice hand. "'And this is my way of looking at it. "'There's the spirit of God,' "'in all things and all times, weekday as well as Sunday, "'and in the great works and inventions, "'and in the figuring and the mechanics. "'And God helps us with our headpieces and our hands "'as well as with our souls. "'And if a man does bits of jobs out of working hours, "'builds a oven for his wife to save her from going to the bakehouse, "'or scrats at his bit of garden "'and makes two potatoes grow instead of one, "'he's doing more good.' "'and he's just as near to God "'as if he was running after some preacher "'and a-praying and a-groaning. "'Well done, Adam,' said Sandy Jim, "'who had paused from his planing "'to shift his planks while Adam was speaking. "'That's the best sermon I've heard this long while. "'By the same token, "'my wife's been a-plaguing on me "'to build her oven this twelve-month. "'There's reason in what thee sayest, Adam,' "'observed Seth gravely. But thee knowest thyself, as it's hearing the preachers thee find'st so much fault with, has turned many an idle man into an industrious un. It's the preacher as empties the alehouse, and if a man gets religion, he'll do his work none the worse for that. Only he'll have the panels out of the doors sometimes, eh, Seth? said Wiry Ben. Ah, Ben, you've got a joke again me as'll last you your life. "'But it isn't a religion as was at fault there. "'It was Seth Bede, as was all as a wool-gathering chap, "'and religion hasna cured him, the more's the pity.' "'Ne'er heed me, Seth,' said Wiry Ben. "'Ye are a downright good-hearted chap, panels or no panels, "'and ye dinna set up your bristles at every bit of fun, "'like some of your kin, as is mayhap cleverer. "'Seth, lad,' said Adam, taking no notice of the sarcasm against himself, "'Thee must na take me unkind. "'I wasna driving at thee in what I said just now. "'Some's got one way of looking at things, and some's got another.' "'Nay, nay, Addy, thee mean'st me no unkindness,' said Seth. "'I know that well enough. "'Thee't like thy dog, Jip. "'Thee barks at me sometimes, but thee always licks my hand after.' "'All hands worked on in silence for some minutes "'until the church clock began to strike six. Before the first stroke had died away, Sandy Jim had loosed his plane and was reaching his jacket. Wiry Ben had left a screw half-driven in and thrown his screwdriver into his tool-basket. Mum Taft, who, true to his name, had kept silence throughout the previous conversation, had flung down his hammer as he was in the act of lifting it, and Seth, too, had straightened his back and was putting out his hand towards his paper cap. Adam alone had gone on with his work as if nothing had happened. 
but observing the cessation of the tools, he looked up, and said in a tone of indignation, "'Look there now. I can't abide to see men throw away their tools of that way. The minute the clock begins to strike, as if they took no pleasure of their work, and was afraid of doing a stroke too much.' Seth looked a little conscious, and began to be slower in his preparations for going. But Mum Taft broke silence, and said, "'Aye, aye, Adam, lad, ye talk like a young un. "'When ye are six and forty like me, "'stid o' six and twenty, "'ye wanna be so flush a workin' for naught?' "'Nonsense,' said Adam, still wrathful. "'What's age got to do with it, I wonder? "'Ye are a getting stiff yet, I reckon. "'I hate to see a man's arms drop down "'as if he was shot before the clock's fairly struck.' "'just as if he'd never a bit of pride and delight in his work. "'The very grindstone'll go on turning a bit after you loose it.' "'Botheration, Adam!' exclaimed Wiry Ben. "'Leave a chap alone, will he? "'Ye were a-findin' fout wit preachers a while ago. "'Ye are fond enough o' preachin' yourn. "'Ye may like work better nor play, "'but I like play better nor work. "'That'll accommodate ye. "'It laves ye the more to do.' With this exit speech, which he considered effective, Wiry Ben shouldered his basket and left the workshop, quickly followed by Mum Taft and Sandy Jim. Seth lingered and looked wistfully at Adam, as if he expected him to say something. "'Shalt go home before thee goes to the preaching?' Adam asked, looking up. "'Nay, I've got my hat and things at Will Maskery's. I shan't be home before going for ten. I'll happen see Dinah Mora safe home, if she's willing. There's nobody comes with her from Poysers, thee knowest. "'Then I'll tell Mother not to look for thee,' said Adam. "'Thee art na going to Poysers thyself to-night?' said Seth, rather timidly, as he turned to leave the workshop. "'Nay, I'm going to the school.' Hitherto Jip had kept his comfortable bed— only lifting up his head and watching Adam more closely as he noticed the other workmen departing. But no sooner did Adam put his ruler in his pocket and begin to twist his apron round his waist than Jip ran forward and looked up in his master's face with patient expectation. If Jip had had a tail, he would doubtless have wagged it, but being destitute of that vehicle for his emotions, he was, like many other worthy personages, destined to appear more phlegmatic than nature had made him. "'What? Art ready for the basket, eh, Jip? said Adam, with the same gentle modulation of voice as when he spoke to Seth. Jip jumped and gave a short bark, as much as to say, "'Of course!' Poor fellow, he had not a great range of expression. The basket was the one which on workdays held Adam's and Seth's dinner, and no official, walking in procession, could look more resolutely unconscious of all acquaintances than Jip with his basket.' "'trotting at his master's heels. "'On leaving the workshop, Adam locked the door, "'took the key out, and carried it to the house "'on the other side of the woodyard. "'It was a low house with smooth grey thatch and buff walls, "'looking pleasant and mellow in the evening light. "'The leaded windows were bright and speckless, "'and the stone door was as clean as a white boulder at ebb tide. "'On the doorstone stood a clean old woman in a dark-striped linen gown, "'a red kerchief, and a linen cap, "'talking to some speckled fowls "'which appeared to have been drawn towards her "'by an illusory expectation of cold potatoes or barley. "'The old woman's sight seemed to be dim, "'for she did not recognize Adam till he said, "'Here's the key, Dolly. "'Lay it down for me in the house, will you?' "'Ay, sure, but when are ye come in, Adam?' "'Miss Mary's i' the house, and Mr. Burge'll be back and on. "'He'd be glad to hie ye to supper win. I'll be as warrand. "'No, Dolly, thank you. I'm off home. Good evening.' "'Adam hastened along with long strides, Jip close to his heels, "'out of the workyard and along the high road, "'leading away from the village and down to the valley. "'As he reached the foot of the slope,' An elderly horseman with his portmanteau strapped behind him stopped his horse when Adam had passed him, and turned round to have another long look at the stalwart workman in paper cap, leather breeches, and dark blue worsted stockings. Adam, unconscious of the admiration he was exciting, 
presently struck across the fields, and now broke out into the tune which had all day long been running in his head. Let all thy converse be sincere, thy conscience as the noonday clear, for God's all-seeing eye surveys thy secret thoughts, thy works and ways. End of chapter 1 How do you find this book? Any thoughts about the book or the author? Any suggestion for improvement? Please take a moment to share your thoughts in a comment. If you like it, share it with your friends who might enjoy it as well. Subscribe to keep in touch. Visit completeaudiobooks.com for more quality content. Chapter 2 of Adam Bede This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Missy, Guangzhou, China. Adam Bede by George Eliot. Chapter 2. The Preaching. About a quarter to seven there was an unusual appearance of excitement in the village of Hayslope, and through the whole length of its little street, from the Donathorne Arms to the churchyard gate, the inhabitants had evidently been drawn out of their houses by something more than the pleasure of lounging in the evening sunshine. The Donathorne Arms stood at the entrance of the village, and a small farmyard and stackyard which flanked it, indicating that there was a pretty take of land attached to the inn, gave the traveller a promise of good feed for himself and his horse, which might well console him for the ignorance in which the weather-beaten sign left him as to the heraldic bearings of that ancient family, the Donathorns. Mr. Casson, the landlord, had been for some time standing at the door with his hands in his pockets, balancing himself on his heels and toes, and looking towards a piece of unenclosed ground with a maple in the middle of it, which he knew to be the destination of certain grave-looking men and women whom he had observed passing at intervals. Mr. Casson's person was by no means of that common type, which can be allowed to pass without description. On a front view it appeared to consist principally of two spheres, bearing about the same relation to each other as the earth and the moon. That is to say, the lower sphere might be said, at a rough guess, to be thirteen times larger than the upper, which naturally performed the function of a mere satellite and tributary. But here the resemblance ceased, for Mr. Casson's head was not at all a melancholy-looking satellite, nor was it a spotty globe, as Milton has irreverently called the moon. On the contrary, no head and face could look more sleek and healthy, and its expression, which was chiefly confined to a pair of round and ruddy cheeks, the slight knot and interruptions forming the nose and eyes being scarcely worth mention, was one of jolly contentment. Only tempered by that sense of personal dignity which usually made itself felt in his attitude and bearing. This sense of dignity could hardly be considered excessive in a man who had been butler to the family for fifteen years, and who in his present high position was necessarily very much in contact with his inferiors. How to reconcile his dignity with the satisfaction of his curiosity by walking towards the green was the problem that Mr. Casson had been revolving in his mind for the last five minutes. But when he had partly solved it by taking his hands out of his pockets, and thrusting them into the armholes of his waistcoat, by throwing his head on one side, and providing himself with an air of contemptuous indifference to whatever might fall under his notice, his thoughts were diverted by the approach of the horseman, whom we lately saw pausing to have another look at our friend Adam, and who now pulled up at the door of the Donathorn Arms. "'Take off the bridle and give him a drink, Ostler,' said the traveller to the lad in the smock-frock, who had come out of the yard at the sound of the horse's hoofs. "'Why, what's up in your pretty village, landlord?' he continued, getting down. "'There seems to be quite a stir.' "'It's a Methodist preaching, sir. "'It's been give out as a young woman's a-going to preach on the green,' answered Mr. Casson, in a treble and wheezy voice, with a slightly mincing accent. "'Will you please to step in, sir, and take something?' "'No, I must be getting on to Rossiter. "'I only want a drink for my horse. "'And what does your parson say, I wonder, to a young woman preaching just under his nose?' Parson Irwine, sir, doesn't live here. He lives at Broxen o'er the hill there. The parsonage here's a tumble-down place, sir, not fit for gentry to live in. 
He comes here to preach of a Sunday afternoon, sir, and puts up his hoss here. It's a great cob, sir, and he sets great store by it. He always puts up his hoss here, sir, ever since before I had the Denethorn Arms. I'm not this countryman, you may tell by my tongue, sir. They're curious talkers of this country, sir. The gentry's hard work to understand em. I was brought up among the gentry, sir, and got the turn of their tongue when I was a by. Why, what do you think the folks here says for heaven't you? The gentry, you know, says heaven't you. Well, the people about here says, Hannah ye. It's what they call the dialect is spoke here about, sir. That's what I've heard Squire Donathorn say many a time. It's the dialect, says he. Ay, ay, said the stranger, smiling. I know it very well. But you've not got many Methodists about here, surely, in this agricultural spot? I should have thought there would hardly be such a thing as a Methodist to be found about here. You're all farmers, aren't you? The Methodists can seldom lay much hold on them. Why, sir, there's a pretty lot of workmen round about, sir. There's Mr. Burge, as owns the timber yard over there, and he undertakes a good bit of building and repairs. And there's the stone pits not far off. There's plenty of empley in this country, sir. And there's a fine batch of Methodists at Treddleson. That's the market town about three mile off. You may be ha come through it, sir. There's pretty nigh a score of em on the green now as come from there. That's where our people gets it from, though there's only two men of em in all Hayslope. That's Will Maskery the wheelwright, and Seth Bede, the young man as works at the carpentering. The preacher comes from Treddleston, then, does she? Nay, sir, she comes out of Stonyshire, pretty nigh thirty mile off. But she's a visitin' hereabout, at Mr. Poyser's at the Hall Farm. It's them barns and big walnut trees right away to the left, sir. She's own niece to Poyser's wife, and they'll be fine and vexed at her for making a fool of herself in that way. But I've heerd, as there's no holdin' these Methodistes when the maggots once got in their head, Many of em go stark staring mad with their religion, though this young woman's quiet enough to look at by what I can make out. I've not seen her myself. Well, I wish I had time to wait and see her, but I must get on. I've been out of my way for the last twenty minutes to have a look at that place in the valley. It's Squire Donathorne's, I suppose? Yes, sir, that's Donathorne Chase, that is. Fine hoax there, isn't there, sir? I should know what it is, sir, for I've lived butler there ago in a fifteen year. It's Captain Donathorne as is the heir, sir. Squire Donathorne's grandson. He'll be coming of hage this A harvest, sir, and we shall have fine doings. He owns all the land about here, sir, Squire Donathorne does. Well, it's a pretty spot, whoever may own it, said the traveller, mounting his horse, and one meets some fine strapping fellows about, too. I met as fine a young fellow as ever I saw in my life about half an hour ago, before I came up the hill. A carpenter. A tall, broad-shouldered fellow with black hair and black eyes, marching along like a soldier. We want such fellows as he to lick the French. Aye, sir, that's Adam Bede, that is, I'll be bound. Thias Bede's son, everybody knows him hereabout. He's an uncommon clever, steady fellow, and wonderful strong. Lord bless you, sir, if you'll excuse me for saying so. He can walk forty mile a day, and lift a matter of sixty stun. He's an uncommon favourite with the gentry, sir. Captain Donathorne and Parson Irwine makes a fine fuss with him, but he's a little lifted up and peppery-like. Well, good evening to you, landlord. I must get on. Your servant, sir. Good evening. The traveller put his horse into a quick walk up the village, but when he approached the green, the beauty of the view that lay on his right hand, the singular contrast presented by the groups of villagers with the knot of Methodists near the maple, and perhaps yet more, curiosity to see the young female preacher proved too much for his anxiety to get to the end of his journey, and he paused. The green lay at the extremity of the village, and from it the road branched off in two directions, one leading farther up the hill by the church, and the other winding gently down towards the valley. On the side of the green that led towards the church, the broken line of thatched cottages was continued nearly to the churchyard gate, but on the opposite northwestern side there was nothing to obstruct the view of gently swelling meadow and wooded valley and dark masses of distant hill. That rich undulating district of Loamshire to which Hayslope belonged lies close to a grim outskirt of Stonyshire, and overlooked by its barren hills as a pretty blooming sister may sometimes be seen linked in the arm of a rugged, tall, swarthy brother, and in two or three hours' ride the traveller might exchange a bleak, treeless region intersected by lines of cold grey stone, for one where his road wound under the shelter of woods, or up swelling hills, muffled with hedgerows and long meadow-grass and thick corn, and where at every turn he came upon some fine old country seat 
nestled in the valley or crowning the slope, some homestead with its long length of barn and its cluster of golden ricks, some grey steeple looking out from a pretty confusion of trees and thatch and dark red tiles. It was just such a picture as this last that Hayslope Church had made to the traveller as he began to mount the gentle slope leading to its pleasant uplands, and now from his station near the green he had before him in one view nearly all the other typical features of this pleasant land. High up against the horizon were the huge conical masses of hill, like giant mounds intended to fortify this region of corn and grass against the keen and hungry winds of the north not distant enough to be clothed in purple mystery, but with sombre greenish sides visibly specked with sheep, whose motion was only revealed by memory, not detected by sight, wooed from day to day by the changing hours, but responding with no change in themselves, left forever, grim and sullen after the flush of morning, the winged gleams of the April noonday, the parting crimson glory of the ripening summer sun and directly below them the eye rested on a more advanced line of hanging woods, divided by bright patches of pasture or furrowed crops, and not yet deepened into the uniform leafy curtains of high summer, but still showing the warm tints of the young oak and the tender green of the ash and lime. Then came the valley, where the woods grew thicker, as if they had rolled down and hurried together from the patches left smooth on the slope, that they might take the better care of the tall mansion which lifted its parapet and sent its faint blue summer smoke among them. Doubtless there was a large sweep of park and a broad glassy pool in front of that mansion, but the swelling slope of meadow would not let our traveller see them from the village green. He saw instead a foreground which was just as lovely, the level sunlight lying like transparent gold among the gently curving stems of the feathered grass, and the tall red sorrel, and the white ambles of the hemlocks lining the bushy hedgerows. It was that moment in summer when the sound of the scythe being wetted makes us cast more lingering looks at the flower-sprinkled tresses of the meadows. He might have seen other beauties in the landscape if he had turned a little in his saddle and looked eastward, beyond Jonathan Burge's pasture and woodyard, towards the green cornfields and walnut trees of the Hall Farm. But apparently there was more interest for him in the living groups close at hand. Every generation in the village was there, from old Father Taft in his brown worsted nightcap who was bent nearly double, but seemed tough enough to keep on his legs a long while, leaning on his short stick, down to the babies with their little round heads lolling forward in quilted linen caps. Now and then there was a new arrival, perhaps a slouching laborer, who, having eaten his supper, came out to look at the unusual scene with a slow bovine gaze, willing to hear what any one had to say in explanation of it, but by no means excited enough to ask a question but all took care not to join the Methodists on the green, and identify themselves in that way with the expectant audience. For there was not one of them that would not have disclaimed the imputation of having come out to hear the preacher woman. They had only come out to see what were a-going on like. The men were chiefly gathered in the neighborhood of the blacksmith's shop. But do not imagine them gathered in a knot. Villagers never swarm. A whisper is unknown among them, and they seem almost as incapable of an undertone as a cow or a stag. Your true rustic turns his back on his interlocutor, throwing a question over his shoulder as if he meant to run away from the answer, and walking a step or two farther off when the interest of the dialogue culminates. So the group in the vicinity of the blacksmith's door was by no means a close one, and formed no screen in front of Chad Cranage, the blacksmith himself, who stood with his black brawny arms folded leaning against the doorpost, and occasionally sending forth a bellowing laugh at his own jokes, giving them a marked preference over the sarcasms of Wiry Ben, who had renounced the pleasures of the holly-bush for the sake of seeing life under a new form. But both styles of wit were treated with equal contempt by Mr. Joshua Rann. Mr. Rann's leathern apron and subdued griminess can leave no one in any doubt that he is the village shoemaker. The thrusting out of his chin and stomach and the twirling of his thumbs are more subtle indications, intended to prepare unwary strangers for the discovery that they are in the presence of the parish clerk. Old Joshua, as he is irreverently called by his neighbors, is in a state of simmering indignation, but he has not yet opened his lips except to say in a resounding bass undertone, like the tuning of a violoncello, "'Say on king of the Amorites, for his mercy endureth forever, and Og the king of Basan." for his mercy endureth forever. 
a quotation which may seem to have a slight bearing on the present occasion, but, as with every other anomaly, adequate knowledge will show it to be a natural sequence. Mr. Rann was inwardly maintaining the dignity of the Church in the face of this scandalous eruption of Methodism, and as that dignity was bound up with his own sonorous utterance of the responses, his argument naturally suggested a quotation from the psalm he had read the last Sunday afternoon. The stronger curiosity of the women had drawn them quite to the edge of the green, where they could examine more closely the Quaker-like costume and odd deportment of the female Methodists. Underneath the maple there was a small cart which had been brought from the wheelwrights to serve as a pulpit, and round this a couple of benches and a few chairs had been placed. Some of the Methodists were resting on these with their eyes closed, as if wrapped in prayer or meditation. Others chose to continue standing and had turned their faces towards the villagers with a look of melancholy compassion, which was highly amusing to Bessie Cranage, the blacksmith's buxom daughter, known to her neighbors as Chad's Bess who wondered why the folks were a-making faces of Adam's. Chad's Bess was the object of peculiar compassion, because her hair, being turned back under a cap which was set at the top of her head, exposed to view an ornament of which she was much prouder than of her red cheeks, namely a pair of large round earrings with false garnets in them. Ornaments condemned not only by the Methodists, but by her own cousin and namesake Timothy's Bess, who, with much cousinly feeling, often wished— them earrings might come to good. Timothy's Bess, though retaining her maiden appellation among her familiars, had long been the wife of Sandy Jim, and possessed a handsome set of matronly jewels, of which it is enough to mention the heavy baby she was rocking in her arms, and the sturdy fellow of five in knee-breeches, and red legs, who had a rusty milk-can round his neck by way of drum, and was very carefully avoided by Chad's small terrier. This young olive branch, notorious under the name of Timothy's Bess's Ben, being of an inquiring disposition, unchecked by any false modesty, had advanced beyond the group of women and children, and was walking round the Methodists, looking up in their faces with his mouth wide open, and beating his stick against the milk can by way of musical accompaniment. But one of the elderly women bending down to take him by the shoulder, with an air of grave remonstrance, Timothy's Bess's Ben first kicked out vigorously, then took to his heels and sought refuge behind his father's legs. "'Ye gallows, young dog,' said Sandy Jim, with some paternal pride. "'If ye dunna keep that stick quiet, I'll take it from ye. What do ye mean by kicking folks?' "'Here, get here to me, Ben,' said Chad Cranage. "'I'll tie up and shoe em as I do the hosses. "'Well, Maester Casson,' he continued, as that personage sauntered up toward the group of men, "'how are ye to-night? Are ye come to help Groon? They say folks allus groon when they're hearkening to the Methodies, as if they were bad o' the inside. I mind to groon as loud as your cow did the other night, and then the preacher'll think I'm o' the right way. I'd advise you not to be up to no nonsense, Chad, said Mr. Casson, with some dignity. Poyser wouldn't like to hear as his wife's niece was treated any ways disrespectful, for all he mayn't be fond of her taking on herself to preach. Ay, and she's a pleasant look to him, too, said Wiry Ben. I'll stick up for the pretty women preaching. I know they'd persuade me over a deal sooner nor the ugly men. I shouldn't wonder if I turn Methody afore the night's out and begin to court the preacher like Seth Bede. Why, Seth's looking rather too high, I should think, said Mr. Casson. This woman's kin wouldn't like her to demean herself to a common carpenter. True, said Ben, with a long treble intonation. What's folks's kin got to do with it? Not a chip. Poyser's wife may turn up her nose and forget bygones, but this Dinah Morris, they tell me, is as poor as ever she was, works at a mill, and's much ado to keep her sin. A strapping young carpenter, as is a ready-made methody like Seth, wouldn't it be a bad match for her? Why, Poyser's make as big a fuss with Adam Bede, as if he were a nevy of her own. Idle talk, idle talk, said Mr. Joshua Rann. Adam and Seth's two men. You want to fit them two with the same last. Maybe, said Wiry Ben, contemptuously, but Seth's the lad for me, though he were a Methody twice o'er. I'm fair be with Seth, for I've been teasing him ever since we've been working together, and he bears me no more malice nor lamb. And he's stout-hearted feller, too, for when we saw the old tree all afire a coming across the fields one night, and we thought as it were a bogey, Seth made no more ado, but he up to it as bold as a constable. 
why there he comes out o will maskeries and there's will hisself looking as meek as if he couldn't knock a nail o the head for fear o hurtin t and there's the pretty preacher woman my eye she's got her bonnet off i mun go a bit nearer several of the men followed ben's lead and the traveller pushed his horse on to the green as dinah walked rather quickly and in advance of her companions toward the cart under the maple tree while she was near seth's tall figure she looked short but when she had mounted the cart and was away from all comparison she seemed above the middle height of woman though in reality she did not exceed it an effect which was due to the slimness of her figure and the simple line of her black stuff dress the stranger was struck with surprise as he saw her approach and mount the cart surprise not so much at the feminine delicacy of her appearance as at the total absence of self-consciousness in her demeanour he had made up his mind to see her advance with a measured step and a demure solemnity of countenance he had felt sure that her face would be mantled with the smile of conscious saintship or else charged with a denunciatory bitterness he knew but two types of methodists the ecstatic and the bilious but dinah walked as simply as if she were going to market and seemed as unconscious of her outward appearance as a little boy there was no blush no tremulousness which said i know you think me a pretty woman too young to preach no casting up or down of the eyelids no compression of the lips no attitude of the arms that said but you must think of me as a saint she held no book in her ungloved hands but let them hang down lightly crossed before her as she stood and turned her grey eyes on the people there was no keenness in the eyes they seemed rather to be shedding love than making observations they had the liquid look which tells that the mind is full of what it has to give out rather than impressed by external objects she stood with her left hand towards the descending sun and leafy boughs screened her from its rays but in this sober light the delicate colouring of her face seemed to gather a calm vividness like flowers at evening it was a small oval face of a uniform transparent whiteness with an egg-like line of cheek and chin a full but firm mouth a delicate nostril and a low perpendicular brow surmounted by a rising arch of parting between smooth locks of pale reddish hair the hair was drawn straight back behind the ears and covered except for an inch or two above the brow by a net quaker cap the eyebrows of the same colour as the hair were perfectly horizontal and firmly pencilled the eyelashes though no darker were long and abundant nothing was left blurred or unfinished it was one of those faces that make one think of white flowers with light touches of colour on their pure petals the eyes had no peculiar beauty beyond that of expression they looked so simple so candid so gravely loving that no accusing scowl no light sneer could help melting away before their glance joshua rann gave a long cough as if he were clearing his throat in order to come to a new understanding with himself chad cranage lifted up his leather skull-cap and scratched his head and wiry ben wondered how seth had the pluck to think of courting her a sweet woman the stranger said to himself but surely nature never meant her for a preacher perhaps he was one of those who think that nature has theatrical properties and with the considerate view of facilitating art and psychology makes up her characters so that there may be no mistake about them but dinah began to speak dear friends she said in a clear but not loud voice let us pray for a blessing she closed her eyes and hanging her head down a little continued in the same moderate tone as if speaking to some one quite near her saviour of sinners when a poor woman laden with sins went out to the well to draw water she found thee sitting at the well she knew thee not she had not sought thee her mind was dark her life was unholy but thou didst speak to her thou didst teach her thou didst show her that her life lay open before thee and yet thou wast ready to give her that blessing which she had never sought jesus thou art in the midst of us and thou knowest all men if there is any here like that poor woman if their minds are dark their lives unholy if they have come out not seeking thee not desiring to be taught deal with them according to the free mercy which thou didst show to her speak to them lord open their ears to my message bring their sins to their minds and make them thirst for that salvation which thou art ready to give 
Lord, thou art with thy people still. They see thee in the night watches, and their hearts burn within them as thou talkest with them by the way. And thou art near to those who have not known thee. Open their eyes that they may see. See thee weeping over them and saying, Ye will not come unto me that ye might have life. See thee hanging on the cross and saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. See thee as thou wilt come again in thy glory to judge them at the last. Amen. Dinah opened her eyes again and paused, looking at the group of villagers, who were now gathered rather more closely on her right hand. Dear friends, she began, raising her voice a little, you have all of you been to church, and I think you must have heard the clergyman read these words. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Jesus Christ spoke those words. He said he came to preach the gospel to the poor. I don't know whether you ever thought about those words much, but I will tell you when I remember first hearing them. It was on just such a sort of evening as this when I was a little girl, and my aunt has brought me up, took me to hear a good man preach out of doors, just as we are here. I remember his face well. He was a very old man and had very long white hair. His voice was very soft and beautiful, not like any voice I had ever heard before. I was a little girl and scarcely knew anything, and this old man seemed to me such a different sort of man from anybody I had ever seen before, that I thought he had perhaps come down from the sky to preach to us. And I said, Aunt, will he go back to the sky tonight like the picture in the Bible? That man of God was Mr. Wesley who spent his life in doing what our blessed Lord did, preaching the gospel to the poor, and he entered into his rest eight years ago. I came to know more about him years after, but I was a foolish, thoughtless child then, and I remembered only one thing he told us in his sermon. He told us his gospel meant good news. The gospel, you know, is what the Bible tells us about God. Think of that now. Jesus Christ did really come down from heaven, as I, like a silly child, thought Mr. Wesley did. And what he came down for was to tell good news about God to the poor. Why, you and me, dear friends, are poor. We have been brought up in poor cottages and have been reared on oat cake and lived coarse, and we haven't been to school much nor read books, and we don't know much about anything but what happens just round us. We are just the sort of people that want to hear good news. For when anybody's well off, they don't much mind about hearing news from distant parts. But if a poor man or woman's in trouble and has hard work to make out a living, they like to have a letter to tell them they've got a friend as will help them. To be sure, we can't help knowing something about God, even if we've never heard the gospel, the good news that our Saviour brought us. For we know everything comes from God. Don't you say almost every day, this and that will happen, please God, and we shall begin to cut the grass soon, please God, to send us a little more sunshine? We know very well we are altogether in the hands of God. We didn't bring ourselves into the world, we can't keep ourselves alive while we're sleeping, the daylight and the wind and the corn and the cows to give us milk. Everything we have comes from God. And he gave us our souls and put love between parents and children and husband and wife. But is that as much as we want to know about God? We see he is great and mighty and can do what he will. We are lost as if we were struggling in great waters when we try to think of him. But perhaps doubts come into your mind like this. Can God take much notice of us poor people? Perhaps he only made the world for the great and the wise and the rich. It doesn't cost him much to give us our little handful of victual and bit of clothing. But how do we know he cares for us any more than we care for the worms and things in the garden, so as we rear our carrots and onions? Will God take care of us when we die? And has he any comfort for us when we are lame and sick and helpless? Perhaps, too, he is angry with us, else why does the blight come and the bad harvests and the fever and all sorts of pain and trouble? For our life is full of trouble, and if God sends us good, he seems to send bad, too. How is it? How is it? Ah, dear friends, we are in sad want of good news about God. And what does other good news signify if we haven't that? For everything else comes to an end, and when we die we leave it all. But God lasts when everything else is gone. What shall we do if he is not our friend? Then Dinah told how the good news had been brought, and how the mind of God towards the poor had been made manifest in the life of Jesus, dwelling on its lowliness and its acts of mercy. So you see, dear friends, she went on, Jesus spent his time almost all in doing good to poor people, 
He preached out of doors to them, and he made friends of poor workmen, and taught them, and took pains with them. Not but what he did good to the rich, too, for he was full of love to all men. Only he saw as the poor were more in want of his help. So he cured the lame, and the sick, and the blind, and he worked miracles to feed the hungry, because he said he was sorry for them. And he was very kind to the little children, and comforted those who had lost their friends, and he spoke very tenderly to poor sinners that were sorry for their sins. Ah, oh, wouldn't you love such a man if you saw him, if he were here in this village? What a kind heart he must have, what a friend he would be to go to in trouble, how pleasant it must be to be taught by him. Well, dear friends, who was this man? Was he only a good man? A very good man, and no more, like our dear Mr. Wesley, who has been taken from us? He was the Son of God, in the image of the Father, the Bible says. That means just like God, who is the beginning and end of all things, the God we want to know about. So then, all the love that Jesus showed to the poor is the same love that God has for us. We can understand what Jesus felt because he came in a body like ours and spoke words such as we speak to each other. We were afraid to think what God was before, the God who made the world and the sky and the thunder and lightning. We could never see him. We could only see the things he had made, and some of these things was very terrible, so as we might well tremble when we thought of him. But our blessed Saviour has showed us what God is in a way us poor ignorant people can understand. He has showed us what God's heart is, what are his feelings towards us. But let us see a little more about what Jesus came on earth for. Another time he said, I came to seek and to save that which was lost. And another time, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The lost! Sinners! Dear friends, does that mean you and me? Hitherto the traveller had been chained to the spot against his will by the charm of Dinah's mellow treble tones, which had a variety of modulation like that of a fine instrument, touched with the unconscious skill of musical instinct. The simple things she said seemed like novelties, as a melody strikes us with a new feeling when we hear it sung by the pure voice of a boyish chorister. The quiet depth of conviction with which she spoke seemed in itself an evidence for the truth of her message. He saw that she had thoroughly arrested her hearers. The villagers had pressed nearer to her, and there was no longer anything but grave attention on all faces. She spoke slowly, though quite fluently, often pausing after a question, or before any transition of ideas. There was no change of attitude, no gesture. The effect of her speech was produced entirely by the inflections of her voice. And when she came to the question, Will God take care of us when we die? She uttered it in such a tone of plaintive appeal that the tears came into some of the hardest eyes. The stranger had ceased to doubt, as he had done at first glance, that she could fix the attention of her rougher hearers, but still he wondered whether she could have that power of rousing their more violent emotions, which must surely be a necessary seal of her vocation as a Methodist preacher, until she came to the words, Lost! sinners when there was a great change in her voice and manner she had made a long pause before the exclamation and the pause seemed to be filled by agitating thoughts that showed themselves in her features her pale face became paler the circles under her eyes deepened as they did when tears half gather without falling and the mild loving eyes took an expression of appalled pity as if she had suddenly discerned a destroying angel hovering over the heads of the people her voice became deep and muffled, but there was still no gesture. Nothing could be less like the ordinary type of the ranter than Dinah. She was not preaching as she heard others preach, but speaking directly from her own emotions and under the inspiration of her own simple faith. But now she had entered into a new current of feeling. Her manner became less calm, her utterance more rapid and agitated, as she tried to bring home to the people their guilt their willful darkness, their state of disobedience to God, as she dwelt on the hatefulness of sin, the divine holiness, and the sufferings of the Saviour, by which a way had been opened for their salvation. At last it seemed as if, in her yearning desire to reclaim the lost sheep, she could not be satisfied by addressing her hearers as a body. She appealed first to one and then to another, beseeching them with tears to turn to God while there was yet time, painting to them the desolation of their souls, lost in sin, feeding on the husks of this miserable world, far away from God their Father, and then the love of the Saviour who was waiting and watching for their return. There was many a responsive sigh and groan from her fellow Methodists, 
that the village mind does not easily take fire and a little smouldering vague anxiety that might easily die out again was the utmost effect dinah's preaching had wrought in them at present yet no one had retired except the children and old feyther taft who being too deaf to catch many words had some time ago gone back to his inglenook wiry ben was feeling very uncomfortable and almost wishing he had not come to hear dinah he thought what she said would haunt him somehow yet he couldn't help liking to look at her and listen to her though he dreaded every moment that she would fix her eyes on him and address him in particular she had already addressed sandy jim who was now holding the baby to relieve his wife and the big soft-hearted man had rubbed away some tears with his fist with a confused intention of being a better fellow going less to the holly bush down by the stone pit and cleaning himself more regularly of a sunday in front of sandy jim stood chad's best who had shown an unwanted quietude and fixity of attention ever since Dinah had begun to speak. Not that the matter of the discourse had arrested her at once, for she was lost in a puzzling speculation as to what pleasure and satisfaction there could be in life to a young woman who wore a cap like Dinah's. Giving up this inquiry in despair, she took to studying Dinah's nose, eyes, mouth, and hair, and wondering whether it was better to have a, such a sort of pale face as that, or fat red cheeks and round black eyes like her own. But gradually the influence of the general gravity told upon her, and she became conscious of what Dinah was saying. The gentle tones, the loving persuasion did not touch her, but when the more severe appeals came she began to be frightened. Poor Bessie had always been considered a naughty girl. She was conscious of it. If it was necessary to be very good, it was clear she must be in a bad way. She couldn't find her places at church as Sally Rand could. She had often been tittering when she churchied to Mr. Irwine. And these religious deficiencies were accompanied by a corresponding slackness in the minor morals, for Bessie belonged unquestionably to that unsoaped lazy class of feminine characters with whom you may venture to eat an egg, an apple, or a nut. All this she was generally conscious of, and hitherto had not been greatly ashamed of it but now she began to feel very much as if the constable had come to take her up and carry her before the justice for some undefined offence she had a terrified sense that god whom she had always thought of as very far off was very near to her and that jesus was close by looking at her though she could not see him for dinah had that belief in visible manifestations of jesus which is common among the methodists and she communicated it irresistibly to her hearers she made them feel that he was among them, bodily, and might at any moment show himself to them in some way that would strike anguish and penitence into their hearts. See, she exclaimed, turning to the left, with her eyes fixed on a point above the heads of the people. See where our blessed Lord stands and weeps and stretches out his arms towards you. Hear what he says. How often would I have gathered you as a hen gathereth her chicks under her wings, and ye would not. And ye would not, she repeated in a tone of pleading reproach, turning her eyes on the people again. See the print of the nails on his dear hands and feet. It is your sins that made them. Ah, how pale and worn he looks. He has gone through all that great agony in the garden, when his soul was exceeding sorrowful even unto death, and the great drops of sweat fell like blood to the ground. They spat upon him and buffeted him. They scourged him. They mocked him. They laid the heavy cross on his bruised shoulders. Then they nailed him up. What pain! His lips are parched with thirst, and they mock him still in this great agony. Yet with those parched lips he prays for them. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Then a horror of great darkness fell upon him, and he felt what sinners feel when they are forever shut out from God. That was the last drop in the cup of bitterness. My God! My God, he cries, why hast thou forsaken me? All this he bore for you, for you, and you never think of him, for you, and you turn your backs on him. You don't care what he has gone through for you, yet he is not weary of toiling for you. He is risen from the dead, he is praying for you at the right hand of God. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And he is upon this earth too, he is among us. He is there close to you now. I see his wounded body and his look of love. Here Dinah turned to Bessie Cranage, whose bonny youth and evident vanity had touched her with pity. Poor child! 
poor child, he is beseeching you, and you don't listen to him. You think of earrings and fine gowns and caps, and you never think of the Savior who died to save your precious soul. Your cheeks will be shriveled one day, your hair will be gray, your poor body will be thin and tottering. Then you will begin to feel that your soul is not saved. Then you will have to stand before God, dressed in your sins, in your evil tempers and vain thoughts. And Jesus, who stands ready to help you now, won't help you then. Because you won't have him to be your savior, he will be your judge. Now he looks at you with love and mercy and says, Come to me that you may have life. Then he will turn away from you and say, Depart from me into everlasting fire. Poor Bessie's wide-open black eyes began to fill with tears. Her great red cheeks and lips became quite pale and her face was distorted like a little child's before a burst of crying. "'Ah, oh, poor blind child,' Dinah went on. "'Think if it should happen to you as it once happened to a servant of God in the days of her vanity. She thought of her lace caps and saved all her money to buy them. She thought nothing about how she might get a clean heart and a right spirit. She only wanted to have better lace than other girls. And one day, when she put her new cap on and looked in the glass, she saw a bleeding face crowned with thorns. That face is looking at you now. Here Dinah pointed to a spot close in front of Bessie. Ah, tear off those follies. Cast them away from you, as if they were stinging adders. They are stinging you. They are poisoning your soul. They are dragging you down into a dark, bottomless pit where you will sink forever, forever, and forever, further away from light and God. Bessie could bear it no longer. A great terror was upon her, and wrenching her earrings from her ears, she threw them down before her, sobbing aloud. Her father, Chad, frightened lest he should be laid hold on, too, this impression on the rebellious Bess striking him as nothing less than a miracle, walked hastily away and began to work at his anvil by way of reassuring himself. "'Folks, mun a horseshoes, preaching or no preaching, the devil can a lay hold of me for that,' he muttered to himself. But now Dinah began to tell of the joys that were in store for the penitent and to describe in her simple way the divine peace and love with which the soul of the believer is filled, how the sense of God's love turns poverty into riches and satisfies the soul so that no uneasy desire vexes it, no fear alarms it, how at last the very temptation to sin is extinguished and heaven is begun upon earth because no cloud passes between the soul and God, who is its eternal Son. Dear friends, she said at last, brothers and sisters, whom I love as those for whom my Lord has died. Believe me, I know what this great blessedness is, and because I know it, I want you to have it too. I am poor like you. I have to get my living with my hands, but no lord nor lady can be so happy as me if they haven't got the love of God in their souls. Think what it is, not to hate anything but sin, to be full of love to every creature, to be frightened at nothing, to be sure that all things will turn to good, not to mind pain because it is our Father's will, to know that nothing, no, not if the earth was to be burnt up or the waters come and drown us, nothing could part us from God who loves us and who fills our souls with peace and joy because we are sure that whatever he wills is holy, just, and good. Dear friends, come and take this blessedness. It is offered to you. It is the good news that Jesus came to preach to the poor. It is not like the riches of this world, so that the more one gets, the less the rest can have. God is without end. His love is without end. It streams the whole creation reach, so plenteous is the store. Enough for all, enough for each, enough for evermore. Dinah had been speaking at least an hour, and the reddening light of the parting day seemed to give a solemn emphasis to her closing words. The stranger, who had been interested in the course of her sermon as if it had been the development of a drama, for there is this sort of fascination in all sincere, unpremeditated eloquence, which opens to one the inward drama of the speaker's emotions, now turned his horse aside and pursued his way, while Dinah said, Let us sing a little, dear friends. And as he was still winding down the slope, the voices of the Methodists reached him, rising and falling in that strange blending of exaltation and sadness which belongs to the cadence of a hymn. End of chapter 2 
Chapter Three of Adam Bede. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Lucy Burgoyne. Adam Bede by George Eliot. Chapter Three. After the preaching. In less than an hour from that time. Seth Bede was walking by Dinah's side along the hedgerow path that skirted the pastures and green cornfields which lay between the village and the hall farm. Dinah had taken off her little Quaker bonnet again, and was holding it in her hands that she might have a freer enjoyment of the cool evening twilight, and Seth could see the expression of her face quite clearly as he walked by her side. Timidly revolving something he wanted to say to her. It was an expression of unconscious placid gravity, of absorption in thoughts that had no connection with the present moment or with her own personality, an expression that is most of all discouraging to a lover. Her very walk was discouraging. It had that quiet elasticity that asks for no support. Seth felt this dimly. He said to himself, She's too good and holy for any man, let alone me, and the words he had been summoning rushed back again before they had reached his lips. But another thought gave him courage. There's no man could love her better and leave her freer to follow the Lord's work. They had been silent for many minutes now. Since they had done talking about Bessie Cranage, Dinah seemed almost to have forgotten Seth's presence, and her pace was becoming so much quicker that the sense of there being only a few minutes' walk from the yard gates of the Hall Farm at last gave Seth courage to speak. You've quite made up your mind to go back to Snowfield, O oh Saturday, Dinah? Yes, said Dinah quietly. I'm called there. It was borne in upon my mind while I was meditating on Sunday night, as Sister Ellen, who's in a decline, is in need of me. I saw her as plain as we see that bit of thin white cloud, lifting up her poor thin hand and beckoning to me. And this morning, when I opened the Bible for direction, the first words my eyes fell on were, and after we had seen the vision, immediately we endeavoured to go into Macedonia. If it wasn't for that clear showing of the Lord's will, I should be loath to go, for my heart yearns over my aunt and her little ones, and that poor wandering lamb, Hetty Sorrel. I've been much drawn out in prayer for her of late, and I look on it as a token that there may be mercy in store for her. God grant it, said Seth, for I doubt Adam's heart is so set on her. He'll never turn to anybody else, and yet it you'd go to my heart if he was to marry her, for I cannot think as she'd make him happy. It's a deep mystery the way the heart of man turns to one woman out of all the rest he's seen I, the world, and makes it easier for him to work seven year for her, like Jacob did for Rachel, sooner than have any other woman for the asking. I often think of them words, and Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days for the love he had to her. I know those words you'd come true with me, Dinah, if so be you'd give me hope as I might win you after seven years was over. I know you think a husband you'd be taking up too much or your thoughts, because St. Paul says, she's that's married careth for the thing of the world how she may please her husband, and may happen you'll think me over bold to speak to you about it again. After what you told me o oh, your mind last Saturday, but I've been thinking it over again by night and by day, and I've prayed not to be blinded by my own desires, 
to think what's only good for me must be good for you too. And it seems to me there's more texts for your marrying than ever you can find against it. For St. Paul says as plain as can be in another place, I will that the younger woman marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to adversary to speak reproachfully, and then two are better than one, and that holds good with marriage as well as with other things. For we should be o oh, one heart and o oh, one mind, Dinah. We both serve the same master, and are striving after the same gifts, and I'd never be the husband to make a claim on you as could interfere with your doing the work God has fitted you for. I'd make a shift, and fend indoor and out, to give you more liberty, more than you can have now, for you've got to get your own living now, and I'm strong enough to work for us both. When Seth had once begun to urge his suit, he went on earnestly and almost hurriedly, lest Dinah should speak some decisive word before he had poured forth all the arguments he had prepared. His cheeks became flushed as he went on, his mild grey eyes filled with tears, and his voice trembled as he spoke the last sentence. They had reached one of those very narrow passes between two tall stones, which performed the office of a stile in Loamshire, and Dinah paused as she turned towards Seth and said, in her tender but calm treble notes, Seth Bede, I thank you for your love towards me, and if I could think of any man as more than a Christian brother, I think it would be you. But my heart is not free to marry. That is good for other women, and it is a great and blessed thing to be a wife and mother. But as God has distributed to every man, as the Lord hath called every man, so let him walk. God has called me to minister to others, not to have any joys or sorrows of my own, but to rejoice with them that do rejoice, and to weep with those that weep. He has called me to speak his word, and he has greatly owned my work. It could only be on a very clear showing that I could leave the brethren and sisters at Snowfield who are favoured with very little of this world's good, where the trees are few, so that a child might count them, and there's very hard living for the poor in the winter. It has been given me to help, to comfort, and strengthen the little flock there, and to call in many wanderers. And my soul is filled with these things, from my rising up till my lying down. My life is too short, and God's work is too great for me to think of making a home for myself in this world. I've not turned a deaf ear to your words, Seth, for when I saw as your love was given to me, I thought it might be a leading of providence for me to change my way of life, and that we should be fellow helpers, and I spread the matter before the Lord." but whenever I tried to fix my mind on marriage and our living together, other thoughts always came in, the times when I prayed by the sick and dying, and the happy hours I've had preaching, when my heart was filled with love, and the word was given to me abundantly. And when I've opened the Bible for direction, I've always lighted on some clear word, to tell me where my work lay. I believe what you say, Seth, that you would try to be a help and not a hindrance to my work, but I see that our marriage is not God's will. He draws my heart another way. I desire to live and die without husband or children. I seem to have no room in my soul for wants and fears of my own. It has pleased God to fill my heart so full with the wants and sufferings of his poor people. Seth was unable to reply, and they walked on in silence, 
At last, as they were nearly at the yard gate, he said, Well, Dinah, I must seek for strength to bear it, and to endure as seeing him who is invisible. But I feel now how weak my faith is. It seems as if, when you are gone, I could never joy in anything any more. I think it's something passing, the love of women, as I feel for you. For I could be content without your marrying me, if I could go and live at Snowfield and be near you. I trusted, as the strong love God has given me towards you, was a leading for us both. But it seems it was only meant for my trial. Perhaps I feel more for you than I ought to feel for any creature, for I often can't help saying of you what the hymn says. In darker shades, if she appear, my dawning is begun. She is my soul's bright morning star, and she my rising sun. That may be wrong, and I am to be taught better, but you wouldn't be displeased with me if things turned out so as I could leave this country, and go to live at Snowfield? No, Seth, but I counsel you to wait patiently, and not lightly to leave your own country and kindred. Do nothing without the Lord's clear bidding. It's a bleak and barren country there, not like this land of Goshen you've been used to. We mustn't be in a hurry to fix and choose our own lot. We must wait to be guided. But you'd let me write you a letter, Dinah, if there was anything I wanted to tell you. Yes, sure, let me know if you're in any trouble. You'll be continually in my prayers. They had now reached the yard gate, and Seth said, I won't go in, Dinah, so farewell. He paused and hesitated after she had given him her hand, and then said, there's no knowing but what you may see things different after a while. There may be a new leading. Let us leave that, Seth. It's good to live only a moment at a time, as I've read in one of Mr. Wesley's books. It isn't for you and me to lay plans. We've nothing to do but to obey and to trust. Farewell. Dinah pressed his hand with rather a sad look in her loving eyes, and then passed through the gate, while Seth turned away to walk lingeringly home. But instead of taking the direct road, he chose to turn back along the fields through which he and Dinah had already passed, and I think his blue linen handkerchief was very wet with tears long before he had made up his mind that it was time for him to set his face steadily homewards. He was but three and twenty, and had only just learned what it is to love, to love with that adoration which a young man gives to a woman whom he feels to be greater and better than himself. Love of this sort is hardly distinguishable from religious feeling. What deep and worthy love is so, whether of woman or child, or art or music. Our caresses, our tender words, our still rapture under the influence of autumn sunsets, or pillared vistas, or calm majestic statues, or Beethoven sympathies all bring with them the consciousness that they are mere waves and ripples in unfathomable ocean of love and beauty. Our emotion in its keenest moment passes from expression into silence. Our love, at its highest flood, rushes beyond its object and loses itself in the sense of divine mystery. And this blessed gift of venerating love has been given to too many humble craftsmen since the world begun for us to feel any surprise that it should have existed in the soul of a Methodist carpenter half a century ago, while there was yet a lingering afterglow from the time when Wesley and his fellow labourer fed on the hips and haws of the Cornwall hedges, after exhausting limbs and lungs in carrying a divine message to the poor. 
That afterglow has long faded away, and the picture we are apt to make of Methodism in our imagination is not an amphitheatre of green hills, or the deep shade of broad-leaved sycamores, where a crowd of rough men and weary-hearted women drunk in a faith which was a rudimentary culture, which linked their thoughts with the past, lifted their imagination above the sordid details of their own narrow lives, and suffused their souls with the sense of a pitying, loving, infinite presence, sweet as summer to the houseless needy. It is too possible that to some of my readers Methodism may mean nothing more than a low-pitched gables, up dingy streets, sleek grocers, sponging preachers, and hypocritical jargon, elements which are regarded as an exhaustive analyst of Methodism in many fashionable quarters. That would be a pity, for I cannot pretend that Seth and Dinah were anything else than Methodists, not indeed of that modern type which reads quarterly reviews and attends in chapels with pillared porticos, but of a very old-fashioned kind. They believed in present miracles, in instantaneous conversations, in revelations by dreams and visions. They drew lots and sought for divine guidance by opening the Bible at hazard, having a literal way of interpreting the scriptures, which is not at all sanctioned by approved commentators, and it is impossible for me to represent their diction as correct, or their instruction as liberal. Still, if I have read religious history aright, faith, hope, and charity have not always been found in a direct ratio with a sensibility to the three concords, and it is possible, thank heaven, to have very erroneous theories and very sublime feelings. The raw bacon which clumsy Molly spares from her own scanty store, that she may carry it to her neighbour's child to stop the fits, may be a piteously inefficacious remedy, but the generous stirring of neighbourly kindness that prompted the deed has a beneficent radiation that is not lost. Considering these things, we can hardly think Dinah and Seth beneath our sympathy, accustomed as we may be to weep over the loftier sorrows of heroines in satin boots and crinoline, and of heroes riding fiery horses, themselves ridden by still more fiery passions. Poor Seth! He was never on horseback in his life except once, when he was a little lad, and Mr. Jonathan Burge took him up behind, telling him to hold on tight, and instead of bursting out into wild accusing apostrophes to God and destiny, he is resolving, as he now walks homewards under the solemn starlight, to repress his sadness, to be less bent on having his own will, and to live more for others, as Dinah does. End of chapter 3「All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Missy, Guangzhou, China. Adam Bede by George Eliot. Chapter 4. Home and Its Sorrows. A green valley, with a brook running through it, full almost to overflowing with the late rains, overhung by low stooping willows. Across this brook a plank is thrown, and over this plank Adam Bede is passing with his undoubting step, followed close by Jip with the basket, evidently making his way to the thatched house with a stack of timber by the side of it, about twenty yards up the opposite slope. The door of the house is open, and an elderly woman is looking out, but she is not placidly contemplating the evening sunshine. She has been watching with dim eyes the gradually enlarging speck, which for the last few minutes she has been quite sure is her darling son Adam. 
Lisbeth Bede loves her son with the love of a woman to whom her firstborn has come late in life. She is an anxious, spare, yet vigorous old woman, clean as a snowdrop. Her gray hair is turned neatly back under a pure linen cap with a black band round it. Her broad chest is covered with a buff neckerchief, and below this you see a sort of short bedgown made of blue checkered linen, tied round the waist and descending to the hips, from whence there is a considerable length of linsey woolsey petticoat. For Lisbeth is tall, and in other points, too, there is a strong likeness between her and her son Adam. Her dark eyes are somewhat dim now, perhaps from too much crying, but her broadly marked eyebrows are still black, her teeth are sound, and as she stands knitting rapidly and unconsciously with her work-hardened hands, she has as firmly upright an attitude as when she is carrying a pail of water on her head from the spring. There is the same type of frame and the same keen activity of temperament in mother and son, but it was not from her that Adam got his well-filled brow and his expression of large-hearted intelligence. Family likeness has often a deep sadness in it. Nature, that great tragic dramatist, knits us together by bone and muscle and divides us by the subtler web of our brains, blends yearning and repulsion, and ties us by our heartstrings to the beans that jar at us at every moment. We hear a voice with the very cadence of our own, uttering the thoughts we despise. We see eyes, ah, so like our mother's, averted from us in cold alienation, and our last darling child startles us with the air and gestures of the sister we parted from in bitterness long years ago. The father to whom we owe our best heritage, the mechanical instinct, the keen sensibility to harmony, the unconscious skill of the modeling hand, galls us and puts us to shame by his daily errors. The long-lost mother, whose face we begin to see in the glass as our own wrinkles come, once fretted our young souls with her anxious humors and irrational persistence. It is such a fond, anxious mother's voice that you hear, as Lisbeth says, Well, my lad, it's gone seven by the clock. They'd always stay till the last child's born. They want thy supper, I'll warrant. Where's Seth? Gone out of some as chaplain, I reckon. Aye, aye, Seth that no harm, mother, thee mayst be sure. But where's father? said Adam quickly as he entered the house and glanced into the room on the left hand, which was used as a workshop. Hasn't he done the coffin for Tholer? There's the stuff standing just as I left it this morning. Done the coffin, said Elizabeth, following him and knitting uninterruptedly, though she looked at her son very anxiously. Eh, my lad, he went off to Treddleston this forenoon, and's never come back. I doubt he's got to the wagon over through again. A deep flush of anger passed rapidly over Adam's face. He said nothing, but threw off his jacket and began to roll up his shirt sleeves again. What art going to do, Adam? said mother, with a tone of look and alarm. Thee wants to go to work again. Well, I hadn't I bit a supper. Adam, too angry to speak, walked into the workshop. But his mother threw down her knitting and, hurrying after him, took hold of his arm and said in a tone of plaintive remonstrance, "Nay, my lad, my lad, thee munna go without thy supper. There's the taters with the gravy in em, just as thee likes em. I saved em a purpose for thee." Come and have a supper, come. Let be, said Adam impetuously, shaking her off and seizing one of the planks that stood against the wall. It's fine talking about having supper when here's a coffin promised to be ready at Broxton by seven o'clock tomorrow morning, and ought to have been there by now, and not a nail struck yet. My throat's too full to swallow victuals. Why, thee canst to get the coffin ready, said Lisbeth. Thee'd work thyself to death. It'd take thee all night to do't. What signifies how long it takes me? Isn't the coffin promised? Can they bury the man without a coffin? I'd work my right hand off sooner than deceive people with lies of that way. It makes me mad to think on it. I shall overrun these doings before long. I've stood enough of them. Poor Lisbeth did not hear this threat for the first time, and if she had been wise, she would have gone away quietly and said nothing for the next hour. But one of the lessons a woman most rarely learns is never to talk to an angry or a drunken man. Lisbeth sat down on the chopping bench and began to cry and by the time she had cried enough to make her voice very piteous, she burst out into words. Nay, my lad, my lad, they wants to go away and break their mother's heart and leave their father to ruin. They wants to have em carry me to the churchyard and thee not to follow me. I shall not rush to my grave if I don't see thee at the last, and how's they to let thee know as I'm a-dying if thee'd gone a work in a distant parts, and Seth be like gone otter thee and thy father not be able to hold a pen for his hand shaken, besides not knowing where thee art. They mun forget thy father. They mun be so bitter again him. He were a good father to thee afore he took to the drink. 
He's a clever workman, and taught thee thy trade, remember, and it's never gin me a blow, nor so much as an ill word. No, not even in strink. Thee wants to go hem to the workhouse. Thee own feyther, and them his was a fine-grown man, and handy at everything almost as thee art thy said five and twenty year ago, when thee wast a baby at the breast. Lisbeth's voice became louder and choked with sobs, a sort of wail, the most irritating of all sounds where real sorrows are to be borne and real work to be done. Now, mother, don't cry and talk so. Haven't I got enough to vex me without that? What's the use of telling me things as I only think too much on every day? If I didn't think on em, why should I do as I do for the sake of keeping things together here? But I hate to be talking where it's no use. I like to keep my breath for doing instead of talking. I know thee dost things as nobody else would do, my lad. But thee'd always so hard upon thy feyther, Adam. Thee thinks nothing too much to do for Seth. Thee snaps me up if ever I find fault with the lad. But thee's so angered with thy feyther, more nor with anybody else. That's better than speaking soft and letting things go the wrong way, I reckon, isn't it? If I wasn't sharp with him, he'd sell every bit of stuff in the yard and spend it on drink. I know there's a duty to be done by my father, but it isn't my duty to encourage him in running headlong to ruin. And what has Seth got to do with it? The lad does no harm, as I know of. But leave me alone, mother, and let me get on th with the work. Lisbeth dared not say any more, but she got up and called Jip, thinking to console herself somewhat for Adam's refusal of the supper she had spread out, in the loving expectation of looking at him while he ate it, by feeding Adam's dog with extra liberality. But Jip was watching his master with wrinkled brow and ears erect, puzzled at this unusual course of things. And though he glanced at Lisbeth when she called him and moved his four paws uneasily, well knowing that she was inviting him to supper, he was in a divided state of mind, and remained seated on his haunches, again fixing his eyes anxiously on his master. Adam noticed Jip's mental conflict, and though his anger had made him less tender than usual to his mother, it did not prevent him from caring as much as usual for his dog. We are apt to be kinder to the brutes that love us than to the women that love us. Is it because the brutes are dumb? Go, Jip. Go, lad, said Adam in a tone of encouraging command, and Jip, apparently satisfied that duty and pleasure were one, followed Lisbeth into the house place. But no sooner had he licked up his supper than he went back to his master, while Lisbeth sat down alone to cry over her knitting. Women who are never bitter and resentful are often the most querulous, and if Solomon was as wise as he is reputed to be, I feel sure that when he compared a contentious woman to a continual dropping on a very rainy day, he had not a vixen in his eye, a fury with long nails, acrid and selfish. Depend upon it, he meant a good creature, who had no joy but in the happiness of the loved ones whom she contributed to make life uncomfortable, putting by all the tidbits for them and spending nothing on herself. Such a woman as Lisbeth, for example, at once patient and complaining, self-renouncing and exacting, brooding the live-long day over what happened yesterday and what is likely to happen tomorrow, and crying very readily both at the good and the evil. But a certain awe mingled itself with her idolatrous love of Adam, and when he said, Leave me alone, she was always silenced. So the hours passed, to the loud ticking of the old day clock and the sound of Adam's tools. At last he called for a light and a draught of water. Beer was a thing only to be drunk on holidays, and Lisbeth ventured to say as she took it in, The supper stands ready for thee when thee likest. Dunna sit thee up, mother, said Adam in a gentle tone. He had worked off his anger now, and whenever he wished to be especially kind to his mother, he fell into his strongest native accent and dialect, with which at other times his speech was less deeply tinged. I'll see to father when he comes home. Maybe he won't come at all tonight. I shall be easier if thee eat in bed. Nay, I'll bide till Seth comes. He won't be long now, I reckon. It was then past nine by the clock, which was always in advance of the days, and before it had struck ten the latch was lifted and Seth entered. He had heard the sound of the tools as he was approaching. "'Why, mother,' he said, "'how is it as father's workin' so late?' "'It's none of thy feyther as is a-workin'. "'Thee might know that well enough "'if thy head weren't a full o' chaplin'. "'It's thy brother as does everything, "'for there's never anybody else of the way to do nothin'.' Lisbeth was going on, for she was not at all afraid of Seth, and usually poured into his words all the querulousness which was repressed by her awe of Adam. Seth had never in his life spoken a harsh word to his mother— and timid people always wreak their peevishness on the gentle. But Seth, with an anxious look, had passed into the workshop and said, "'Addy, how's this? What, father's forgot the coffin?' "'Aye, lad, the old tale. 
but I shall get it done, said Adam, looking up and casting one of his bright, keen glances at his brother. Why, what's the matter with thee? Thee's in trouble. Seth's eyes were red, and there was a look of deep depression on his mild face. Yes, Addy, but it's what must be borne and can't be helped. Why, thee's never been to the school, then? School? No, that screw can wait, said Adam, hammering away again. Let me take my turn now, and do thee go to bed, said Seth. No, lad, I'd rather go on, now I'm in harness. Thee'd help me to carry it to Broxton when it's done. I'll call thee up at sunrise. Go and eat thy supper and shut the door, so as I mayn't hear mother's talk. Seth knew that Adam always meant what he said, and was not to be persuaded into meaning anything else. So he turned, with rather a heavy heart, into the house place. "'Adam's never touched a bit of victual since he's come home,' said Lisbeth. "'I reckon thee'st had thy supper at some of thy methody folks.' "'Nay, mother,' said Seth, "'I've had no supper yet.' "'Come, then,' said Lisbeth. "'But dunna thee eat the taters, for Adam'll help and ate them if I leave em stannin'. He loves a bit of taters and gravy. But he's been so sore and angered he wouldn't eat em, for all I'd put in em by a purpose for him. And he's been a-threatening to go away again,' she went on, whimpering. "'And I'm fast sure he'll go some dawnin' afore I'm up, and never let me know aforehand, and he'll never come back again when once he's gone. And I'd better never a had had a son, as is like no other buddy's son, for the deafness and the handiness, and so looked on by the grit folks, and tall and upright like a poplar tree, and me to be parted from him, and never see him no more.' "'Come, mother, don't grieve thyself in vain,' said Seth, in a soothing voice. "'Thee's not half so good reason to think as Adam will go away as to think he'll stay with thee. "'He may say such a thing when he's in wrath, and he's got excuse for being wrathful sometimes, "'but his heart had never let him go. "'Think how he stood by us all when it's been none so easy, "'paying his savings to free me from going for a soldier, and turning his earnings into wood for father, "'when he's got plenty of uses for his own money, and many a young man like him had have been married and settled before now.' He'll never turn round and knock down his own work and forsake them as it's been the labor of his life to stand by. Don't talk to me about his marrying, said Lisbeth, crying afresh. He sets heart on that heady sorrel as will never save a penny and will toss up her head at at's old mother. And to think as he might a had Mary Burge and be took partners and be a big man with workmen under him like Mr. Burge. Dolly's told me so o'er and o'er again. If it weren't as he sets heart on that bit of a wench, as is no more use nor the gilly flower on the wall. And he's so wise at booking and figuring, and not to know no better nor that. But, mother, thee knows we kind of love just where other folks would have us. There's nobody but God can control the heart of man. I could a wished myself as Adam could a made another choice, but I won't reproach him for what he can't help. And I'm not sure but what he tries to overcome it. "'but it's a matter as he doesn't like to be spoke to about, "'and I can only pray to the Lord to bless and direct him. "'Aye, thee'd always ready enough at praying, "'but I don't see as thee gets much with thy praying. "'Thee want to get double earnings o' this side yule. "'The Methodies will never make thee half the man thy brother is, "'for all they're making a preacher on thee.' "'It's partly truth thee speaks there, mother,' said Seth mildly. "'Adam's far before me, and's done more for me than I can ever do for him.' God distributes talents to every man according as he sees good. But thee must not undervalue prayer. Prayer may not bring money, but it brings us what no money can buy, a power to keep from sin and be content with God's will, whatever he may please to send. If thee wouldst pray to God to help thee and trust in his goodness, thee wouldst to be so uneasy about things. Uneasy? I'm of the right on it to be uneasy. It's well seen on thee what it is never to be uneasy. Think ye away all thy earnings, and never be uneasy as thee's nothing laid up again a rainy day. If Adam had been as easy as thee, he'd never ha had no money to pay for thee. Take no thought for the morrow, take no thought. That's what thee'd always say in, and what comes on it. Why is Adam has to take thought for thee? Those are the words of the Bible, mother, said Seth. They don't mean as we should be idle. They mean we shouldn't be over-anxious and worried in ourselves about what'll happen to-morrow. But do our duty, and leave the rest to God's will. Ay, ay, that's the way with thee. Thee always makes a peck of thy own words out of a pint of the Bibles. I dunna see how thee to know, as take no thought for the morrow means all that. And when the Bible's such a big book, and thee canst read all through it, and how the pick of the text is, I cannot think why thee doesna pick better words, as dunna mean so much more nor they say. Adam doesna pick that un. I can understand the text as he's always a saying, God helps them as helps their sins. "'Nay, mother,' said Seth, "'that's no text of the Bible. "'It comes out of a book as Adam picked up at the stall at Treddleston. "'It was wrote by a knowing man, but overworldly, I doubt. 
However, that saying's partly true, for the Bible tells us we must be workers together with God. Well, how am I to know? It sounds like a text. But what's the matter with the lad? They'd hardly eaten a bit of supper. Doesn't mean to ha no more, nor that bit of oat cake. And thee looks as white as a flick of new bacon. What's the matter with thee? Nothing to mind about, mother. I'm not hungry. I'll just look in at Adam again and see if he'll let me go on with the coffin. Ha a drop of warm broth, said Lisbeth, whose motherly feeling now got the better of her nattering habit. I'll set two, three sticks alight in a minute. Nay, mother, thank thee, thee very good, said Seth gratefully, and encouraged by this touch of tenderness, he went on. Let me pray a bit with thee for father, and Adam, and all of us. It'll comfort thee, happen more than thee thinkst. Well, I've nothing to say again it. Lisbeth, though disposed always to take the negative side in her conversations with Seth, had a vague sense that there was some comfort and safety in the fact of his piety, and that it somehow relieved her from the trouble of any spiritual transactions on her own behalf. So the mother and son knelt down together, and Seth prayed for the poor wandering father, and for those who were sorrowing for him at home. And when he came to the petition that Adam might never be called to set up his tent in a far country, but that his mother might be cheered and comforted by his presence all the days of her pilgrimage, Lisbeth's ready tears flowed again, and she wept aloud. When they rose from their knees, Seth went to Adam again and said, "'Wilt only lie down for an hour or two, and let me go on the while?' "'No, Seth, no. Make mother go to bed, and go thyself.' Meantime Lisbeth had dried her eyes, and now followed Seth, holding something in her hands. It was the brown and yellow platter containing the baked potatoes with the gravy in them, and bits of meat which she had cut and mixed among them. Those were dear times, when wheaten bread and fresh meat were delicacies to working people. She set the dish down rather timidly on the bench by Adam's side, and said, "'Thee canst pick a bit while thee workin'. I'll bring thee another drop of water.' "'Aye, mother, do,' said Adam kindly. "'I'm getting very thirsty.' In half an hour all was quiet. No sound was to be heard in the house but the loud ticking of the old day clock and the ringing of Adam's tools. The night was very still. When Adam opened the door to look out at twelve o'clock, the only motion seemed to be in the glowing, twinkling stars. Every blade of grass was asleep. Bodily haste and exertion usually leave our thoughts very much at the mercy of our feelings and imagination. And it was so tonight with Adam. While his muscles were working lustily, his mind seemed as passive as a spectator at a diorama. Scenes of the sad past, and probably sad future, floating before him and giving place one to the other in swift succession. He saw how it would be tomorrow morning, when he had carried the coffin to Broxton and was at home again, having his breakfast. His father, perhaps, would come in, ashamed to meet his son's glance, would sit down, looking older and more tottering than he had done the morning before, and hang down his head, examining the floor quarries, while Lisbeth would ask him how he supposed the coffin had been got ready, that he had slinked off and left undone, for Lisbeth was always the first to utter the word of reproach, though she cried at Adam's severity toward her father. So it will go on, worsening and worsening, thought Adam. There's no slipping uphill again, and no standing still when once you've begun to slip down. And then the day came back to him when he was a little fellow, and used to run by his father's side, proud to be taken out to work, and prouder still to hear his father boasting to his fellow workmen how the little chap had an uncommon notion of carpentering. What a fine, active fellow his father was then! When people asked Adam whose little lad he was, he had a sense of distinction as he answered, I'm Thias Bede's lad. He was quite sure everybody knew Thias Bede. Didn't he make the wonderful pigeon house at Broxton Parsonage? Those were happy days, especially when Seth, who was three years the younger, began to go out working too, and Adam began to be a teacher as well as a learner. But then came the days of sadness, when Adam was some way on in his teens, and Thias began to loiter at the public houses, and Lisbeth began to cry at home, and to pour forth her plaints in the hearing of her sons. Adam remembered well the night of shame and anguish when he first saw his father quite wild and foolish, shouting a song out fitfully among his drunken companions at the wagon overthrown. He had run away once, when he was only eighteen, making his escape in the morning twilight with a little blue bundle over his shoulder and his mensuration book in his pocket, and saying to himself very decidedly that he could bear the vexations of home no longer. He would go and seek his fortune, setting up his stick at the crossways and bending his steps the way it fell. 
But by the time he got to Stoniton, the thought of his mother and Seth, left behind to endure everything without him, became too importunate, and his resolution failed him. He came back the next day, but the misery and terror his mother had gone through in those two days had haunted her ever since. No, Adam said to himself tonight, that must never happen again. It'd make a poor balance when my doings are cast up at the last, if my poor old mother stood o' the wrong side. My back's broad enough and strong enough. I should be no better than a coward to go away and leave the troubles to be borne by them as aren't half so able. They that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of those that are weak, and not to please themselves. There's a text wants no candle to show it. It shines by its own light. It's plain enough you get into the wrong road of this life if you run after this and that only for the sake of making things easy and pleasant to yourself. A pig may poke his nose into the trough and think of nothing outside it, but if you've got a man's heart and soul in you, you can't be easy a making your own bed and leaving the rest to lie on the stones. Nay, nay, I'll never slip my neck out of the yoke and leave the load to be drawn by the weakens. Father's a sore cross to me, and's likely to be for many a long year to come. What then? I've got the health and the limbs and the spirit to bear it. At this moment a smart rap, as if with a willow wand, was given at the house door, and Jip, instead of barking as might have been expected, gave a loud howl. Adam, very much startled, went at once to the door and opened it. Nothing was there. All was still, as when he opened it an hour before. The leaves were motionless, and the light of the stars showed the placid fields on both sides of the brook quite empty of visible life. Adam walked round the house and still saw nothing except a rat which darted into the woodshed as he passed. He went in again, wondering. The sound was so peculiar that the moment he heard it it called up the image of the willow wand striking the door. He could not help a little shudder, as he remembered how often his mother had told him of just such a sound coming as a sign when someone was dying. Adam was not a man to be gratuitously superstitious, but he had the blood of the peasant in him as well as of the artisan, and a peasant can no more help believing in a traditional superstition than a horse can help trembling when he sees a camel. Besides, he had that mental combination which is at once humble in the region of mystery and keen in the region of knowledge. It was the depth of his reverence quite as much as his hard common sense which gave him his disinclination to doctrinal religion, and he often checked Seth's argumentative spiritualism by saying, "Eh, it's a big mystery. Thee knowest but little about it. And so it happened that Adam was at once penetrating and credulous. If a new building had fallen down, and he had been told that this was divine judgment, he would have said, Maybe, but the barren of the roof and walls wasn't right, else it wouldn't have come down. Yet he believed in dreams and prognostics, and to his dying day he bated his breath a little when he told the story of the stroke with the willow wand. I tell it as he told it, not attempting to reduce it to its natural elements. In our eagerness to explain impressions, we often lose our hold of the sympathy that comprehends them. But he had the best antidote against imaginative dread in the necessity for getting on with the coffin, and for the next ten minutes his hammer was ringing so uninterruptedly that other sounds, if there were any, might well be overpowered. A pause came, however, when he had to take up his ruler, and now again came the strange rap, and again Jip howled. Adam was at the door without the loss of a moment, but again— all was still, and the starlight showed there was nothing but the dew-laden grass in front of the cottage. Adam for a moment thought uncomfortably about his father, but of late years he had never come home at dark hours from Treddleston, and there was every reason for believing that he was then sleeping off his drunkenness at the wagon overthrown. Besides, to Adam the conception of the future was so inseparable from the painful image of his father that the fear of any fatal accident to him was excluded by the deeply infixed fear of his continual degradation. The next thought that occurred to him was one that made him slip off his shoes and tread lightly upstairs to listen at the bedroom doors. But both Seth and his mother were breathing regularly. Adam came down and set to work again, saying to himself, I won't open the door again. It's no use staring about to catch sight of a sound. Maybe there's a world about us as we can't see, but the ear's quicker than the eye and catches a sound from it now and then. Some people think they got a sight on it, too, but they're mostly folks whose eyes are not much use to em at anything else. For my part, I think it's better to see when your perpendicular's true than to see a ghost. Such thoughts as these are apt to grow stronger and stronger as daylight quenches the candles and the birds begin to sing. By the time the red sunlight shone on the brass nails that formed the initials on the lid of the coffin— 
any lingering foreboding from the sound of the willow wand was merged in satisfaction that the work was done and the promise redeemed. There was no need to call Seth, for he was already moving overhead, and presently came downstairs. "'Now, lad,' said Adam, as Seth made his appearance, "'the coffin's done, and we can take it over to Broxton and be back again before half after six. I'll take a mouthful of oat cake, and then we'll be off.' The coffin was soon propped on the tall shoulders of the two brothers, and they were making their way, followed close by Jip, out of the little woodyard into the lane at the back of the house. It was but about a mile and a half to Broxton over the opposite slope, and their road wound very pleasantly along lanes and across fields, where the pale woodbines and the dog roses were scenting the hedgerows, and the birds were twittering and trilling in the tall leafy boughs of oak and elm. It was a strangely mingled picture, the fresh youth of the summer morning with its Eden-like peace and loveliness, the stalwart strength of the two brothers in their rusty working clothes, and the long coffin on their shoulders. They paused for the last time before a small farmhouse outside the village of Broxton. By six o'clock the task was done, the coffin nailed down, and Adam and Seth were on their way home. They chose a shorter way homewards, which would take them across the fields and the brook in front of the house. Adam had not mentioned to Seth what had happened in the night, but he still retained sufficient impression from it himself to say, "'Seth, lad, if father isn't come home by the time we've had our breakfast,' I think it'll be as well for thee to go over to Treddleson and look after him, and thee canst get me the brass wire I want. Never mind about losing an hour at thy work, we can make that up. What dost say? I'm willing, said Seth, but see what clouds have gathered since we set out. I'm thinking we shall have more rain. It'll be a sore time for the haymaking if the meadows are flooded again. The brook's fine and full now, another day's rain would cover the plank, and we should have to go round by the road. They were coming across the valley now, and had entered the pasture through which the brook ran. "'Why, what's that sticking against the willow?' continued Seth, beginning to walk faster. Adam's heart rose to his mouth. The vague anxiety about his father was changed into a great dread. He made no answer to Seth, but ran forward, preceded by Jip, who began to bark uneasily, and in two moments he was at the bridge. This was what the omen meant then and the grey-haired father, of whom he had thought with a sort of hardness a few hours ago, as certain to live to be a thorn in his side, was perhaps even then struggling with that watery death. This was the first thought that flashed through Adam's conscience, before he had time to seize the coat and drag out the tall, heavy body. Seth was already by his side, helping him, and when they had it on the bank, the two sons in the first moment knelt and looked with mute awe at the glazed eyes, forgetting that there was need for action, forgetting everything but that their father lay dead before them. Adam was the first to speak. "'I'll run to mother,' he said, in a loud whisper. "'I'll be back to thee in a minute.' Poor Lisbeth was busy preparing her son's breakfast, and their porridge was already steaming on the fire. Her kitchen always looked the pink of cleanliness, but this morning she was more than usually bent on making her hearth and breakfast table look comfortable and inviting. "'The lads will be fine and hungry,' she said half aloud, as she stirred the porridge. "'It's a good step to Broxton, and it's hungry air over the hill.' "'with that heavy coffin, too. "'Eh, it's heavier now with poor Bob Fuller in it. "'However, I've made a dret more porridge nor common this morning. "'The feather'll happen to come in arter a bit. "'Not as he'll ate much porridge. "'He swallows six penn'orth of al and saves a half of porridge. "'That's his way of laying by money, as I've told him many a time, "'and am likely to tell him again before the day's out. "'Ah, poor man, he takes it quiet enough. "'There's no denying that.' "'But now Lisbeth heard the heavy thud of a running footstep on the turf, "'and turning quickly towards the door, she saw Adam enter, looking so pale and overwhelmed that she screamed aloud and rushed towards him before he had time to speak. "'Hush, mother,' Adam said rather harshly. "'Don't be frightened. Father's tumbled into the water. Be like we may bring him round again. Seth and me are going to carry him in, get a blanket, and make it as hot as the fire.' In reality, Adam was convinced that his father was dead, but he knew there was no other way of repressing his mother's impetuous wailing grief than by occupying her with some active task which had hope in it. He ran back to Seth, and the two sons lifted the sad burden in heart-stricken silence. The wide-open glazed eyes were gray, like Seth's, and had once looked with mild pride on the boys before whom Thias had lived to hang his head in shame. Seth's chief feeling was awe and distress at this sudden snatching away of his father's soul, but Adam's mind rushed back over the past in a flood of relenting and pity. When death, the great reconciler, has come, it is never our tenderness that we repent of, 
but our severity. End of chapter 4《Adam Bede》by George Eliot, Chapter Five. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Five: The Rector. Before twelve o'clock, there had been some heavy storms of rain, and the water lay in deep gutters on the side of the gravel walks in the garden of Broxton Parsonage. The great Provence roses had been cruelly tossed by the wind and beaten by the rain, and all the delicate stemmed border flowers had been dashed down and stained with the wet soil. A melancholy morning, because it was nearly time hay harvest should begin, and instead of that the meadows were likely to be flooded. But people who have pleasant homes get indoor enjoyments that they would never think of but for the rain. If it had not been a wet morning, Mr. Irwine would not have been in the dining room playing at chess with his mother, and he loves both his mother and chess quite well enough to pass some cloudy hours very easily by their help. Let me take you into that dining room and show you the Reverend Adolphus Irwine, rector of Broxton, vicar of Hayslope, and vicar of Blythe, a pluralist at whom the severest church reformer would have found it difficult to look sour. We will enter very softly and stand still in the doorway, without awaking the glossy brown setter who is stretched across the hearth, with her two puppies beside her, or the pug who is dozing with his black muzzle aloft like a sleepy president. The room is a large and lofty one, with an ample, maligned, oriel window at one end. The walls you see are new and not yet painted, but the furniture, though originally of an expensive sort, is old and scanty, and there is no drapery about the window. The crimson cloth over the large dining table is very threadbare, though it contrasts pleasantly enough with the dead hue of the plaster on the walls. But on this cloth there is a massive silver waiter with a decanter of water on it, of the same pattern as two larger ones that are propped up on the sideboard, with a coat of arms conspicuous in their centre. You suspect at once that the inhabitants of this room have inherited more blood than wealth, and would not be surprised to find that Mr. Irwine had a finely cut nostril and upper lip, but at present we can only see that he has a broad, flat back and an abundance of powdered hair, all thrown backward and tied behind with a black ribbon, a bit of conservatism in costume which tells you that he is not a young man. He will perhaps turn round by and by. And in the meantime, we can look at that stately old lady, his mother, a beautiful aged brunette, whose rich-toned complexion is well set off by the complex wrappings of pure white cambric and lace about her head and neck. She is as erect in her comely embonpoint as a statue of Ceres, and her dark face, with its delicate aquiline nose, firm proud mouth, and small intense black eye, is so keen and sarcastic in its expression. That you instinctively substitute a pack of cards for the chessmen and imagine her telling your fortune. The small brown hand, with which she is lifting her queen, is laden with pearls, diamonds, and turquoises, and a large black veil is very carefully adjusted over the crown of her cap, and falls in sharp contrast on the white folds about her neck. It must take a long time to dress that old lady in the morning. But it seems a law of nature that she should be dressed so. She is clearly one of those children of royalty who have never doubted their right divine and never met with any one so absurd as to question it. There, Dauphin, tell me what that is," says the magnificent old lady as she deposits her queen very quietly and folds her arms. "I should be sorry to utter a word disagreeable to your feelings. Ah, you witch mother, you sorceress!" How is a Christian man to win a game off you? I should have sprinkled the board with holy water before we began. You've not won that game by fair means now, so don't pretend it. Yes, yes, that's what the beaten have always said of great conquerors. But see, there's the sunshine falling on the board to show you more clearly what a foolish move you made with the pawn. Come, shall I give you another chance? No, mother, I shall leave you to your own conscience now. It's clearing up. We must go and plash up the mud a little, mustn't we, Juno? 
This was addressed to the brown setter, who had jumped up at the sound of the voices and laid her nose in an insinuating way on her master's leg. But I must go upstairs first and see Anne. I was called away to Tholder's funeral just as I was going before. It's of no use, child. She can't speak to you. Kate says she has one of her worst headaches this morning. Oh, she likes me to go and see her just the same. She's never too ill to care about that. If you know how much of human speech is mere purposeless impulse or habit, you will not wonder when I tell you that this identical objection had been made and had received the same kind of answer many hundred times in the course of the fifteen years that Mr. Irwine's sister Anne had been an invalid. Splendid old ladies who take a long time to dress in the morning have often a slight sympathy with sickly daughters. But while Mr. Irwine was still seated, leaning back in his chair and stroking Juno's head, the servant came to the door and said, "'If you please, sir, Joshua Rann wishes to speak with you, if you are at liberty.' "'Let him be shown in here,' said Mrs. Irwine, taking up her knitting. "'I always like to hear what Mr. Rann has got to say. His shoes will be dirty, but see that he wipes them, Carol.' In two minutes Mr. Rann appeared at the door with very deferential bows, which, however, were far from conciliating Pug, who gave a sharp bark and ran across the room to reconnoitre the stranger's legs, while the two puppies, regarding Mr. Rand's prominent calf and ribbed worsted stockings, from a more sensuous point of view, plunged and growled over them in great enjoyment. Meantime, Mr. Irwin turned round in his chair and said, "'Well, Joshua, anything the matter at Hayslope?' that you've come over this damp morning? Sit down, sit down. Never mind the dogs. Give them a friendly kick. Here, Pug, you rascal. It is very pleasant to see some men turn around. Pleasant as a sudden rush of warm air in winter, or the flash of firelight in the chill dusk. Mr. Irwine was one of those men. He bore the same sort of resemblance to his mother, that our loving memory of a friend's face often bears to the face itself. The lines were all more generous, the smile brighter, the expression heartier. If the outline had been less finely cut, his face might have been called jolly, but that was not the right word for its mixture of bonhomie and distinction. "'Thank your reverence,' answered Mr. Rann, endeavouring to look unconcerned about his legs, but shaking them alternately to keep off the puppies. "'I'll stand, if you please, as more becoming. I hope I see you and Mrs. Irwine well, and, and Miss Irwine, and Miss Anne, I hope, as, as well as usual.' "'Yes, Joshua, thank you. "'You see how blooming my mother looks. "'She beats us younger people hollow. "'But what's the matter?' "'Well, sir, I had come to Brox on to deliver some works, "'and I thought it but right to call and let you know "'the goings-on as there's been in the village, "'such as I had a seen in my time. "'And I've lived in it, man and boy, sixty year come St. Thomas, "'and collected these to Jews from Mr. Blick "'before your reverence come into the parish.' and been on the rigging and the bell, every bell, and the digging every grave, and sung in the choir long before Bartle Marcy came from nobody knows where, with his counter-singing and his fine anthems, and as puts everybody out by himself, one taking up after another like a sheep a bleating at the fold. I know what belongs to being a parish clerk, and I know as I should be wanting the respect to your reverence and church and king if I was to allow such goings on without speaking. I was took by surprise, and knowed nothing on it beforehand, and I was so flustered, I was clean as if I'd lost my tools. I had not slept more than four hours this night, as it passed and gone, and then it was nothing but a nightmare, as tired me worse no waking. Why, what in the world is the matter, Joshua? Have the thieves been at church again? Thieves? No, sir, and yet, as I may say, it is thieves, and a thief in the church, too. It's the Methodists as is like to get up a hand in the parish, if your reference and his honour, Squire Donathorn, don't I think, well, to say the word and forbid it. Not as I dictating to you, sir. I'm not forgetting myself so far as to be wise above my betters. However, whether I'm wise or no, that's neither here nor there. But what I've got to say, I say, as the young Methodist woman, as is Mr. Poyers, was a-preaching and a-praying on the green last night, as sure as I'm a-standing before your reverence now. Preaching on the green? said Mr. Irwine, looking surprised but quite serene. What, that pale young woman I've seen at Poyser's? I saw she was a Methodist or a Quaker or something of that sort by her dress, but I didn't know she was a preacher. It's a true word, as I say, sir, rejoined Mr. Rann, compressing his mouth into a semi-circular form and pausing long enough to indicate three notes of exclamation. 
She preached on the green last night, and she laid hold of Chad's best as the girl been a fit swelly ever sin. Well, Bessie Crange is a hearty-looking lass. I dare say she'll come around again, Joshua. Did anybody else go into fits? No, sir, I cannot say as they did. But there's no knowing what'll come, if we're to have such preaching as that going on every week. There'll be no living in the village. For them Methodists make folks believe as they take a mug of drink extra and make themselves a bit comfortable. They'll have to go to hell for it, sure as they're born. I'm not a tippling man nor a drunkard, nobody could say it on me. But I like extra quarter Easter or Christmas time, and it's natural when we're going the round of singing and folks offer the, you for nothing. Or when I'm a-collecting the dues, and I like a point with my pipe, and a neighbourly chat at Mr. Casson's now and then. For I was brought up in the church, thank God. Uh, I've been a parish clerk this two and thirty year. I should know what the church religion is. Well, what's your advice, Joshua? What do you think should be done? Well, Your Reverence, I'm not for taking any measures again the young woman. She's well enough if she'd let her own preaching, as I, I hear she's a-going away back to her own country soon. She's Mr. Poise's own niece, and I don't wish to say was always disrespectful of the family of the Hall Farm as I measured for shoes, little and big, and Willie ever since I've been a shoemaker. Well, there's that Will Maskery, sir, as is the rampagious Methodist as can be, and I make no doubt it was him as stirred up the young woman to preach last night, and he'll be bringing other folks to preach from treadles on, if his comb ain't cut a bit, and I think as he should be let know as he isn't a, have the making and amending the church carts and implements, let alone staying at that house as yard as a squire Donathorn's. Well, but you say yourself, Joshua, that you never knew anyone come to preach on the green before. Why should you think they'll come again? The Methodists don't come to preach in little villages like Hayslope, where there's only a handful of laborers too tired to listen to them. They might as well go and preach on the Binton Hills. Will Maskery is no preacher himself, I think. Nay, sir, he's no gift at stringing the words together with our book. He'll be struck fast like a cow with wet clay, but he's got tongue enough to speak disrespectful about nebbers, for he said, as I was blind Pharisee, a use in the Bible in that way to find nicknames for folks as are his elders and betters, and what's worse, he's been heard to say very unbecoming words about your reverence, for I could bring them as it swear he called you a dumb dog and an idle shepherd. You'll forgive me for saying such things over again. Better not, better not, Joshua. Let evil words die as soon as they're spoken. Will Maskery might be a great deal worse fellow than he is. He used to be a wild, drunken rascal, neglecting his work and beating his wife, they told me. Now he's thrifty and decent, and he and his wife look comfortable together. If you can bring me any proof that he interferes with his neighbours and creates any disturbance, I shall think it my duty as a clergyman and a magistrate to interfere. But it wouldn't become wise people like you and me to be making a fuss about trifles, as if we thought the church was in danger because Will Maskery lets his tongue wag rather foolishly, or a young woman talks in a serious way to a handful of people on the green. We must live and let live, Joshua, in religion as well as in other things. You go on doing your duty as parish clerk and sexton, as well as you've always done it, and making those capital thick boots for your neighbours, and things won't go far wrong in Hayslope, depend on it. Your reverence is very good to say so, and I'm sensible as you're not living in the parish, there's more upon my shoulders. To be sure, and, and you must mind and not lower the church in people's eyes by seeming to be frightened about it for a little thing, Joshua. I shall trust to your good sense. Now to take no notice at all of what Will Maskery says, either about you or me, you and your neighbours can go on taking your pot of beer soberly when you've done your day's work like good churchmen, and if Will Maskery doesn't like to join you but to go to a prayer meeting at Traddleston instead, let him. That's no business of yours, as long as he doesn't hinder you from doing what you like. And as to people saying a few idle words about us, we must not mind that any more than the old church steeple minds the rooks cawing about it. Will Maskery comes to church every Sunday afternoon, and does his wheelwright's business steadily in the weekdays, and as long as he does that he must be less alone. Ah, sir, but when he comes to church he sits and shakes his head, and looks as sour as in coxy when we're a-singing, as I should like to fetch him a rap across the jowl, God forgive me, and Miss Irwan, and your reverence too, for speaking as I for you, and he said as our Christmas singing was no better nor the crackling of thorns under a pot. Well, he's got a bad ear for music, Joshua. When people have wooden heads, you know, it can't be helped. 
he won't bring the other people in haste up round his opinion while you go on singing as well as you do yes sir but it turns a man's stomach to hear the scripture misused in that way i know as much of the words of the bible as he does and could say the psalms right through in my sleep if you was to pinch me but i know better nor to take him to say it in my own way with oh you might as well take the sacrament cup home and use it as meals that's a very sensible remark of yours joshua but as i said before while Mr. Irwine was speaking, the sound of a booted step and the clink of a spur were heard on the stone floor of the entrance hall, and Joshua Rann moved hastily aside from the doorway to make room for someone who paused there and said in a ringing tenor voice, "'Godson Arthur, may he come in?' "'Come in, come in, Godson,' Mrs. Irwine answered in the deep half-masculine tone which belongs to the vigorous old woman, and there entered a young gentleman in a riding dress with his right arm in a sling, whereupon followed that pleasant confusion of laughing interjections and handshakings and how are yous, mingled with joyous short barks and wagging of tails on the part of the canine members of the family, which tells us that the visitor is on the best terms with the visited. The young gentleman was Arthur Donathon, known in Hayslope variously as the young squire, the heir, and the captain. He was only a captain in the Loamshire militia, but to the Hayslope tenants he was more intensely a captain than all the young gentlemen of the same rank in His Majesty's regulars. He unshunned them as the planet Jupiter outshines the Milky Way. If you want to know more particularly how he looked, call to your remembrance some tawny-whiskered, brown-locked, clear-complexioned young Englishman whom you have met with in a foreign town, and have been proud of as a fellow countryman, well-washed, high-bred, white-handed, yet looking as if he could deliver well from the left shoulder and floor his man. I will not be so much of a tailor as to trouble your imagination with the difference of costume, and insist on the striped waistcoat, long-tailed coat, and low-top boots. Turning round to take a chair, Captain Donathorn said, But don't let me interrupt Joshua's business. He has something to say. Uh, humbly you are begging your honour's pardon, said Joshua, bowing low. There was one thing I have to say to his reverence, as other things had drove out my head. Outwitted Joshua quickly, said Mr. Irwine. Belike, sir, you an er, haven't an heard as Thias Bede's dead, drowned this morning, or more like overnight, in, in the Willowbrook, again the bridge, right before the house. Ah! exclaimed both gentlemen at once, as if they were a good deal interested in the information. And, and said Speed's been to me this morning, and he wish me to tell your reverence, as his brother Adam begged of you particular, to allow his father's grave to be dug by the white thorn, because his mother set her heart on it, on account of a dream she had, and they had come themselves to ask you, but they got so much to see after with the crown and, and that, and their mothers took on so, and wants um, to make sure uh, the spot for fear somebody else should take it. And if your reverence sees well and good, I'll send my boy to tell him as, as soon as I get home, and that's why I, I make bold to trouble you with his honour being present. To be sure, Joshua, to be sure, they shall have it. I'll ride round to Adam myself and see him. Send your boy, however, to say that they shall have the grave, lest anything should happen to detain me. And now, good morning, Joshua. Go into the kitchen and have some ale. Poor old Thias, said Mr. Irwine, when Joshua was gone. I'm afraid the drink helped the brook to drown him. I should have been glad for the load to have been taken off my friend Adam's shoulders in a less painful way. That fine fellow has been propping up his father from ruin for the last five or six years. He's a regular tramp, is Adam, said Captain Donathorn. When I was a little fellow, and Adam was a strapping lad of fifteen, and taught me carpenting, I used to think if ever I was a rich sultan, I would make Adam my grand vizier. And I believe now he should bear the exultation as well as any poor wise man in the eastern story. If ever I live to be a large acred man instead of a poor devil with a mortgaged allowance of pocket money, I'll have Adam for my right hand. He shall manage my woods for me, for he seems to have a better notion of those things than any man I've ever met with, and I know he would make twice the money of them that my grandfather does with that miserable old satchel to manage, who understands no more about timber than an old carp. I've mentioned the subject to my grandfather once or twice, but for some reason or other he has a dislike to Adam, and I can do nothing. But come, your reverence, are you for a ride with me? It's splendid out of doors now. We can go to Adam's together if you like, but I want to call at the hall farm on my way to look at the whelps Poyser is keeping for me. You must stay and have lunch first, Arthur, 
said Mrs. Irwine. It's nearly two. Carol will bring it in directly. I want to go to the Hall Farm, too, said Mr. Irwine, to take another look at a little Methodist who was staying there. Joshua tells me she was preaching on the green last night. Oh, by Jove, said Captain Dornthorne, laughing. Why, she looks as quiet as a mouse. There's something rather striking about her, though. I positively felt quite bashful the first time I saw her. She was sitting stooping over her sewing in the sunshine outside the house when I rode up and called out, without noticing that she was a stranger. Is Martin Poyser at home, I declare, when she got up and looked at me and just said, He's in the house, I believe. I'll go and call him. I felt quite ashamed of having spoken so abruptly to her. She looked like St. Catherine in a Quaker dress. It's a type of face one rarely sees among our common people. I should like to see the young woman, Dauphin, said Mrs. Irwine. Make her come here on some pretext or other. I don't know how I can manage that, Mother. It will hardly do for me to patronize a Methodist preacher, even if she would consent to be patronized by an idle shepherd, as Will Maskery calls me. You should have come in a little sooner, Arthur, to hear Joshua's denunciation of his neighbor, Will Maskery. The old fellow wants me to excommunicate the wheelwright, and then deliver him over to the civil arm, that is to say, to your grandfather, to be turned out of house and yard. If I chose to interfere in this business now, I might get up as pretty a story of hatred and persecution as the Methodists need desire to publish in the next number of their magazine. It wouldn't take me much trouble to persuade Chad Cranage and half a dozen other bull-headed fellows that they would be doing an acceptable service to the church by hunting Will Maskery out of the village with rope ends and pitchforks, and then, when I had furnished them with half a sovereign to get gloriously drunk after their exertions, I should have put the climax to as pretty a farce as any of my brother clergy have set going in their parishes for the last thirty years. It's really insolent of the man, though, to call you an idle shepherd and a dumb dog, said Mrs. Irwine. I should be inclined to check him a little there. You're too easy-tempered, Dauphin. Why, mother, you don't think it would be a good way of sustaining my dignity to set about vindicating myself from the aspersions of Will Maskery? Besides, I'm not so sure they are aspersions. I am a lazy fellow, and get terribly heavy in my saddle, not to mention that I'm always spending more than I can afford in bricks and mortar, so that I get savage at a lame beggar when he asks me for sixpence. Those poor lean cobblers who think that they can help to regenerate mankind by setting out to preach in the morning twilight before they have begun their day's work may well have a poor opinion of me. But come, let us have our luncheon. Isn't Kate coming to lunch? "'Miss Irwine told Bridget to take her lunch upstairs,' said Carol. "'She can't leave Miss Anne.' "'Oh, very well. Tell Bridget to say I'll go up and see Miss Anne presently. "'You can use your right arm quite well now, Arthur,' Mr. Irwine continued, "'observing that Captain Donnithorne had taken his arm out of the sling. "'Yes, pretty well, but Goodwin insists on my keeping it up constantly for some time to come. "'I hope I shall be able to get away to the regiment, though, in the beginning of August.' It is a desperately dull business being shut up at the chase in the summer months, when one can neither hunt nor shoot, so as to make oneself pleasantly sleepy in the evening. However, we are to astonish the echoes on the 30th of July. My grandfather has given me carte blanche for once, and I promise you the entertainment shall be worthy of the occasion. The world shall not see the grand epoch of my majority twice. I think I shall have a lofty throne for you, Grandmamma or rather two, one in the lawn and another in the ballroom, that you may sit and look down upon us like Olympian goddess. I mean to bring out my best brocade that I wore at your christening twenty years ago, said Mrs. Irwin. Yeah, I think I shall like your poor mother flitting about in her white dress, which looked to me almost like a shroud that very day, and it was her shroud only three months after, and your little cap and christening dress were buried with her too, and she had set her heart on that sweet soul. Thank God you take after your mother's family, Arthur. If you had been a puny, wiry, yellow baby, I wouldn't have stood grandmother to you. I should have been sure you would turn out a Donathorn. But you were such a broad-faced, broad-chested, loud, screaming rascal. I knew you were every inch of you a tragic. But you might have been a little too hasty there, mother, said Mr. Irwine, smiling. Don't you remember how it was with Juno's last pups? One of them was the very image of its mother, but it had two or three of its father's tricks notwithstanding. Nature is clever enough to cheat even you, mother. Nonsense, child. Nature never makes a ferret in the shape of a mastiff. You'll never persuade me that I can't tell what men are by the outsides. If I don't like a man's looks, depend upon it I shall never like him. 
I don't want to know people that look ugly and disagreeable, any more than I want to taste dishes that look disagreeable. If they make me shudder at the first glance, I say, take them away. An ugly, piggish, or fishy eye now makes me feel quite ill. It's like a bad smell. Talking of eyes, said Captain Donaldcorn, that reminds me that I've got a book I meant to bring you, Grandmamma. It came down in a parcel from London the other day. I know you are fond of queer, wizard-like stories. It's a volume of poems, lyrical ballads. Most of them seem to be twaddling stuff, but the first is in a different style. The Ancient Mariner is the title. I can hardly make head or tail of it as a story, but it's a strange, striking thing. I'll send it over to you, and there are some other books that you may like, Erwine. Pamphlets about antinomianism and evangelicism, uh, whatever they may be. I can't think what the fellow means by sending such things to me. I've written to him to desire that from henceforth he will send me no book or pamphlet on anything that ends with ism. Well, I don't know that I'm very fond of isms myself, but I may as well look at the pamphlets. Uh, they let one see what is going on. I have a little matter to attend to, Arthur, continued Mr. Irwine, rising to leave the room, and then I shall be ready to go out with you. The little matter that Mr. Irwine had to attend to took him up the stone staircase, part of the house was very old, and made him pause before a door at which he knocked gently. Come in, said a woman's voice, and he entered a room so darkened by blinds and curtains that Miss Kate, the thin middle-aged lady standing by the bedside, would not have had light enough for any sort of work, for any other sort of work than knitting which lay on the little table near her. But at present she was doing what required only the dimmest light, sponging the aching head that lay on the pillow with fresh vinegar. It was a small face, that of the poor sufferer. Perhaps it had once been pretty, but now it was worn and sallow. Miss Kate came towards her brother and whispered, "'Don't speak to her. She can't bear to be spoken to today.' Anne's eyes were closed and her brow contracted as if from intense pain. Mr. Irwine went to the bedside and took up one of the delicate hands and kissed it. A slight pressure from the small fingers told him that it was worth while to have come upstairs for the sake of doing that. He lingered a moment, looking at her, and then turned away and left the room, treading very gently. He had taken off his boots and put on slippers before he came upstairs. Whoever remembers how many things he has declined to do even for himself, rather than have the trouble of putting on or taking off his boots, will not think this last detail insignificant. And Mr. Irwine's sisters, as any person of the family within ten miles of Broxton could have testified, were such stupid, uninteresting women. It was quite a pity handsome, clever Mrs. Irwine should have had such commonplace daughters. That fine old lady herself was worth driving ten miles to see any day. Her beauty, her well-preserved faculties, and her old-fashioned dignity made her a graceful subject for conversation in turn with the King's health. The sweet new patterns in cotton dresses, the news from Egypt, and Lord Dacey's lawsuit, which was fretting poor Lady Dacey to death. But no one ever thought of mentioning the Miss Irwines, except the poor people in Broxton Village, who regarded them as deep in the science of medicine, and spoke of them vaguely as the gentlefolks. If anyone had asked old Job Domelo, who gave him his flannel jacket, he would have answered, the gentlefolks last winter and Widow Steen dwelt much on the virtues of the stuff the gentlefolks gave her for her cough. Under this name, too, they were used to great effect as a means of taming refractory children, so that the sight of poor Miss Anne's sallow face, several small urchins had a terrified sense that she was cognizant of all their worst misdemeanours, and knew the precise number of stones with which they had intended to hit Farmer Britain's ducks. But for all who saw them through a less mythical medium, the Miss Irwines were quite superfluous existences, inartistic figures crowding the canvas of life without adequate effect. Miss Anne, indeed, if her chronic headaches could have been accounted for by a pathetic story of disappointed love, might have had some romantic interest attached to her, but no such story had either been known or invented concerning her, and the general impression was quite in accordance with the fact that both the sisters were old maids, for the prosaic reason that they had never received an eligible offer. Nevertheless, to speak paradoxically, the existence of insignificant people has very important consequences in the world. It can be shown to affect the price of bread and the rate of wages, to call forth many evil tempers from the selfish, and many heroisms from the sympathetic, and, in other ways, to play no small part in the tragedy of life. And if that handsome, generous-blooded clergyman, the Reverend Adolphus Irwine, had not had these two hopelessly maiden sisters, 
his lot would have been shaped quite differently. He would very likely have taken a comely wife in his youth, and now, when his hair was getting grey under the powder, would have had tall sons and blooming daughters, such possessions in turn as men commonly think will repay them for all the labour they take under the sun. As it was, having with all his three livings no more than seven hundred a year, and seeking no way of keeping his splendid mother and his sickly sister, not to reckon a second sister, who was usually spoken of without any adjective, in such ladylike ease as became their birth and habits, and at the same time providing for a family of his own, he remained, you see, at the age of eight and forty a bachelor, not making any merit of that renunciation, but saying laughingly, if any one alluded to it, that he had made an excuse for many indulgences which a wife would never have allowed him. And perhaps he was the only person in the world who did not think his sisters uninteresting and superfluous. For his was one of those large-hearted, sweet-blooded natures that never know a narrow or a grudging thought, epicurean, if you will, with no enthusiasm, no self-scourging sense of duty, but yet, as you have seen, of a sufficiently subtle moral fibre to have an unwearying tenderness for obscure and monotonous suffering. It was his large-hearted indulgence that made him ignore his mother's hardness towards her daughters, which was the more striking from its contrast with her doting fondness towards himself. He held it no virtue to frown at irremediable faults. See the difference between the impression a man makes on you when you walk by his side in familiar talk, or look at him in his home, and the figure he makes when seen from a lofty historical level, or even in the eyes of a critical neighbour who thinks of him as an embodied system or opinion rather than as a man. Mr. Rowe, the travelling preacher stationed at Treddleston, had included Mr. Irwine in a general statement concerning the church clergy in the surrounding district, whom he described as men given up to the lusts of the flesh and the pride of life, hunting and shooting and adorning their houses, asking what shall we eat and what shall we drink and wherewithal shall we be clothed, careless of dispensing the bread of life to their flocks, preaching at best but a carnal and soul-benumbing morality and trafficking in the souls of men by receiving money for discharging the pastoral office in parishes where they did not as much as look on the faces of the people more than once a year. The ecclesiastical historian, too, looking into parliamentary reports of that period, finds honourable members zealous for the church, and untainted with any sympathy for the tribe of canting Methodists, making statements scarcely less melancholy than that of Mr. Rowe. And it is impossible for me to say that Mr. Irwin was altogether belied by the general classification assigned him. He really had no very lofty aims, no theological enthusiasm. If I were closely questioned, I should be obliged to confess that he felt no serious alarms about the souls of his parishioners, and would have thought it a mere loss of time to talk in a doctrinal and awakening matter to old Fayther Thaft, or even to Chad Cranage the blacksmith. If he had been in the habit of speaking theoretically, he would perhaps have said that the only healthy form religion could take in such minds was that of certain dim but strong emotions, suffusing themselves as a hallowing influence over the family affections and neighbourly duties. He thought the custom of baptism more important than its doctrine, and that the religious benefits the peasant drew from the church where his fathers worshipped and the sacred piece of turf where they lay buried were but slightly dependent on a clear understanding of liturgy or the sermon. Clearly the rector was not what is called in these days an earnest man. He was fonder of church history than of divinity, and had much more insight into men's characters than interest in their opinions. He was neither laborious nor obviously self-denying, nor very copious in alms-giving, and his theology, you perceive, was lax. His mental palate, indeed, was rather pagan, and found a savouriness in a quotation from Sophocles or Theocritus that was quite absent from any text in Isaiah or Amos. But if you feed your young setter on raw flesh, how can you wonder at its retaining a relish for uncooked partridge in afterlife? And Mr. Irwine's recollections of young enthusiasm and ambition were all associated with poetry and ethics that lay aloof from the Bible. On the other hand, I must plead, for I have an affectionate partiality towards the rector's memory, that he was not vindictive, and some philanthropists have been so, and that he was not intolerant. There is a rumour that some zealous theologians have not been altogether free from that blemish, 
and although he would probably have declined to give his body to be burned in any public cause, and was far from bestowing all his goods to feed the poor, he had that charity which has sometimes been lacking to very illustrious virtue. He was tender to other men's failings, and unwilling to impute evil. He was one of those men, and they are not the commonest, of whom we can know the best only by following them away from the market-place, the platform, and the pulpit, entering with them into their own homes, hearing the voice with which they speak to the young and aged about their own hearthstone, and witnessing their thoughtful care for the everyday wants of everyday complaints, who take all their kindness as a matter of course, and not as a subject for panegyric. Such men happily have lived in times when great abuses flourished, and have sometimes even been the living representatives of the abuses. That is a thought which might comfort us a little under the opposite fact, that it is better sometimes not to follow great reformers of abuses beyond the thresholds of their homes. But whatever you think of Mr. Irwine now, if you had met him that June afternoon, riding on his grey cob, with his dogs running beside him, portly, upright, manly, with a good-natured smile on his finely turned lips as he talked to his dashing young companion on the bay mare, you must have felt that, however ill he harmonized with sound theories of the clerical office, he somehow harmonized extremely well with that peaceful landscape. See them in the bright sunlight, interrupted every now and then by rolling masses of cloud, ascending the slope from the Broxton side, where the tall gables and elms of the refectory predominate over the tiny, whitewashed church. They will soon be in the parish of Hayslope. The grey church tower and village roofs lie before them to the left, and farther on to the right they can just see the chimneys of the Hall Farm. This ends Chapter 5 of Adam Bede by George Eliot. Chapter 6 of Adam Bede. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Adam Bede by George Eliot. The Hall Farm. Evidently, the gate is never opened, for the long grass and the great hemlocks grow close against it. And if it were opened, it is so rusty that the force necessary to turn it on its hinges would be likely to pull down the square stone-built pillars to the detriment of the two stone lionesses which grin with a doubtful carnivorous affability above a coat of arms surmounting each of the pillars. It would be easy enough, by the aid of the nicks in the stone pillars, to climb over the brick wall with its smooth stone coping. But by putting our eyes to the rusty bars of the gate, we can see the house well enough, and all but the very corners of the grassy enclosure. It is a very fine old place of red brick, softened by a pale, powdery lichen, which has dispersed itself with happy irregularity, so as to bring the red brick into terms of friendly companionship with the limestone ornaments surrounding the three gables, the windows, and the door place. But the windows are patched with wooden panes, and the door, I think, is like the gate. It is never opened. How it would groan and grate against the floor if it were! For it is a solid, heavy, handsome door, and must once have been in the habit of shutting with a sonorous bang behind the liveried lackey who had just seen his master and mistress off the grounds in a carriage and pair. But at present, one might fancy the house in the early stage of a chancery suit, and that the fruit from that grand double row of walnut trees on the right hand of the enclosure would fall and rot among the grass if it were not that we heard the booming bark of dogs echoing from the great buildings at the back. And now the half-weaned calves that have been sheltering themselves in a gorse-built hovel against the left-hand wall come out and set up a silly answer to that terrible bark, doubtless supposing that it has reference to buckets of milk. Yes, the house must be inhabited, 
and we will see by whom. For imagination is a licensed trespasser. It has no fear of dogs, but may climb over walls and peep in windows with impunity. Put your face to one of the glass panes in the right-hand window. What do you see? A large open fireplace with rusty dogs in it and a bare-boarded floor. At the far end, fleeces of wool stacked up. In the middle of the floor, some empty corn bags. That is the furniture of the dining room. And what through the left-hand window? Several clothes horses, a pillion, a spinning wheel, and an old box wide open and stuffed full of colored rags. At the edge of this box there lies a great wooden doll, which, so far as mutilation is concerned, bears a strong resemblance to the finest Greek sculpture, and especially in the total loss of its nose. Near it there's a little chair, and the butt end of a boy's leather long-lashed whip. The history of the house is plain now. It was once the residence of a country squire, whose family, probably dwindling down to mere spinsterhood, got merged in the more territorial name of Donnythorne. It was once the hall. Now it is the hall farm. Like the life in some coast town that was once a watering place and is now a port, where the genteel streets are silent and grass-grown, and the docks and warehouses are busy and resonant, the life of the hall has changed its focus, and no longer radiates from the parlor, but from the kitchen and the farmyard. Plenty of life there, though this is the drowsiest time of the year, just before the hay harvest. And it is the drowsiest time of day, too, for it is close upon three by the sun, and it is half-past three by Mrs. Poyser's handsome eight-day clock. But there is always a stronger sense of life when the sun is brilliant after rain. And now he is pouring down his beams and making sparkles among the wet straw and lighting up every patch of vivid green moss on the red tiles of the cowshed and turning even the muddy water that is hurrying along the channel to the drain into a mirror for the yellow-billed ducks who are seizing the opportunity of getting a drink with as much body in it as possible. There is quite a concert of noises. The great bulldog, chained against the stables, is thrown into furious exasperation by the unwary approach of a cock too near the mouth of his kennel, and sends forth a thundering bark, which is answered by two foxhounds shut up in the opposite cowhouse. The old top-knotted hens, scratching with their chicks among the straw, set up a sympathetic croaking as the discomfited cock joins them. A sow with her brood, all very muddy to the legs and curled as to the tail, throws in some deep staccato notes. Our friends the calves are bleeding from the home croft. And, under all, the fine ear discerns the continuous hum of human voices. For the great barn doors are thrown wide open, and men are busy there mending the harness under the superintendence of Mr. Goby, the widow, otherwise Saddler, who entertains them with the latest Treddleston gossip. It is certainly rather an unfortunate day that Alec, the shepherd, has chosen for having the widows, since the morning has turned out so wet, and Mrs. Poyser has spoken her mind pretty strongly as to the dirt which the extra number of men's shoes brought into the house at dinner time. Indeed, she has not yet recovered her equanimity on the subject, though it is now nearly three hours since dinner, and the house is pretty clean again, as clean as everything else in that wonderful house place, where the only chance of collecting a few grains of dust would be to climb on the salt coffer and put your finger on the high mantel shelf on which the glittering brass candlesticks are enjoying their summer sinecure. For at this time of year, of course, everyone goes to bed while it is yet light, or at least light enough, to discern the outline of objects after you have bruised your shins against them. Surely nowhere else could an oak clock case and an oak table have got such a polish by hand, 
genuine elbow polish, as Mrs. Poyser called it, for she thanks to God she never had any of your varnished rubbish in her house. Hetty Sorrel often took the opportunity, when her aunt's back was turned, of looking at the pleasing reflection of herself in those polished services. For the oak table was usually turned up like a screen, and was more for ornament than for use. And she could see herself sometimes in the great round pewter dishes that were ranged on the shelves above the long deal dinner table, or in the hobs of the grate which always shone like jasper. Everything was looking at its brightest at this moment, for the sun shone right on the pewter dishes, and from their reflecting surfaces pleasant jets of light were thrown on mellow oak and bright brass, and on a still pleasanter object than these, for some of the rays fell on Dinah's finely molded cheek, and lit up her pale red hair to auburn, as she bent over the heavy household linens which she was mending for her aunt. No scene could have been more peaceful, if Mrs. Poyser, who was ironing a few things that still remained from the Monday's wash, had not been making a frequent clicking with her iron, and moving to and fro whenever she wanted it to cool. Carrying the keen glance of her blue-gray eye from the kitchen to the dairy, where Hetty was making up the butter, and from the dairy back to the kitchen, where Nancy was taking the pies out of the oven. Do not suppose, however, that Mrs. Poyser was elderly or shrewish in her appearance. She was a good-looking woman, not more than eight and thirty, of fair complexion and sandy hair, well-shapen, light-footed. The most conspicuous article in her attire was the ample checkered linen apron, which almost covered her skirt, and nothing could be plainer or less noticeable than her cap and gown, for there was no weakness of which she was less tolerant than feminine vanity and the preference of ornament to utility. The family likeness between her and her niece Dinah Morris, with the contrast between her keenness and Dinah's seraphic gentleness of expression, might have served a painter as an excellent suggestion for a Martha and Mary. Their eyes were just of the same color, but a striking test of the difference in their operation was seen in the demeanor of Trip the black and tan terrier, whenever that much-suspected dog unwarily exposed himself to the freezing arctic ray of Mrs. Poyser's glance. Her tongue was not less keen than her eye, and whenever a damsel came within earshot, seemed to take up an unfinished lecture, as a barrel organ takes up a tune precisely at the point where it had left off. The fact that it was churning day was another reason why it was inconvenient to have the widows, and why, consequently, Mrs. Poyser should scold Molly, the housemaid, with unusual severity. To all appearance, Molly had got through her after-dinner work in an exemplary manner, had cleaned herself with great dispatch, and now came to ask submissively if she should sit down to her spinning till milking time. But this blameless conduct according to Mrs. Poyser, shrouded a secret indulgence of unbecoming wishes, which she now dragged forth and held up to Molly's view with cutting eloquence. Spinning, indeed. It isn't spinning you'd be at, I'll be bound, and let you have your own way. I never knew your equals for gallowsness. To think of a gal of your age wanting to go and sit with half a dozen men— I'd have been ashamed to let the words pass over my lips if I'd have been you. And you, as have been here since last Michaelmas, and I hired you at Treddleston's Statitz, without a bit of character, as I say, you might be grateful to be hired in that way to a respectable place, and you knew no more what belongs to work when you came here than the mockins in the field. As poor a two-fisted thing as I ever saw, you know you was. Who taught you to scrub a floor? I should like to know. Why, you'd leave the dirt in heaps in the corners. Anybody'd think you'd never been brought up among Christians. And as for spinning, why, you've wasted as much as your wage in the flax you've spoiled learning to spin. 
and you've a right to feel that, and not to go out as gaping and as thoughtless as if you'd been beholding to nobody. Comb the wool for the widows indeed. That's what you'd like to be doing, is it? That's the way with you. That's the road you'd all like to go, headlongs to ruin. You're never easy till you've got some sweetheart as is as big a fool as yourself. You think you'll be finally off when you're married, I dare say. And you've got a three-legged stool to sit on, and never a blanket to cover you, and a bit of oatcake for your dinner, as three children are snatching at. I'm sure I don't want to go with the widows, Molly said, whimpering, and quite overcome by the Dantean picture of her future. Only we always used to comb the wool for an at Mr. Oatley's, and so I just asked you, I don't want to set eyes on the widows again. I wish I may never stir if I do. Mr. Oatley's, indeed. It's fine talking of what you did at Mr. Oatley's. Your missus there might like her floors dirted with widows, for what I know. There's no knowing what people won't like, such ways as I never heard of. I never heard a gal come into my house as seemed to know what cleaning was. I think people live like pigs, for my part. And as to that Betty, as was dairymaid at Trent's before she come to me, she'd have left the cheeses without turning from week's end to week's end, and the dairy thralls, I might have wrote my name on em. When I come downstairs after my illness, as the doctor said it was inflammation, it was a mercy I got well of it. And to think of your knowing no better, Molly, and been here a going on nine months, not for want of talking to neither. And what are you standing there for? like a jack as is run down, instead of getting your wheel out. You are a rare un for sitting down to your work a little while after it's time to put by. Money, my iron's twite told. Please put it down to warm. The small chirping voice that uttered this request came from a little sunny-haired girl between three and four, who, seated on a high chair at the end of the ironing table, was arduously clutching the handle of a miniature iron with her tiny fat fist, and ironing rags with an assiduity that required her to put her little red tongue out as far as anatomy would allow. Cold is it, my darling? Bless your sweet face, said Mrs. Poyser, who was remarkable for the facility with which she could relapse from her official objugatory to one of fondness or of friendly converse. Never mind. Mother's done her ironing now. She's going to put the ironing things away. Money, I did like to do into the barn to Tommy to see the widowed. No, no, no. Toddy'd get her feet wet," said Mrs. Poyser, carrying away her iron. "Run into the dairy and see your cousin Hetty make butter." I did like a bit of pum take," rejoined Toddy, who seemed to be provided with several relays of requests. At the same time. Taking the opportunity of her momentary leisure to put her fingers into a bowl of starch, and drag it down so as to empty the contents with tolerable completeness onto the ironing sheet, did ever anybody see the like? Screamed Mrs. Poyser, running towards the table, when her eye had fallen on the blue stream. The child's always in mischief if your back's turned a minute. What shall I do to you, you naughty, naughty girl? Toddy, however, had descended from her chair with great swiftness and was already in retreat towards the dairy with a sort of waddling run and an amount of fat on the nape of her neck which made her look like the metamorphosis of a white suckling pig. The white starch, having been wiped up by Molly's help and the ironing apparatus put by, Mrs. Poyser took up her knitting, which always lay ready at hand, and was the work she liked best. Because she could carry it on automatically as she walked to and fro. But now she came and sat down opposite Dinah, whom she looked at in a meditative way, as she knitted her worsted gray stocking. You look the image of your aunt Judith, Dinah, when you sit a sewing. I could almost fancy it was thirty years back, and I was a little girl at home, looking at Judith as she sat at her work. After she'd done the house up, only it was a little cottage. Father's was, and not a big rambling house as gets dirty in one corner as fast as you clean it in another. But for all that, I could fancy you was your aunt Judith. Only her hair was a deal darker than yours, 
and she was stouter and broader in the shoulders. Judith and me always hung together, though she had such queer ways. But your mother and her could never agree. Ah, your mother little thought as she'd have a daughter just cut out after the very pattern of Judith, and leave her an orphan, too, for Judith to take care on, and bring up with a spoon when she was in the graveyard at Stoniton. I always said that of Judith, as she'd bear a pound weight any day to save anybody else carrying an ounce. And she was just the same from the first of my remembering her. It made no difference in her, as I could see, when she took to the Methodists, only she talked a bit different and wore a different sort of cap, but she'd never in her life spent a penny on herself more than keeping herself decent. She was a blessed woman, said Dinah. God had given her a loving, self-forgetting nature, and he perfected it by grace. And she was very fond of you, too, Aunt Rachel. I often heard her talk of you in the same sort of way. When she had that bad illness, and I was only eleven years old, she used to say, You'll have a friend on earth in your Aunt Rachel, if I'm taken from you, for she has a kind heart, and I'm sure I've found it so. I don't know how, child. Anybody'd be cunning to do anything for you, I think. You're like the birds of the air, and live nobody knows how. And I have been glad to behave to you like a mother's sister, if you'd come and live in this country where there's some shelter and victual for man and beast, and folks don't live on the naked hills like poultry is scratching on a gravel bank. And then you might get married to some decent man, and there'd be plenty ready to have you, if only you'd leave off that preaching, as is ten times worse than anything your Aunt Judith ever did. And even if you'd marry Seth Bede, as is a poor, wool-gathering Methodist, and is never like to have a penny beforehand, I know your uncle'd help you with a pig, and very like a cow, for he's always been good-natured to my kin, for all they're poor, and made him welcome to the house, and it'd do for you, I'll be bound, as much as ever he'd do for Hetty, though she's his own niece." And there's linen in the house, as I could well spare you, for I got lots of sheeting and table clothing and toweling as isn't made up. There's a piece of sheeting I could give you as that squinting Katie spun. She was a rare girl to spin, for all she squinted, and the children couldn't abide her. And you know, spinning's going on constant, and there's new linen wove twice as fast as the old wears out. But where's the use of talking if you want to be persuaded and settle down like any other woman in her senses instead of wearing yourself out with walking and preaching and giving away every penny you get? So as you've nothing saved against sickness and all the things you've got in the world, I verily believe, it go into a bundle no bigger nor a double cheese. And all because you got notions in your head about religion more than what's in the catechism and the prayer book. But not more than what's in the Bible, aunt, said Dinah. Yes, and the Bible too, for that matter, Mrs. Poyser rejoined rather sharply. Else why shouldn't them as know best what's in the Bible, the parsons and people as have got nothing better to do but learn it, do the same as you? But for the matter of that, if everybody was to do like you, the world must come to a standstill. For if everybody tried to do without house and home, and with poor eating and drinking was always talking as we must despise things of the world as you say, I should like to know where the pick of the stock and the corn and the best new milk cheeses that have to go. Everybody would be wanting bread made of tail ends, and everybody would be running after everybody else to preach to them instead of bringing up their families and laying by against a bad harvest. It stands to sense, as that can't be the right religion. Nay, dear aunt, you never heard me say that all people are called to forsake their work and their families. It's quite right the land should be plowed and sowed, and the precious corn stored, and the things of this life cared for, and right that people should rejoice in their families and provide for them, so that this is done in fear of the Lord, and that they are not unmindful of the soul's wants while they are caring for the body. We can all be servants of God wherever our lot is cast. But he gives us different sorts of work, according as he fits us for it and calls us to it, I can no more help spending my life in trying to do what I can for the souls of others than you could help running if you heard little Toddy crying at the other end of the house. The voice would go to your heart. You would think the dear child was in trouble or in danger, and you couldn't rest without running to help her and comfort her. 
Ah, said Mrs. Poyser, rising and walking toward the door. I know it'd be just the same if I talked to you for hours. You'd make me the same answer at the end. I might as well talk to the running brook and tell it to stand still. The causeway outside the kitchen door was dry enough now for Mrs. Poyser to stand there quite pleasantly and see what was going on in the yard. The gray worsted stocking making a steady progress in her hands all the while. But she had not been standing there more than five minutes before she came in again and said to Dinah in a rather flurried, awe-stricken tone, "If there isn't Captain Donnythorne and Mister Irwin a coming into the yard, I'll lay my life they're coming to speak about your preaching on the green, Dinah. It's you must answer 'em, for I am dumb. I've said enough already about your bringing such disgrace upon your uncle's family. I wouldn't a minded if you'd been Mister Poyser's own niece." Folks must put up with their own kin as they put up with their own noses. It's their own flesh and blood. But to think a niece of mine being the cause of my husband's being turned out of his farm and me brought him no fording but my savings. Nay, dear Aunt Rachel, Dinah said gently, you've no cause for such fears. I've strong assurance that no evil will happen to you and my uncle and the children from anything I've done. I didn't preach without direction. Direction. I know well what you mean by direction," said Mrs. Poyser, knitting in a rapid, agitated manner. "When there's a bigger maggot than usual in your head, you call it direction, and then nothing can stir you. You look like the steady on the outside of the Treadleston Church, a staring and a smiling, whether it's fair weather or foul. I had a common patience with you." By this time, the two gentlemen had reached the palings and had got down from their horses. It was plain they meant to come in. Mrs. Poyser advanced to the door to meet them, curtsying low and trembling between anger with Dinah and anxiety to conduct herself with perfect propriety on the occasion. For in those days, the keenest of bucolic minds felt a whispering awe at the sight of the gentry, such as men of old felt when they stood on tiptoe to watch the gods passing by in tall human shape. Well, Mrs. Poyser. How are you after this stormy morning? Said Mister Irwin with his stately cordiality. Our feet are quite dry. We shall not soil your beautiful floor. Oh, sir, don't mention it," said Missus Poyser. "Will you and the captain please walk into the parlor?" No, indeed, thank you, Missus Poyser," the captain said, looking eagerly round the kitchen as if his eye were seeking something it could not find. I delight in your kitchen. I think it the most charming room I know. I should like every farmer's wife to come and look at it for a pattern. Oh, you're pleased to say so, sir. Pray take a seat," said Mrs. Poyser, relieved a little by this compliment and the captain's evident good humor, but still glancing anxiously at Mr. Irwin, who she saw was looking at Dinah and advancing towards her. Poyser is not at home, is he? said Captain Donnythorne, seating himself where he could see along the short passage to the open dairy door. No, sir, he isn't. He's gone to Rossiter to see Mister West, the factor, about the wool. But there's father in the barn, sir. If he'd be of any use. No, thank you. I'll just look at the whelps and leave a message about them with your shepherd. I must come another day and see your husband. I want to have a consultation with him about horses. Do you know when he's likely to be at liberty? Why, sir, you can hardly miss him, except it's on Treadleston market day. That's of a Friday, you know. For if he's anywhere on the farm, we can send for him in a minute. If we got rid of the scant lands, we should have no outlying fields, and I should be glad of it. For if anything happens, he's sure to be gone to the scant lands. Things always happen so contrary if they've a chance, and it's an unnatural thing to have one bit of your farm in one county and all the rest in another. Ah, the scant lands would go much better with Choice's farm, especially as he wants dairy land, and we've got plenty. I think yours is the prettiest farm on the estate, though. And do you know, Mrs. Poyser, if I were going to marry and settle down, I should be tempted to turn you out and do up this fine old house and turn farmer myself. Oh, sir," said Mrs. Poyser, rather alarmed, "you wouldn't like it at all. As for farming, it's putting money into your pocket with your right hand and fetching it out with your left. 
As far as I can see, it's raising victuals for other folks and just getting a mouthful for yourself and your children as you go along. Not as you'd be like a poor man as wants to get his bread. You could afford to lose as much money as you liked in farming. But it's poor fun losing money, I should think. Though I understand it's what the great folks in London play at more than anything. For my husband heard at market as Lord Dacey's eldest son had lost thousands upon thousands to the Prince of Wales. "'and they said my lady was going to pawn her jewels to pay for him. "'But you know more about that than I do, sir. "'But as for farming, sir, you cannot think as you'd like it. "'And this house, the drafts in it are enough to cut you through, "'and it's my opinion the floors upstairs are very rotten, "'and the rats in the cellar are beyond anything. "'Why, that's a terrible picture, Mrs. Poyser. "'I think I should be doing you a service to turn you out of such a place. "'But there's no chance of that.' I'm not likely to settle for the next twenty years, till I'm a stout gentleman of forty, and my grandfather would never consent to part with such good tenants as you. Well, sir, if he thinks so well of Mr. Poyser as a tenant, I wish you could put in a word for him to allow us some new gates for the five closes, for my husband's been asking and asking till he's tired, and to think of what he's done for the farm, and's never had a penny allowed to him, be the times good or bad." And as I have said to my husband often and often, I am sure if the captain had anything to do with it, it wouldn't be so. Not as I wish to speak disrespectful of them as got power in their hands, but it's more than flesh and blood will bear sometimes, to be toiling and striving, and up early and down late, and hardly sleeping a wink when you lie down, for thinking as the cheese may swell, or the cows may slip their calf, or the wheat may grow green again in the sheaf. And after all, at the end of the year, it's like as if you'd been cooking a feast and had got a smell of it for your pains. Mrs. Poyser, once launched into conversation, always sailed along without any check from her preliminary awe of gentry. The confidence she felt in her own powers of exposition was a motive force that overcame all resistance. I'm afraid I should only do him harm instead of good if I were to speak about the gates, Mrs. Poyser, the captain said. "'though I assure you there's no man on the estate "'I would sooner say a word for than your husband. "'I know his farm is in better order "'than any other within ten miles of us. "'And as for the kitchen,' he added, smiling, "'I don't believe there's one in the kingdom to beat it. "'By the by, I've never seen your dairy. "'I must see your dairy, Mrs. Poyser. "'Indeed, sir, it's not fit for you to go in, "'for Hetty's in the middle of making butter, "'for the churning was thrown late, "'and I'm quite ashamed.' This, Mrs. Poyser said, blushing, and believing that the captain was really interested in her milk pans, and would adjust his opinion of her to the appearance of her dairy. "'Oh, I've no doubt it's in capital order. Take me in,' said the captain, himself leading the way, while Mrs. Poyser followed. End of chapter 6 The Hall Farm Chapter 7 of Adam Bede. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Lucy Burgoyne. Adam Bede by George Eliot. Chapter 7 The Dairy. The Dairy was certainly worth looking at. It was a scene to sicken for a sort of calenture in hot and dusty streets. Such coolness, such purity, such fresh fragrance of new-pressed cheese, of firm butter, of wooden vessels perpetually bathed in pure water, such soft colouring of red earthenware and creamy surfaces, brown wood and polished tin, grey limestone and rich orange red rust on the iron weights and hooks and hinges but one gets only a confused notion of these details when they surround a distractingly pretty girl of seventeen standing on little patterns and rounding her dimpled arms to lift a pound of butter out of the scale hetty blushed a deep rose colour when Captain Donnithorne entered the dairy and spoke to her. But it was not at all a distressed blush, for it was enwreathed with smiles and dimples, and with sparkles from under long, 
curled, dark eyelashes, and while her aunt was discoursing to him about the limited amount of milk that was to be spared for butter and cheese, so long as the calves were not all weaned, and a large quantity but inferior quality of milk yielded by the shorthorn, which had been bought on experiment, together with other matters which must be interesting to a young gentleman who would one day be a landlord. Hetty tossed and patted her pound of butter, with quite a self-possessed, coquettish air, slyly conscious that no turn of her head was lost. There are various orders of beauty, causing men to make fools of themselves in various styles, from the desperate to the sheepish, but there is one order of beauty which seems made to turn the heads not only of men, but of all intelligent mammals, even of women. It is a beauty like that of kittens, or very small downy ducks, making gentle rippling noises with their soft bills or babies just beginning to toddle and to engage in conscious mischief, a beauty with which you can never be angry, but that you feel ready to crush for inability to comprehend the state of mind into which it throws you. Hetty Sorrels was that sort of beauty. Her aunt, Mrs. Poyser, who professed to desire all personal attractions, and intended to be the severest of mentors, continually gazed at Hetty's charms by the sly, fascinated in spite of herself, and after administering such a scolding as naturally flowed from her anxiety to do well by her husband's niece, who had no mother of her own to scold her, poor thing, she would often confess to her husband, when they were safe out of hearing, that she firmly believed the naughtier the little hussy behaved, the prettier she looked. It is of little use for me to tell you that Hetty's cheek was like a rose petal, that dimples played about her pouting lips, that her large dark eyes hid a soft roguishness under their long lashes, and that her curly hair, though all pushed back under her round cap while she was at work, stole back in dark, delicate rings on her forehead, and about her white shell-like ears. It is of little use for me to say how lovely was the contour of her pink and white neckerchief, tucked into her low plum-coloured stuffed bodice, or how the linen butter making apron, with its bib, seemed a thing to be imitated in silk by duchesses since it fell in such charming lines, or how her brown stockings and thick sole buckled shoes lost all that clumsiness which they must certainly have had when empty of her foot and ankle of little use, unless you have seen a woman who affected you as Hetty affected her beholders, for otherwise, though you might conjure up the image of a lovely woman, she would not in the least resemble that distracting kitten-like maiden. I might mention all the divine charms of a bright spring day, but if you had never in your life utterly forgotten yourself in straining your eyes after the mounting lark, or in wandering through the still lanes when the fresh open blossoms filled them with a sacred silent beauty like that of fretted isles, where would be the use of my descriptive catalogue? I could never make you know what I meant by a bright spring day. Hetty's was a spring-tide beauty. It was the beauty of young frisking things, round-limbed, gamboling, circumfeting you by a false air of innocence, the innocence of a young star-browed calf. For example, that being inclined for a promenade out of bounds, lead you a severe steeplechase over hedge and ditch, and only comes to a stand in the middle of a bog. And they are the prettiest attitudes and movements into which a pretty girl is thrown in making up butter, tossing movements that give a charming curve to the arm, 
and a sideward inclination of the round white neck, little patting and rolling movements with the palm of the hand, and nice adaptions and finishings which cannot at all be affected without a great play of the pouting mouth and the dark eyes. And then the butter itself seems to communicate a fresh charm. It is so pure, so sweet-scented, it is turned off the mould with such a beautiful firm surface, like marble in a pale yellow light. Moreover, Hetty was particularly clever at making up the butter. It was the one performance of hers that her aunt allowed to pass without severe criticism. So she handled it with all the grace that belongs to mastery. I hope you will be ready for a great holiday on the 30th of July, Mrs. Poyser, said Captain Donnithorne when he had sufficiently admired the dairy and given several improvised opinions on sweet turnips and shorthorns. You know what is to happen then, and I shall expect you to be one of the guests who come earliest and leave latest. Will you promise me your hand for two dances, Miss Hetty? If I don't get your promise now, I know I shall hardly have a chance— for all the smart young farmers will take care to secure you. Hetty smiled and blushed, but before she could answer, Mrs. Poyser interposed, scandalised at the mere suggestion that the young squire could be excluded by any meaner partners. Indeed, sir, you are very kind to take that notice of her, and I'm sure whenever you're pleased to dance with her, She'll be proud and thankful if she stood still all the rest of the evening. Oh, no, no, that would be too cruel to all the other young fellows who can dance. But you will promise me two dances, won't you? The captain continued, determined to make Hetty look at him and speak to him. Hetty dropped the prettiest little curtsy and stole a half-shy, half-coquettish glance at him as she said, "'Yes, thank you, sir. "'And you must bring all your children, you know, Mrs. Poyser, "'your little totty, as well as the boys. "'I want all the youngest children on the estate to be there, "'all those who will be fine young men and women "'when I am a bald old fellow. "'Oh, dear, sir, that you'll be a long time first, said Mrs. Poyser quite overcome at the young squire's speaking so lightly of himself, and thinking how her husband would be interested in hearing her recount this remarkable specimen of high-born humour. The captain was thought to be very full of jokes, and was a great favourite throughout the estate on account of his free manners. Every tenant was quite sure things would be different when the reins got into his hands. There was to be a millennial abundance of new gates, allowances of lime, and returns of ten per cent. But where is Totty today? he said. I want to see her. Where is the little one, Hetty? said Mrs. Poyser. She came in here not long ago. I don't know. She went into the brew house to Nancy, I think. The proud mother, unable to resist the temptation to show her totty, passed at once into the back kitchen in search of her, not, however, without misgivings, lest something should have happened to render her person and attire unfit for presentation. And do you carry the butter to market when you've made it? said Captain to Hetty, meanwhile. Oh, no, sir, not when it's so heavy. I'm not strong enough to carry it. Alec takes it on horseback. No, I'm sure your pretty arms were never meant for such heavy weights. But you go out a walk sometimes these pleasant evenings, don't you? Why don't you have a walk in the chase sometimes? Now it's so green and pleasant, I hardly ever see you anywhere except at home and at church. Aunt doesn't like me to go a-walking only when I'm going somewhere, said Hetty, 
but I go through the chase sometimes. And don't you ever go to see Mrs. Best, the housekeeper? I think I saw you once in the housekeeper's room. It isn't Mrs. Best, it's Mrs. Pomfret, the lady's maid, as I go to see. She's teaching me tent stitch and the lace mending. I'm going to tea with her tomorrow afternoon. The reason why there had been space for this tete-a-tete can only be known by looking into the back kitchen, where Totty had been discovered rubbing a stray blue bag against her nose, and in the same moment allowing some liberal indigo drops to fall on her afternoon pinafore. But now she appeared holding her mother's hand, the end of her round nose rather shiny from a recent and hurried application of soap and water. Here she is, said the captain, lifting her up and setting her on the low stone shelf. Here's Totty. By the by, what's her other name? She wasn't christened Totty. Oh, sir, we call her sadly out of her name, Charlotte's, her christened name. It's a name I... Mr. Poyser's family, his grandmother, was named Charlotte, but we began with calling her Lottie, and now it's got to Totty. To be sure, it's more like a name for a dog than a Christian child. Totty's a capital name. Why, she looks like a Totty. Has she got a pocket on? said the captain, feeling in his own waistcoat pockets. Totty immediately, with great gravity, lifted up her frock, and showed a tiny pink pocket at present in a state of collapse. "'It got nothing in it,' she said, as she looked down at it very earnestly. "'No, what a pity, such a pretty pocket. Well, I think I've got some things in mine that will make a pretty jingle in it. Yes, I declare I've got five little round silver things, and here, what a pretty noise they make in Totty's pink pocket.' Here he shook the pocket with the five sixpences in it, and Totty showed her teeth and wrinkled her nose in a great glee. But, divining that, there was nothing more to be got by staying. She jumped off the shelf and ran away to jingle her pocket in the hearing of Nancy, while her mother called after her. Oh, for shame, you naughty girl! Not to thank the captain for what he's given you, I'm sure, sir, it's very kind of you, but she's spoiled shameful. Her father won't have her said nay in anything, and there's no managing her. It's been the youngest, and the only girl. Oh, she's a funny little fatty. I wouldn't have her different, but I must be going now, for I suppose the rector is waiting for me. With a good-bye, a bright glance, and a bow to Hetty Arthur, left the dairy. But he was mistaken in imagining himself waited for. The rector had been so much interested in his conversation with Dinah that he would not have chosen to close it earlier. And you shall hear now what they had been saying to each other. End of chapter 7「Chapter Eight of Adam Bede. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Robin Cotter, October 2007. Adam Bede by George Eliot. Chapter Eight A Vocation. Dinah, who had risen when the gentleman came in, but still kept hold of the sheet she was mending, curtsied respectfully when she saw Mr. Irwine looking at her and advancing towards her. He had never yet spoken to her or stood face to face with her, and her first thought, as her eyes met his, was, What a well-favoured countenance! Oh, that the good seed might fall on that soil, for it would surely flourish! The agreeable impression must have been mutual— for Mr. Irwine bowed to her with a benignant difference, which would have been equally in place if she had been the most dignified lady of his acquaintance. "'You are only a visitor in this neighbourhood, I think. 
were his first words as he seated himself opposite to her. "'No, sir, I come from Snowfield, in Stonyshire. But my aunt was very kind, wanting me to have rest from my work there, because I'd been ill, and she invited me to come and stay with her for a while. "'Ah, I remember Snowfield very well. I once had occasion to go there. It's a dreary, bleak place. They were building a cotton mill there, but that's many years ago now. I suppose the place is a good deal changed by the employment that mill must have brought.' It is changed, so far as the mill has brought people there, who get a livelihood for themselves by working in it, and make it better for the tradesfolks. I work in it myself, and have reason to be grateful, for thereby I have enough, and to spare. But it's still a bleak place, as you say, sir, very different from this country. You have relations living there, probably, so that you are attached to the place as your home? I had an aunt there once. She brought me up, for I was an orphan. But she was taken away seven years ago, and I have no other kindred that I know of, besides my aunt Poyser, who was very good to me, and would have me come and live in this country, which, to be sure, is a good land, wherein they eat bread without scarceness. But I'm not free to leave Snowfield, where I was first planted, and have grown deep into it, like the small grass on the hilltop. Ah! Uh, I dare say you have many religious friends and companions there. You are a Methodist? A Wesleyan, I think? Yes, my aunt at Snowfield belonged to the Society, and I have cause to be thankful for the privileges I have had thereby from my earliest childhood. And have you been long in the habit of preaching? For I understand you preached at Hayslope last night. I first took to the work four years ago, when I was twenty-one. Your Society sanctions women's preaching, then? It doesn't forbid them, sir, when they've a clear call to the work, and when their ministry is owned by the conversion of sinners and the strengthening of God's people. Mrs. Fletcher, as you may have heard about, was the first woman to preach in the society, I believe, before she was married, when she was Miss Bosanquet. And Mr. Wesley approved of her undertaking the work. She had a great gift, and there are many others now living who are precious fellow-helpers in the work of the ministry." I understand there's been voices raised against it in the society of late, but I cannot but think their counsel will come to naught. It isn't for men to make channels for God's Spirit, as they make channels for the watercourses, flow here, but flow not there. But don't you find some danger among your people? I don't mean to say that it is so with you, far from it, but don't you find sometimes that both men and women fancy themselves channels for God's Spirit, and are quite mistaken? so that they set about a work for which they are unfit, and bring holy things into contempt? Doubtless it is so sometimes, for there have been evildoers among us who have sought to deceive the brethren, and some there are who deceive their own selves. But we are not without discipline and correction to put a check upon these things. There is a very strict order kept among us, and the brethren and sisters watch for each other's souls, as they that must give account." They don't go every one his own way, and say, Am I my brother's keeper? But tell me, if I may ask, and I am really interested in knowing it, how you first came to think of preaching. Indeed, sir, I didn't think of it at all. I'd been used from the time I was sixteen to talk to the little children, and teach them, and sometimes I had had my heart enlarged to speak in class, and was much drawn out in prayer with the sick. But I had felt no call to preach, for when I'm not greatly wrought upon, I'm too much given to sit still and keep by myself. It seems as if I could sit silent all day long, with the thought of God overflowing my soul, as the pebbles lie bathed in the willow brook. For thoughts are so great, aren't they, sir? They seem to lie upon us like a deep flood, and it's my besetment to forget where I am, and everything about me, and lose myself in thoughts that I could give no account of for I could neither make a beginning nor ending of them in words. That was my way as long as I can remember, but sometimes it seemed as if speech came to me without any will of my own, and words were given to me that came out as the tears come, because our hearts are full, and we can't help it. And those were always times of great blessing, though I had never thought it could be so with me before a congregation of people. But, sir, we are led on like little children— by a way that we know not. I was called to preach quite suddenly, and since then I have never been left in doubt 
about the work that was laid upon me. But tell me the circumstances, just how it was the very day you began to preach. It was one Sunday I walked with Brother Marlowe, who was an aged man, one of the local preachers, all the way to Hetton Deeps, that's a village where the people get their living by working in the lead mines, and where there's no church nor preacher, but they live like sheep without a shepherd. It's better than twelve miles from Snowfield, so we set out early in the morning, for it was summer time, and I had a wonderful sense of the divine love as we walked over the hills, where there's no trees, you know, sir, as there is here, to make the sky look smaller, but you see the heavens stretched out like a tent, and you feel the everlasting arms around you. But before we got to Hetton, Brother Marlowe was seized with a dizziness that made him afraid of falling, for he overworked himself sadly, at his years, in watching and praying, and walking so many miles to speak the word, as well as carrying on his trade of linen-weaving. And when we got to the village, the people were expecting him, for he'd appointed the time and the place when he was there before, and such of them as cared to hear the word of life were assembled on a spot where the cottages was thickest, so as others might be drawn to come. But he felt as he couldn't stand up to preach, and he was forced to lie down in the first of the cottages we came to. So I went to tell the people, thinking we'd go into one of the houses, and I would read and pray with them. But as I passed along by the cottages, and saw the aged and trembling women at the doors, and the hard looks of the men, who seemed to have their eyes no more filled with the sight of the Sabbath morning than if they had been dumb oxen that never looked up to the sky. I felt a great movement in my soul, and I trembled as if I was shaken by a strong spirit entering into my weak body. And I went to where the little flock of people was gathered together, and stepped on the low wall that was built against the green hillside, and I spoke the words that were given to me abundantly. And they all came round me out of all the cottages, and many wept over their sins, and have since been joined to the Lord. That was the beginning of my preaching, sir, and I've preached ever since. Dinah had let her work fall during this narrative, which she uttered in her usual simple way, but with that sincere articulate, thrilling treble by which she always mastered her audience. She stooped now to gather up her sewing, and then went on with it as before. Mr. Irwine was deeply interested. He said to himself, "'He must be a miserable prig who would act the pedagogue here. One might as well go and lecture the trees for growing in their own shape. And you never feel any embarrassment from the sense of your youth, that you are a lovely young woman on whom men's eyes are fixed?' he said aloud. "'No, I've no room for such feelings, and I don't believe the people ever take notice about that. I think, sir, when God makes his presence felt through us, we are like the burning bush. Moses never took any heed what sort of bush it was. He only saw the brightness of the Lord. I've preached to as rough, ignorant people as can be in the villages about Snowfield, men that looked very hard and wild, but they never said an uncivil word to me, and often thanked me kindly as they made way for me to pass through the midst of them. That I can believe, that I can well believe." said Mr. Irwine emphatically. And what did you think of your hearers last night now? Did you find them quiet and attentive? Very quiet, sir, but I saw no signs of any great work upon them, except in a young girl named Bessie Cranage, towards whom my heart yearned greatly when my eyes first fell on her blooming youth, given up to folly and vanity. I had some private talk and prayer with her afterwards, and I trust her heart is touched. But I've noticed that in these villages, where the people lead a quiet life among the green pastures and the still waters, tilling the ground and tending the cattle, there's a strange deadness to the word, as different as can be from the great towns, like Leeds, where I once went to visit a holy woman who preaches there. It's wonderful how rich is the harvest of souls up those high-walled streets, where you seem to walk as in a prison-yard and the ear is deafened with the sounds of worldly toil. I think maybe it is because the promise is sweeter when this life is so dark and weary, and the soul gets more hungry when the body is ill at ease. Why, yes, our farm laborers are not easily roused. They take life almost as slowly as the sheep and cows, but we have some intelligent workmen about here. I dare say you know the beads. Seth Bede, by the by, is a Methodist. 
"'Yes, I know Seth well, and his brother Adam a little. "'Seth is a gracious young man, sincere and without offence, "'and Adam is like the patriarch Joseph, "'for his great skill and knowledge "'and the kindness he shows to his brother and his parents. "'Perhaps you don't know the trouble that has just happened to them. "'Their father, Matthias Bede, was drowned in the Willowbrook last night, "'not far from his own door. "'I'm going now to see Adam. "'Ah, their poor aged mother!' said Dinah, dropping her hands and looking before her with pitying eyes, as if she saw the object of her sympathy. She will mourn heavily, for Seth has told me she is of an anxious, troubled heart. I must go and see if I can give her any help. As she rose and was beginning to fold up her work, Captain Donathorne, having exhausted all plausible pretexts for remaining among the milk-pans, came out of the dairy, followed by Mrs. Poyser. Mr. Irwine now rose also, and advancing towards Dinah, held out his hand, and said, "'Good-bye. I hear you are going away soon, but this will not be the last visit you will pay your aunt, so we shall meet again, I hope.' His cordiality towards Dinah set all Mrs. Poyser's anxieties at rest, and her face was brighter than usual, as she said, "'I've never asked after Mrs. Irwine and the Miss Irwine, sir. I hope they're as well as usual.' "'Yes, thank you, Mrs. Poyser, except that Miss Anne has one of her bad headaches to-day. "'By the by, we all liked that nice cream cheese you sent us, my mother especially.' "'I'm very glad indeed, sir. It is but seldom I make one, but I remembered Mrs. Irwine was fond of em. "'Please to give my duty to her, and to Miss Kate and Miss Anne. "'They've never been to look at my poultry this long while, and I've got some beautiful speckled chickens.' black and white, as Miss Kate might like to have some amongst hers. "'Well, I'll tell her. She must come and see them. Good-bye,' said the rector, mounting his horse. "'Just ride slowly on, Irwine,' said Captain Donathorne, mounting also. "'I'll overtake you in three minutes. I'm only going to speak to the shepherd about the whelps. Good-bye, Mrs. Poyser. Tell your husband I shall come and have a long talk with him soon.' Mrs. Poyser curtsied duly and watched the two horses until they had disappeared from the yard, amidst great excitement on the part of the pigs and the poultry, and under the furious indignation of the bulldog, who performed a pyrrhic dance, that every moment seemed to threaten the breaking of his chain. Mrs. Poyser delighted in this noisy exit. It was a fresh assurance to her that the farmyard was well guarded, and that no loiterers could enter unobserved, and it was not until the gate had closed behind the captain that she turned into the kitchen again, where Dinah stood with her bonnet in her hand, waiting to speak to her aunt, before she set out for Lisbeth Bede's cottage. Mrs. Poyser, however, though she noticed the bonnet, deferred remarking on it until she had disburdened herself of her surprise at Mr. Irwine's behaviour. "'Why, Mr. Irwine wasn't angry, then? What did he say to you, Dinah? Didn't he scold you for preaching?' "'No, he was not at all angry.' He was very friendly to me. I was quite drawn out to speak to him. I hardly know how, for I had always thought of him as a worldly sadduce. But his countenance is as pleasant as the morning sunshine. Pleasant! And what else did you expect to find him but pleasant? said Mrs. Poyser impatiently, resuming her knitting. I should think his countenance is pleasant indeed, and him a gentleman born, and's got a mother like a picter. "'You may go the country round and not find such another woman turned sixty-six. "'It's somewhat like to see such a man as that at the desk of a Sunday. "'As I say to Poyser, it's like looking at a crop full of wheat, "'or a pasture with a fine dairy of cows in it. "'It makes you think the world's comfortable-like. "'But as for such creatures as you Methodists run after, "'I'd as soon go to look at a lot of bare-ribbed runts on a common. "'Fine folks they are to tell you what's right.' as look as if they'd never tasted nothing better than bacon sword and sour cake in their lives. But what did Mr. Irwine say to you about that fool's trick of preaching on the green? He only said he'd heard of it. He didn't seem to feel any displeasure about it. But, dear aunt, don't think any more about that. He told me something that I'm sure will cause you sorrow, as it does me. Ty Speed was drowned last night in the Willow Brook, and I'm thinking that the aged mother will be greatly in need of comfort— Perhaps I can be of use to her, so I have fetched my bonnet, and am going to set out. Dear heart, dear heart, but you must have a cup of tea first, child, said Mrs. Poyser, falling at once from the key of B with five sharps to the frank and genial C. 
"'The kettle's boiling. We'll have it ready in a minute, "'and the young uns will be in, and wanting theirs directly. "'I'm quite willing you should go and see the old woman, "'for you're one as is allays welcome in trouble, "'Methodist or no Methodist. "'But for the matter o' that, "'it's the flesh and blood folks are made on as makes the difference. "'Some cheeses are made o' skimmed milk, "'and some o' new milk. "'And it's no matter what you call em. "'You may tell which is which by the look and the smell. "'But as to Tyus Bede, "'he's better out o' the way nor in. "'God forgive me for saying so, "'for he's done little this ten year, "'but make trouble for them as belong to him. "'And I think it'd be well for you "'to take a little bottle o' rum for the old woman, "'for I dare say she's got never a drop o' nothing "'to comfort her inside. "'Sit down, child, and be easy, "'for you shan't stir out till you've had a cup o' tea, "'and so I tell you. During the latter part of this speech, Mrs. Poyser had been reaching down the tea-things from the shelves, and was on her way towards the pantry for the loaf, followed close by Totty, who had made her appearance on the rattling of the teacups, when Hetty came out of the dairy relieving her tired arms by lifting them up and clasping her hands at the back of her head. "'Molly,' she said rather languidly, "'just run out and get me a bunch of dock leaves. The butter's ready to pack up now.' "'Do you hear what's happened, Hetty?' "'said her aunt. "'No? How should I hear anything?' "'was the answer, in a pettish tone. "'Not as you'd care much, I dare say, if you did hear, "'for you're too feather-headed to mind if everybody was dead, "'so as you could stay upstairs addressing yourself for two hours by the clock. "'But anybody besides yourself would mind about such things happening to them "'as think a deal more of you than you deserve. "'But Adam Bede and all his kin might be drowned for what you'd care. "'You'd be perkin at the glass the next minute.' "'Adam Bede? Drowned?' said Hetty, letting her arms fall and looking rather bewildered, but suspecting that her aunt was as usual exaggerating with a didactic purpose. "'No, my dear, no,' said Dinah kindly, for Mrs. Poyser had passed on to the pantry without deigning more precise information. "'Not Adam. Adam's father, the old man, is drowned. He was drowned last night in the Willowbrook. Mr. Irwine has just told me about it.' "'Oh, how dreadful!' said Hetty, "'looking serious, but not deeply affected, "'and as Molly now entered with the dock-leaves, "'she took them silently and returned to the dairy "'without asking further questions. "'End of chapter 8「もし私が死んでいたら、もし私が死んでいたら、もし私が死んでいたら、もし私が死んでいたら、もし私が死んでいたら、もし私が死んでいたら、もし私が死んでいたら、もし私が死んでいたら、もし私が死んでいたら、Bright, admiring glances from a handsome young gentleman with white hands, a gold chain, occasional regimentals, and wealth and grandeur immeasurable. Those were the warm rays that set poor Hetty's heart vibrating and playing its little foolish tunes over and over again. We do not hear that Memnon's statue gave forth its melody at all under the rushing of the mightiest wind, or in response to any other influence divine or human than certain short-lived sunbeams of morning. And we must learn to accommodate ourselves to the discovery that some of those cunningly fashioned instruments called human souls have only a very limited range of music, and will not vibrate in the least under a touch that fills others with tremulous rapture or quivering agony. Hetty was quite used to the thought that people liked to look at her. She was not blind to the fact that young Luke Britton of Broxton came to Hayslope Church on a Sunday afternoon on purpose that he might see her. And that he would have made much more decided advances if her uncle Poyser, thinking but lightly of a young man whose father's land was so foul as old Luke Britton's, had not forbidden her aunt to encourage him by any civilities. She was aware, too, that Mr. Craig, the gardener at the chase, was over head and ears in love with her, and had lately made unmistakable avowals in luscious strawberries and hyperbolical peas. She knew still better that Adam Bede, tall, upright, clever, brave Adam Bede, who carried such authority with all the people round about, and whom her uncle was always delighted to see of an evening, saying that Adam knew a fine sight more of the nature of things than those as thought themselves his betters. 
She knew that this Adam, who was often rather stern to other people and not much given to run after the lasses, could be made to turn pale or red any day by a word or a look from her. Hetty's sphere of comparison was not large, but she couldn't help perceiving that Adam was something like a man, always knew what to say about things, could tell her uncle how to prop the hovel, and had mended the churn in no time, knew with only looking at it the value of the chestnut tree that was blown down, and why the damp came in the walls, and what they must do to stop the rats, and wrote a beautiful hand that you could read off and could do figures in his head, a degree of accomplishment totally unknown among the richest farmers of that countryside. Not at all like that slouching Luke Britton, who, when she once walked with him all the way from Broxton to Hayslope, had only broken silence to remark that the grey goose had begun to lay. And as for Mr. Craig, the gardener, he was a sensible man enough, to be sure, but he was knock-kneed, and had a queer sort of sing-song in his talk. Moreover, on the most charitable supposition, he must be far on the way to forty. Hetty was quite certain her uncle wanted her to encourage Adam, and would be pleased for her to marry him, for those were times when there was no rigid demarcation of rank between the farmer and the respectable artisan, and on the home-hearth, as well as in the public house, they might be seen taking their jug of ale together the farmer having a latent sense of capital and of weight in parish affairs, which sustained him under his conspicuous inferiority in conversation. Martin Poyser was not a frequenter of public houses, but he liked a friendly chat over his own home-brood, and though it was pleasant to lay down the law to a stupid neighbor who had no notion how to make the best of his farm, it was also an agreeable variety to learn something from a clever fellow like Adam Bede. Accordingly, for the last three years, ever since he had superintended the building of the new barn, Adam had always been made welcome at the hall farm, especially of a winter evening, when the whole family, in patriarchal fashion, master and mistress, children and servants, were assembled in that glorious kitchen at well-graduated distances from the blazing fire. And for the last two years, at least, Hetty had been in the habit of hearing her uncle say, Adam Bede may be working for wage now, but he'll be a master man some day, as sure as I sit in this chair. Mr. Burge is in the right aunt to want him to go partners and marry his daughter, if it's true what they say. The woman as marries him will have a good take, be it Lady Day or Michaelmas, a remark which Mrs. Poyser always followed up with her cordial assent. Ah, she would say, it's all very fine having a ready-made rich man, but may happen he'll be a ready-made fool and it's no use filling your pocket full of money if you've got a hole in the corner. It'll do you no good to sit in a spring cart of your own, if you've got a soft to drive you. He'll soon turn you over into the ditch. I always said I'd never marry a man as had got no brains, for where's the use of a woman having brains of her own if she's tackled to a geck as everybody's a-laughing at? She might as well dress herself fine to sit backwards on a donkey. These expressions, though figurative, sufficiently indicated the bent of Mrs. Poyser's mind with regard to Adam and though she and her husband might have viewed the subject differently if Hetty had been a daughter of their own, it was clear that they would have welcomed the match with Adam for a penniless niece. For what could Hetty have been but a servant elsewhere, if her uncle had not taken her in and brought her up as a domestic help to her aunt, whose health since the birth of Toddy had not been equal to more positive labor than the superintendence of servants and children? But Hetty had never given Adam any steady encouragement. Even in the moments when she was most thoroughly conscious of his superiority to her other admirers, she had never brought herself to think of accepting him. She liked to feel that this strong, skillful, keen-eyed man was in her power, and would have been indignant if he had shown the least sign of slipping from under the yoke of her coquettish tyranny and attaching himself to the gentle Mary Burge, who would have been grateful enough for the most trifling notice of him. Mary Burge, indeed! Such a sallow-faced girl! If she put on a bit of pink ribbon, she looked as yellow as a crow flower, and her hair was as straight as a hank of cotton. And always when Adam stayed away for several weeks from the hall farm, and otherwise made some show of resistance to his passion as a foolish one, Hetty took care to entice him back into the net by little airs of meekness and timidity, as if she were in trouble at his neglect. But as to marrying Adam, that was a very different affair. There was nothing in the world to tempt her to do that. Her cheeks never grew a shade deeper when his name was mentioned. She felt no thrill when she saw him passing along the causeway by the window, or advancing towards her unexpectedly in the footpath across the meadow. She felt nothing when his eyes rested on her but the cold triumph of knowing that he loved her and would not care to look at Mary Burge. He could no more stir in her the emotions that make the sweet intoxication of young love than the mere picture of a sun can stir the spring sap in the subtle fibers of the plant. 
She saw him as he was, a poor man with old parents to keep who would not be able, for a long while to come, to give her even such luxuries as she shared in her uncle's house. And Hetty's dreams were all of luxuries— to sit in a carpeted parlor and always wear white stockings, to have some large beautiful earrings, such as were all the fashion, to have Nottingham lace round the top of her gown, and something to make her handkerchief smell nice, like Miss Lydia Donnithorne's when she drew it out at church, and not to be obliged to get up early or be scolded by anybody. She thought if Adam had been rich and could have given her these things, she loved him well enough to marry him. But for the last few weeks a new influence had come over Hetty, vague, atmospheric, shaping itself into no self-confessed hopes or prospects, but producing a pleasant narcotic effect, making her tread the ground and go about her work in a sort of dream, unconscious of weight or effort, and showing her all things through a soft, liquid veil, as if she were living not in this solid world of brick and stone, but in a beatified world, such as the sun lights up for us in the waters. Hetty had become aware that Mr. Arthur Donathorne would take a good deal of trouble for the chance of seeing her, that he always placed himself at church so as to have the fullest view of her, both sitting and standing, that he was constantly finding reason for calling at the hall farm, and always would contrive to say something for the sake of making her speak to him and look at him. The poor child no more conceived at present the idea that the young squire could ever be her lover than a baker's pretty daughter in the crowd, whom a young emperor distinguishes by an imperial but admiring smile, conceives that she shall be made empress. But the baker's daughter goes home and dreams of the handsome young emperor, and perhaps weighs the flower amiss while she is thinking what a heavenly lot it must be to have him for a husband. And so poor Hetty had got a face and a presence haunting her waking and sleeping dreams. Bright, soft glances had penetrated her, and suffused her life with a strange, happy languor. The eyes that shed those glances were really not half so fine as Adam's, which sometimes looked at her with a sad, beseeching tenderness, but they had found a ready medium in Hetty's little silly imagination, whereas Adam's could get no entrance through that atmosphere. For three weeks, at least, her inward life had consisted of little else than living through in memory the looks and words Arthur had directed towards her of little else than recalling the sensations with which she heard his voice outside the house, and saw him enter, and became conscious that his eyes were fixed on her, and then became conscious that a tall figure, looking down on her with eyes that seemed to touch her, was coming nearer in clothes of beautiful texture, with an odor like that of a flower garden borne on the evening breeze. Foolish thoughts, but all this happened, you must remember, nearly sixty years ago, and Hetty was quite uneducated a simple farmer's girl, to whom a gentleman with a white hand was dazzling as an Olympian god. Until today she had never looked farther into the future than to the next time Captain Donathorne would come to the farm, or the next Sunday when she should see him at church. But now she thought perhaps he would try to meet her when she went to the chase tomorrow, and if he should speak to her and walk a little way when nobody was by. That had never happened yet, and now her imagination, instead of retracing the past, was busy fashioning what would happen tomorrow, where about in the chase she should see him coming towards her, how she should put her new rose-colored ribbon on, which she had never seen, and what he would say to her to make her return his glance, a glance which she would be living through in her memory, over and over again, all the rest of the day. In this state of mind, how could Hetty give any feeling to Adam's troubles, or think much about poor old Thias being drowned? Young souls in such pleasant delirium as hers— are as unsympathetic as butterflies sipping nectar. They are isolated from all appears by a barrier of dreams, by invisible looks and impalpable arms. While Hetty's hands were busy packing up the butter, and her head filled with these pictures of the morrow, Arthur Donathorne, riding by Mr. Irwin's side towards the valley of the Willow Brook, had also certain indistinct anticipations, running as an undercurrent in his mind while he was listening to Mr. Irwin's account of Dinah indistinct yet strong enough to make him feel rather conscious when Mr. Irwin suddenly said, "'What fascinated you so in Mrs. Poyser's dairy, Arthur? Have you become an amateur of damp quarries and skimming dishes?' Arthur knew the rector too well to suppose that a clever invention would be of any use, so he said with his accustomed frankness, "'No, I went to look at the pretty butter-maker, Hetty Sorrel. She's a perfect hebe, and if I were an artist, I would paint her.' It's amazing what pretty girls one sees among the farmer's daughters, when the men are such clowns. That common, round, red face one sees sometimes in the men, all cheek and no features, like Martin Poyser's, comes out in the women of the family as the most charming fizz imaginable. Well, I have no objection to your contemplating heavy in an artistic light, 
But I must not have you feeding her vanity and filling her little noodle with the notion that she's a great beauty, attractive to fine gentlemen, or you will spoil her for a poor man's wife. Honest Craig's, for example, whom I have seen bestowing soft glances on her. The little puss seems already to have airs enough to make a husband as miserable as it's a law of nature for a quiet man to be when he marries a beauty. Apropos of marrying, I hope our friend Adam will get settled, now the poor old man's gone. He will only have his mother to keep him in future, and I've a notion that there's a kindness between him and that nice modest girl, Mary Burge, from something that fell from old Jonathan one day when I was talking to him. But when I mentioned the subject to Adam, he looked uneasy and turned the conversation. I suppose the love-making doesn't run smooth, or perhaps Adam hangs back till he's in a better position. He has independence of spirit enough for two men, rather an excess of pride, if anything. That would be a capital match for Adam. He would slip into old Burgess's shoes and make a fine thing of that building business. I'll answer for him. I should like to see him well settled in this parish. He would be ready then to act as my grand vizier when I wanted one. We could plan no end of repairs and improvements together. I've never seen the girl, though, I think. At least I've never looked at her. Look at her next Sunday at church. She sits with her father on the left of the reading desk. You needn't look quite so much at Hetty Sorrel, then. When I've made up my mind that I can't afford to buy a tempting dog, I take no notice of him, because if he took a strong fancy to me and looked lovingly at me, the struggle between arithmetic and inclination might become unpleasantly severe. I pique myself on my wisdom there, Arthur, and as an old fellow to whom wisdom has become cheap, I bestow it upon you. Thank you. It may stand me in good stead some day, though I don't know that I have any present use for it. Bless me, how the brook has overflowed— Suppose we have a canter now we're at the bottom of the hill. That is the great advantage of dialogue on horseback. It can be merged any minute into a trot or a canter, and one might have escaped from Socrates himself in the saddle. The two friends were free from the necessity of further conversation till they pulled up in the lane behind Adam's cottage. End of chapter 9《Chapter Ten of Adam Bede》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《Adam Bede》by George Eliot《Chapter Ten》Diner visits Lisbeth. At five o'clock. Lisbeth came downstairs with a large key in her hand. It was the key of the chamber where her husband lay dead. Throughout the day, except in her occasional outbursts of wailing grief, she had been in incessant movement, performing the initial duties to her dead with the awe and exactitude that belong to religious rites. She had brought out her little store of bleached linen, which she had for long years kept in reserve for this supreme use. It seemed but yesterday, that time so many midsummers ago, when she had told Theus where this linen lay, that he might be sure and reach it out for her when she died, for she was the elder of the two. Then there had been the work of cleansing to the strictest purity every object in the sacred chamber, and of removing from it every trace of common daily occupation. The small window which had hitherto freely let in the frosty moonlight or the warm summer sunrise on the working man's slumber must not be darkened with a fair white sheet, for this was the sleep which is as sacred under the bare rafters as in sealed houses. Lisbeth had even mended a long-neglected and unnoticeable rent in checkered bit of bed curtain, for the moments were few and precious now in which she would be able to do the smallest office of respect or love for the still corpse, to which in all her thoughts she attributed some consciousness. Our dead are never dead to us until we have forgotten them. They can be injured by us, 
they can be wounded. They know all our penitence, all our aching sense that their place is empty, all the kisses we bestow on the smallest relic of their presence. And the aged peasant woman most of all believes that her dead are conscious. Decent burial was what Lisbeth had been thinking of for herself three years of thrift, with an indistinct expectation that she should know when she was being carried to the churchyard, followed by her husband and her sons, and now she felt as if the greatest work of her life were to be done in seeing that Theus was buried decently before her under the white thorn, where once, in a dream, she had thought she lay in the coffin, yet all the while saw the sunshine above, and smelt the white blossoms that were so thick upon the thorn the Sunday she went to be churched after Adam was born. But now she had done everything that could be done today in the chamber of death, had done it all herself with some aid from her sons in lifting, for she would let no one be fetched to help her from the village, not being fond of female neighbours generally, and her favourite Dolly, the old housekeeper at Mr. Burgess, who had come to condole with her in the morning, as soon as she heard of Theus's death, was too dim-sighted to be of much use. She had locked the door, and now held the key in her hand, as she threw herself wearily into a chair that stood out of its place in the middle of the house floor, where in ordinary times she would never have consented to sit. The kitchen had had none of her attention that day. It was soiled with the tread of muddy shoes, and untidy with clothes and other objects out of place but what at another time would have been intolerable to Lisbeth's habits of order and cleanliness seemed to her now just what should be. It was right that things should look strange and disordered and wretched, now that the old man had come to his end in that sad way. The kitchen ought not to look as if nothing had happened. Adam, overcome with the agitations and exertions of the day, after his night of hard work, had fallen asleep on a bench in the workshop, and Seth was in the back kitchen making a fire of sticks, that he might get the kettle to boil, and persuade his mother to have a cup of tea, an indulgence which she rarely allowed herself. There was no one in the kitchen when Lisbeth entered and threw herself into the chair. She looked round with blank eyes at the dirt and confusion on which the bright afternoon sun shone dismally. It was all of a piece with the sad confusion of her mind, that confusion which belongs to the first hours of a sudden sorrow, when the poor human soul is like one who has been deposited sleeping among the ruins of a vast city, and wakes up in dreary amazement, not knowing whether it is the growing of the dying day, not knowing why and whence came this illimitable scene of desolation, or why he too finds himself desolate in the midst of it. At another time, Lisbeth's first thought, would have been, where is Adam? But the sudden death of her husband had restored him in these hours to that first place in her affections, which he had held six and twenty years ago. She had forgotten his faults as we forget the sorrows of our departed childhood, and thought of nothing but the young husband's kindness and the old man's patience. Her eyes continued to wander blankly until Seth came in and began to remove some of the scattered things and clear the small round deal table that he might set out his mother's tea upon it. "'What art going to do?' she said, 
rather peevishly. "'I want thee to have a cup of tea, mother,' answered Seth tenderly. "'It'll do thee good, and I'll put two or three of these things away, and make the house look more comfortable.' "'Comfortable? How canst talk, O oh, main things comfortable? Let it be, let it be. There's no comfort for me no more.' she went on, the tears coming when she began to speak. Now thy poor father's gone, as I'm washed for amended, and God's victual for him for thirty year, and him always so pleased with everything I done for him, and used to be so handy and do the jobs for me when I were ill and cumbered with the bubby, and made me the posses and brought it upstairs as proud as could be and carried the lad as wore as heavy as two children for five miles, and near grumbled, all the way to Warson Wake, cause I wanted to go and see my sister, as wore dead and gone the very next Christmas, and er come, and him to be drowned in the brook as we passed all the day we were married, and come home together, and he'd made me lots of shelves for me to put my plates and things on, and showed em me as proud as could be, cause he'd knowed I should be pleased, and he were to die, and me not to know, but to be and sleepin in my bed, as if I cared not naught about it, ay, and me to live to see that, and us, as poor young folks once, and thought we should do rarely when we were married, let it be, lad, let it be, I won't a had no tay, I care not if I near ate nor drink no more. When one end of the bridge tumbles down, where the use of the other standin'? I may as well die and follow my old man. There's no knowing that he'll want me. Here Lisbeth broke from words into moans, swaying herself backwards and forwards on her chair. Seth, always timid in his behaviour towards his mother, from the sense that he had no influence over her, felt it was useless to attempt to persuade or soothe her till this passion was past. So he contented himself with tending the back kitchen fire and folding up his father's clothes, which had been hanging out to dry since morning, afraid to move about in the room where his mother was, lest he should irritate her further. But after Lisbeth had been rocking herself and moaning for some minutes, she suddenly paused and said aloud to herself, I'll go and see Arthur Adam, for I canna think where he's gotten, and I want him to go upstairs with me afore it's dark, for the minutes to look at the corpse is like the melting snow. Seth overheard this, and coming into the kitchen again, as his mother rose from her chair, he said, Adam's asleep in the workshop, mother. Thee's better not wake him. He was overwrought with work and trouble. Wake him? Who's a-going to wake him? I shan't awake with looking at him. I hadn't seen the lad this two hour. I'd welly forgotten as he'd er growed up from a baby when's father carried him. Adam was seated on a rough bench, his head supported by his arm, which rested from the shoulder to the elbow on the long planning table in the middle of the workshop. It seemed as if he had sat down for a few minutes, rest, and had fallen asleep without slipping from his first attitude of sad, fatigued thought, his face unwashed since yesterday looked pallid and clammy. His hair was tossed shaggily about his forehead, and his closed eyes had the sunken look which follows upon watching and sorrow. His brow was knit, and his whole face had an expression of weariness and pain. Jip was evidently uneasy, for he sat on his haunches, resting his nose on his master's stretched-out leg, and dividing the time between licking the hand that hung listlessly down, and glancing with a listening air towards the door. 
The poor dog was hungry and restless, but would not leave his master, and was waiting impatiently for some change in the scene. It was owing to this feeling on Gyp's part that, when Lisbeth came into the workshop and advanced towards Adam as noiselessly as she could, her intention to awaken him was immediately defeated, for Gyp's excitement was too great to find vent in anything short of a sharp bark, and in a moment Adam opened his eyes and saw his mother standing before him. It was not very unlike his dream, for his sleep had been little more than living through again, in a fevered delirious way, all that had happened since daybreak, and his mother, with her fretful grief, was present to him through it all. The chief difference between the reality and the vision was that in his dream Hetty was continually coming before him, in bodily presence, strangely mingling herself as an actor in scenes with which she had nothing to do. She was even by the willow brook. She made his mother angry by coming into the house, and he met her with her smart clothes quite wet through, as he walked in the rain to Treddleston to tell the coroner. But wherever Hetty came, his mother was sure to follow soon, and when he opened his eyes, it was not at all startling to see her standing near him. Eh, my lad, my lad! Lisbeth burst out immediately, her wailing impulse returning, for grief in its freshness feels the need of associating its loss and its lament with every change of scene and incident. "'There's got nobody now but thy old mother to torment thee and be a burden to thee. "'Thy poor father, you'll near anger thee no more, "'and thy mother may's well go arter him. "'The sooner the better, for I'm no good to nobody now. "'One cold coat and you'll do to patch another, "'but it's good for naught else. "'Thee's like to have a wife to mend thy clothes and get thy victual.' "'Better nor thy old mother. "'And I shall be naught but cumber, a sitting, "'I the chimney corner.' "'Adam winced and moved uneasily. "'He dreaded, of all things, "'to hear his mother speak of Hetty. "'But if thy father had lived, "'he'd near have wanted me to go "'to make room for another, "'for he could no more have done without me nor one side of the scissors can do without the other. Ah, we should have been both flung away together, and then I shouldn't have seen this day, and one burying. You'd have done for us both. Here Lisbeth paused, but Adam sat in pained silence. He could not speak otherwise than tenderly to his mother today, but he could not help being irritated by this plant. It was not possible for poor Lisbeth to know how it affected Adam any more than it is possible for a wounded dog to know how his moans affect the nerves of his master. Like all complaining women, she complained in the expectation of being soothed, and when Adam said nothing, she was only prompted to complain more bitterly. I know thee couldn't do better without me, for thee couldst go where thee likeliest and marry them as thee likes. But I don't want to say thee nay. Let thee bring home who thee what. I near open my lips to find fault, for when folks is old and of no use, they may think their scenes well off to get the bit and the suck though they need swallow ill words wit. And if thee set thy heart on a lass, as bring thee naught and waste all, when thee mightest have them, as you'd make a man of thee, I'll say naught, now thy father's dead and drowned it, for I'm no better nor an old hack when the blade's gone. Adam, unable to bear this any longer, rose silently from the bench, 
and walked out of the workshop into the kitchen. But Lisbeth followed him. Thee want to go upstairs and see thy father then? I'd done everything now, and he'd like thee to go and look at him, for he were always so pleased when thee was mild to him. Adam turned round at once and said, Yes, mother, let us go upstairs. Come, Seth, let us go together. They went upstairs, and for five minutes all was silence. Then the key was turned again, and there was a sound of footsteps on the stairs. But Adam did not come down again. He was too weary and worn out to encounter more of his mother's querulous grief, and he went to rest on his bed. Lisbeth no sooner entered the kitchen and sat down than she threw her apron over her head and began to cry and moan and rock herself as before. Seth thought, she will be quieter by and by, now we have been upstairs, and he went into the back kitchen again to tend his little fire, hoping that he should presently induce her to have some tea. Lisbeth had been rocking herself in this way for more than five minutes, giving a low moan with every forward movement of her body, when she suddenly felt a hand placed gently on hers, and a sweet treble voice said to her, Dear sister, the Lord has sent me to see if I can be a comfort to you. Lisbeth paused, in a listening attitude, without removing her apron from her face. The voice was strange to her, could it be her sister's spirit come back to her from the dead after all those years? She trembled and dared not look. Dinah, believing that this pause of wonder was in itself a relief for the sorrowing woman, said no more just yet, but quietly took off her bonnet, and then, motioning silence to Seth, who, on hearing her voice, had come in with a beating heart, laid one hand on the back of Elizabeth's chair and leaned over her, that she might be aware of a friendly presence. Slowly Elizabeth drew down her apron, and timidly she opened her dim dark eyes. She saw nothing at first but a face, a pure pale face with loving grey eyes, and it was quite unknown to her. Her wonder increased, perhaps it was an angel. But in the same instant, Dinah had laid her hand on Lisbeth's again, and the old woman looked down at it. It was a much smaller hand than her own, but it was not white and delicate, but Dinah had never worn a glove in her life and her hand bore the traces of labour from her childhood upwards. Lisbeth looked earnestly at the hand for a moment, and then, fixing her eyes again on Dinah's face, said, with something of restored courage, but in a tone of surprise, Why, you're a working woman. Yes, I am Dinah Morris, and I work in the cotton mill when I am at home. Aye, said Lisbeth slowly, still wondering. Ye come in so light, like the shadow on the wall, and spoke in my ear, as I thought ye might be a spirit. You've got a most the face of one as is a sitting on the grave. I Adam's new Bible. I come from the Hall Farm now. You know Mrs. Poyser, she's my aunt, and she has heard of your great affliction, and is very sorry, and I'm come to see if I can be any help to you in your trouble, for I know your sons, Adam and Seth, and I know you have no daughter, and when the clergyman told me how the hand of God was heavy upon you, my heart went out towards you, and I felt a command to come and be to you in the place of a daughter in this grief, if you will let me. Ah, I know who you are now. 
"'You are a Methody, like Seth. "'He's told me on you,' said Lisbeth fretfully, "'her overpowering sense of pain returning. "'Now her wonder was gone. "'You'll make it out as trouble's a good thing, "'like he always does. "'But where's the use of talking to me at that end? "'You can't make the smart less with talking.' You'll near make me believe as it's better for me not to have my old man die in his bed, if he must die, and have the parson to pray by him, and me to sit by him, and tell him near to mind the ill words I've given him sometimes when I were angered, and to give him a bit and a sup, as long as a bit and a sup he'd swallow. But, ah, oh, to die in the cold water, and you's close to him, and near to know, and me is sleeping as if I near belonged to him no more, nor if he'd been a journeyman tramp from nobody knows where. Here Lisbeth began to cry and rock herself again, and Dinah said, Yes, dear friend, your affliction is great. It would be hardness of heart to say that your trouble was not heavy to bear. God didn't send me to you to make light of your sorrow, but to mourn with you, if you will let me. If you had a table spread for a feast, and was making merry with your friends, you would think it was kind to let me come and sit down and rejoice with you, because you'd think I should like to share those good things, but I should like better to share in your trouble and your labour and it would seem harder to me if you denied me that. You won't send me away. You're not angry with me for coming. Nay, nah, nay, nah, angered. Who said I were angered? It were good on you to come. And Seth, why don't you get her some tay? Ye were in a hurry to get some for me, as had no need, but you don't a think a getting to for them as wants it. Sit ye down, sit ye down. I thank you kindly for coming, for it's a little wage you get by walking through the wet fields to see an old woman like me. Nah, I've got no daughter. Oh, my own near had one. I weren't a sorry, for they're poor queechy things, gals is. I always wanted to have lads as could fend for their sins. And the lads all be marrying. I shall have daughters enough, and too many. But now, do you make the tay as you like it, for I've got no taste in my mouth this day. It's all one what a swallow. It's all got the taste of sorrow wit. Dinah took care not to betray that she had had her tea, and accepted Lisbeth's invitation very readily, for the sake of persuading the old woman herself to take the food and drink she so much needed after a day of hard work and fasting. Seth was so happy now Dinah was in the house that he could not help thinking her presence was worth purchasing with a life in which grief incessantly followed upon grief. But the next moment he reproached himself. It was almost as if he was rejoicing in his father's sad death. Nevertheless, the joy of being with Dinah would triumph it was like the influence of climate, which no resistance can overcome, and the feeling even suffused itself over his face so as to attract his mother's notice while she was drinking her tea. These may's well talk a trouble being a good thing, Seth, for thee thrivest on. Thee looketh as if thee knows no more or care and cumber nor when thee was a bubby a lying awake in the cradle, for thee's always lie still with thy eyes open, and Adam near or lie still a minute when he wakened. Thee was always like a bag of meal as can near be bruised though, for the matter of that. Thy poor father were just such another, but you've got the same look too. Here Lisbeth turned to Dinah. I reckon it's with being a methody, not as I'm a-finding fault with the fort, for we no call to be frettin', and somehow ye lookin' sorry too. Ah, 
Well, if the Methodies are fond of trouble, they're like to thrive. It's a pity they canna had all, and take it away from me as done a like it. I could have given him plenty, for when I'd gotten my old man, I were warranted from morn till night, and now he's gone. I'd be glad for the worst or again. Yes, said Dinah, careful not to oppose any feeling of Lisbeth's, for her reliance in her smallest words and deeds, on a divine guidance, always issued in that finest woman's tact which proceeds from acute and ready sympathy. Yes, I remember too, when my dear aunt died, I longed for the sound of her bad cough in the nights, instead of the silence that came when she was gone. But now, dear friend, drink this other cup of tea and eat a little more. What? said Lisbeth, taking the cup and speaking in a less querulous tone. Had ye got no father and mother, then, as ye were so sorry about your aunt? No, I never knew a father or a mother. My aunt brought me up from a baby. She had no children, for she was never married, and she brought me up as tenderly as if I'd been her own child. Ah, uh, she'd fine work with ye. I'll warrant bringing ye up from a bubby, and her a lone woman. It's ill bringing up a cad lamb. But I dare say ye won a frenzy, for ye look as if ye need been angered in your life. But what did ye say when your aunt died? And why don't ye come to live in this country, being as Mrs. Poyser's your aunt too? Dinah, seeing that Lisbeth's attention was attracted, told the story of her early life, how she had been brought up to work hard, and what sort of place Snowfield was, and how many people had a hard life there, all the details that she thought likely to interest Lisbeth. The old woman listened, and forgot to be fretful, unconsciously subject to the soothing influence of Dinah's face and voice. After a while she was persuaded to let the kitchen to be made tidy, for Dinah was bent on this, believing that the sense of order and quietude around her would help in disposing Lisbeth to join in the prayer she longed to pour forth at her side. Seth, meanwhile, went out to chop wood, for he surmised that Dinah would like to be left alone with his mother. Lisbeth sat watching her as she moved about in her still quick way, and said at last, "'You've got a notion of cleaning up. "'I wouldn't mind ye for a daughter, "'for ye wouldn't spend the lad's wage "'in fine clothes and waste. "'Ye not like the lasses on this countryside. "'I reckon folks is different at Snowfield "'from what they are here. "'They have a different sort of life, "'many of them,' said Dinah. "'They work at different things, "'some in the mill.' and many in the mines, in the villages round about. But the heart of man is the same everywhere, and there are the children of this world, and the children of light there as well as elsewhere. But we've many more Methodists there than in this country. Well, I didn't know as a Methody woman were like ye, for there's Will Maskery's wife, as they say a big Methody, isn't pleasant to look at at all. I'd as life look at a toad. And I'm thinking, and I wouldn't mind if you'd stayed and sleep here, for I should like to see ye thy house in the morning. But may happen they'll be looking for ye at Mr. Poyser's. No, said Dinah, they don't expect me, and I should like to stay if you'll let me. Well, there's room. I got me bed laid in thy little room of the back kitchen, and ye can lie beside me. I'd be glad to have ye with me to speak in the night, for ye've got a nice way of talking. It puts me in mind of the swallows was under the thack last year, when they first began to sing low and soft-like in the morning. Ah, 
But my old man were fond of them birds, and so were Adam. But they're near comed again this year. Happen they're dead too. There, said Dinah, now the kitchen looks tidy. And now, dear mother, for I'm your daughter tonight, you know, I should like you to wash your face and have a clean cap on. Do you remember what David did when God took away his child from him? While the child was yet alive, he fasted and prayed to God to spare it, and he would neither eat nor drink, but lay on the ground all night, beseeching God for the child. But when he knew it was dead, he rose up from the ground and washed and anointed himself, and changed his clothes, and ate and drank. And when they asked him how it was that, He seemed to have left off grieving now the child was dead. He said, While the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, Who can tell whether God will be gracious to me, that the child may live? But now he is dead. Wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. Ah, that's a true word, said Lisbeth. Yeah, my old man want to come back to me, but I shall go to him, the sooner the better. Well, ye may do as ye like with me. There's a clean cap in the drawer, and I'll go in the back of the kitchen and wash my face. And Seth, thee mayst reach down Adam's new Bible with the pictures in, and she shall read us a chapter. Ah, I like them words. I shall go to him, but he want to come back to me. Dinah and Seth were both inwardly offering thanks for the greatest quietness of spirit that had come over Lisbeth. This was what Dinah had been trying to bring about, through all her still sympathy and absence from exhortation. From her girlhood upwards, she had had experience among the sick and the mourning, among minds hardened and shriveled through poverty and ignorance, and had gained the subtlest perception of the mode in which they could best be touched and softened into willingness to receive words of spiritual consultation or warning. As Dinah expressed it, she was never left to herself but it was always given her when to keep silence and when to speak. And do we not all agree to call rapid thought a noble impulse by the name of inspiration? After our subtlest analysis of the mental process, we must still say, as Dinah did, that our highest thoughts and our best deeds are all given to us. And so there was earnest prayer, there was faith, love, and hope pouring forth that evening in the little kitchen. And poor, aged, fretful Lisbeth, without grasping any distinct idea, without going through any course of religious emotions, felt a vague sense of goodness and love, and of something right lying underneath and beyond all this sorrowing life. She couldn't understand the sorrow, but, for these moments, under the subduing influence of Dinah's spirit, she felt that she must be patient and still. End of chapter 10「『Adam Bede』This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Lucy Burgoyne. « Adam Bede » by George Eliot. Chapter 11 In the Cottage It was but half-past four the next morning, when Dinah, tired of lying awake, listening to the birds and watching the growing light 
through the little window in the garret roof, rose and began to dress herself very quietly, lest she should disturb Lisbeth. But already someone else was astir in the house, and had gone downstairs, preceded by Dip. The dog's pattering step was a sure sign that it was Adam who went down. But Dinah was not aware of this, and she thought it was more likely to be Seth, for he had told her how Adam had stayed up working the night before. Seth, however, had only just awakened at the sound of the opening door. The exciting influence of the previous day, heightened at last by Dinah's unexpected presence, had not been counteracted by any bodily weariness, for he had not done his ordinary amount of hard work, and so when he went to bed it was not till he had tired himself with hours of tossing wakefulness that drowsiness came, and led on a heavier morning sleep than was usual with him. But Adam had been refreshed by his long rest, and with his habitual impatience of mere passivity, he was eager to begin the new day and subdue sadness by his strong will and strong arm. The white mist lay in the valley. It was going to be a bright warm day, and he would start to work again when he had had his breakfast. There's nothing but what's bearable as long as a man can work, he said to himself, the nature o' things doesn't change, though it seems as if one's own life was nothing but change. The square of four is sixteen, and you must lengthen your lever in proportion to your weight. It is true when a man's miserable as when he's happy, and the best o' working is it gives you a grip hold of things outside your own lot. As he dashed the cold water over his head and face, he felt completely himself again, and with his black eyes as keen as ever and his thick black hair all glistening with the fresh moisture, he went into the workshop to look out the wood for his father's coffin, intending that he and Seth should carry it with them to Jonathan Burgess and have the coffin made by one of the workmen there so that his mother might not see and hear the sad task going forward at home. He had just gone into the workshop when his quick ear detected a light rapid foot on the stairs, certainly not his mother's. He had been in bed and asleep when Dinah had come in, in the evening, and now he wondered whose step this could be. A foolish thought came and moved him strangely, as if it could be Hetty. She was the last person likely to be in the house, and yet he felt reluctant to go and look and have the clear proof that it was someone else. He stood leaning on a plank he had taken hold of, listening to sounds which his imagination interpreted for him so pleasantly that the keen strong face became suffused with the timid tenderness. The light footstep moved about the kitchen, followed by the sound of the sweeping brush, hardly making so much noise as the lightest breeze that chases the autumn leaves along the dusty path, and Adam's imagination saw a dimpled face, with dark bright eyes and roguish smiles looking backward at this brush, and a rounded figure just leaning a little to clasp the handle. A very foolish thought it could not be Hetty, but the only way of dismissing such nonsense from his head was to go and see who it was, for his fancy only got nearer and nearer to belief while he stood there listening. He loosened the plank and went to the kitchen door. "'How do you do, Adam Bede?' said Dinah, in her calm treble pausing from her sweeping and fixing her mild grave eyes upon him. I trust you feel rested and strengthened again to bear the burden and heat of the day. It was like dreaming of the sunshine and awaking in the moonlight. Adam had seen Dinah several times, 
but always at the Hall Farm, where he was not very vividly conscious of any woman's presence except Hetty's, and he had only in the last day or two begun to suspect that Seth was in love with her, so that his attention had not hitherto been drawn towards her for his brother's sake. But now her slim figure, her plain black gown, and her pale, serene face impressed him with all the force that belongs to a reality contrasted with a preoccupying fancy. For the first moment or two he made no answer, but looked at her with the concentrated, examining glance which a man gives to an object in which he has suddenly begun to be interested. Dinah, for the first time in her life, felt a painful self-consciousness. There was something in the dark, penetrating glance of this strong man so different from the mildness and timidity of his brother Seth. A faint blush came, which deepened as she wondered at it. This blush recalled Adam from his forgetfulness. I was quite taken by surprise. It was very good of you to come and see my mother in her trouble, he said, in a gentle, grateful tone, for his quick mind told him at once how she came to be there. I hope my mother was thankful to have you, he added, wondering rather anxiously what had been Dinah's reception. Yes, said Dinah, resuming her work. She seemed greatly comforted after a while, and she's had a good deal of rest in the night, by times. She was fast asleep when I left her. Who was it took the news to the Hall Farm? said Adam, his thoughts reverting to someone there. He wondered whether she had felt anything about it. It was Mr. Irwine, the clergyman, told me, and my aunt was grieved for your mother when she heard it, and wanted me to come, and so is my uncle. I'm sure now he's heard it that he was gone out to Rosseter all yesterday. They'll look for you there as soon as you've got time to go, for there's nobody round that hearth but what's glad to see you. Dinah, with her sympathetic divination, knew quite well that Adam was longing to hear if Hetty had said anything about their trouble. She was too rigorously truthful for benevolent invention, but she had contrived to say something in which Hetty was tacitly included. Love has a way of cheating itself consciously, like a child who plays at solitary, hide-and-seek. It is pleased with assurances that it all the while disbelieves. Adam liked what Dinah had said so much that his mind was directly full of the next visit he should pay to the Hall Farm when Hetty would perhaps behave more kindly to him than she had ever done before. But you won't be there yourself any longer, he said to Dinah. No, I go back to Snowfield on Saturday, and I shall have to set out to Treddleston early, to be in time for Oakbourne Carrier, so I must go back to the farm tonight, that I may have the last day with my aunt and her children." but I can stay here all to-day, if your mother would like me, and her heart seemed inclined towards me last night. Ah, then, she's sure to want you to-day. If mother takes to people at the beginning, she's sure to get fond of them, but she's a strange way of not liking young women. Though, to be sure, Adam went on smiling, her not liking other young women is no reason why she shouldn't like you. Hitherto Jip had been assisting at this conversation in motionless silence, seated on his haunches, and alternately looking up in his master's face to watch its expression and observing Dinah's movements about the kitchen. The kind smile with which Adam uttered the last words was apparently decisive with Jip of the light in which the stranger was to be regarded. 
and as she turned round after putting aside her sweeping brush, he trotted towards her and put up his muzzle against her hand in a friendly way. "'You see, Jip bids you welcome,' said Adam, "'and he's very slow to welcome strangers.' "'Poor dog,' said Dinah, patting the rough grey coat. "'I've a strange feeling about the dumb things as if they wanted to speak, "'and it was a trouble to em because they couldn't. "'I can't help being sorry for the dogs always, "'though perhaps there's no need, "'but they may well have more in them than they know how to make us understand.' for we can't say half what we feel, with all our words. Seth came down now, and was pleased to find Adam talking with Dinah. He wanted Adam to know how much better she was than all other women. But after a few words of greeting, Adam drew him into the workshop to consult about the coffin, and Dinah went on with her cleaning. By six o'clock they were all at breakfast, with Lisbeth in a kitchen as clean as she could have made it herself. The window and door were open, and the morning air brought with it a mingled scent of southern wood, thyme, and sweet briar from the patch of garden by the side of the cottage. Dinah did not sit down at first, but moved about serving the others with the warm porridge and the toasted oat-cake, which she had got ready in the usual way, for she had asked Seth to tell her just what his mother gave them for breakfast. Lisbeth had been unusually silent since she came downstairs, apparently requiring some time to adjust her ideas to a state of things in which she came down like a lady to find all the work done and sat still to be waited on. Her new sensation seemed to exclude the remembrance of her grief. At last, after tasting the porridge, she broke silence. "'Ye might have made the porridge worse,' she said to Dinah. "'I can eat it without its turn in my stomach. It might have been a trifle thicker, and no harm, and I always put in a spring of mint in myself.' "'But how's you to know that? "'The lads are in alike to get folks as I'll make their porridge, "'as I've made it for em. "'It's well if they get on body as I'll make porridge at all. "'But ye might do with a bit of showin', "'for ye're a stirrin' body in a morning, "'and ye've a light heel, "'and ye've cleaned the house well enough for a makeshift.' "'Makeshift, mother,' said Adam. "'Why?' I think the house looks beautiful. I don't know how it could look better. Thee dost na know. Nah, how's thee to know? The men near know whether the floor's clean or cat licked. But thee'll know when thee gets thy porridge burnt, as it's like enough to be when I'm gin, or makin' it. Thee think thy mother wore good for something then. Dinah said, Seth. Do come and sit down now, and have your breakfast. We're all served now. Aye, come and sit ye down, do, said Lisbeth, and ate a morsel. You'd need, arter being up on your legs this hour and a half already. Come then, she added, in a tone of complaining affection, as Dinah sat down by her side. I'll be low for you go, but you can't stay much longer. I doubt. I could put up with you in the house better nor with most folks. I'll stay till tonight, if you're willing, said Dinah. I'd stay longer, only I'm going back to Snowfield on Saturday, and I must be with my aunt tomorrow. Ah, I'd near go back to that country. My old man come from that Stonyshire side, but he left it when he were a young un and I the right on too, for he said as there war no wood there, and it ought to have been a bad country for a carpenter. I said Adam, I remember father telling me when I was a little lad that he made up his mind if ever he moved it should be southward, but I'm not so sure about it. Bartle Massey says, and he knows the south 
as the northern men are a finer breed than the southern, harder-headed and stronger-bodied, and a deal taller. And then he says in some of those counties it's as flat as the back of your hand, and you can see nothing of a distance without climbing up the highest trees. I couldn't abide that. I like to go to work by a road that'll take me up a bit of a hill, and see the fields for miles round me, and a bridge, or a town, or a bit of steeple here and there. It makes you feel the world's a big place, and there's no other men working in it with their heads and hands besides yourself. I like the hills best, said Seth, when the clouds are over your head, and you see the sun shining ever so far off, over the Loamford Way, as I've often done a lake on the stormy days. It seems to me as if that was heaven, where there's always joy and sunshine, though this life's dark and cloudy. Oh, I love the stony shire side, said Dinah. I shouldn't like to set my face towards the countries where they're rich in corn and cattle, and the ground so level and easy to tread, and to turn my back on the hills where the poor people have to live such a hard life and the men spend their days in the mines away from the sunlight. It's very blessed on a bleak cold day when the sky is hanging dark over the hill to feel the love of God in one's soul and carry it to the lonely, bare, stone houses where there's nothing else to give comfort. Eh, said Lisbeth, that's very well for you to talk as looks welly like the snowdrop flowers, has you lived for days and days when I'm gibbered em with nothing but a drop o' water and peep o' daylight. But the hungry folks had better leave the hungry country. It makes less mouths for the scant cake. But she went on, looking at Adam. Donna thee talk o' goin' southern or northern, and leaving thy father and mother either churchyard and going to a country as they know nothing on. I'll near rest on my grave if I donna see thee, I'd churchyard of a Sunday. Donna fear, mother, said Adam, if I hadn't made up my mind not to go, I should have been gone before now. He had finished his breakfast now, and rose as he was speaking. What art going to do? asked Lisbeth. Set about thy father's coffin, "'No, mother,' said Adam. "'We're going to take the wood to the village "'and have it made there.' "'Nah, my lad, nay,' Lisbeth burst out in an eager, wailing tone. "'Thee won't not let nobody make thy father's coffin but thy sin. "'Who'd make it so well? "'And him as knowed what good work war, "'and got a son as it is the head of the village, "'and all treadles on too for cleverness.' "'Very well, mother, if that's thy wish. "'I'll make the coffin at home. "'But I thought thee wouldst no like to hear the work going on. "'And why shouldn't I like it? "'It's the right thing to be done. "'And what's liking got to do with? "'It's choice o' oh, mislikings is all in got a eye this world. "'One morsel's as good as another when your mouth's out of taste. "'Thee mun set about it now this morning.' first thing. I want to have nobody to touch the coffin but thee. Adam's eyes met Seth's, which looked from Dinah to him rather wistfully. No, mother, he said, I'll not consent, but Seth shall have a hand in it too, if it's to be done at home. I'll go to the village this forenoon, because Mr. Burge will want to see me, and Seth shall stay at home and begin the coffin. I can come back at noon, and then he can go. Nay, nay, persisted Lisbeth, beginning to cry. In set my heart on as thee shalt mar thy father's coffin. Thee so stiff and masterful. Thee near do as thy mother wants thee. Thee wast often angered with thy father when he were alive. Thee must be the better to him now he's gone. He'd have thought nothing on to for Seth to mar's coffin. "'Say no more, Adam, say no more,' said Seth, gently, though his voice told that he spoke with some effort. 
Mother's in the right. I'll go to work and do thee stay at home. He passed into the workshop immediately, followed by Adam, while Lisbeth, automatically obeying her old habits, began to put away the breakfast things, as if she did not mean Dinah to take her place any longer. Dinah said nothing, but presently used the opportunity of quietly joining the brothers in the workshop. They had already got on their aprons and paper caps, and Adam was standing with his left hand on Seth's shoulder, while he pointed with the hammer in his right to some boards which they were looking at. Their backs were turned towards the door by which Dinah entered, and she came in so gently that they were not aware of her presence till they heard her voice saying, Seth Bede. Seth started, and they both turned around. Dinah looked as if she did not see Adam, and fixed her eyes on Seth's face, saying with calm kindness, I won't say farewell. I shall see you again when you come from work, so as I'm at the farm before dark, it will be quite soon enough. Thank you, Dinah. I should like to walk home with you once more. It'll perhaps be the last time. There was a little tremor in Seth's voice. Dinah put out her hand and said, You'll have sweet peace in your mind today, Seth for your tenderness and long-suffering towards your aged mother. She turned round and left the workshop as quickly and quietly as she had entered it. Adam had been observing her closely all the while, but she had not looked at him. As soon as she was gone, he said, I don't wonder at thee for loving her, Seth. She's got a face like a lily. Seth's soul rushed to his eyes and lips. He had never yet confessed his secret to Adam, but now he felt a delicious sense of disburdenment as he answered, Ay, Addy, I do love her too much, I doubt. But she doesn't love me, lad, only as one child of God loves another. She'll never love any man as a husband. That's my belief. Nay, lad, there's no telling. Thee mustn't lose heart. She's made out of stuff with a finer grain than most of the women. I can see that clear enough. But if she's better than they are in other things, I cannot think she'll fall short of them in loving. No more was said. Seth set out to the village, and Adam began his work on the coffin. God help the lad, and me too, he thought as he lifted the board. We're like enough to find life a tough job, hard work inside and out. It's a strange thing to think of a man as can lift a chair with his teeth and walk fifty mile on end, trembling and turning, hot and cold, at only a look from one woman out of all the rest of the world. It's a mystery we can give no account of, but no more we can of the sprouting of a seed, for that matter. End of chapter 11 Chapter 12 of Adam Bede This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Missy Guangzhou, China. Adam Bede by George Eliot. Chapter 12. In the Wood. That same Thursday morning, as Arthur Donathorne was moving about in his dressing room, seeing his well-looking British person reflected in the old-fashioned mirrors, and stared at from a dingy olive-green piece of tapestry by Pharaoh's daughter and her maidens, who ought to have been minding the infant Moses, he was holding a discussion with himself which, by the time his valet was tying the black silk sling over his shoulder, had issued in a distinct practical resolution. "'I mean to go to Eagledale and fish for a week or so,' he said aloud. "'I shall take you with me, Pim, and set off this morning, so be ready by half-past eleven.' 
the low whistle which had assisted him in arriving at this resolution here broke out into his loudest ringing tenor and the corridor as he hurried along it echoed to his favorite song from the beggar's opera when the heart of a man is oppressed with care not in a heroic strain nevertheless arthur felt himself very heroic as he strode towards the stables to give his orders about the horses his own approbation was necessary to him and it was not an approbation to be enjoyed quite gratuitously it must be won by a fair amount of merit he had never yet forfeited that approbation and he had considerable reliance on his own virtues no young man could confess his faults more candidly candor was one of his favorite virtues and how can a man's candor be seen in all its lustre unless he has a few failings to talk of but he had an agreeable confidence that his faults were all of a generous kind impetuous warm-blooded leonine never crawling crafty reptilian it was not possible for arthur donnithorne to do anything mean dastardly or cruel no i'm a devil of a fellow for getting myself into a hobble but i always take care the load shall fall on my own shoulders unhappily there is no inherent poetical justice in hobbles and they will sometimes obstinately refuse to inflict their worst consequences on the prime offender in spite of his loudly expressed wish it was entirely owing to this deficiency in the scheme of things that arthur had ever brought any one into trouble besides himself he was nothing if not good-natured and all his pictures of the future when he should come into the estate were made up of a prosperous contented tenantry adoring their landlord who would be the model of an english gentleman mansion in first-rate order all elegance and high taste jolly housekeeping finest stud in loamshire purse open to all public objects in short everything as different as possible from what was now associated with the name of donnithorne and one of the first good actions he would perform in that future should be to increase erwine's income for the vicarage of hayslope so that he might keep a carriage for his mother and sisters his hearty affection for the rector dated from the age of frocks and trousers it was an affection partly filial partly fraternal fraternal enough to make him like erwine's company better than that of most younger men and filial enough to make him shrink strongly from incurring Irwine's disapprobation. You perceive that Arthur Donnithorne was a good fellow. All his college friends thought him such. He couldn't bear to see anyone uncomfortable. He would have been sorry, even in his angriest moods, for any harm to happen to his grandfather, and his Aunt Lydia herself had the benefit of that soft-heartedness which he bore towards the whole sex. Whether he would have self-mastery enough to be always as harmless and purely beneficent as his good nature led him to desire was a question that no one had yet decided against him. He was but twenty-one, you remember, and we don't inquire too closely into character in the case of a handsome, generous young fellow who will have property enough to support numerous peccadilloes, who, if he should unfortunately break a man's legs in his rash driving, will be able to pension him handsomely or, if he should happen to spoil a woman's existence for her, will make it up to her with expensive bonbons, packed up and directed by his own hands. It would be ridiculous to be prying and analytic in such cases, as if one were inquiring into the character of a confidential clerk. We use round, general, gentlemanly epithets about a young man of birth and fortune. And ladies, with that fine intuition which is the distinguishing attribute of their sex, see at once that he is nice. The chances are that he will go through life without scandalizing any one, a seaworthy vessel that no one would refuse to insure. Ships certainly are liable to casualties, which sometimes make terribly evident some flaw in their construction that would never have been discoverable in smooth water, and many a good fellow, through a disastrous combination of circumstances, has undergone a like betrayal. But we have no fair ground for entertaining unfavorable auguries concerning Arthur Donnithorne, who this morning proves himself capable of a prudent resolution founded on conscience. One thing is clear. Nature has taken care that he shall never go far astray with perfect comfort and satisfaction to himself. He will never get beyond that borderland of sin, where he will be perpetually harassed by assaults from the other side of the boundary. He will never be a courtier of vice and wear her orders in his buttonhole. It was about ten o'clock, and the sun was shining brilliantly. Everything was looking lovelier for the yesterday's rain. It is a pleasant thing on such a morning to walk along the well-rolled gravel on one's ways to the stables, meditating an excursion. But the scent of the stables, which in a natural state of things ought to be among the soothing influences of a man's life, always brought with it some irritation to Arthur. 
There was no having his own way in the stables. Everything was managed in the stingiest fashion. His grandfather persisted in retaining as head groom an old dolt whom no sort of lever could move out of his old habits, and who was allowed to hire a succession of raw Loamshire lads as his subordinates, one of whom had lately tested a new pair of shears by clipping an oblong patch on Arthur's bay mare. This state of things is naturally embittering. One can put up with annoyances in the house, but to have the stable made a scene of vexation and disgust is a point beyond what human flesh and blood can be expected to endure long together, without danger of misanthropy. Old John's wooden, deep-wrinkled face was the first object that met Arthur's eyes as he entered the stable-yard, and it quite poisoned for him the bark of the two bloodhounds that kept watch there. He could never speak quite patiently to the old blockhead. "'You must have Meg saddled for me and brought to the door at half-past eleven, and I shall want Rattler saddled for Pym at the same time. Do you hear?' "'Yes, I hear, I hear, Captain. said old John very deliberately, following the young master into the stable. John considered a young master as the natural enemy of an old servant, and young people in general as a poor contrivance for carrying on the world. Arthur went in for the sake of patting Meg, declining as far as possible to see anything in the stables, lest he should lose his temper before breakfast. The pretty creature was in one of the inner stables, and turned her mild head as her master came beside her. Little Trot, a tiny spaniel, her inseparable companion in the stable, was comfortably curled up on her back. "'Well, Meg, my pretty girl,' said Arthur, patting her neck, "'we'll have a glorious canter this morning.' "'Nay, Your Honour, I dunna see as that can be,' said John. "'Not be? Why not?' "'Why, she's got lamed.' "'Lamed? Confound you! What do you mean?' "'Why, the lad took her too close to Dalton's hosses, and one of them flung out at her, and she's got her shank bruised o' the near foreleg.' The judicious historian abstains from narrating precisely what ensued. You understand that there was a great deal of strong language, mingled with soothing, who hoes while the leg was examined, that John stood by with quite as much emotion as if he had been a cunningly carved crab-tree walking-stick, and that Arthur Donathorne presently repassed the iron gates of the pleasure-ground without singing as he went. He considered himself thoroughly disappointed and annoyed. There was not another mount in the stable for himself and his servant besides Meg and Rattler. It was vexatious, just when he wanted to get out of the way for a week or two. It seemed culpable in Providence to allow such a combination of circumstances— to be shut up at the chase with a broken arm when every other fellow in his regiment was enjoying himself at Windsor, shut up with his grandfather, who had the same sort of affection for him as for his parchment deeds, and to be disgusted at every turn with the management of the house and the estate. In such circumstances a man necessarily gets in an ill humour, and works off the irritation by some excess or other. Salkeld would have drunk a bottle of port every day, he muttered to himself, but I'm not well seasoned enough for that. Well, since I can't go to Eagledale, I'll have a gallop on Rattler to Norburn this morning and lunch with Gawain. Behind this explicit resolution there lay an implicit one. If he lunched with Gawain and lingered chatting, he should not reach the chase again till nearly five, when Hetty would be safe out of his sight in the housekeeper's room, and when she set out to go home it would be his lazy time after dinner, so he should keep out of her way altogether. There really would have been no harm in being kind to the little thing— and it was worth dancing with a dozen ballroom bells only to look at Hetty for half an hour. But perhaps he had better not take any more notice of her. It might put notions into her head, as Erwine had hinted, though Arthur, for his part, thought girls were not by any means so soft and easily bruised. Indeed, he had generally found them twice as cool and cunning as he was himself. As for any real harm in Hetty's case, it was out of the question. Arthur Donathorne accepted his own bond for himself with perfect confidence." So the twelve o'clock sun saw him galloping towards Norburn, and by good fortune Halsell Common lay in his road and gave him some fine leaps for Rattler. Nothing like taking a few bushes and dishes for exercising a demon. And it is really astonishing that the centaurs, with their immense advantages in this way, have left so bad a reputation in history. After this you will perhaps be surprised to hear that, although Gawain was at home, the hand of the dial in the courtyard had scarcely cleared the last stroke of three, when Arthur returned through the entrance gates, got down from the panting rattler, and went into the house to take a hasty luncheon. But I believe there have been men since his day who have ridden a long way to avoid a rencontre, and then galloped hastily back lest they should miss it. 
It is the favorite stratagem of our passions to sham a retreat, and to turn sharp round upon us at the moment we have made up our minds that the day is our own. The captain's been riding the devil's own pace, said Dalton, the coachman, whose person stood out in high relief as he smoked his pipe against the stable wall when John brought up Rattler. And I wish he'd get the devil to do his groomin' for him, growled John. Aye, he'd have a deal hambler groom nor what he has now, observed Dalton. And the joke appeared to him so good that, being left alone upon the scene, he continued at intervals to take his pipe from his mouth in order to wink at an imaginary audience, and shake luxuriously with a silent ventral laughter, mentally rehearsing the dialogue from the beginning, that he might recite it with effect in the servants' hall. When Arthur went up to his dressing-room again after luncheon, it was inevitable that the debate he had had with himself there earlier in the day should flash across his mind— but it was impossible for him now to dwell on the remembrance, impossible to recall the feelings and reflections which had been decisive with him then, any more than to recall the peculiar scent of the air that had freshened him when he first opened his window. The desire to see Hetty had rushed back like an ill-stemmed current. He was amazed himself at the force with which this trivial fancy seemed to grasp him. He was even rather tremulous as he brushed his hair. Pooh! it was riding in that breakneck way. It was because he had made a serious affair of an idle matter by thinking of it as if it were any, of any consequence. He would amuse himself by seeing Hetty to-day and get rid of the whole thing from his mind. It was all Irwine's fault. If Irwine had said nothing, I shouldn't have thought half so much of Hetty as of Meg's lameness. However, it was just the sort of day for lolling in the hermitage, and he would go and finish Dr. Moore's Zeluco there before dinner. The hermitage stood in Fir-Tree Grove— the way Hetty was sure to come in walking from the hall farm. So nothing could be simpler and more natural. Meeting Hetty was a mere circumstance of his walk, not its object. Arthur's shadow flitted rather faster among the sturdy oaks of the chase than might have been expected from the shadow of a tired man on a warm afternoon, and it was still scarcely four o'clock when he stood before the tall, narrow gate leading into the delicious labyrinthine wood which skirted one side of the chase, and which was called Fir-Tree Grove, not because the firs were many, but because they were few. It was a wood of beeches and limes, with here and there a light silver-stemmed birch, just the sort of wood most haunted by the nymphs. You see their white sunlit limbs gleaming athwart the boughs, or peeping from behind the smooth sweeping outline of a tall lime. You hear their soft, liquid laughter. But if you look with a too curious, sacrilegious eye, they vanish behind the silvery beeches. They make you believe that their voice was only a running brooklet. Perhaps they metamorphose themselves into a tawny squirrel that scampers away and mocks you from the topmost bough. It was not a grove with measured grass or rolled gravel for you to tread upon, but with narrow, hollow-shaped earthy paths, edged with faint dashes of delicate moss paths which look as if they were made by the free will of the trees and underwood, moving reverently aside to look at the tall queen of the white-footed nymphs. It was along the broadest of these paths that Arthur Donathorne passed, under an avenue of limes and beeches. It was a still afternoon. The golden light was lingering languidly among the upper boughs, only glancing down here and there on the purple pathway and its edge of faintly sprinkled moss. An afternoon in which destiny disguises her cold, awful face behind a hazy, radiant veil, encloses us in warm, downy wings, and poisons us with violet-scented breath. Arthur strolled along carelessly, with a book under his arm, but not looking on the ground as meditative men are apt to do. His eyes would fix themselves on the distant bend in the road, round which a little figure must surely appear before long. Ah, there she comes. First a bright patch of color, like a tropic bird among the boughs, then a tripping figure with a round hat on and a small basket under her arm, then a deep blushing, almost frightened, but bright smiling girl, making her curtsy with a fluttered yet happy glance as Arthur came up to her. If Arthur had had time to think at all, he would have thought it strange that he should feel fluttered too, be conscious of blushing too, in fact, look and feel just as foolish as if he had been taken by surprise, instead of meeting just what he expected. Poor things! It was a pity they were not in that golden age of childhood when they would have stood face to face, 
eyeing each other with timid liking, then giving each other a little butterfly kiss and toddled off to play together. Arthur would have gone home to his silk-curtained cot and Hetty to her homespun pillow, and both would have slept without dreams, and tomorrow would have been a life hardly conscious of a yesterday. Arthur turned round and walked by Hetty's side without giving a reason. They were alone together for the first time. What an overpowering presence that first privacy is! He actually dared not look at this little butter-maker for the first minute or two. As for Hetty, her feet rested on a cloud, and she was borne along by warm zephyrs. She had forgotten her rose-colored ribbons. She was no more conscious of her limbs than if her childish soul had passed into a water-lily, resting on a liquid bed and warmed by the midsummer sunbeams. It may seem a contradiction, but Arthur gathered a certain carelessness and confidence from his timidity. It was an entirely different state of mind from what he had expected in such a meeting with Hetty, and full as he was of vague feeling, there was room in those moments of silence for the thought that his previous debates and scruples were needless. "'You are quite right to choose this way of coming to the chase,' he said at last, looking down at Hetty. "'It is so much prettier, as well as shorter, than coming by either of the lodges.' "'Yes, sir,' Hetty answered, with a tremulous, almost whispering voice. She didn't know one bit how to speak to a gentleman like Mr. Arthur, and her very vanity made her more coy of speech. "'Do you come every week to see Mrs. Pomfret?' "'Yes, sir, every Thursday, only when she's got to go out with Miss Donathorne.' "'And she's teaching you something, is she?' "'Yes, sir. The lace-mending, as she learnt abroad, and the stocking-mending. It looks just like the stocking. You can't tell it's been mended, and she teaches me cutting out, too.' "'What? Are you going to be a lady's maid?' "'I should like to be one very much indeed,' Hetty spoke more audibly now, but still rather tremulously. She thought perhaps she seemed as stupid to Captain Donathorne as Luke Britton did to her. "'I suppose Mrs. Pomfret always expects you at this time?' "'She expects me at four o'clock. I'm rather late today because my aunt couldn't spare me, but the regular time is four, because that gives us time before Miss Donathorne's bell rings.' "'Ah, then, I must not keep you now, else I should like to show you the hermitage.' "'Did you ever see it?' "'No, sir.' "'This is the walk where we turn up to it. "'But we must not go now. "'I'll show it to you some other time, if you'd like to see it.' "'Yes, please, sir.' "'Do you always come back this way in the evening, "'or are you afraid to come so lonely a road?' "'Oh, no, sir, it's never late. "'I always set out by eight o'clock, "'and it's so light now in the evening. "'My aunt would be angry with me "'if I didn't get home before nine. "'Perhaps Craig, the gardener, comes to take care of you?' A deep blush overspread Hetty's face and neck. "'I'm sure he doesn't. I'm sure he never did. I wouldn't let him. I don't like him,' she said hastily. And the tears of vexation had come so fast that before she had done speaking a bright drop rolled down her hot cheek. Then she felt ashamed to death that she was crying, and for one long instant her happiness was all gone. But in the next she felt an arm steal round her, and a gentle voice said, "'Why, Hetty, what makes you cry? I didn't mean to vex you.' I wouldn't vex you for the world, you little blossom. Come, don't cry. Look at me, else I shall think you won't forgive me. Arthur had laid his hand on the soft arm that was nearest to him, and was stooping towards Hetty with a look of coaxing entreaty. Hetty lifted her long, dewy lashes and met the eyes that were bent towards her with a sweet, timid, beseeching look. What a space of time those three moments were while their eyes met and his arms touched her. Love is such a simple thing when we have only one and twenty summers, and a sweet girl of seventeen trembles under our glance, as if she were a bud first opening her heart with wondering rapture to the morning. Such young, unfurrowed souls roll to meet each other, like two velvet peaches that touch softly and are at rest. They mingle as easily as two brooklets that ask for nothing but to entwine themselves and ripple with ever-interlacing curves in the leafiest hiding-places. While Arthur gazed into Hetty's dark, beseeching eyes, it made no difference to him what sort of English she spoke, and even if hoops and powder had been in fashion, he would very likely not have been sensible just then that Hetty wanted those signs of high breeding. But they started asunder with beating hearts. Something had fallen on the ground with a rattling noise. It was Hetty's basket. All her little workwoman's matters were scattered on the path, some of them showing a capability of rolling to great lengths. 
There was much to be done in picking up, and not a word was spoken, but when Arthur hung the basket over her arm again, the poor child felt a strange difference in his look and manner. He just pressed her hand and said with a look and tone that were almost chilling to her, "'I have been hindering you. I must not keep you any longer now. You will be expected at the house. Good-bye.' Without waiting for her to speak, he turned away from her and hurried back towards the road that led to the hermitage, leaving Hetty to pursue her way in a strange dream that seemed to have begun in bewildering delight and was now passing into contrarieties and sadness. Would he meet her again as she came home? Why had he spoken almost as if he were displeased with her, and then run away so suddenly? She cried, hardly knowing why. Arthur, too, was very uneasy but his feelings were lit up for him by a more distinct consciousness. He hurried to the hermitage, which stood in the heart of the wood, unlocked the door with a hasty wrench, slammed it after him, pitched Saluko into the most distant corner, and thrusting his right hand into his pocket, first walked four or five times up and down the scanty length of the little room, and then seated himself on the ottoman in an uncomfortable, stiff way, as we often do when we wish not to abandon ourselves to feeling. He was getting in love with Hetty, that was quite plain. He was ready to pitch everything else, no matter where, for the sake of surrendering himself to this delicious feeling which had just disclosed itself. It was no use blinking the fact now. They would get too fond of each other, if he went on taking notice of her. And what would come of it? He should have to go away in a few weeks, and the poor little thing would be miserable. He must not see her alone again. He must keep out of her way. What a fool he was for coming back from Gawain's. He got up and threw open the windows to let in the soft breath of the afternoon and the healthy scent of the firs that made a belt round the hermitage. The soft air did not help his resolution, as he leaned out and looked into the leafy distance, but he considered his resolution sufficiently fixed. There was no need to debate with himself any longer. He had made up his mind not to meet Hetty again and now he might give himself up to thinking how immensely agreeable it would be if circumstances were different. How pleasant it would have been to meet her this evening as she came back and put his arm round her again and look into her sweet face. He wondered if the dear little thing were thinking of him, too. Twenty to one she was. How beautiful her eyes were with the tear on their lashes. He would like to satisfy his soul for a day with looking at them, and he must see her again, he must see her, simply to remove any false impression from her mind about his manner to her just now. He would behave in a quiet, kind way to her, just to prevent her from going home with her head full of wrong fancies. Yes, that would be the best thing to do, after all. It was a long while, more than an hour before Arthur had brought his meditations to this point, but once arrived there he could stay no longer at the hermitage. The time must be filled up with movement until he should see Hetty again, and it was already late enough to go and dress for dinner, for his grandfather's dinner hour was six. End of chapter 12「Chapter 13 of Adam Bede This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Adam Bede by George Eliot Chapter 13 Evening in the Wood It happened that Mrs. Pomfret had had slight quarrel with Mrs. Best, the housekeeper, on this Thursday morning, a fact which had two consequences highly convenient to Hetty. It caused Mrs. Pomfret to have tea sent up to her own room, and it inspired that exemplary lady's maid with so lively a recollection of former passages in Mrs. Best's conduct, and of dialogues in which Mrs. Best had decidedly the inferiority as an interlocutor with Mrs. Pomfret, that Hetty required no more presence of mind than was demanded for using her needle, and throwing in an occasional yes or no. She would have wanted to put on her hat earlier than usual, only she had told Captain Donnithorne that she usually set out about eight o'clock and if he should go to the grove again expecting to see her, and she should be gone. Would he come? Her little butterfly soul fluttered incessantly between memory and dubious expectation. At last, the minute hand of the old-fashioned brazen-faced timepiece was on the last quarter to eight, and there was every reason for its being time to get ready for departure. 
even Mrs. Pomfret's preoccupied mind did not prevent her from noticing what looked like a new flush of beauty in the little thing as she tied on her hat before the looking-glass. "'That child gets prettier and prettier every day, I do believe,' was her inward comment. "'The more's the pity. She'll get neither a place nor a husband any the sooner for it. Sober well-to-do men don't like such pretty wives. When I was a girl, I was more admired than if I had been so very pretty.' However, she's reason to be grateful to me for teaching her something to get her bread with, better than farmhouse work. They always told me I was good-natured, and that's the truth, and to my hurt, too, else there's none in this house that wouldn't be here now to lord it over me in the housekeeper's room. Hetty walked hastily across the short space of pleasure ground which she had to traverse, dreading to meet Mr. Craig, to whom she could hardly have spoken civilly. How relieved she was when she had got safely under the oaks and among the fern of the chase. Even then she was as ready to be startled as the deer that leaped away at her approach. She thought nothing of the evening light that lay gently in the grassy alleys between the fern, and made the beauty of their living green more visible than it had been in the overpowering flood of noon. She thought of nothing that was present. She only saw something that was possible— Mr. Arthur Donathorn coming to meet her again along the fir-tree grove. That was the foreground of Hetty's picture. Behind it lay a bright hazy something, days that were not to be as the other days of her life had been. It was as if she had been wooed by a river god who might any time take her to his wondrous halls below a watery heaven. There was no knowing what would come since this strange entrancing delight had come. If a chest full of lace and satin and jewels had been sent her from some unknown source— how could she but have thought that her whole lot was going to change, and that tomorrow some still more bewildering joy would befall her? Hetty had never read a novel. If she had ever seen one, I think the words would have been too hard for her. How then could she find a shape for her expectations? They were as formless as the sweet languid odors of the garden at the chase, which had floated past her as she walked by the gate. She is at another gate now, that leading into fir-tree grove. She enters the wood, where it is already twilight, and at every step she takes, the fear at her heart becomes colder. If he should not come, oh, how dreary it was, the thought of going out at the other end of the wood into the unsheltered road, without having seen him. She reaches the first turning towards the hermitage, walking slowly. He is not there. She hates the leveret that runs across the path. She hates everything that is not what she longs for. She walks on, happy, whenever she is coming to a bend in the road, for perhaps he is behind it. No. She is beginning to cry. Her heart is swelled so. The tears stand in her eyes. She gives one great sob while the corners of her mouth quiver and the tears roll down. She doesn't know that there is another turning to the hermitage, that she is close against it, and that Arthur Donathorn is only a few yards from her, full of one thought, and a thought of which she only is the object. He is going to see Hetty again. That is the longing which has been growing through the last three hours to a feverish thirst. Not, of course, to speak in the caressing way into which he had unguardedly fallen before dinner, but to set things right with her by a kindness which would have the air of friendly civility and prevent her from running away with wrong notions about their mutual relation. If Hetty had known he was there, she would not have cried, and it would have been better— for then Arthur would perhaps have behaved as wisely as he had intended. As it was, she started when he appeared at the end of the side alley, and looked up at him with two great drops rolling down her cheeks. What else could he do but speak to her in a soft, soothing tone, as if she were a bright-eyed spaniel with a thorn in her foot? "'Has something frightened you, Hetty? Have you seen anything in the wood? Don't be frightened, I'll take care of you now.' Hetty was blushing so, she didn't know whether she was happy or miserable, to be crying again. What did gentlemen think of girls who cried in that way? She felt unable even to say no, but could only look away from him and wipe the tears from her cheek. Not before a great drop had fallen on her rose-colored strings, she knew that quite well. Come, be cheerful again. Smile at me and tell me what's the matter. Come, tell me. Hetty turned her head towards him, whispered, I thought you wouldn't come and slowly got courage to lift her eyes to him. That look was too much. He must have had eyes of Egyptian granite not to look too lovingly in return. You little frightened bird, little tearful rose, silly pet, you won't cry again now I'm with you, will you? 
Ah, uh, he doesn't know in the least what he is saying. This is not what he meant to say. His arm is stealing round the waist again. It is tightening its clasp. He is bending his face nearer and nearer to the round cheek. His lips are meeting those pouting child lips, and for a long moment time has vanished. He may be a shepherd in Arcadia, for aught he knows. He may be the first youth kissing the first maiden. He may be Eros himself, sipping the lips of Psyche. It is all one. There was no speaking for minutes after. They walked along with beating hearts till they came within sight of the gate at the end of the wood. Then they looked at each other, not quite as they had looked before, for in their eyes there was the memory of a kiss. But already something bitter had begun to mingle itself with the fountain of sweets. Already Arthur was uncomfortable. He took his arm from Hetty's waist and said, Here we are, almost at the end of the grove. I wonder how late it is, he added, pulling out his watch. Twenty minutes past eight. But my watch is too fast. However, I'd better not go any further now. Trot along quickly with your little feet and get home safely. Goodbye. He took her hand and looked at her half sadly, half with a constrained smile. Hetty's eyes seemed to beseech him not to go away yet, but he patted her cheek and said goodbye again. She was obliged to turn away from him and go on. As for Arthur, he rushed back through the wood, as if he wanted to put a wide space between himself and Hetty. He would not go to the Hermitage again. He remembered how he had debated with himself there before dinner, and it had all come to nothing, worse than nothing. He walked right on into the chase, glad to get out of the grove, which surely was haunted by his evil genius. Those beaches and smooth limes, there was something enervating in the very sight of them, but the strong, knotted old oaks had no bending languor in them. The sight of them would give a man some energy. Arthur lost himself among the narrow openings in the fern, winding about without seeking any issue, till the twilight deepened almost to night under the great boughs, and the hair looked black as it darted across his path. He was feeling much more strongly than he had done in the morning. It was as if his horse had wheeled round from a leap and dared to dispute his mastery. He was dissatisfied with himself, irritated, mortified. He no sooner fixed his mind on the probable consequences of giving way to the emotions which had stolen over him today, of continuing to notice Hetty, of allowing himself any opportunity for such slight caresses as he had been betrayed into already, than he refused to believe such a future possible for himself. To flirt with Hetty was a very different affair from flirting with a pretty girl of his own station. That was understood to be an amusement on both sides, or, if it became serious, there was no obstacle to marriage. But this little thing would be spoken ill of directly if she happened to be seen walking with him. And then those excellent people, the Poisers, to whom a good name was as precious as if they had the best blood in the land in their veins. He should hate himself if he made a scandal of that sort on the estate that was to be his own some day, and among tenants by whom he liked, above all, to be respected. He could no more believe that he should so fall in his own esteem than that he should break both his legs and go on crutches all the rest of his life. He couldn't imagine himself in that position. It was too odious, too unlike him. And even if no one knew anything about it, they might get too fond of each other, and then there could be nothing but the misery of parting after all. No gentleman out of a ballad could marry a farmer's niece. There must be an end to the whole thing at once. It was too foolish. And yet he had been so determined this morning, before he went to Gowan's, and while he was there something had taken hold of him and made him gallop back. It seemed he couldn't quite depend on his own resolution, as he had thought he could. He almost wished his arm would get painful again, and then he should think of nothing but the comfort it would be to get rid of the pain. There was no knowing what impulse might seize him tomorrow in this confounded place, where there was nothing to occupy him imperiously through the live-long day. What could he do to secure himself from any more of this folly? There was but one resource. He would go and tell Irwin, tell him everything. The mere act of telling it would make it seem trivial. The temptation would vanish, as the charm of fond words vanishes when one repeats them to the indifferent. In every way it would help him to tell Irwin. He would write to Broxton Rectory the first thing after breakfast tomorrow. Arthur had no sooner come to this determination than he began to think which of the paths would lead him home and made as short a walk thither as he could. He felt sure he should sleep now. He had had enough to tire him, and there was no more need for him to think. End of chapter 13
Chapter Fourteen of Adam Bede. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Missy, Guangzhou, China. Adam Bede by George Eliot. Chapter Fourteen, The Return Home. While that parting in the wood was happening. There was a parting in the cottage, too, and Lisbeth had stood with Adam at the door, straining her aged eyes to get the last glimpse of Seth and Dinah as they mounted the opposite slope. "'Eh, I'm loath to see the last on her,' she said to Adam, as they turned into the house again. "'I'd have been willing to have her about me till I died and went to lie by my old man. She'd make it easier, dying. She spikes so gentle and moves about so still. I could be fast sure that picture was drawed for her i thy new Bible.' the angel is sitting on the big stone by the grave. Ah, I wouldn't a mind hadn't a daughter like that. But nobody ne'er marries them as is good for aught. Well, mother, I hope thee wilt have her for a daughter, for Seth's got a liking for her, and I hope she'll get a liking for Seth in time. Where is the use o' talking of that un? She cares na for Seth. She's going away twenty mile aft. How's she to get a liking for him, I'd like to know? No more nor the cake will come without the leaven. Thy figurin' books might ha' told thee better nor that, I should think, else thee might as well read the common print as Seth allus does. Nay, mother, said Adam, laughing, the figures tell us a fine deal, and we couldn't go far without em, but they don't tell us about folks's feelings. It's a nicer job to calculate them. But Seth is good-hearted a lad as ever handled a tool, and plenty of sense, and good looking too, and he's got the same way of thinking as Dinah. He deserves to win her, though there's no denying she's a rare bit of workmanship. You don't see such women turned off the wheel every day. Eh, thee will always stick up for thy brother. Thee's been just the same, ere sin ye were little uns together. Thee wert always for halfing everything with him. But what's Seth got to do with Marian, as is only three and twenty? He'd more need to learn and lay by sixpence. And as for his deserving her, she's two year older nor Seth, she's pretty near as old as thee. But that's the way. Folks mun always choose by contraries as if they must be sorted like the pork, a bit of good meat with a bit of offal. To the feminine mind, in some of its moods, all things that might be receive a temporary charm from comparison with what is, and since Adam did not want to marry Dinah himself, Lisbeth felt rather peevish on that score, as peevish as she would have been if he had wanted to marry her, and so shut himself out from Mary Burge and the partnership as effectually as by marrying Hetty. It was more than half-past eight when Adam and his mother were talking in this way, so that when about ten minutes later Hetty reached the turning of the lane that led to the farmyard gate, she saw Dinah and Seth approaching it from the opposite direction, and waited for them to come up to her. They too, like Hetty, had lingered a little in their walk, for Dinah was trying to speak words of comfort and strength to Seth in these parting moments. But when they saw Hetty, they paused and shook hands. Seth turned homewards, and Dinah came on alone. "'Seth Bede would have come and spoken to you, my dear,' she said, as she reached Hetty, "'but he's very full of trouble to-night.' Hetty answered with a dimpled smile, as if she did not quite know what had been said, and it made a strange contrast to see that sparkling, self-engrossed loveliness looked at by Dinah's calm, pitying face, with its open glance which told that her heart lived in no cherished secrets of its own, but in feelings which it longed to share with all the world.' Hetty liked Dinah as well as she had ever liked any woman. How was it possible to feel otherwise towards one who always put in a kind word for her when her aunt was finding fault, and who was always ready to take Totty off her hands? Little, tiresome Totty, that was always made such a pet of by every one, and that Hetty could see no interest in at all. Dinah had never said anything disapproving or reproachful to Hetty during her whole visit to the Hall Farm. She had talked to her a great deal in a serious way, but Hetty didn't mind that much for she never listened. Whatever Dinah might say, she almost always stroked Hetty's cheek after it, and wanted to do some mending for her. Dinah was a riddle to her. Hetty looked at her much in the same way as one might imagine a little perching bird that could only flutter from bough to bough to look at the swoop of the swallow or the mounting of the lark. But she did not care to solve such riddles any more than she cared to know what was meant by the pictures in the Pilgrim's Progress, or in the old folio Bible that Marty and Tommy always plagued her about on a Sunday. Dinah took her hand now and drew it under her own arm. "'You look very happy to-night, dear child,' she said. 
I shall think of you often when I'm at Snowfield, and see your face before me as it is now. It's a strange thing. Sometimes when I'm quite alone, sitting in my room with my eyes closed, or walking over the hills, the people I've seen and known, if it's only been for a few days, are brought before me, and I hear their voices and see them look and move, almost plainer than I ever did when they were really with me, so as I could touch them. And then my heart is drawn out towards them, and I feel their lot as if it was my own, and I take comfort in spreading it before the Lord, and resting in His love on their behalf as well as my own. And so I feel sure you will come before me. She paused a moment, but Hetty said nothing. It has been a very precious time to me, Dinah went on, last night and today, seeing two such good sons as Adam and Seth Bede. They are so tender and thoughtful for their aged mother, and she has been telling me what Adam has done for these many years, to help his father and his brother. It's wonderful what a spirit of wisdom and knowledge he has, and how he's ready to use it all in behalf of them that are feeble. And I'm sure he has a loving spirit, too. I've noticed it often among my own people round Snowfield, that the strong, skilful men are often the gentlest to the women and children, and it's pretty to see him carrying the little babies as if they were no heavier than little birds. And the babies always seem to like the strong arm best. I feel sure it would be so with Adam Bede. Don't you think so, Hetty? Yes, said Hetty, abstractedly, for her mind had been all the while in the wood, and she would have found it difficult to say what she was assenting to. Dinah saw she was not inclined to talk, but there would not have been time to say much more, for they were now at the yard gate. The still twilight, with its dying western red and its few faint struggling stars, rested on the farmyard, where there was not a sound to be heard but the stamping of the cart-horses in the stable. It was about twenty minutes after sunset. The fowls were all gone to roost, and the bulldog lay stretched on the straw outside his kennel, with the black and tan terrier by his side when the falling to of the gate disturbed them and set them barking, like good officials, before they had any distinct knowledge of the reason. The barking had its effect in the house, for as Dinah and Hetty approached, the doorway was filled by a portly figure with a ruddy black-eyed face, which bore in it the possibility of looking extremely acute, and occasionally contemptuous, on market days, but had now a predominant after-supper expression of hearty good nature. It is well known that great scholars who have shown the most pitiless acerbity in their criticism of other men's scholarship have yet been of a relenting and indulgent temper in their private life. And I have heard of a learned man meekly rocking the twins in the cradle with his left hand, while with his right he inflicted the most lacerating sarcasms on an opponent who had betrayed a brutal ignorance of Hebrew. Weaknesses and errors must be forgiven. Alas, they are not alien to us. But the man who takes the wrong side on the momentous subject of the Hebrew points must be treated as the enemy of his race. There was the same sort of antithetic mixture in Martin Poyser. He was of so excellent a disposition that he had been kinder and more respectful than ever to his old father, since he had made a deed of gift of all his property, and no man judged his neighbors more charitably on all personal matters. But for a farmer, like Luke Britton, for example, whose fallows were not well cleaned, who didn't know the rudiments of hedging and ditching, and showed but a small share of judgment in the purchase of winter stock, Martin Poyser was as hard and implacable as the northeast wind. Luke Britton could not make a remark, even on the weather, but Martin Poyser detected in it a taint of that unsoundness and general ignorance which was palpable in all his farming operations. He hated to see the fellow lift the pewter pint to his mouth in the bar of the Royal George on Market Day, and the mere sight of him on the other side of the road brought a severe and critical expression into his black eyes, as different as possible from the fatherly glance he bent on his two nieces as they approached the door. Mr. Poyser had smoked his evening pipe and now held his hands in his pockets, as the only resource of a man who continues to sit up after the day's business is done. "'Why, lasses, you're rather late to-night,' he said, when they reached the little gate leading into the causeway. "'The mother's begun to fidget about you, and she's got the little un ill. "'And how did you leave the old woman be, Dinah? Is she much down about the old man? "'He'd been but a poor bargain to her this five year.' "'She's been greatly distressed for the loss of him,' said Dinah. "'But she seemed more comforted to-day. "'Her son Adam's been at home all day, working at his father's coffin, and she loves to have him at home.' She's been talking about him to me almost all the day. She has a loving heart, though she's sorely given to fret and be fearful. 
I wish she had a surer trust to comfort her in her old age. Adam's sure enough, said Mr. Poyser, misunderstanding Dinah's wish. There's no fear but he'll yield well in the threshing. He's not one of them as is all straw and no grain. I'll be bond for him any day, as he'll be a good son to the last. Did he say he'd be coming to see us soon? But come in, come in, he added, making way for them. I hadn't need keep you out any longer. The tall buildings round the yard shut out a good deal of the sky, but the large window let in abundant light to show every corner of the house-place. Mrs. Poyser, seated in the rocking-chair, which had been brought out of the right-hand parlour, was trying to soothe Toddy to sleep, but Toddy was not disposed to sleep, and when her cousins entered she raised herself up and showed a pair of flushed cheeks, which looked fatter than ever now they were defined by the edge of her linen nightcap. In the large wicker-bottomed armchair in the left-hand chimney-nook sat old Martin Poyser, a hale but shrunken and bleached image of his portly black-haired son, his head hanging forward a little and his elbows pushed backwards so as to allow the whole of his forearm to rest on the arm of the chair. His blue handkerchief was spread over his knees, as was usual indoors, when it was not hanging over his head, and he sat watching what went forward with the quiet outward glance of healthy old age which, disengaged from any interest in an inward drama, spies out pins upon the floor, follows one's minutest motions with an unexpected purposeless tenacity, watches the flickering of the flame or the sun-gleams on the wall, counts the quarries on the floor, watches even the hand of the clock, and pleases itself with detecting a rhythm in the tick. "'What a time of night this is to come home, Hetty,' said Mrs. Poyser. "'Look at the clock, do.' Why, it's going on for half-past nine, and I've sent the girls to bed this half-hour, and late enough, too, when they've got to get up at half after four, and the mower's bottles to fill, and the baking, and here's this blessed child with the fever for what I know, and as wakeful as if it was dinner-time, and nobody to help me to give her the physic but your uncle, and fine work there's been, and half of it spilt on her nightgown. It's well if she's swallowed more nor all to make her worse instead of better. But folks as have no mind to be a use have all is the luck to be out of the road when there's anything to be done." "'I did set out before eight, aunt,' said Hetty, in a pettish tone, with a slight toss of her head. "'But this clock's so much before the clock at the chase, there's no telling what time it'll be when I get here.' "'What? You'd be wanting the clock set by gentlefolks's time, would you? And sit up burning candle and lie abed with the sun a-baking you like a cowcumber of the frame. The clock hasn't been put forward for the first time to-day, I reckon.' The fact was, Hetty had really forgotten the difference of the clocks when she told Captain Donnithorne that she set out at eight, and this, with her lingering pace, had made her nearly half an hour later than usual. But here her aunt's attention was diverted from this tender subject by Toddy, who, perceiving at length that the arrival of her cousins was not likely to bring anything satisfactory to her in particular, began to cry, "'Money! Money!' in an explosive manner. "'Well, then, my pet mother's got her. Mother won't leave her.' Toddy, be a good dilling and go to sleep now, said Mrs. Poyser, leaning back and rocking the chair, while she tried to make Toddy nestle against her. But Toddy only cried louder and said, Don't yock! So the mother, with that wondrous patience which love gives to the quickest temperament, sat up again and pressed her cheek against the linen nightcap and kissed it, and forgot to scold Hetty any longer. Come, Hetty, said Martin Poyser, in a conciliatory tone. Go and get your supper at the pantry, as the things are all put away, and then you can come and take the little one while your aunt undresses herself, for she won't lie down in bed without her mother. And I reckon you could eat a bit, Dinah, for they don't keep much of a house down there. No, thank you, uncle, said Dinah. I ate a good meal before I came away, for Mrs. Bede would make a kettle cake for me. I don't want any supper, said Hetty, taking off her hat. I can hold Totty now, if aunt wants me. Why, what nonsense that is to talk, said Mrs. Poyser. Do you think you can live without eatin' and nourish your inside with stickin' red ribbons on your head? Go and get your supper this minute, child. There's a nice bit of cold pudding in the safe, just what you're fond of. Hetty complied silently by going towards the pantry, and Mrs. Poyser went on speaking to Dinah. Sit down, my dear, and look as if you knowed what it was to make yourself a bit comfortable in the world. I warrant the old woman was glad to see you, since you stayed so long. She seemed to like having me there at last, but her sons say she doesn't like young women about her commonly, and I thought just at first she was almost angry with me for going. Hey, it's a poor lookout when the old folks doesn't like the young ones," said old Martin, bending his head down lower and seeming to trace the pattern of the quarries with his eye. "Ay, it's ill living in a henroost for them as doesn't like fleas," said Mrs. Poyser. 
"'We've all had our turn at being young, I reckon, be it good luck or ill.' "'But she must learn to accommodate herself to young women,' said Mr. Poyser, "'for it isn't to be counted on as Adam and Seth'll keep bachelors for the next ten year to please their mother. That'd be unreasonable. It isn't right for old nor young neither to make a bargain all o' their own side. What's good for one's good all round o' the long run. I'm no friend to young fellows a marryin' afore they know the difference between a crab and an apple, but they may wait o'er long.' "'To be sure,' said Mrs. Poyser, "'if you go past your dinner-time there'll be a little relish o' your meat. "'You turn it o'er and o'er with your fork, and don't eat it after all. "'You find fault with your meat, and the fault's all in your own stomach.' "'Hetty now came back from the pantry and said, "'I can take Totty now, Aunt, if you like.' "'Come, Rachel,' said Mr. Poyser, as his wife seemed to hesitate, "'seeing that Totty was at last nestling quietly. "'Thee'dst better let Hetty carry her upstairs while thee takes thy things off.' Thee tired. It's time thee wast in bed. Thee bring on the pain in thy side again. Well, she may hold her if the child to go to her, said Mrs. Poyser. Hetty went close to the rocking chair and stood without her usual smile and without any attempt to entice Totty, simply waiting for her aunt to give the child into her hand. Wilt go to cousin Hetty, my darling? Will mother gets ready to go to bed? Then Totty shall go into mother's bed and sleep there all night. Before her mother had done speaking, Totty had given her answer in an unmistakable manner, by knitting her brow, setting her tiny teeth against her underlip, and leaning forward to slap Hetty on the arm with her utmost force. Then, without speaking, she nestled to her mother again. "'Hey, hey!' said Mr. Poyser, while Hetty stood without moving. "'Not go to Cousin Hetty. That's like a baby. Totty's a little woman and not a baby.' "'It's no use trying to persuade her,' said Mrs. Poyser. "'She always takes against Hetty when she isn't well.' happen she'll go to Dinah. Dinah, having taken off her bonnet and shawl, had hitherto kept quietly seated in the background, not liking to thrust herself between Hetty and what was considered Hetty's proper work. But now she came forward, and putting out her arms, said, "'Come, Toddy, come and let Dinah carry her upstairs along with Mother. Poor, poor Mother, she's so tired. She wants to go to bed.' Toddy turned her face towards Dinah and looked at her an instant, then lifted herself up, put out her little arms, and let Dinah lift her from her mother's lap. Hetty turned away without any sign of ill-humour, and taking her hat from the table, stood waiting with an air of indifference, to see if she should be told to do anything else. "'You may make the door fast now, Poyser. Alec's been coming this long while,' said Mrs. Poyser, rising with an appearance of relief from her low chair. "'Get me the matches down, Hetty, for I must have the rushlight burning in my room. Come, father.' The heavy wooden bolts began to roll in the house doors, and old Martin prepared to move by gathering up his blue handkerchief and reaching his bright knobbed walnut tree stick from the corner. Mrs. Poyser then led the way out of the kitchen, followed by the grandfather and Dinah with Toddy in her arms, all going to bed by twilight like the birds. Mrs. Poyser, on her way, peeped into the room where her two boys lay, just to see their ruddy round cheeks on the pillow and to hear for a moment their light regular breathing. "'Come, Hetty, get to bed,' said Mr. Poyser, in a soothing tone, as he himself turned to go upstairs. "'You didn't mean to be late, I'll be bound, but your aunt's been worried to-day. Good night, my wench, good night.'" End of chapter 14 Chapter 15 of Adam Bede this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Adam Bede by George Eliot Chapter 15 The Two Bedchambers Hetty and Dinah both slept in the second story, in rooms adjoining each other, meagerly furnished rooms, with no blinds to shut out the light, which was now beginning to gather new strength from the rising of the moon, more than enough strength to enable Hetty to move about and undress with perfect comfort. She could see quite well the pegs in the old painted linen press on which she hung her hat and gown. She could see the head of every pin on her red cloth pin cushion. She could see a reflection of herself in the old-fashioned looking-glass, quite as distinct as was needful, considering that she had only to brush her hair and put on her nightcap. A queer old looking glass. Hetty got into an ill temper with it almost every time she dressed. It had been considered a handsome glass in its day, 
and had probably been bought into the Poyser family a quarter of a century before, at a sale of genteel household furniture. Even now an auctioneer could say something for it. It had a great deal of tarnished gilding about it. It had a firm mahogany base, well supplied with drawers, which opened with a decided jerk and sent the contents leaping out from the farthest corners, without giving you the trouble of reaching them. Above all, it had a brass candle socket on each side, which would give it an aristocratic air to the very last. But Hetty objected to it, because it had numerous dim blotches sprinkled over the mirror, which no rubbing would remove, and because, instead of swinging backwards and forwards, it was fixed in an upright position, so that she could only get one good view of her head and neck, and that was to be had only by sitting down on a low chair before her dressing table. And the dressing table was no dressing table at all, but a small old chest of drawers, the most awkward thing in the world to sit down before, for the big brass handles quite hurt her knees, and she couldn't get near the glass at all comfortably. But devout worshippers never allow inconveniences to prevent them from performing their religious rites, and Hetty this evening was more bent on her peculiar form of worship than usual. Having taken off her gown and white kerchief, she drew a key from the large pocket that hung outside her petticoat, and unlocking one of the lower drawers in the chest, reached from it two short bits of wax candle, secretly bought at Treddleston, and stuck them in the two brass sockets. Then she drew forth a bundle of matches and lighted the candles, and last of all, a small red-framed shilling looking-glass without blotches. It was into this small glass that she chose to look first after seating herself. She looked into it, smiling and turning her head on one side, for a minute, then laid it down and took out her brush and comb from an upper drawer. She was going to let down her hair and make herself look like that picture of a lady in Miss Lydia Donathorne's dressing room. It was soon done, and the dark hyacinthine curves fell on her neck. It was not heavy, massive, merely rippling hair, but soft and silken, running at every opportunity into delicate rings. But she pushed it all backward to look like the picture, and form a dark curtain, throwing into relief her round white neck. Then she put down her brush and comb and looked at herself, folding her arms before her, still like the picture. Even the old mottled glass couldn't help sending back a lovely image, nonetheless lovely because Hetty's stays were not of white satin, such as I feel sure heroines must generally wear, but of dark greenish cotton texture. Oh yes, she was very pretty. Captain Donathorne thought so. Prettier than anybody about Hayslope, prettier than any of the ladies she had ever seen visiting at the chase. Indeed, it seemed fine ladies were rather old and ugly, and prettier than Miss Bacon, the miller's daughter, who was called the beauty of Treddleston. And Hetty looked at herself tonight with quite a different sensation from what she had ever felt before. There was an invisible spectator whose eye rested on her like morning on the flowers. His soft voice was saying over and over again those pretty things she had heard in the wood. His arm was round her, and the delicate rose scent of his hair was with her still. The vainest woman is never thoroughly conscious of her own beauty till she is loved by the man who sets her own passion vibrating in return. But Hetty seemed to have made up her mind that something was wanting, for she got up and reached an old black lace scarf out of the linen press, and a pair of large earrings out of the sacred drawer from which she had taken her candles. It was an old, old scarf, full of rents, but it would make a becoming border round her shoulders, and set off the whiteness of her upper arm. And she would take out the little earrings she had in her ears. Oh, how her aunt had scolded her for having her ears bored, and put in those large ones. They were but coloured glass and gilding, but if you didn't know what they were made of, they looked just as well as what the ladies were. And so she sat down again, with the large earrings in her ears, and the black lace scarf adjusted round her shoulders. She looked down at her arms— no arms could be prettier down to a little way below the elbow. They were white and plump, and dimpled to match her cheeks, but towards the wrist she thought with vexation that they were coarsened by butter-making and other work that ladies never did. Captain Donathorne couldn't like her to go on doing work. He would like to see her in nice clothes and thin shoes and white stockings, perhaps with silk clocks to them, for he must love her very much. No one else had ever put his arm round her and kissed her in that way. He would want to marry her and make a lady of her. She could hardly dare to shape the thought. Yet how else could it be? Marry her quite secretly, as Mr. James, the doctor's assistant, married the doctor's niece, and nobody ever found it out for a long while after, and then it was of no use to be angry. The doctor had told her aunt all about it in Hetty's hearing. She didn't know how it would be, but it was quite plain the old squire could never be told anything about it, for Hetty was ready to faint with awe and fright if she came across him at the chase. 
He might have been earthborn for what she knew. It had never entered her mind that he had been young like other men. He had always been the old squire at whom everybody was frightened. Oh, it was impossible to think how it would be. But Captain Donnithorne would know. He was a great gentleman, and could have his way in everything, and could buy everything he liked. And nothing could be as it had been again. Perhaps some day she should be a grand lady, and ride in her coach, and dress for dinner in a brocaded silk, with feathers in her hair, and her dress sweeping the ground, like Miss Lydia and Lady Daisy, when she saw them going into the dining room one evening as she peeped through the little round window in the lobby. Only she should not be old and ugly like Miss Lydia, or all the same thickness like Lady Daisy, but very pretty, with her hair done in a great many different ways, and sometimes in a pink dress, and sometimes in a white one. She didn't know which she liked best and Mary Burge and everybody would perhaps see her going out in her carriage, or rather they would hear of it. It was impossible to imagine these things happening at Hayslope inside of her aunt. At the thought of all this splendor, Hetty got up from her chair, and in doing so caught the little red-framed glass with the edge of her scarf, so that it fell with a bang on the floor. But she was too eagerly occupied with her vision to care about picking it up, and after a momentary start began to pace with a pigeon-like stateliness backwards and forwards along her room, in her colored stays and colored skirt, and the old black lace scarf round her shoulders, and the great glass earrings in her ears. How pretty the little puss looks in that odd dress! It would be the easiest folly in the world to fall in love with her. There is such a sweet baby-like roundness about her face and figure. The delicate dark rings of hair lie so charmingly about her ears and neck. Her great dark eyes with their long eyelashes touch one so strangely, as if an imprisoned frisky sprite looked out from them. Ah, what a price the man gets who wins a sweet bride like Hetty! How the men envy him who come to the wedding breakfast and see her hanging on his arm in her white lace and orange blossoms. The dear, young, round, soft, flexible thing. Her heart must be just as soft, her temper just as free from angles, her character just as pliant. If anything ever goes wrong, it must be the husband's fault there. He can make her what he likes. That is plain. And the lover himself thinks so, too. The little darling is so fond of him. Her little vanities are so bewitching. He wouldn't consent to her being a bit wiser. Those kitten-like glances and movements are just what one wants to make one's hearth a paradise. Every man under such circumstances is conscious of being a great physiognomist. Nature, he knows, has a language of her own, which she uses with strict veracity, and he considers himself an adept in the language. Nature has written out his bride's character for him in those exquisite lines of cheek and lip and chin, in those eyelids delicate as petals, in those long lashes curled like the stamen of a flower, in the dark liquid depths of those wonderful eyes. How she will dote on her children! She is almost a child herself and the little pink round things will hang about her like florets round the central flower, and the husband will look on, smiling benignly, able, whenever he chooses, to withdraw into the sanctuary of his wisdom, towards which his sweet wife will look reverently, and never lift the curtain. It is a marriage such as they made in the golden age, when the men were all wise and majestic, and the women all lovely and loving. It was very much in this way that our friend Adam B. thought about Hetty, only he put his thoughts into different words. If ever she behaved with cold vanity towards him, he said to himself, it is only because she doesn't love me well enough. And he was sure that her love, whenever she gave it, would be the most precious thing a man could possess on earth. Before you despise Adam as deficient in penetration, pray ask yourself if you were ever predisposed to believe evil of any pretty woman, if you ever could, without hard head-breaking demonstration, believe evil of the one supremely pretty woman who has bewitched you. No, people who love downy peaches are apt not to think of the stone, and sometimes jar their teeth terribly against it. Arthur Donnithorne, too, had the same sort of notion about Hetty, so far as he had thought of her nature of all. He felt sure she was a dear, affectionate, good little thing, the man who awakes the wondering, tremulous passion of a young girl always thinks her affectionate, and if he chances to look forward to future years, probably imagines himself being virtuously tender to her, because the poor thing is so clingingly fond of him. God made these dear women so, and it is a convenient arrangement in case of sickness. After all, I believe the wisest of us must be beguiled in this way sometimes, and must think both better and worse of people than they deserve. Nature has her language, and she is not unveracious, 
but we don't know all the intricacies of her syntax just yet, and in a hasty reading we may happen to extract the very opposite of her real meaning. Long dark eyelashes. Now, what can be more exquisite? I find it impossible not to expect some depth of soul behind a deep gray eye with a long dark eyelash, in spite of an experience which has shown me that they may go along with deceit, peculation, and stupidity. But if, in the reaction of disgust, I have betaken myself to a fishy eye, there has been a surprising similarity of result. One begins to suspect at length that there is no direct correlation between eyelashes and morals, or else that the eyelashes express the disposition of the fair one's grandmother, which is on the whole less important to us. No eyelashes could be more beautiful than Hetty's, and now, while she walks with her pigeon-like stateliness along the room and looks down on her shoulders bordered by the old black lace, the dark fringe shows to perfection on her pink cheek. They are but dim, ill-defined pictures that her narrow bit of an imagination can make of the future, but of every picture she is the central figure in fine clothes. Captain Donathorne is very close to her, putting his arm round her, perhaps kissing her, and everybody else is admiring and envying her, especially Mary Burge, whose new print dress looks very contemptible by the side of Hetty's resplendent toilette. Does any sweet or sad memory mingle with this dream of the future, any loving thought of her second parents, of the children she had helped to tend, of any youthful companion, any pet animal, any relic of her own childhood even? Not one. There are some plants that have hardly any roots. You may tear them from their native nook of rock or wall, and just lay them over your ornamental flower-pot, and they blossom none the worse. Hetty could have cast all her past life behind her, and never cared to be reminded of it again. I think she had no feeling at all towards the old house, and did not like the Jacob's ladder and the long row of hollyhocks in the garden better than other flowers, perhaps not so well. It was wonderful how little she seemed to care about waiting on her uncle, who had been a good father to her. She hardly ever remembered to reach him his pipe at the right time without being told, unless a visitor happened to be there, who would have a better opportunity of seeing her as she walked across the hearth. Hetty did not understand how anybody could be very fond of middle-aged people. And as for those tiresome children, Marty and Tommy and Toddy, they had been the very nuisance of her life, as bad as buzzing insects that will come teasing you on a hot day when you want to be quiet. Marty, the eldest, was a baby when she first came to the farm, for the children born before him had died, and so Hetty had had them all three, one after the other, toddling by her side in the meadow, or playing about her on wet days in the half-empty rooms of the large old house. The boys were out of hand now, but Toddy was still a day-long plague, worse than either of the others had been, because there was more fuss made about her, and there was no end to the making and mending of clothes. Hetty would have been glad to hear that she should never see a child again. They were worse than the nasty little lambs that the shepherd was always bringing in to be taken special care of in lambing time, for the lambs were got rid of sooner or later. As for the young chickens and turkeys, Hetty would have hated the very word hatching if her aunt had not bribed her to attend to the young poultry by promising her the proceeds of one out of every brood. The round downy chicks peeping out from under their mother's wing never touched Hetty with any pleasure. That was not the sort of prettiness she cared about, but she did care about the prettiness of the new things she would buy for herself at Treddleston Fair with the money they fetched. And yet she looked so dimpled, so charming, as she stooped down to put the soaked bread under the hen coop, that you must have been a very acute personage indeed to suspect her of that hardness. Molly, the housemaid, with a turn-up nose and a protuberant jaw, was really a tender-hearted girl, and, as Mrs. Poyser said, a jewel to look after the poultry. But her stolid face showed nothing of this maternal delight, any more than a brown earthenware pitcher will show the light of the lamp within it. It is generally a feminine eye that first detects the moral deficiencies hidden under the dear deceit of beauty, so it is not surprising that Mrs. Poyser, with her keenness and abundant opportunity for observation, should have formed a tolerably fair estimate of what might be expected from Hetty in the way of feeling, and in moments of indignation she had sometimes spoken with great openness on the subject to her husband. She's no better than a peacock, as it strut about on the wall and spread its tail when the sun shone if all the folks in the parish was dying. There's nothing seems to give her a turn in the inside, not even when we thought Toddy had tumbled into the pit. 
to think of that dear cherub, and we found her with her little shoes stuck in the mud and crying fit to break her heart by the far horse pit. But had he never minded it, I could see, though she's been at the nursing of the child ever since it was a baby. It's my belief her heart's as hard as pebble. Nay, nay, said Mr. Poyser, thee mustn't judge Hetty too hard. Them young girls are like the unripe grain. They'll make good meal by and by, but they're squashy as yet. They'd see Hetty'll be all right when she's got a good husband and children of her own. I don't want to be hard upon the gal. She's got clever fingers of her own and can be useful enough when she likes, and I should miss her with butter, for she's got a cool hand. And let be what may, I'd strive to do my part by a niece of yours. And that I've done, for I've taught her everything as belongs to a house, and I've told her her duty often enough, though, God knows, I've no breath to spare, and that catching pain comes on dreadful by times. With them three girls in the house, I'd need have twice the strength to keep them up to their work. It's like having roast meat at three fires. As soon as you've blasted one, another's burning. Hetty stood sufficiently in awe of her aunt to be anxious to conceal from her so much of her vanity as could be hidden without too great a sacrifice. She could not resist spending her money in bits of finery, which Mrs. Poyser disapproved. But she would have been ready to die with shame, vexation, and fright if her aunt had this moment opened the door and seen her with her bits of candle lighted and strutting about decked in her scarf and earrings. To prevent such a surprise, she always bolted her door, and she had not forgotten to do so tonight. It was well, for there now came a light tap, and Hetty, with a leaping heart, rushed to blow out the candles and throw them into the drawer. She dared not stay to take out her earrings, but she threw off her scarf and let it fall on the floor, before the light tap came again. We shall know how it was that the light tap came if we leave Hetty for a short time and return to Dinah at the moment when she had delivered Toddy to her mother's arms and was come upstairs to her bedroom adjoining Hetty's. Dinah delighted in her bedroom window. Being on the second story of that tall house, it gave her a wide view over the fields. The thickness of the wall formed a broad step about a yard below the window, where she could place her chair. And now the first thing she did on entering her room was to seat herself in this chair and look out on the peaceful fields beyond which the large moon was rising, just above the hedgerow elms. She liked the pasture best where the milch cows were lying, and next to that the meadow where the grass was half-mown and lay in silvered sweeping lines. Her heart was very full, for there was to be only one more night on which she would look out on those fields for a long time to come, but she thought little of leaving the mere scene, for to her, bleak snowfield had just as many charms. She thought of all the dear people whom she had learned to care for among these peaceful fields, and who would now have a place in her loving remembrance forever. She thought of the struggles and the weariness that might lie before them in the rest of their life's journey when she would be away from them and know nothing of what was befalling them, and the pressure of this thought soon became too strong for her to enjoy the unresponding stillness of the moonlit fields. She closed her eyes that she might feel more intensely the presence of a love and sympathy deeper and more tender than was breathed from the earth and sky. That was often Dinah's mode of praying in solitude simply to close her eyes and to feel herself enclosed by the divine presence. Then gradually, her fears, her yearning anxieties for others, melted away like ice crystals in a warm ocean. She had sat in this way perfectly still, with her hands crossed on her lap and the pale light resting on her calm face, for at least ten minutes, when she was startled by a loud sound, apparently of something falling in Hetty's room. But like all sounds that fall on our ears in a state of abstraction, it had no distinct character, but was simply loud and startling, so that she felt uncertain whether she had interpreted it rightly. She rose and listened, but all was quiet afterwards, and she reflected that Hetty might merely have knocked something down in getting into bed. She began slowly to undress, but now, owing to the suggestion of this sound, her thoughts became concentrated on Hetty that sweet young thing, with life and all its trails before her, the solemn daily duties of the wife and mother, and her mind so unprepared for them all, bent merely on little foolish, selfish pleasures, like a child hugging its toys in the beginning of a long toilsome journey, in which it will have to bear hunger and cold and unsheltered darkness. Dinah felt a double care for Hetty, because she shared Seth's anxious interest in his brother's lot, and she had not come to the conclusion that Hetty did not love Adam well enough to marry him. 
She saw too clearly the absence of any warm, self-devoting love in Hetty's nature to regard the coldness of her behavior towards Adam as any indication that he was not the man she would like to have for a husband. And this blank in Hetty's nature, instead of exciting Dinah's dislike, only touched her with a deeper pity. The lovely face and form affected her as beauty always affects a pure and tender mind, free from selfish jealousies. It was an excellent divine gift that gave a deeper pathos to the need, the sin, the sorrow with which it was mingled, as the canker in a lily-white bud is more grievous to behold than in a common pot-herb. By the time Dinah had undressed and put on her nightgown, this feeling about Hetty had gathered a painful intensity. Her imagination had created a thorny thicket of sin and sorrow, in which she saw the poor thing struggling, torn and bleeding, looking with tears for rescue and finding none. It was in this way that Dinah's imagination and sympathy acted and reacted habitually, each heightening the other. She felt a deep longing to go now and pour into Hetty's ear all the words of tender warning and appeal that rushed into her mind. But perhaps Hetty was already asleep. Dinah put her ear to the partition and heard still some slight noises, which convinced her that Hetty was not yet in bed. Still she hesitated. She was not quite certain of a divine direction— the voice that told her to go to Hetty seemed no stronger than the other voice which said that Hetty was weary, and that going to her now, in an unseasonable moment, would only tend to close her heart more obstinately. Dinah was not satisfied with a more unmistakable guidance than those inward voices. There was light enough for her, if she opened her Bible, to discern the text sufficiently to know what it would say to her. She knew the physiognomy of every page, and could tell on what book she opened— sometimes on what chapter, without seeing title or number. It was a small, thick Bible, worn quite round at the edges. Dinah laid it sideways on the window ledge, where the light was strongest, and then opened it with her forefinger. The first words she looked at were those at the top of the left-hand page, and they all wept sore and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him. That was enough for Dinah. She had opened on that memorable parting at Ephesus, when Paul had felt bound to open his heart in a last exhortation and warning. She hesitated no longer, but opening her own door gently, went and tapped on Hetty's. We know she had to tap twice, because Hetty had to put out her candles and throw off her black lace scarf. But after the second tap, the door was opened immediately. Dinah said, "'Will you let me come in, Hetty?' And Hetty, without speaking, for she was confused and vexed, opened the door wider and let her in. What a strange contrast the two figures made, visible enough in that mingled twilight and moonlight. Hetty, her cheeks flushed and her eyes glistening from her imaginary drama, her beautiful neck and arms bare, her hair hanging in a curly tangle down her back, and the baubles in her ears. Dinah, covered with her long white dress, her pale face full of subdued emotion, almost like a lovely corpse into which the soul has returned charged with sublimer secrets and a sublimer love. They were nearly of the same height, Dinah evidently a little taller as she put her arm round Hetty's waist and kissed her forehead. "'I knew you were not in bed, my dear,' she said in her sweet, clear voice, which was irritating to Hetty, mingling with her own peevish fixation like music with jangling chains." for I heard you moving, and I long to speak to you again tonight, for it is the last but one that I shall be here, and we don't know what may happen tomorrow to keep us apart. Shall I sit down with you while you do up your hair? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, said Hetty, hastily turning round and reaching the second chair in the room, glad that Dinah looked as if she did not notice her earrings. Dinah sat down, and Hetty began to brush together her hair before twisting it up, doing it with an air of excessive indifference which belongs to confused self-consciousness. But the expression of Dinah's eyes gradually relieved her. They seemed unobservant of all details. "'Dear Hetty,' she said, "'it has been borne in upon my mind tonight that you may some day be in trouble. Trouble is appointed for us all here below, and there comes a time when we need more comfort and help than the things of this life can give.' I want to tell you that if ever you are in trouble and need a friend that will always feel for you and love you, you have got that friend in Dinah Morris at Snowfield, and if you come to her or send for her, she will never forget this night and the words she is speaking to you now. Will you remember it, Hetty? Yes, said Hetty, rather frightened. But why should you think I shall be in trouble? Do you know of anything? Hetty had seated herself as she tied on her cap 
and now Dinah leaned forwards and took her hands as she answered, "'Because, dear, trouble comes to us all in this life. We set our hearts on things which isn't God's will for us to have, and then we go sorrowing. The people we love are taken from us, and we can joy in nothing because they are not with us. Sickness comes, and we faint under the burden of our feeble bodies. We go astray and do wrong, and bring ourselves into trouble with our fellow men.' There is no man or woman born into this world to whom some of these trials do not fall, and so I feel that some of them must happen to you, and I desire for you that while you are young you should seek for strength from your Heavenly Father, that you may have a support which will not fail you in the evil day. Dinah paused and released Hetty's hands that she might not hinder her. Hetty sat quite still. She felt no response within herself to Dinah's anxious affectation. But Dinah's words uttered with solemn pathetic distinctness affected her with a chill fear. Her flush had died away almost to paleness. She had the timidity of a luxurious pleasure-seeking nature, which shrinks from the hint of pain. Dinah saw the effect, and her tender anxious pleading became the more earnest, till Hetty, full of a vague fear that something evil was some time to befall her, began to cry. It is our habit to say that while the lower nature can never understand the higher, the higher nature commands a complete view of the lower. But I think the higher nature has to learn this comprehension, as we learn the art of vision, by a good deal of hard experience, often with bruises and gashes incurred in taking things up by the wrong end and fancying our space wider than it is. Dinah had never seen Hetty affected in this way before, and with her usual benignant hopefulness she trusted it was the stirring of a divine impulse she kissed the sobbing thing and began to cry with her for grateful joy. But Hetty was simply in that excitable state of mind in which there is no calculating what turn the feelings may take from one moment to another, and for the first time she became irritated under Dinah's caress. She pushed her away impatiently and said, with a childish sobbing voice, "'Don't talk to me so, Dinah. Why do you come to frighten me? I've never done anything to you. Why can't you let me be?' Poor Dinah felt a pang. She was too wise to persist, and only said mildly, "'Yes, my dear, you're tired. I won't hinder you any longer. Make haste and get into bed. Good night.' She went out of the room almost as quietly and quickly as if she had been a ghost, but once by the side of her own bed she threw herself on her knees and poured out in deep silence all the passionate pity that filled her heart. As for Hetty, she was soon in the wood again her waking dreams being merged in a sleeping life scarcely more fragmentary and confused. End of chapter 15「16 of Adam Bede This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Adam Bede by George Eliot Chapter 16 Links Arthur Donathorne, you remember, is under an engagement with himself to go and see Mr. Irwin this Friday morning, and he is awake and dressing so early that he determines to go before breakfast instead of after. The rector, he knows, breakfasts alone at half-past nine, the ladies of the family having a different breakfast hour. Arthur will have an early ride over the hill and breakfast with him. One can say everything best over a meal. The progress of civilization has made a breakfast or a dinner an easy and cheerful substitute for more troublesome and disagreeable ceremonies. We take a less gloomy view of our errors now our father confessor listens to us over his egg and coffee. We are more distinctly conscious that rude penances are out of the question for gentlemen in an enlightened age, and that mortal sin is not incompatible with an appetite for muffins. An assault on our pockets, which in more barbarous times would have been made in the brusque form of a pistol shot, is quite a well-bred and smiling procedure now it has become a request for a loan thrown in as an easy parenthesis between the second and third glasses of claret. Still, there was this advantage in the old rigid forms, that they committed you to the fulfillment of a resolution by some outward deed. When you have put your mouth to one end of a hole in a stone wall, and are aware that there is an expectant ear at the other end, 
you are more likely to say what you came out with the intention of saying than if you were seated with your legs in an easy attitude under the mahogany with a companion who will have no reason to be surprised if you have nothing particular to say. However, Arthur Donnithorne, as he winds among the pleasant lanes on horseback in the morning sunshine, has a sincere determination to open his heart to the rector, and the swirling sound of the scythe as he passes by the meadow is all the pleasanter to him because of this honest purpose. He is glad to see the promise of settled weather now, for getting in the hay, about which the farmers have been fearful, and there is something so healthful in the sharing of a joy that is general and not merely personal, that this thought about the hay harvest reacts on his state of mind and makes his resolution seem an easier matter. A man about town might perhaps consider that these influences were not to be felt out of a child's story-book, but when you are among the fields and hedgerows, it is impossible to maintain a consistent superiority to simple natural pleasures. Arthur had passed the village of Hayslip and was approaching the Broxton side of the hill, when, at a turning in the road, he saw a figure about a hundred yards before him, which it was impossible to mistake for anyone else than Adam Bede, even if there had been no grey, tailless shepherd-dog at his heels. He was striding along at his usual rapid pace, and Arthur pushed on his horse to overtake him, for he retained too much of his boyish feeling for Adam to miss an opportunity of chatting with him. I will not say that his love for that good fellow did not owe some of its force to the love of patronage. Our friend Arthur liked to do everything that was handsome, and to have his handsome deeds recognized. Adam looked round as he heard the quickening clatter of the horse's heels, and waited for the horseman, lifting his paper cap from his head with a bright smile of recognition. Next to his own brother Seth, Adam would have done more for Arthur Donnithorne than for any other young man in the world. There was hardly anything he would not rather have lost than the two-feet ruler which he always carried in his pocket. It was Arthur's present— bought with his pocket money when he was a fair-haired lad of eleven, and when he had profited so well by Adam's lessons in carpentering and turning as to embarrass every female in the house with gifts of superfluous thread-reels and round-boxes. Adam had quite a pride in the little squire in those early days, and the feeling had only become slightly modified as the fair-haired lad had grown into the whiskered young man. Adam, I confess, was very susceptible to the influence of rank— and quite ready to give an extra amount of respect to everyone who had more advantages than himself, not being a philosopher or a proletaire with democratic ideas, but simply a stout-limbed, clever carpenter with a large fund of reverence in his nature, which inclined him to admit all established claims unless he saw very clear grounds for questioning them. He had no theories about setting the world to rights, but he saw there was a great deal of damage done by building with ill-seasoned timber, by ignorant men in fine clothes making plans for outhouses and workshops and the like, without knowing the bearings of things, by slovenly joiners' work, and by hasty contracts that could never be fulfilled without ruining somebody, and he resolved, for his part, to set his face against such doings. On these points, he would have maintained his opinion against the largest landed proprietor in Loamshire, or Stornishire either, but he felt that beyond these it would be better for him to defer to people who were more knowing than himself. He saw as plainly as possible how ill the woods on the estate were managed, and the shameful state of the farm buildings, and if old Squire Donathorne had asked him the effect of this mismanagement, he would have spoken his opinion without flinching, but the impulse to a respectful demeanour towards a gentleman would have been strong within him all the while. The word gentleman had a spell for Adam, and, as he often said, he couldn't abide a fellow who thought he made himself fine by being coxy to his betters. I must remind you again that Adam had the blood of the peasant in his veins, and that since he was in his prime half a century ago, you must expect some of his characteristics to be obsolete. Towards the young squire, this instinctive reverence of Adam's was assisted by boyish memories and personal regard, so you may imagine that he thought far more of Arthur's good qualities and attached far more value to very slight actions of his than if they had been the qualities and actions of a common workman like himself. He felt sure it would be a fine day for everybody about Hayslope when the young squire came into the estate. Such a generous, open-hearted disposition as he had, and an uncommon notion about improvements and repairs, considering he was only just coming of age. Thus there was both respect and affection in the smile with which he raised his paper cap as Arthur Donathorne rode up. "'Well, Adam, how are you?' said Arthur, holding out his hand. He never shook hands with any of the farmers, and Adam felt the honour keenly. 
I could swear to your back a long way off. It's just the same back, only broader, as when you used to carry me on it. Do you remember? Aye, sir, I remember. It'd be a poor lookout if folks didn't remember what they did and said when they were lads. We should think no more about old friends than we do about new ones, then. You're going to Broxton, I suppose? said Arthur, putting his horse on at a slow pace while Adam walked by his side. Are you going to the rectory? No, sir. I'm going to see about Bradwell's barn. They're afraid of the roof pushing the walls out, and I'm going to see what can be done with it before we send the stuff and the workmen. Why, Burge trusts almost everything to you now, Adam, doesn't he? I should think he will make you his partner soon. He will, if he's wise. Nay, sir, I don't see as he'd be much the better off for that. A foreman, if he's got a conscience and delights in his work, will do this business as well as if he was a partner. I wouldn't give a penny for a man as a drive a nail in slack because he didn't get extra pay for it. I know that, Adam. I know you work for him as well as if you were working for yourself. But you would have more power than you have now, and could turn the business to better account, perhaps. The old man must give up his business some time, and he has no son. I suppose you'll want a son-in-law who can take to it. But he has rather grasping fingers of his own, I fancy. I dare say he wants a man who can put some money into the business. If I were not as poor as a rat, I would gladly invest some money in that way, for the sake of having you settled on the estate. I'm sure I should profit by it in the end, and perhaps I shall be better off in a year or two. I shall have a larger allowance now I'm of age, and when I've paid off a debt or two, I shall be able to look about me. You're very good to say so, sir, and I'm not unthankful, but— Adam continued in a decided tone. I shouldn't like to make any offers to Mr. Burge, or to have any made for me. I see no clear road to a partnership. If he should ever want to dispose of the business, that'd be a different matter. I should be glad of some money at a fair interest then, for I feel sure I could pay it off in time. Very well, Adam, said Arthur, remembering what Mr. Irwin had said about a probable hitch in the love-making between Adam and Mary Burge. We'll say no more about it at present. When is your father to be buried? On Sunday, sir. Mr. Irwin's coming earlier on purpose. I shall be glad when it's over, for I think my mother will perhaps get easier then. It cuts one sadly to see the grief of old people. They've no way of working it off, and the new spring brings no new shoots out on the withered tree. Ah, you've had a good deal of trouble and vexation in your life, Adam. I don't think you've ever been hare-brained and light-hearted, like other youngsters. You've always had some care on your mind. Why, yes, sir, but that's nothing to make a fuss about. If we're men and have men's feelings, I reckon we must have men's troubles. We can't be like the birds as fly from their nest as soon as they've got their wings, and never know their kin when they see them, and get a fresh lot every year. I've had enough to be thankful for. I always had health and strength and brains to give me a delight in my work, and I count it a great thing as I've had Bartle Massey's night school to go to. He's helped me to knowledge I could never have got by myself." "'What a rare fellow you are, Adam,' said Arthur, after a pause, in which he had looked musingly at the big fellow walking by his side. "'I could hit out better than most men at Oxford, and yet I believe you would knock me into next week if I were to have a battle with you.' "'God forbid I should ever do that, sir,' said Adam, looking around at Arthur and smiling. "'I used to fight for fun, but I've never done that since I was the cause of poor Gil Tranter being laid up for a fortnight. I'll never fight any man again, only when he behaves like a scoundrel.' If you get hold of a chap that's got no shame nor conscience to stop him, you must try what you can do by bunging his eyes up. Arthur did not laugh, for he was preoccupied with some thought that made him say it presently, I should think now, Adam, you never have any struggles within yourself. I fancy you would master a wish that you had made up your mind it was not quite right to indulge, as easily as you would knock down a drunken fellow who was quarrelsome with you. I mean, you are never shilly-shally, first making up your mind that you won't do a thing and then doing it after all? Well, said Adam slowly, after a moment's hesitation, no, I don't remember ever being seesaw in that way, when I'd made my mind up, as you say, that a thing was wrong. It takes the taste out of my mouth for things when I know I should have a heavy conscience after them. I've seen pretty clear, ever since I could cast up a sum, as you can never do what's wrong without breeding sin and trouble more than you can ever see. It's like a bit of bad workmanship. You never see the end of the mischief it'll do. And it's a poor lookout to come into the world to make your fellow creatures worse off instead of better. But there's a difference between the things folks call wrong. 
I'm not for making a sin of every little fool's trick, or bit of nonsense anybody may be let into, like some of them dissenters. And a man may have two minds whether it isn't worth while to get a bruise or two for the sake of a bit of fun. But it isn't my way to be seesaw about anything. I think my fault lies the other way. When I've said a thing, if it's only to myself, it's hard for me to go back. Yes, that's just what I expected of you, said Arthur. You've got an iron will, as well as an iron arm. But however strong a man's resolution may be, it costs him something to carry it out now and then. We may determine not to gather any cherries and keep our hands sturdily in our pockets, but we can't prevent our mouths from watering. That's true, sir. But there's nothing like settling with ourselves, as there's a deal we must do without of this life. It's no use looking on life as if it was a Treadleson fair, where folks only go to see shows and get fairings. If we do, we shall find it different. But where's the use of me talking to you, sir? You know better than I do. I'm not sure of that, Adam. You've had four or five years of experience more than I've had, and I think your life has been a better school to you than college has been to me. Why, sir, you seem to think a college something like what Bartle Massey does. He says college mostly makes people like bladders, just good for nothing, but to hold the stuff as is poured into em. But he's got a tongue like a sharp blade Bartle has. It never touches anything, but it cuts. Here's the turning, sir. I must bid you good morning as you're going to the rectory. Goodbye, Adam. Goodbye. Arthur gave his horse to the groom at the rectory gate and walked along the gravel towards the door which opened on the garden. He knew that the rector always breakfasted in his study, and the study lay on the left hand of this door, opposite the dining room. It was a small low room belonging to the old part of the house, dark with the somber covers of the books that lined the walls. Yet it looked very cheery this morning as Arthur reached the open window, for the morning sun fell aslant on the great glass globe with gold fish in it, which stood on a scatliola pillar in front of the ready-spread bachelor breakfast table, and by the side of this breakfast table was a group which would have made any room enticing. In the crimson damask easy chair sat Mr. Irwin, with that radiant freshness which he always had when he came from his morning toilet. His finely formed plump white hand was playing along Juno's brown curly back, and close to Juno's tail, which was wagging with calm matronly pleasure. The two brown pups were rolling over each other in an ecstatic duet of worrying noises. On a cushion a little removed sat Pug, with the air of a maiden lady, who looked on these familiarities as animal weaknesses, which she made as little show as possible of observing. On the table, at Mr. Irwin's elbow, lay the first volume of the Foolish Aeschylus, which Arthur knew well by sight, and the silver coffee-pot, which Carol was bringing in, sent forth a fragrant steam which completed the delights of a bachelor breakfast. "'Hello, Arthur. That's a good fellow. You're just in time,' said Mr. Irwin, as Arthur paused and stepped in over the low window-sill. "'Carol, we shall want more coffee and eggs. And haven't you got some cold fowl for us to eat with that ham? Why, this is like old days, Arthur. You haven't been to breakfast with me these five years.' It was a tempting morning for a ride before breakfast, said Arthur, and I used to like breakfasting with you so when I was reading with you. My grandfather is always a few degrees colder at breakfast than any other hour in the day. I think his morning bath doesn't agree with him. Arthur was anxious not to imply that he came with any special purpose. He had no sooner found himself in Mr. Irwin's presence than the confidence which he had thought quite easy before suddenly appeared the most difficult thing in the world to him, and at the very moment of shaking hands he saw his purpose in quite a new light. How could he make Irwin understand his position unless he told him those little scenes in the wood, and how could he tell them without looking like a fool? And then his weakness in coming back from Gowan's, and doing the very opposite of what he intended— Irwin would think him a shilly-shally fellow ever after. However, it must come out in an unpremeditated way. The conversation might lead up to it. "'I like breakfast time better than any other moment in the day,' said Mr. Irwin. "'No dust has settled on one's mind, then, and it presents a clear mirror to the rays of things. I always have a favorite book by me at breakfast, and I enjoy the bits I pick up then so much that regularly every morning it seems to me as if I should certainly become studious again.' But presently Dent brings up a poor fellow who has killed a hare, and when I've got through my justicing, as Carol calls it, I'm inclined for a ride round the glebe, and on my way back I meet with the master of the workhouse, who has got a long story of a mutinous pauper to tell me. And so the day goes on, and I'm always the same lazy fellow before evening sets in. Besides, one wants the stimulus of sympathy, and I have never had that since poor Dioily left Treddleston. 
If you had stuck to your books well, you rascal, I should have had a pleasanter prospect before me. But scholarship doesn't run in your family blood. No, indeed. It is well if I can remember a little inapplicable Latin to adorn my maiden speech in Parliament six or seven years hence. Cross ingens iterabimus equor, and a few shreds of that sort, will perhaps stick to me, and I shall arrange my opinion so as to introduce them. But I don't think a knowledge of the classics is a pressing want to a country gentleman, as far as I can see. He'd much better have a knowledge of manners. I've been reading your friend Arthur Young's books lately, and there's nothing I should like better than to carry out some of his ideas in putting the farmers on a better management of their land, and, as he says, making what was a wild country, all of the same dark hue, bright and variegated with corn and cattle. My grandfather will never let me have any power while he lives, but there's nothing I should like better than to undertake the Stonisher side of the estate. It's in a dismal condition, and set improvements on foot, and gallop about from one place to another and overlook them. I should like to know all the laborers, and see them touching their hats to me with a look of good will. Bravo, Arthur. A man who has no feeling for the classics couldn't make a better apology for coming into the world than by increasing the quantity of food to maintain scholars, and rectors who appreciate scholars. And whenever you enter on your career of model landlord, may I be there to see— you want a portly rector to complete the picture and take his tithe of all the respect and honor you get by your hard work. Only don't set your heart too strongly on the goodwill you are to get in consequence. I am not sure that men are the fondest of those who try to be useful to them. You know, Gowan has got the curses of the whole neighborhood upon him about that enclosure. You must make it quite clear to your mind which you are most bent upon, old boy, popularity or usefulness, else you may happen to miss both. Oh, Gowan is harsh in his manners. He doesn't make himself personally agreeable to his tenants. I don't believe there's anything you can't prevail on people to do with kindness. For my part, I couldn't live in a neighborhood where I was not respected and beloved, and it's very pleasant to go among the tenants here. They seem all so well inclined to me, I suppose it seems only the other day to them since I was a little lad, riding on a pony about as big as a sheep. And if fair allowances were made to them, and their buildings attended to, one could persuade them to farm on a better plan, stupid as they are. Then mind you fall in love in the right place, and don't get a wife who will drain your purse and make you niggardly in spite of yourself. My mother and I have a little discussion about you sometimes. She says, I'll never risk a single prophecy on Arthur until I see the woman he falls in love with. She thinks your lady love will rule you as the moon rules the tides but I feel bound to stand up for you, as my pupil, you know, and I maintain that you're not of that watery quality, so mind you don't disgrace my judgment. Arthur winced under the speech, for keen old Mrs. Irwin's opinion about him had the disagreeable effect of a sinister omen. This, to be sure, was only another reason for persevering in his intention and getting an additional security against himself. Nevertheless, at this point in the conversation, he was conscious of increased disinclination to tell his story about Hetty. He was of an impressible nature, and lived a great deal in other people's opinions and feelings concerning himself, and the mere fact that he was in the presence of an intimate friend, who had not the slightest notion that he had had any such serious internal struggle as he came to confide, rather shook his own belief in the seriousness of the struggle. It was not, after all, a thing to make a fuss about, and what could Irwin do for him that he could not do for himself? He would go to Eagledale in spite of Meg's lameness, go on Rattler, and let Pym follow as well as he could on the old hack. That was his thought as he sugared his coffee, but the next minute, as he was lifting the cup to his lips, he remembered how thoroughly he had made up his mind last night to tell Irwin. No, he would not be vacillating again. He would do what he had meant to do this time so it would be well not to let the personal tone of the conversation altogether drop. If they went to quite indifferent topics, his difficulty would be heightened. It had required no noticeable pause for this rush and rebound of feeling before he answered, but I think it is hardly an argument against a man's general strength of character that he should be apt to be mastered by love. A fine constitution doesn't insure one against smallpox or any other of those inevitable diseases. A man may be very firm in other matters, and yet be under a sort of witchery from a woman. Yes, but there's a difference between love and smallpox, or bewitchment either, that if you detect the disease at an early stage and try change of air, there is every chance of complete escape without any further development of symptoms, 
and there are certain alternative doses which a man may administer to himself by keeping unpleasant consequences before his mind. This gives you a sort of smoked glass through which you may look at the resplendent fair one and discern her true outline, though I'm afraid, by and by, the smoked glass is apt to be missing just at the moment it is most wanted. I dare say, now, even a man fortified with the knowledge of the classics might be lured into an imprudent marriage, in spite of the warning given him by the chorus in the Prometheus. The smile that flitted across Arthur's face was a faint one, and instead of following Mr. Irwin's playful lead, he said, quite seriously, Yes, that's the worst of it. It's a desperately vexatious thing, that after all one's reflection and quiet determinations, we should be ruled by moods that one can't calculate on beforehand. I don't think a man ought to be blamed so much if he is betrayed into doing things in that way, in spite of his resolutions. Ah, but the moods lie in his nature, my boy, just as much as his reflections did, and more. A man can never do anything at variance with his own nature. He carries within him the germ of his most exceptional action, and if we wise people make eminent fools of ourselves on any particular occasion, we must endure the legitimate conclusion that we carry a few grains of folly to our ounce of wisdom. Well, but one may be betrayed into doing things by a combination of circumstances, which one might never have done otherwise. Why, yes, a man can't very well steal a banknote unless the banknote lies within convenient reach. But he won't make us think him an honest man because he begins to howl at the banknote for falling in his way. But surely you don't think a man who struggles against the temptation into which he falls at last as bad as the man who never struggles at all? No, certainly. I pity him in proportion to his struggles, for they foreshadow the inward suffering which is the worst form of nemesis. Consequences are unpitying. Our deeds carry their terrible consequences, quite apart from any fluctuations that went before. Consequences that are hardly ever confined to ourselves. And it is best to fix our minds on that certainty, instead of considering what may be the elements of excuse for us. But I never knew you so inclined for moral discussion, Arthur." Is it some danger of your own that you are considering in this philosophical, general way? In asking this question, Mr. Irwin pushed his plate away, threw himself back in his chair, and looked straight at Arthur. He really suspected that Arthur wanted to tell him something, and thought of smoothing the way for him by this direct question. But he was mistaken. Brought suddenly and involuntary to the brink of confession, Arthur shrank back and felt less disposed towards it than ever. The conversation had taken a more serious tone than he had intended— it would quite mislead Irwin. He would imagine there was a deep passion for Hetty, while there was no such thing. He was conscious of coloring, and was annoyed at his boyishness. "'Oh, no, no danger,' he said, as indifferently as he could. "'I don't know that I am more liable to your resolution than other people. Only there are little incidents, now and then, that set one speculating on what might happen in the future.' Was there a motive at work under this strange reluctance of Arthur's, which had a sort of backstairs influence not admitted to himself? Our mental business is carried on much in the same way as the business of the state. A great deal of hard work is done by agents who are not acknowledged. In a piece of machinery, too, I believe there is often a small and noticeable wheel, which has a great deal to do with the motion of the large obvious ones. Possibly there was some such unrecognized agent secretly busy in Arthur's mind at this moment. Possibly it was the fear lest he might hereafter find the fact of having made a confession to the rector a serious annoyance, in case he should not be able quite to carry out his good resolutions. I dare not assert that it was not so. The human soul is a very complex thing. The idea of Hetty had just crossed Mr. Irwin's mind as he looked inquiringly at Arthur, but his disclaiming indifferent answer confirmed the thought which had quickly followed, that there could be nothing serious in that direction. There was no probability that Arthur ever saw her except at church, and at her own home under the eye of Mrs. Poyser, and the hint he had given Arthur about her the other day had no more serious meaning than to prevent him from noticing her, so as to rouse the little chit's vanity, and in this way perturb the rustic drama of her life. Arthur would soon join his regiment and be far away. No, there could be no danger in that quarter, even if Arthur's character had not been a strong security against it. His honest, patronizing pride in the good will and respect of everybody about him was a safeguard even against foolish romance, still more against a lower kind of folly. If there had been anything special on Arthur's mind in the previous conversation, it was clear he was not inclined to enter into details, and Mr. Irwin was too delicate to imply even a friendly curiosity. He perceived a change of subject would be welcome, and said, 
By the way, Arthur, at your colonel's birthday fete there were some transparencies that made a great effect in honour of Britannia and Pitt and the Loamshire militia, and above all, the generous youth, the hero of the day. Don't you think you should get up something of the same sort to astonish our weak minds? The opportunity was gone. While Arthur was hesitating, the rope to which he might have clung had drifted away. He must trust now to his own swimming. In ten minutes from that time, Mr. Irwin was called for on business, and Arthur, bidding him good-bye, mounted his horse again with a sense of dissatisfaction, which he tried to quell by determining to set off for Eagledale without an hour's delay. End of chapter 16 Chapter 17 of Adam Bede. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Adam Bede by George Eliot. Chapter 17 In Which the Story Pauses a Little. This rector of Broxton is little better than a pagan, I hear one of my readers exclaim. How much more edifying it would have been if you had made him give Arthur some truly spiritual advice. You might have put into his mouth the most beautiful things, quite as good as reading a sermon. Certainly I could, if I held it the highest vocation of the novelist to represent things as they never have been and never will be. Then, of course, I might refashion life and character entirely after my own liking. I might select the most unexceptionable type of clergyman, and put my own admirable opinions into his mouth on all occasions. But it happens, on the contrary, that my strongest effort is to avoid any such arbitrary picture, and to give a faithful account of men and things as they have mirrored themselves in my mind. The mirror is doubtless defective, the outlines will sometimes be disturbed, the reflection faint or confused, but I feel as much bound to tell you as precisely as I can what that reflection is, as if I were in the witness-box, narrating my experience on oath. Sixty years ago, it is a long time, so no wonder things have changed, all clergymen were not zealous. Indeed, there is reason to believe that the number of zealous clergymen was small, and it is probable that if one among the small minority had owned the livings of Broxton and Hayslop in the year 1799, you would have liked him no better than you like Mr. Irwin. Ten to one you would have thought him a tasteless, indiscreet, methodistical man, it is so very rarely that facts hit that nice medium required by our own enlightened opinions and refined taste. Perhaps you will say, Do improve the facts a little, then. Make them more accordant with those correct views which it is our privilege to possess. The world is not just what we like. Do touch it up with a tasteful pencil, and make believe it is not quite such a mixed and tangled affair. Let all people who hold unexceptionable opinions act unexceptionably. Let your most faulty characters always be on the wrong side, and your virtuous ones on the right. Then we shall see at a glance whom we are to condemn and whom we are to approve. Then we shall be able to admire, without the slightest disturbance of our prepossessions. We shall hate and despise with that true ruminant relish which belongs to undoubting confidence. But, my good friend, what will you do then with your fellow parishioner who opposes your husband in the vestry? with your newly appointed vicar, whose style of preaching you find painfully below that of his regretted predecessor, with the honest servant who worries your soul with her one failing, with your neighbor, Mrs. Green, who was really kind to you in your last illness, but has said several ill-natured things about you since your convalescence, nay, with your excellent husband himself, who has other irritating habits beside that of not wiping his shoes. These fellow mortals, every one, must be accepted as they are, you can neither straighten their noses, nor brighten their wit, nor rectify their dispositions, and it is these people, amongst whom your life has passed, that it is needful you should tolerate, pity, and love. It is these more or less ugly, stupid, inconsistent people whose movements of goodness you should be able to admire, for whom you should cherish all possible hopes, all possible patience. And I would not, even if I had the choice, be the clever novelist who could create a world so much better than this in which we get up in the morning to do our daily work, that you would be likely to turn a harder, colder eye on the dusty streets and the common green fields, on the real breathing men and women, who can be chilled by your indifference or injured by your prejudice, who can be cheered and helped onward by your fellow-feeling, 
your forbearance, your outspoken, brave justice. So I am content to tell my simple story, without trying to make things seem better than they were, dreading nothing indeed but falsity, which in spite of one's best efforts, there is reason to dread. Falsehood is so easy, truth so difficult. The pencil is conscious of a delightful facility in drawing a griffin. The longer the claws, and the larger the wings, the better. But that marvellous facility which we mistook for genius is apt to forsake us when we want to draw a real, unexaggerated lion. Examine your words well, and you will find that even when you have no motive to be false, it is a hard thing to say the exact truth, even about your own immediate feelings, much harder than to say something fine about them which is not the exact truth. It is for this rare, precious quality of truthfulness that I delight in many Dutch paintings, which lofty-minded people despise. I find a source of delicious sympathy in these faithful pictures of a monotonous homely existence, which has been the fate of so many more among my fellow mortals than a life of pomp or of absolute indigence, of tragic suffering or of world-stirring actions. I turn without shrinking from cloud-born angels, from prophets, sibyls, and heroic warriors, to an old woman bending over her flower-pot, or eating her solitary dinner, while the noonday light, softened perhaps by a screen of leaves, falls on her mob-cap, and just touches the rim of her spinning-wheel, and her stone-jug, and all those cheap common things which are the precious necessaries of life to her. Or I turn to that village wedding, kept between four brown walls, where an awkward bridegroom opens the dance with a high-shouldered, broad-faced bride, while elderly and middle-aged friends look on, with very irregular noses and lips, and probably with quart-pots in their hands, but with an expression of unmistakable contentment and goodwill. Foe, says my idealistic friend, what vulgar details! What good is there in taking all these pains to give an exact likeness of old women and clowns? What a low phase of life! What clumsy, ugly people! But, bless us, things may be lovable that are not altogether handsome, I hope. I am not at all sure that the majority of the human race have not been ugly, and even among those lords of their kind, the British, squat figures, ill-shapen nostrils, and dingy complexions, are not startling exceptions. Yet there is a great deal of family love amongst us. I have a friend or two whose class of features is such that the Apollo curl on the summit of their brows would be decidedly trying, yet to my certain knowledge tender hearts have beaten for them, and their miniatures, flattering but still not lovely, are kissed in secret by motherly lips. I have seen many an excellent matron, who could have never in her best days have been handsome, and yet she had a packet of yellow love letters in a private drawer, and sweet children showered kisses on her sallow cheeks and I believe there have been plenty of young heroes, of middle stature and feeble beards, who have felt quite sure they could never love anything more insignificant than a Diana, and yet have found themselves in middle life happily settled with a wife who waddles. Yes, thank God, human feeling is like the mighty rivers that bless the earth. It does not wait for beauty. It flows with resistless force and brings beauty with it. All honor and reverence to the divine beauty of form, let us cultivate it to the utmost in men, women, and children, in our gardens and in our houses. But let us love that other beauty, too, which lies in no secret of proportion, but in the secret of deep human sympathy. Paint us an angel, if you can, with a floating violet robe and a face paled by the celestial light. Paint us yet oftener a Madonna, turning her mild face upward and opening her arms to welcome the divine glory. But do not impose on us any aesthetic rules which shall banish from the region of art those old women scraping carrots with their work-worn hands, those heavy clowns taking holiday in a dingy pothouse, those rounded backs and stupid weather-beaten faces that have bent over the spade and done the rough work of the world, those homes with their tin pans, their brown pitchers, their rough curs, and their clusters of onions. In this world there are so many of these common coarse people who have no picturesque sentimental wretchedness. It is so needful we should remember their existence, else we may happen to leave them quite out of our religion and philosophy and frame lofty theories which only fit a world of extremes. Therefore, let art always remind us of them. Therefore, let us always have men ready to give the loving pains of a life to the faithful representing of commonplace things, men who see beauty in these commonplace things and delight in showing how kindly the light of heaven falls on them. There are few prophets in the world, few sublimely beautiful women, few heroes. I can't afford to give all my love and reverence to such rarities. I want a great deal of those feelings for my everyday fellow-men, especially for the few in the foreground of the great multitude, whose faces I know, 
whose hands I touch, for whom I have to make way with kindly courtesy. Neither are picturesque lazzaroni or romantic criminals half so frequent as your common laborer, who gets his own bread and eats it vulgarly, but creditably, with his own pocket-knife. It is more needful that I should have a fibre of sympathy connecting me with that vulgar citizen who weighs out my sugar in a vilely assorted cravat and waistcoat, than with the handsomest rascal in red scarf and green feathers. More needful that my heart should swell with loving admiration at some trait of gentle goodness in the faulty people who sit at the same hearth with me, or in the clergyman of my own parish, who is perhaps rather too corpulent, and in other respects is not an Oberlin or a Tillotson, than at the deeds of heroes, whom I shall never know except by hearsay, or at the sublimest abstract of all clerical graces that was ever conceived by an able novelist. And so I come back to Mr. Irwin, with whom I desire you to be in perfect charity, far as you may be from satisfying your demands on the clerical character. Perhaps you think he was not, as he ought to have been, a living demonstration of the benefits attached to a national church. But I am not sure of that, at least I know that the people in Broxton and Hayslip would have been very sorry to part with their clergyman, and that most faces brightened at his approach. And until it can be proved that hatred is a better thing for the soul than love, I must believe that Mr. Irwin's influence in his parish was a more wholesome one than that of the zealous Mr. Ride, who came here twenty years afterwards, when Mr. Irwin had been gathered to his father's. It is true Mr. Ride insisted strongly on the doctrines of the Reformation, visited his flock a great deal in their own homes, and was severe in rebuking the aberrations of the flesh put a stop, indeed, to the Christmas rounds of the church singers, as promoting drunkenness and too light a handling of sacred things. But I gathered from Adam Bede, to whom I talked of these matters in his old age, that few clergymen could be less successful in winning the hearts of their parishioners than Mr. Ride. They learned a great many notions about doctrine from him, so that almost every churchgoer under fifty began to distinguish as well between the genuine gospel and what did not come precisely up to that standard as if he had been born and bred a dissenter, and for some time after his arrival there seemed to be quite a religious movement in that quiet rural district. But, said Adam, I've seen pretty clear ever since I was a young'un, as religion's something else besides notions. It isn't notions that's people doing the right thing, it's feelings. It's the same with the notions in religion as it is with mathematics. A man may be able to work problems straight off in his head as he sits by the fire and smokes his pipe, but if he has to make a machine or a building, he must have a will and a resolution and love something else better than his own ease. Somehow the congregation began to fall off, and people began to speak light of Mr. Ride. I believe he meant right at bottom, but you see, he was sourish-tempered and was for beating down prices with the people as worked for him, and his preaching wouldn't go down well with that sauce, and he wanted to be like my lord judge of the parish, punishing folks for doing wrong, and he scolded him for the pulpit as if he'd been a ranter and yet he couldn't abide the dissenters, and was a deal more set against him than Mr. Irwin was. And then he didn't keep within his income, for he seemed to think at first go-off that six hundred a year was to make him as big a man as Mr. Donathorn. That's a sore mischief I've often seen with the poor curates jumping into a bit of living all of a sudden. Mr. Ride was a deal thought on at a distance, I believe, and he wrote books, but as for mathematics and the nature of things, he was as ignorant as a woman." He was very knowing about doctrines, and used to call them the bulwarks of the Reformation. But I've always mistrusted that sort of learning as leaves folks foolish and unreasonable about business. Now Mr. Irwin was as different as could be, as quick. He understood what you meant in a minute, and he knew all about building, and could see when you'd made a good job. And he behaved as much like a gentleman to the farmers, and the old women, and the laborers, as he did to the gentry. You never saw him interfering and scolding and trying to play the emperor. Ah, he was a fine man as ever you set eyes on, and so kind to his mother and sisters. That poor sickly Miss Anne. He seemed to think more of her than of anybody else in the world. There wasn't a soul in the parish had a word to say against him, and his servants stayed with him till they were so old and pottering he had to hire other folks to do their work. Well, I said, that was an excellent way of preaching in the weekdays. But I dare say, if your old friend Mr. Irwin were to come to life again and get into the pulpit next Sunday, you wouldn't be rather ashamed that he didn't preach better after all your praise of him. Nay, nay, said Adam, broadening his chest and throwing himself back in his chair, as if he were ready to meet all inferences. Nobody has ever heard me say Mr. Irwin was much of a preacher. He didn't go into deep spiritual experience, 
and I know there's a deal in a man's inward life as you can't measure by the square, and say, do this and that'll follow, and do that and this'll follow. There's things go on in the soul, and times when feelings come into you like a rushing mighty wind, as the scripture says, and part your life in two almost, so you look back on yourself as if you were somebody else. Those are things as you can't bottle up in a do this and do that and I'll go so far with the strongest Methodist ever you'll find. That shows me there's deep spiritual things in religion. You can't make much out with talking about it, but you feel it. Mr. Irwin didn't go into those things. He preached short, moral sermons, and that was all. But then he acted pretty much up to what he said. He didn't set up for being so different from other folks one day, and then be as like him as two peas the next. And he made folks love him and respect him, and that was better nor stirring up their gall with being over busy. Mrs. Poyser used to say, you know, she would have her word about everything. She said, Mr. Irwin was like a good meal of victual. You were the better for him without thinking on it. And Mr. Ride was like a dose of physic. He gripped you and worded you, and after all he left you much the same. But didn't Mr. Ride preach a great deal more about the spiritual part of religion that you talk of, Adam? Couldn't you get more out of his sermons than out of Mr. Irwin's? Eh, I know no. He preached a deal about doctrines. But I've seen pretty clear ever since I was a young un as religion's something else besides doctrines and notions. I look at it as if the doctrines was like finding names for your feelings, so as you can talk of em when you've never known em, just as a man may talk tools when he knows their names, though he's never so much as seen em, still less handle em. I've heard a deal of doctrine in my time, for I used to go after the dissenting preachers along with Seth, when I was a lad of seventeen, and got puzzling myself a deal about the Arminians and the Calvinists. The Wesleyans, you know, are strong Arminians, and Seth, who could never abide anything harsh and was always for hope in the best, held fast by the Wesleyans from the very first. But I thought I could pick a hole or two in their notions, and I got disputing with one of the class leaders down at Treddleson, and harassed him so. First to this side, then to that, till at last he said, Young man, it's the devil making use of your pride and conceit as a weapon to war against the simplicity of truth. I couldn't help laughing then, but as I was going home, I thought the man wasn't far wrong. I began to see as all this weighing and sifting, what this text means and that text means, and whether folks are saved all by God's grace, or whether there goes an ounce of their own will to it, was no part of real religion at all. You may talk of these things for hours on end, and you'll only be all the more coxy and conceited for it. So I took to going nowhere but to church, and hearing nobody but Mr. Irwin for he said nothing but what was good and what should be the wiser for remembering, and I found it better for my soul to be humble before the mysteries of God's dealings and not be making a clatter about what I could never understand. And they're poor foolish questions, after all, for what have we got either inside or outside of us but what comes from God? If we got a resolution to do right, he gave it us, I reckon, first or last, but I see plain enough we shall never do it without a resolution, and that's enough for me." Adam, you perceive, was a warm admirer, perhaps a partial judge, of Mr. Irwin, as happily some of us still are of the people we have known familiarly. Doubtless it will be despised as a weakness by that lofty order of minds who pant after the ideal and are oppressed by a general sense that their emotions are of too exquisite a character to find fit objects among their everyday fellowmen. I have often been favored with the confidence of these select natures, and find them to concur in the experience that great men are overestimated and small men are insupportable, that if you would love a woman without ever looking back on your love as a folly, she must die when you are courting her, and if you would maintain the slightest belief in human heroism, you must never make a pilgrimage to see the hero. I confess I have often meanly shrunk from confessing to these accomplished and acute gentlemen what my own experience has been. I am afraid I have often smiled with hypocritical assent, and gratified them with an epigram on the fleeting nature of our illusions, which any one moderately acquainted with French literature can command at a moment's notice. Human converse, I think some wise man has remarked, is not rigidly sincere. But I herewith discharge my conscience, and declare that I have had quite enthusiastic movements of admiration towards old gentlemen who spoke the worst English, who were occasionally fretful in their temper, and who had never moved in a higher sphere of influence than that of parish overseer, and that the way in which I have come to the conclusion that human nature is lovable, the way I have learned something of its deep pathos, its sublime mysteries, has been by living a great deal among people more or less commonplace and vulgar, of whom you would perhaps hear nothing very surprising if you were to inquire about them in the neighborhoods where they dwelt. 
Ten to one most of the small shopkeepers in their vicinity sought nothing at all in them, for I have observed this remarkable coincidence that the select natures who pant after the ideal and find nothing in pantaloons or petticoats great enough to command the reverence and love are curiously in unison with the narrowest and pettiest. For example, I have often heard Mr. Gedge, the landlord of the Royal Oak, who used to turn a bloodshot eye on his neighbors in the village of Shepperton, sum up his opinion of the people in his own parish, and they were all the people he knew, in these emphatic words. Ay, sir, I've said it often, and I'll say it again. They're a poor lot in this parish. A poor lot, sir, big and little. I think he had a dim idea that if he could migrate to a distant parish, he might find neighbors worthy of him, and indeed he did subsequently transfer himself to the Saracen's Head, which was doing a thriving business in the back street of a neighboring market town. But oddly enough, he has found the people up that back street of precisely the same stamp as the inhabitants of Shepperton. A poor lot, sir, big and little, and them as comes for a go of gin are no better than them as comes for a pint of twopenny. A poor lot. End of chapter 17「Eighteen of Adam Bede. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Missy, Guangzhou, China. Adam Bede by George Eliot. Chapter 18. Church. Hetty! Hetty! Don't you know church begins at two, and it's gone half after one already? Have you got nothing better to think on this good Sunday, as poor old Pius leaves to be put into the ground, and him drowned at the dead of the night, as it's enough to make one's back run cold? But you must be dizing in yourself as if there was a wedding instead of a funeral. Well, aunt, said Hetty, I can't be ready so soon as everybody else when I've got Totty's things to put on, and I've ever such work to make her stand still. Hetty was coming downstairs, and Mrs. Poyser, in her plain bonnet and shawl, was standing below. If ever a girl looked as if she had been made of roses, that girl was Hetty, in her Sunday hat and frock. For her hat was trimmed with pink, and her frock had pink spots, sprinkled on a white ground. There was nothing but pink and white about her, except in her dark hair and eyes, and her little buckled shoes. Mrs. Poyser was provoked at herself, for she could hardly keep from smiling, as any mortal is inclined to do at the sight of pretty round things. So she turned without speaking and joined the group outside the house door, followed by Hetty, whose heart was fluttering so at the thought of someone she expected to see at church that she hardly felt the ground she trod on. And now the little procession set off. Mr. Poyser was in his Sunday suit of drab, with a red and green waistcoat and a green watch ribbon having a large cornelian seal attached, pendant like a plumb line from that promontory where his watch pocket was situated, a silk handkerchief of a yellow tone round his neck, and excellent grey ribbed stockings, knitted by Mrs. Poyser's own hand, setting off the proportions of his leg. Mr. Poyser had no reason to be ashamed of his leg, and suspected that the growing abuse of top boots and other fashions tending to disguise the nether limbs had their origin in a pitiable degeneracy of the human calf. Still less had he reason to be ashamed of his round, jolly face, which was good humour itself, as he said, "'Come, Hetty, come, little uns," and giving his arm to his wife, led the way through the causeway gate into the yard. The little uns addressed were Marty and Tommy, boys of nine and seven, in little fustian tailed coats and knee-breeches, relieved by rosy cheeks and black eyes, looking as much like their father as a very small elephant is like a very large one. Hetty walked between them, and behind came patient Molly, whose task it was to carry Toddy through the yard and over all the wet places on the road, for Toddy, having speedily recovered from her threatened fever, had insisted on going to church to-day, and especially on wearing her red and black necklace outside her tippet and there were many wet places for her to be carried over this afternoon, for there had been heavy showers in the morning, though now the clouds had rolled off and lay in towering silvery masses on the horizon. You might have known it was Sunday if you had only waked up in the farmyard. The cocks and hens seemed to know it, and made only crooning subdued noises. 
the very bulldog looked less savage as if he would have been satisfied with a smaller bite than usual the sunshine seemed to call all things to rest and not to labour it was asleep itself on the moss-grown cowshed on the group of white ducks nestling together with their bills tucked under their wings on the old black sow stretched languidly on the straw while her largest young one found an excellent spring-bed on his mother's fat ribs on alec the shepherd in his new smock-frock taking an uneasy siesta half sitting half standing on the granary steps alec was of the opinion that church like other luxuries was not to be indulged in often by a foreman who had the weather and the ewes on his mind church nay i'm gotten summat else to think on was an answer which he often uttered in a tone of bitter significance that silenced further question i feel sure alec meant no irreverence indeed i know that his mind was not of a speculative negative cast and he would on no account have missed going to church on christmas day easter day and Whissantide, but he had a general impression that public worship and religious ceremonies, like other non-productive employments, were intended for people who had leisure. "'There's father a-standin' at the yard-gate,' said Martin Poyser. "'I reckon he wants to watch us down the field. It's wonderful what sight he has, and him turns seventy-five. "'Ah, I often think it's with the old folks as it is with the babies,' said Mrs. Poyser. "'They're satisfied with lookin', no matter what they're lookin' at.' it's god almighty's way of quietening them i reckon afore they go to sleep old martin opened the gate as he saw the family procession approaching and held it wide open leaning on his stick pleased to do this bit of work for like all old men whose life has been spent in labour he liked to feel that he was still useful that there was a better crop of onions in the garden because he was by at the sowing and that the cows would be milked the better if he stayed at home on a sunday afternoon to look on he always went to church on sacrament sundays but not very regularly at other times on wet sundays or whenever he had a touch of rheumatism he used to read the three first chapters of genesis instead they'll ha put in thigh speed o' the ground afore ye get to the churchyard he said as his son came up it ud ha been better luck if they'd had it buried him in the forenoon when the rain was fallin there's no likelihoods of a drop now and the moon lies like a boat there dost see that's a sure sign of fair weather there's a many as is false but that's sure ay ay said the son i'm in hopes it'll hold up now mind what the parson says mind what the parson says my lads said grandfather to the black-eyed youngsters in knee-breeches conscious of a marble or two in their pockets which they looked forward to handling a little secretly during the sermon do by dan dad said toddy me doin de church me dot my necklace on Did me a peppermint Grandad, shaking with laughter at this deep little wench, slowly transferred his stick to his left hand, which held the gate open, and slowly thrust his finger into the waistcoat pocket, on which Toddy had fixed her eyes with a confident look of expectation. And when they were all gone, the old man leaned on the gate again, watching them across the lane, along the home close, and through the far gate, till they disappeared behind a bend in the hedge. For the hedgerows in those days shut out one's view, even on the better-managed farms. And this afternoon the dog-roses were tossing out their pink wreaths, the nightshade was in its yellow and purple glory, the pale honeysuckle grew out of reach, peeping high up out of a holly-bush, and over all an ash or a sycamore every now and then threw its shadow across the path. There were acquaintances at other gates who had to move aside and let them pass. At the gate of the home close there was half the dairy of cows standing one behind the other, extremely slow to understand that their large bodies might be in the way at the far gate there was the mare holding her head over the bars and beside her the liver-coloured foal with its head towards its mother's flank apparently still much embarrassed by its own straddling existence the way lay entirely through mr poyser's own fields till they reached the main road leading to the village and he turned a keen eye on the stock and the crops as they went along while mrs poyser was ready to supply a running commentary on them all the woman who manages a dairy has a large share in making the rent, so she may well be allowed to have her opinion on stock and their keep, an exercise which strengthens her understanding so much that she finds herself able to give her husband advice on most other subjects. "'There's that short-horned Sally,' she said, as they entered the home clothes, and she caught sight of the meek beast that lay chewing the cud and looking at her with a sleepy eye. 
I begin to hate the sight of the cow. And I say now what I said three weeks ago, the sooner we get rid of her the better, for there's that little yellow cow as doesn't give half the milk, and yet I've twice as much butter from her. Why, thee'd not like the women in general, said Mr. Poyser. They like the shorthorns as give such a lot of milk. There's Chow's wife wants him to buy no other sort. What did signify what Chow's wife likes? A poor soft thing with no more headpiece nor a sparrow. She take a big cullender to strain her lard with, and then wonder as the scratchins run through. I've seen enough of her to know as I'll never take a servant from her house again. All hugger mugger, and you'd never know when you went in whether it was Monday or Friday the wash dragging on to the end of the week. And as for her cheese, I know well enough it rose like a loaf in the tin last year. And then she talks of the weather being in the fault, as there's folks that stand on their heads and then say the fault was of their boots. Well, Chown's been wantin' to buy Sally so he can get rid of her if he likes said Mr. Poyser, secretly proud of his wife's superior power of putting two and two together. Indeed, on recent market days he had more than once boasted of her discernment in this very matter of shorthorns. Ay, them as choose a soft for a wife may's well buy up the shorthorns, for if you get your head stuck in a bog, your legs may's well go after it. Eh, talk o' legs, there's legs for you, Mrs. Poyser continued, as Toddy, who had been set down now the road was dry, toddled all in front of her father and mother. They're shapes, and she's got such a long foot she'll be her father's own child. Ay, she'll be welly such a one as Hetty at ten years' time. Only she's got thy coloured eyes. I never remember a blue eye in my family. My mother had eyes as black as sloes, just like Hetty's. The child would be none the worse for having summat as isn't like Hetty. And I'm none for having her so over pretty. Though for the matter of that, there's people with light hair and blue eyes as pretty as them with black. If Dinah had got a bit o' colour in her cheeks, and didn't stick that Methodist cap on her head enough to frighten the cows, folks would think her as pretty as Hetty. Nay, nay, said Mr. Poyser, with rather a contemptuous emphasis. They does not know the pints of a woman. The men had never run after Dinah as they would after Hetty. What care I what the men had run after? It's well seen what choice the most of em know how to make, by the poor draggle tails o' wives ye see, like bits o' gauze ribbon good for nothing when the colour's gone. Well, well, they can't still say but what I knowed how to make a choice when I married thee, said Mr. Poyser, who usually settled little conjugal disputes by a compliment of this sort, and thee was twice as booksome as Dinah ten year ago. I never said as a woman had need to be ugly to make a good missus of a house. There's Chown's wife, ugly enough to turn the milk and save the rennet, but she'll never save nothing any other way. But as for Dinah, poor child, she's never likely to be booksome as long as she'll make her dinner a cake and water, for the sake of giving to them as want. She provoked me past bearing sometimes, and as I told her, she went clean again the scripture, for that says, love your neighbor as yourself. But, I said, if you loved your neighbor no better nor you do yourself, Dinah, it's little enough you'd do for him. You'd be thinking he might do well enough on a half-empty stomach. Ah, I wonder where she is this blessed Sunday." "'Sitting by that sick woman, I dare say, "'as she'd set her heart on going to all of a sudden. "'Ah, it was a pity she should take such megrims into her head "'when she might have stayed with us all summer "'and eaten twice as much as she wanted, "'and it had never had been missed. "'She made no odds in the house at all, "'for she sat as still at her sewing as a bird on the nest "'and was uncommon nimble at running to fetch anything. "'If Hetty gets married, thee'd like to have Dinah with thee constant.' "'It's no use thinking of that,' said Mrs. Poyser. "'You might as well beckon to the flying swallow "'as ask Dinah to come and live here comfortable like other folks. "'If anything could turn her, I should have turned her, "'for I've talked to her for an hour on end. "'And scolded her, too, for she's my own sister's child, "'and it behoves me to do what I can for her. "'But, eh, poor thing, as soon as she'd said us good-bye "'and got into the cart, and looked back at me with her pale face, "'as is welly like her Aunt Judith come back from heaven, "'I begun to be frightened to think all the set-downs I'd given her, for it comes over you sometimes, as if she'd a way o' knowin' the rights o' things more nor other folks have. But I'll never give in as that's cause she's a Methodist, no more nor a white calf's white cause it eats out of the same bucket with a black un. Nay, said Mr. Poyser, with as near an approach to a snarl as his good nature would allow, I'm no opinion o' the Methodists. It's only trades folks as turn Methodists. You never knew a farmer bitten with them maggots. There's maybe a workman now and then, as is an over-clever at's work, takes to preaching in that, like Seth Bede. But you see Adam, as has got one of the best headpieces hereabout, knows better. He's a good churchman, else I'd never encourage him for a sweetheart for Hetty. Why, 
"'Goodness me,' said Mrs. Poyser, who had looked back while her husband was speaking. "'Look where Molly is with them lads. They're the field's length behind us. How could you let him do so, Hetty? Anybody might as well set a picture to watch the children as you. Run back and tell him to come on.' Mr. and Mrs. Poyser were now at the end of the second field, so they set Toddy on top of one of the large stones forming the true Loamshire style, and awaited the loiterers, Toddy observing with complacency, "'Dey naughty, naughty boys! Me do it!' The fact was that this Sunday walk through the fields was fraught with great excitement to Marty and Tommy, who saw a perpetual drama going on in the hedgerows, and could no more refrain from stopping and peeping than if they had been a couple of spaniels or terriers. Marty was quite sure he saw a yellow hammer on the boughs of that great ash, and while he was peeping he missed the sight of a white-throated stoat, which had run across the path and was described with much fervor by the junior Tommy. Then there was a little greenfinch, just fledged, fluttering along the ground, and it seemed quite possible to catch it, till it managed to flutter under the blackberry bush. Hetty could not be got to give any heed to these things, so Molly was called on for her ready sympathy, and peeped with open mouth wherever she was told, and said, "'Locks!' whenever she was expected to wonder. Molly hastened on with some alarm when Hetty had come back and called to them that her aunt was angry, but Marty ran on first, shouting, "'We found the speckled turkey's nest, mother!' with the instinctive confidence that people who bring good news are never in fault. "'Ah!' said Mrs. Poyser, really forgetting all discipline in this pleasant surprise. "'That's a good lad. Why, where is it?' "'Down in ever such a hole under the hedge. I saw it first, looking after the greenfinch, and she sat on the nest.' "'You didn't frighten her, I hope,' said the mother, "'else she'll forsake it. "'No, I went away as still as still, and whispered to Molly. "'Didn't I, Molly?' "'Well, well. Now come on,' said Mrs. Poyser, "'and walk before father and mother, and take your little sister by the hand. "'We must go straight on now. "'Good boys don't look after the birds of a Sunday.' "'But, mother,' said Marty, "'you said you'd give half a crown to find the speckled turkey's nest. "'Mayn't I have the half crown put into my money-box?' "'We'll see about that, my lad, if you walk along now like a good boy.' The father and mother exchanged a significant glance of amusement at their eldest-born's acuteness, but on Tommy's round face there was a cloud. "'Mother,' he said, half crying, "'Marty's got ever so much more money in his box nor I've got in mine.' "'Money, me want a half a town in my box,' said Toddy. "'Hush, hush, hush,' said Mrs. Poyser. "'Did ever anybody hear such naughty children? Nobody shall ever see their money-boxes any more if they don't make haste and go on to church.' This dreadful threat had the desired effect, and through the two remaining fields the three pair of small legs trotted on without any serious interruption, notwithstanding a small pond full of tadpoles, alias bullheads, which the lads looked at wistfully. The damp hay that must be scattered and turned afresh to-morrow was not a cheering sight to Mr. Poyser, who during hay and corn harvest had often some mental struggles as to the benefits of a day of rest but no temptation would have induced him to carry on any field-work, however early in the morning, on a Sunday. For had not Michael Holdsworth had a pair of oxen sweltered while he was ploughing on Good Friday? That was a demonstration that work on sacred days was a wicked thing, and with wickedness of any sort Martin Poyser was quite clear that he would have nothing to do, since money got by such means would never prosper. "'It almost makes your fingers itch to be at the hay now the sun shines so,' he observed, as they passed through the big meadow but it's poor foolishness to think of saving by going against your conscience. There's that Jim Wakefield, as they used to call Gentleman Wakefield, used to do the same of a Sunday as weekdays, and took no heed to right or wrong, as if there was neither God nor devil. And what's he come to? Why, I saw him myself last market day a-carrying a basket with oranges in it. Ah, to be sure, said Mrs. Poyser, emphatically, you make but a poor trap to catch luck if you go and bait it with wickedness. The money as is got so's like to burn holes o' your pocket. I'd never wish us to leave our lads a sixpence, but what was got i' the rightful way. And as for the weather, there's one above makes it, and we must put up with it. It's nothing of a plague to what the wenches are. Notwithstanding the interruption in their walk, the excellent habit which Mrs. Poyser's clock had of taking time by the forelock had secured their arrival at the village while it was still a quarter to two, though almost every one who meant to go to church was already within the churchyard gates. Those who stayed at home were chiefly mothers, like Timothy's Bess, who stood at her own door nursing her baby and feeling as women feel in that position, that nothing else can be expected of them. 
It was not entirely to see Thias Bede's funeral that the people were standing about the churchyard so long before service began. That was their common practice. The women, indeed, usually entered the church at once, and the farmers' wives talked in an undertone to each other, over the tall pews, about their illnesses and the total failure of doctor's stuff, recommending dandelion tea and other homemade specifics as far preferable, about the servants, growing exorbitance as to wages, whereas the quality of their services declined from year to year, and there was no girl nowadays to be trusted any further than you could see her, about the bad price Mr. Dingall, the Treddleston grocer, was giving for butter, and the reasonable doubts that might be held as to his solvency, notwithstanding that Mrs. Dingall was a sensible woman, and they were all sorry for her, for she had very good kin. Meantime the men lingered outside, and hardly any of them except the singers, who had a humming and fragmentary rehearsal to go through, entered the church until Mr. Irwine was in the desk. They saw no reason for that premature entrance. What could they do in church if they were there before service began? And they did not conceive that any power in the universe could take it ill of them if they stayed out and talked a little about business. Chad Cranage looks like quite a new acquaintance to-day, for he has got his clean Sunday face, which always makes his little granddaughter cry at him as a stranger. But an experienced eye would have fixed on him at once as the village blacksmith, after seeing the humble deference with which the big saucy fellow took off his hat and stroked his hair to the farmers. For Chad was accustomed to say that a working man must hold a candle to a personage understood to be as black as he was himself on weekdays, by which evil-sounding rule of conduct he meant what was, after all, rather virtuous than otherwise, namely, that men who had horses to be shod must be treated with respect. Chad and the rougher sort of workmen kept aloof from the grave under the white thorn, where the burial was going forward. But Sandy Jim and several of the farm laborers made a group round it, and stood with their hats off, as fellow mourners with the mother and sons. Others held a midway position, sometimes watching the group at the grave, sometimes listening to the conversation of the farmers, who stood in a knot near the church door, and were now joined by Martin Poyser, while his family passed into the church. On the outside of this knot stood Mr. Casson, the landlord of the Donathorn Arms, in his most striking attitude, that is to say, with the forefinger of his right hand thrust between the buttons of his waistcoat, his left hand in his breeches pocket, and his head very much on one side, looking, on the whole, like an actor who has only a monosyllabic part entrusted to him, but feels sure that the audience discern his fitness for the leading business. Curiously in contrast with old Jonathan Burge, who held his hands behind him and leaned forward, coughing asthmatically, with an inward scorn of all knowingness that could not be turned into cash. The talk was in rather a lower tone than usual to-day, hushed a little by the sound of Mr. Irwine's voice reading the final prayers of the burial service. They had all had their word of pity for poor Thias, but now they had got upon the nearer subject of their own grievances against Fashel, the squire's bailiff, who played the part of steward so far as it was not performed by old Mr. Donathorne himself. For that gentleman had the meanness to receive his own rents and make bargains about his own timber. This subject of conversation was an additional reason for not being loud, since Satchel himself might presently be walking up the paved road to the church door. And soon they became suddenly silent, for Mr. Irwine's voice had ceased, and the group round the white thorn was dispersing itself towards the church. They all moved aside and stood with their hats off while Mr. Irwine passed. Adam and Seth were coming next with their mother between them, for Joshua Rann officiated as head sexton as well as clerk, and was not yet ready to follow the rector into the vestry. But there was a pause before the three mourners came on. Lisbeth had turned round to look again towards the grave. Ah, there was nothing now but the brown earth under the white thorn. She cried less to-day than she had done any day since her husband's death. Along with all her grief there was mixed an unusual sense of her own importance, in having a burial, and in Mr. Irwine's reading a special service for her husband. And besides, she knew the funeral psalm was going to be sung for him. She felt this counter-excitement to her sorrow still more strongly as she walked with her sons towards the parish door, and saw the friendly sympathetic nods of their fellow parishioners. The mother and sons passed into the church, and one by one the loiterers followed, though some still lingered without. The sight of Mr. Donathorne's carriage, which was winding slowly up the hill, perhaps helping to make them feel that there was no need for haste. But presently the sound of the bassoon and the key-bugles burst forth. The evening hymn, which always opened the service, had begun, 
and every one must now enter and take his place. I cannot say that the interior of Hayslope Church was remarkable for anything except for the grey age of its oaken pews. Great square pews, mostly, ranged on each side of a narrow aisle. It was free, indeed, from the modern blemish of galleries. The choir had two narrow pews to themselves in the middle of the right-hand row, so that it was a short process for Joshua Rand to take his place among them as principal bass and return to his desk after the singing was over. The pulpit and desk, gray and old as the pews, stood on one side of the arch leading into the chancel, which also had its gray square pews for Mr. Donathorne's family and servants. Yet I assure you these gray pews, with the buff-washed walls, gave a very pleasing tone to this shabby interior, and agreed extremely well with the ruddy faces and bright waistcoats and there were liberal touches of crimson toward the chancel. For the pulpit and Mr. Donathorne's own pew had handsome crimson cloth cushions, and to close the vista there was a crimson altar cloth embroidered with golden rays by Miss Lydia's own hand. But even without the crimson cloth, the effect must have been warm and cheering when Mr. Irwine was in the desk, looking benignly round on that simple congregation, on the hardy old men, with bent knees and shoulders, perhaps, but with vigor left for much hedge-clipping and thatching, on the tall, stalwart frames and roughly cut bronzed faces of the stone-cutters and carpenters, on the half-dozen well-to-do farmers with their apple-cheeked families, and on the clean old women, mostly farm laborers' wives, with their bit of snow-white cap border under their black bonnets, and with their withered arms bare from the elbow, folded passively over their chests for none of the old people held books. Why should they? Not one of them could read. But they knew a few good words by heart, and their withered lips now and then moved silently, following the service, without any very clear comprehension indeed, but with a simple faith in its efficacy to ward off harm and bring blessing. And now all faces were visible, for all were standing up, the little children on the seats, peeping over the edge of the grey pews, while good Bishop Ken's evening hymn was being sung to one of those lively psalm tunes which died out with the last generation of rectors and choral parish clerks. Melodies die out, like the pipe of Pan, with the ears that love them and listen for them. Adam was not in his usual place among the singers to-day, for he sat with his mother and Seth, and he noticed with surprise that Bartle Massey was absent too, all the more agreeable for Mr. Joshua Rann, who gave out his bass notes with unusual complacency, and threw an extra ray of severity into the glances he sent over his spectacles at the recusant Will Maskery. I beseech you to imagine Mr. Irwine looking round on this scene, in his ample white surplice that became him so well, with his powdered hair thrown back, his rich brown complexion, and his finely cut nostril and upper lip for there was a certain virtue in that benignant yet keen countenance, as there is in all human faces from which a generous soul beams out. And over all streamed the delicious June sunshine through the old windows with their desultory patches of yellow, red, and blue that threw pleasant touches of color on the opposite wall. I think, as Mr. Irwine looked round to-day, his eyes rested an instant longer than usual on the square pew occupied by Martin Poyser and his family and there was another pair of dark eyes that found it impossible not to wander thither, and rest on that round pink and white figure. But Hetty was at that moment quite careless of any glances. She was absorbed in the thought that Arthur Donathorne would soon be coming into church, for the carriage must surely be at the church gate by this time. She had never seen him since she parted with him in the wood on Thursday evening, and—oh, how long the time had seemed! Things had gone on just the same as ever since that evening— the wonders that had happened then had brought no changes after them. They were already like a dream. When she heard the church door swinging, her heart beat so she dared not look up. She felt that her aunt was curtsying. She curtsied herself. That must be old Mr. Donathorne. He always came first. The wrinkled small old man peering round with short-sighted glances at the bowing and curtsying congregation. Then she knew Miss Lydia was passing, and though Hetty liked so much to look at her fashionable little coal-scuttle bonnet with the wreath of small roses round it, she didn't mind it to-day. But there were no more curtsies. No, he was not come. She felt sure there was nothing else passing the pew door but the housekeeper's black bonnet and the lady's maid's beautiful straw hat that had once been Miss Lydia's, and then the powdered heads of the butler and footman. No, he was not there. 
Yet she would look now, she might be mistaken, for after all she had not looked. So she lifted up her eyelids and glanced timidly at the cushioned pew in the chancel. There was no one but old Mr. Donathorne rubbing his spectacles with his white handkerchief, and Miss Lydia opening the large gilt-edged prayer book. The chill disappointment was too hard to bear. She felt herself turning pale, her lips trembling. She was ready to cry. Oh, what should she do? Everybody would know the reason. They would know she was crying because Arthur was not there. And Mr. Craig, with the wonderful hot-house plant in his buttonhole, was staring at her, she knew. It was dreadfully long before the general confession began, so that she could kneel down. Two great drops would fall then, but no one saw them except good-natured Molly, for her aunt and uncle knelt with their backs towards her. Molly, unable to imagine any cause for tears in church except faintness, of which she had a vague traditional knowledge, drew out of her pocket a queer little flat blue smelling bottle, and after much labor in pulling the cork out, thrust the narrow neck under Hetty's nostrils. "'It don't smell,' she whispered, thinking this was a great advantage which old salts had over fresh ones. They did you good without biting your nose. Hetty pushed it away peevishly. But this little flash of temper did what the salts could not have done. It roused her to wipe away the traces of her tears, and try with all her might not to shed any more. Hetty had a certain strength in her vain little nature. She would have borne anything rather than be laughed at, or pointed at with any other feeling than admiration. She would have pressed her own nails into her tender flesh rather than people should know a secret she did not want them to know. What fluctuations there were in her busy thoughts and feelings while Mr. Irwine was pronouncing the solemn absolution in her deaf ears, and through all the tones of petition that followed. Anger lay very close to disappointment, and soon won the victory over the conjectures her small ingenuity could devise to account for Arthur's absence on the supposition that he really wanted to come, really wanted to see her again. And by the time she rose from her knees mechanically, because all the rest were rising, the color had returned to her cheeks even with a heightened glow, for she was framing little indignant speeches to herself, saying she hated Arthur for giving her this pain, she would like him to suffer too. Yet while this selfish tumult was going on in her soul, her eyes were bent down on her prayer book, and the eyelids with their dark fringe looked as lovely as ever. Adam Bede thought so, as he glanced at her for a moment on rising from his knees. But Adam's thoughts of Hetty did not deafen him to the service. They rather blended with all the other deep feelings for which the church service was a channel to him this afternoon, as a certain consciousness of our entire past and our imagined future blends itself with all our moments of keen sensibility. And to Adam the church service was the best channel he could have found for his mingled regret, yearning, and resignation. Its interchange of beseeching cries for help with outbursts of faith and praise, its recurrent responses and the familiar rhythm of its collects, seemed to speak for him as no other form of worship could have done. As to those early Christians who had worshipped from their childhood upwards in catacombs, the torchlight and shadows must have seemed nearer the divine presence than the heathenish daylight of the streets. The secret of our emotions never lies in the bare object, but in its subtle relations to our own past. No wonder the secret escapes the unsympathizing observer, who might as well put on his spectacles to discern odors. But there was one reason why even a chance-comer would have found the service in Hayslope Church more impressive than in most other village nooks in the kingdom, a reason of which I am sure you have not the slightest suspicion. It was the reading of our friend Joshua Rann. Where that good shoemaker got his notion of reading from remained a mystery even to his most intimate acquaintances. I believe, after all, he got it chiefly from nature, who had poured some of her music into this honest, conceited soul as she had been known to do into other narrow souls before his. She had given him, at least, a fine bass voice and a musical ear, but I cannot positively say what he's alone with the rich chant in which he delivered the responses. The way he rolled from a rich, deep forte into a melancholy cadence, subsiding at the end of the last word into a sort of faint resonance, like the lingering vibrations of a fine violoncello. I can compare to nothing for its strong, calm melancholy but the rush and cadence of the wind among the autumn boughs. This may seem a strange mode of speaking about the reading of a parish clerk, a man in rusty spectacles with stubbly hair, a large occiput, and a prominent crown. But that is nature's way. 
she will allow a gentleman of splendid physiognomy and poetic aspirations to sing woefully out of tune and not give him the slightest hint of it and takes care that some narrow-browed fellow trolling a ballad in the corner of a pot-house shall be as true to his intervals as a bird joshua himself was less proud of his reading than of his singing and it was always with a sense of heightened importance that he passed from the desk to the choir still more to-day it was a special occasion for an old man familiar to all the parish had died a sad death not in his bed a circumstantial to the mind of the peasant and now the funeral psalm was to be sung in memory of his sudden departure moreover barthy was not at church and joshua's importance in the choir suffered no eclipse it was a solemn minor strain they sang the old psalm tunes have many a wail among them and the words thou sweep'st the song as with the flood we vanish hence like dreams seem to have a closer application than usual in the death of poor thias the mother and sons listened each with peculiar feelings lisbeth had a vague belief that the psalm was doing her husband good it was part of that decent burial which she would have thought it a greater wrong to withhold from him than to have caused him many unhappy days while he was living the more there was said about her husband the more there was done for him surely the safer he would be it was poor lisbeth's blind way of feeling that human love and pity are a ground of faith in some other love seth who was easily touched shed tears and tried to recall as he had done continually since his father's death all that he had heard of the possibility that a single moment of consciousness at the last might be a moment of pardon and reconcilement for was it not written in the very psalm they were singing that the divine dealings were not measured and circumscribed by time adam had never been unable to join in a psalm before he had known plenty of trouble and vexation since he had been a lad but this was the first sorrow that had hemmed in his voice and strangely enough it was sorrow because the chief source of his past trouble and vexation was forever gone out of his reach he had not been able to press his father's hand before their parting and say father you know it was all right between us i never forgot what i owed you when i was a lad you forgive me if i have been too hot and hasty now and then adam thought but little to-day of the hard work and the earnings he had spent on his father his thoughts ran constantly on what the old man's feelings had been in moments of humiliation when he had held down his head before the rebukes of his son when our indignation is borne in submissive silence we are apt to feel twinges of doubt afterwards as to our own generosity if not justice how much more when the object of our anger has gone into everlasting silence and we have seen his face for the last time in the meekness of death ah i was always too hard adam said to himself it's a sore fault in me as i'm so hot and out of patience with people when they do wrong and my heart gets shut up against em so as i can't bring myself to forgive em i see clear enough there's more pride nor love in my soul for i could sooner make a thousand strokes with the hammer for my father than bring myself to say a kind word to him and there went plenty of pride and temper to the strokes as the devil will be having his finger in what we call our duties as well as our sins mayhap the best thing i ever did in my life was only doing what was easiest for myself it's always been easier for me to work nor to sit still but the real tough job for me would be to master my own will and temper and go right against my own pride it seems to me now if i was to find father at home to-night i should behave different but there's no knowing perhaps nothing would be a lesson to us if it didn't come too late it's well we should feel as life's a reckoning we can't make twice over there's no real making amends in this world any more nor you can mend a wrong subtraction by doing your addition right this was the keynote to which adam's thoughts had perpetually returned since his father's death and the solemn wail of the funeral psalm was only an influence that brought back the old thoughts with stronger emphasis so was the sermon which mr irwine had chosen with reference to thias's funeral it spoke briefly and simply of the words in the midst of life we are in death how the present moment is all we can call our own for works of mercy of righteous dealing and of family tenderness all very old truths but what we thought the oldest truth becomes the most startling to us in the week when we have looked on the dead face of one who has made a part of our own lives 
for when men want to impress us with the effect of a new and wonderfully vivid light do they not let it fall on the most familiar objects that we may measure its intensity by remembering the former dimness then came the moment of the final blessing when the forever sublime words the peace of god which passeth all understanding seemed to blend with the calm afternoon sunshine that fell on the bowed heads of the congregation and then the quiet rising the mothers tying on the bonnets of the little maidens who had slept through the sermon the fathers collecting the prayer books until all streamed out through the old archway into the green churchyard and began their neighborly talk their simple civilities and their invitations to tea for on a sunday every one was ready to receive a guest it was the day when all must be in their best clothes and their best humor mr and mrs poyser paused a minute at the church gate they were waiting for adam to come up not being contented to go away without saying a kind word to the widow and her sons well mrs bede said mrs poyser as they walked on together you must keep up your heart husbands and wives must be content when they've lived to rear their children and see one another's hair gray ay ay said mr poyser they wanna have long to wait for one another then anyhow and you've got two of the strappinest sons o the country and well you may for i remember poor thias as fine a broad-shouldered fellow as need to be and as for you mrs bede why you're straighter of a back nor half the young women now eh said lisbeth it's poor luck for the platter to wear well when it's broke a too the sooner i'm laid under the thorn the better i'm no good to nobody now adam never took notice of his mother's little unjust plaints but seth said nay mother thee mustna say so thy sons'll never get another mother that's true lad that's true said mr poyser and it's wrong on us to give way to grief mrs bede for it's like the children cryin when the fathers and mothers take things from em there's one above knows better nor us ah said mrs poyser and it's poor work allays settin the dead above the livin it'd be better if folks ud make much on us beforehand istead o beginnin when we're gone it's but little good you'll do a water in the last year's crop well adam said mr poyser feeling that his wife's words were as usual rather incisive than soothing and that it would be well to change the subject you'll come and see us again now i hope i hanna had a talk with you this long while and the missus here wants you to see what can be done with her best spinnin wheel for it's got broke and it'll be a nice job to mend it they'll want a bit o turnin you'll come as soon as you can now will you mr poyser paused and looked around while he was speaking as if to see where hetty was for the children were running on before hetty was not without a companion and she had besides more pink and white about her than ever for she held in her hand the wonderful pink and white hothouse plant with a very long name a scotch name she supposed since people said mr craig the gardener was scotch adam took the opportunity of looking round too and i am sure you will not require of him that he should feel any vexation in observing a pouting expression on hetty's face as she listened to the gardener's small talk yet in her secret heart she was glad to have him by her side for she would perhaps learn from him how it was arthur had not come to church not that she cared to ask him the question but she hoped the information would be given spontaneously for mr craig like a superior man was very fond of giving information mr craig was never aware that his conversation and advances were received coldly for to shift one's point of view beyond certain limits is impossible to the most liberal and expansive mind we are none of us aware of the impression we produce on brazilian monkeys of feeble understanding it is possible they see hardly anything in us moreover mr craig was a man of sober passions and was already in his tenth year of hesitation as to the relative advantages of matrimony and bachelorhood it is true that now and then when he had been a little heated by an extra glass of grog he had been heard to say of hetty that the lass was well enough and that a man might do worse but on convivial occasions men are apt to express themselves strongly martin poyser held mr craig in honour as a man who knew his business and who had great lights concerning soils and compost but he was less of a favourite with mrs poyser who had more than once said in confidence to her husband you're mighty fond o craig but for my part i think he's welly like a cock as thinks the sun's rose a purpose to hear him crow for the rest mr craig was an estimable gardener and was not without reasons for having a high opinion of himself he had also high shoulders and high cheekbones and hung his head forward a little as he walked along with his hands in his breeches pockets i think it was his pedigree only that had the advantage of being scotch and not his bringing up 
for except that he had a stronger burr in his accent, his speech differed little from that of the Loamshire people about him. But a gardener is Scotch, as a French teacher is Parisian. "'Well, Mr. Poyser,' he said, before the good slow farmer had time to speak, "'you'll not be carrying your hay to-morrow, I'm thinking. The glass sticks at change, and you may rely upon my word as will have more a downfall afore twenty-four hours is past. You see that darkish blue cloud there upon the horizon. You know what I mean by the horizon, where the land and sky seems to meet. Ay, ay, I see the cloud, said Mr. Poyser, risin' or no risin'. It's right o'er my Coldsworth's fallow, and a foul fellow it is. Well, you mark my words, as that cloud'll spread o'er the sky pretty nigh as quick as you'd spread a tarpaulin over one o' your hayricks. It's a great thing to a study the look o' the clouds. Lord bless you. The meteorological almanacs can learn me nothing, but there's a pretty sight of things I could let them up to if they'd just come to me. And how are you, Mrs. Poyser? Thinking o' gathering the red currants soon, I reckon? You'd a deal better gather em afore they're o'er ripe, with such weather as we got to look forward to. How do you do, Mistress Bede? Mr. Craig continued, without a pause, nodding, by the way, to Adam and Seth. I hope you enjoyed them spinach and gooseberries as I sent Chester with the other day. If you want vegetables while you're in trouble, you know where to come to. It's well known I'm not giving other folks things away, for when I've supplied the house the garden is my own speculation, and it isn't every man the old squire could get as'd be equal to the undertaking, let alone asking whether he'd be willing. I've got to run my calculation fine, I can tell you, to make sure o' getting back the money as I pay the squire. I should like to see some o' them fellows as make the almanacs looking as far before their noses as I've got to do every year as comes. They look pretty fur, though, said Mr. Poyser, turning his head on one side and speaking in rather a subdued reverential tone. Why, what could come truer nor that picture o' the cock with the big spurs, as has got its head knocked down with the anchor, and the firin' and the ships behind? Why, that picture was made afore Christmas, and yet it's come as true as the Bible. Why, the cock's France, and the anchor's Nelson, and they told us that beforehand. Pee said Mr. Craig. A man does not want to see fur as to know the English will beat the French. Why, I know upon good authority, as it's a big Frenchman as reaches five foot high, and they live upon spoon-meat mostly. I knew a man as his father had a particular knowledge of the French. I should like to know what them grasshoppers are to do against such fine fellows as our young Captain Arthur. Why, it did astonish a Frenchman only to look at him. His arms thicker nor a Frenchman's body, I'll be bound, for they pinch their cells in with stays, and it's easy enough, for they got nothing on their insides. Where is the captain as he wasn't at church to-day? said Adam. I was talking to him a Friday, and he said nothing about his going away. Oh, he's only gone to Eagledale for a bit of fishing. I reckon he'll be back again afore many days are o'er, for he's to be at all the arranging and preparing o' things for the coming age o' the thirtieth of July. But he's fond o' getting away for a bit now and then. Him and the old squire fit one another like frost and flowers. Mr. Craig smiled and winked slowly as he made this last observation, but the subject was not developed farther, for now they had reached the turning in the road where Adam and his companions must say good-bye. The gardener, too, would have had to turn off in the same direction, if he had not accepted Mr. Poyser's invitation to tea. Mrs. Poyser duly seconded the invitation, for she would have held it a deep disgrace not to make her neighbors welcome to her house. Personal likes and dislikes must not interfere with that sacred custom. Moreover, Mr. Craig had always been full of civilities to the family at the Hall Farm, and Mrs. Poyser was scrupulous in declaring that she had— Nothing to say again him, only it was a pity he couldn't be hatched o'er again and hatched different. So Adam and Seth, with their mother between them, wound their way down to the valley and up again to the old house, where a saddened memory had taken the place of a long, long anxiety, where Adam would never have to ask again as he entered, Where's father? And the other family party, with Mr. Craig for company, went back to the pleasant, bright house place at the Hall Farm all with quiet minds except Hetty, who knew now where Arthur was gone, but was only the more puzzled and uneasy. For it appeared that his absence was quite voluntary. He need not have gone. He would not have gone if he had wanted to see her. She had a sickening sense that no lot could ever be pleasant to her again if her Thursday night's vision was not to be fulfilled. And in this moment of chill, bare, wintry disappointment and doubt, she looked towards the possibility of being with Arthur again, of meeting his loving glance, and hearing his soft words with that eager yearning which one may call the growing pain of passion. 
End of chapter 18「Adam Bede. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Missy. Guangzhou, China. Adam Bede by George Eliot. Chapter 19. Adam on a Working Day. Notwithstanding Mr. Craig's prophecy, the dark blue cloud dispersed itself without having produced the threatened consequences. The weather, as he observed the next morning, the weather, you see, is a ticklish thing, and a fool will hit on it sometimes when a wise man misses. That's why the almanacs get so much credit. It's one of them chancy things as fools thrive on. This unreasonable behavior of the weather, however, could displease no one else in Hayslope besides Mr. Craig. All hands were to be out in the meadows this morning as soon as the dew had risen, the wives and daughters did double work in every farmhouse, that the maids might give their help in tossing the hay, and when Adam was marching along the lanes with his basket of tools over his shoulder, he caught the sound of jocose talk and ringing laughter from behind the hedges. The jocose talk of haymakers is best at a distance. Like those clumsy bells round the cow's necks, it has a rather coarse sound when it comes close, and may even grate on your ears painfully, but heard from far off, it mingles very prettily with the other joyous sounds of nature. Men's muscles move better when their souls are making merry music, though their merriment is of a poor blundering sort, not at all like the merriment of birds. And perhaps there is no time in a summer's day more cheering than when the warmth of the sun is just beginning to triumph over the freshness of the morning, when there is just a lingering hint of early coolness to keep off languor under the delicious influence of warmth. The reason Adam was walking along the lanes at this time was because his work for the rest of the day lay at a country house about three miles off, which was being put in repair for the son of a neighboring squire, and he had been busy since early morning with the packing of panels, doors, and chimney pieces in a wagon, which was now gone on before him, while Jonathan Burge himself had ridden to the spot on horseback to await its arrival and direct the workmen. This little walk was a rest to Adam, and he was unconsciously under the charm of the moment. It was a summer morning in his heart and he saw Hetty in the sunshine, a sunshine without glare, with slanting rays that tremble between the delicate shadows of the leaves. He thought, yesterday, when he put out his hand to her as they came out of church, that there was a touch of melancholy kindness in her face, such as he had not seen before, and he took it as a sign that she had some sympathy with his family trouble. Poor fellow! That touch of melancholy came from quite another source, but how was he to know? We look at the one little woman's face we love as we look at the face of our mother earth and see all sorts of answers to our own yearnings. It was impossible for Adam not to feel that what had happened in the last week had brought the prospect of marriage nearer to him. Hitherto he had felt keenly the danger that some other man might step in and get possession of Hetty's heart and hand while he himself was still in a position that made him shrink from asking her to accept him even if he had had a strong hope that she was fond of him, and his hope was far from being strong. He had been too heavily burdened with other claims to provide a home for himself and Hetty, a home such as he could expect her to be content with, after the comfort and plenty of the farm. Like all strong natures, Adam had confidence in his ability to achieve something in the future. He felt sure he should some day, if he lived, be able to maintain a family and make a good broad path for himself but he had too cool a head not to estimate to the full the obstacles that were to be overcome. And the time would be so long. And there was Hetty, like a bright-cheeked apple hanging over the orchard wall, within sight of everybody, and everybody must long for her. To be sure, if she loved him very much, she would be content to wait for him. But did she love him? His hopes had never risen so high that he had dared to ask her. He was clear-sighted enough to be aware that her uncle and aunt would have looked kindly on his suit, and indeed without this encouragement he would never have persevered in going to the farm. But it was impossible to come to any but fluctuating conclusions about Hetty's feelings. She was like a kitten, and had the same distractingly pretty looks that meant nothing for everybody that came near her. But now he could not help saying to himself that the heaviest part of his burden was removed, 
and that even before the end of another year his circumstances might be brought into a shape that would allow him to think of marrying. It would always be a hard struggle with his mother, he knew. She would be jealous of any wife he might choose, and she had set her mind especially against Hetty, perhaps for no other reason than that she suspected Hetty to be the woman he had chosen. It would never do, he feared, for his mother to live in the same house with him when he was married, and yet how hard she would think it if he asked her to leave him. Yes, there was a great deal of pain to be gone through with his mother, but it was a case in which he must make her feel that his will was strong. It would be better for her in the end. For himself he would have liked that they should all live together till Seth was married, and they might have built a bit themselves to the old house and made more room. He did not like to part with the lad. They had hardly ever been separated for more than a day since they were born. But Adam had no sooner caught his imagination leaping forward in this way, making arrangements for an uncertain future, than he checked himself. A pretty building I'm making without either bricks or timber. I'm up at the garret already, and I haven't so much as dug the foundation. Whenever Adam was strongly convinced of any proposition, it took the form of a principle in his mind. It was knowledge to be acted on, as much as the knowledge that damp will cause rust. Perhaps here lay the secret of the hardness he had accused himself of. He had too little fellow-feeling with the weakness that errs in spite of foreseen consequences. Without this fellow-feeling, how are we to get enough patience and charity towards our stumbling, falling companions in the long and changeful journey? And there is but one way in which a strong, determined soul can learn it, by getting his heart-strings bound round the weak and erring, so that he must share not only the outward consequence of their error, but their inward suffering. That is a long and hard lesson, and Adam had at present only learned the alphabet of it in his father's sudden death, which, by annihilating in an instant all that had stimulated his indignation, had sent a sudden rush of thought and memory over what had claimed his pity and tenderness. But it was Adam's strength, not its correlative hardness, that influenced his meditations this morning. He had long made up his mind that it would be wrong as well as foolish for him to marry a blooming young girl, so long as he had no other prospect than that of growing poverty with a growing family. And his savings had been so constantly drawn upon, besides the terrible sweep of paying for Seth's substitute in the militia, that he had not enough money beforehand to furnish even a small cottage, and keep something in reserve against a rainy day. He had good hope that he should be firmer on his legs by and by, but he could not be satisfied with a vague confidence in his arm and brain. He must have definite plans, and set about them at once. The partnership with Jonathan Burge was not to be thought of at present. There were things implicitly tacked to it that he could not accept. But Adam thought that he and Seth might carry on a little business for themselves, in addition to their journeyman's work, by buying a small stock of superior wood, and making articles of household furniture, for which Adam had no end of contrivances. Seth might gain more by working at separate jobs under Adam's direction than by his journeyman's work, and Adam in his over-hours could do all the nice work that required peculiar skill. The money gained in this way, with the good wages he received as foreman, would soon enable them to get beforehand with the world, so sparingly as they would all live now. No sooner had this little plan shaped itself in his mind than he began to be busy with exact calculations about the wood to be bought and the particular article of furniture that should be undertaken first, a kitchen cupboard of his own contrivance, with such an ingenious arrangement of sliding doors and bolts, such convenient nooks for stowing household provender, and such a symmetrical result to the eye, that every good housewife would be in raptures with it and fall through all the gradations of melancholy longing till her husband promised to buy it for her. Adam pictured to himself Mrs. Poyser examining it with her keen eye and trying in vain to find out a deficiency. And, of course, close to Mrs. Poyser stood Hetty, and Adam was again beguiled from calculations and contrivances into dreams and hopes. Yes, he would go and see her this evening. It was so long since he had been at the hall farm. He would have liked to go to the night school to see why Bartle Massey had not been at church yesterday, for he feared his old friend was ill. But unless he could manage both visits, this last must be put off till to-morrow. The desire to be near Hetty and to speak to her again was too strong. As he made up his mind to this, he was coming very near to the end of his walk, within the sound of the hammers at work on the refitting of the old house. The sound of tools to a clever workman who loves his work is like the tentative sounds of the orchestra to the violinist who has to bear his part in the overture. 
the strong fibres begin their accustomed thrill, and what was a moment before joy, vexation, or ambition begins its change into energy. All passion becomes strength when it has an outlet from the narrow limits of our personal lot, in the labour of our right arm, the cunning of our right hand, or the still creative activity of our thought. Look at Adam through the rest of the day as he stands on the scaffolding with the two-feet ruler in his hand, whistling low while he considers how a difficulty about a floor-joist or a window-frame is to be overcome, or as he pushes one of the younger workmen aside and takes his place in upheaving a weight of timber, saying, Let alone, lad, thee's got too much gristle o' thy bones yet, or as he fixes his keen black eyes on the motions of a workman on the other side of the room and warns him that his distances are not right. Look at this broad-shouldered man with the bare muscular arms and the thick, firm black hair, tossed about like trodden meadow-grass whenever he takes off his paper cap, and with the strong baritone voice bursting every now and then into loud and solemn psalm tunes, as of seeking an outlet for superfluous strength, yet presently checking himself, apparently crossed by some thought which jars with the singing. Perhaps, if you had not been already in the secret, you might not have guessed what sad memories, what warm affection, what tender, fluttering hopes, had their home in this athletic body with the broken fingernails, in this rough man, who knew no better lyrics than he could find in the old and new version and an occasional hymn, who knew the smallest possible amount of profane history, and for whom the motion and shape of the earth, the course of the sun, and the changes of the seasons, lay in the region of mystery just made visible by fragmentary knowledge. It had cost Adam a great deal of trouble and his work in over-hours to know what he knew, over and above the secrets of his handicraft, and that acquaintance with mechanics and figures and the nature of the materials he worked with, which was made easy to him by inborn inherited faculty, to get the mastery of his pen and write a plain hand, to spell without any other mistakes than must in fairness be attributed to the unreasonable character of orthography rather than to any deficiency in the speller, and moreover to learn his musical notes and part singing. Besides all this, he had read his Bible, including the apocryphal books, Poor Richard's Almanac, Taylor's Holy Living and Dying, The Pilgrim's Progress with Bunyan's Life and Holy War, a great deal of Bailey's Dictionary, Valentine and Orson, and part of a history of Babylon, which Bartle Massey had lent him. He might have had many more books from Bartle Massey, but he had no time for reading The Common Print, as Lisbeth called it, so busy as he was with figures in all the leisure moments which he did not fill up with extra carpentry. Adam, you perceive, was by no means a marvellous man, nor, properly speaking, a genius. Yet I will not pretend that his was an ordinary character among workmen, and it would not be at all a safe conclusion that the next best man you may happen to see, with a basket of tools over his shoulder and a paper cap on his head, has the strong conscience and the strong sense, the blended susceptibility and self-command of our friend Adam. He was not an average man. Yet such men as he are reared here and there in every generation of our peasant artisans, with an inheritance of affections nurtured by a simple family life, of common need and common industry, and an inheritance of faculties trained in skilful, courageous labor. They make their way upwards, rarely as geniuses, most commonly as painstaking, honest men, with the skill and conscience to do well the tasks that lie before them. Their lives have no discernible echo beyond the neighborhood where they dwelt, but you are almost sure to find there some good piece of road, some building, some application of mineral produce, some improvement in farming practice, some reform of parish abuses, with which their names are associated by one or two generations after them. Their employers were the richer for them, the work of their hands has worn well, and the work of their brains has guided well the hands of other men. They went about in their youth in flannel or paper caps, in coats black with coal dust or streaked with lime and red paint. In old age their white hairs are seen in a place of honor at church and at market, and they tell their well-dressed sons and daughters, seated round the bright hearth on winter evenings, how pleased they were when they first earned their two pence a day. Others there are who die poor and never put off the workman's coal on weekdays. They have not had the art of getting rich, but they are men of trust, and when they die before the work is all out of them, it is as if some main screw had got loose in a machine. The master who employed them says, Where shall I find their like? End of chapter 19
Chapter Twenty of Adam Bede. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Missy, Guangzhou, China. Adam Bede by George Eliot. Chapter Twenty. Adam visits the Hall Farm. Adam came back from his work in the empty wagon. That was why he had changed his clothes, and was ready to set out to the hall farm when it still wanted a quarter to seven. "'What's thee got thy Sunday clothes on for?' said Lisbeth complainingly, as he came downstairs. "'Thee art no going to the school i thy best coat.' "'No, mother,' said Adam quietly. "'I'm going to the hall farm, but mayhap I may go to the school after, so thee must no wonder if I'm a bit late. Seth'll be at home in half an hour. He's only gone to the village.' so thee wouldn't a mind. Eh, and what's thee got thy best clothes on for to go to the hall farm? The poiser folks seed thee in them yesterday, I warrant. What dost mean by turnin' work a day into Sunday of Adam? It's poor keepin' company with folks as don't like to see thee in thy workin' jacket. Good-bye, mother, I can't stay, said Adam, putting on his hat and going out. But he had no sooner gone a few paces beyond the door than Lisbeth became uneasy at the thought that she had vexed him. Of course, the secret of her objection to the best clothes was her suspicion that they were put on for Hetty's sake. But deeper than all her peevishness lay the need that her son should love her. She hurried after him and laid hold of his arm before he had got halfway down to the brook, and said, "'Nay, my lad, thee wouldn't go away angered with thy mother, and her got not to do but to sit by her son and think on thee?' "'Nay, nay, mother,' said Adam gravely, and standing still while he put his arm on her shoulder, "'I'm not angered.' "'But I wish for thy own sake thee'dst be more contented "'to let me do what I've made up my mind to do. "'I'll never be no other than a good son to thee as long as we live. "'But a man has other feelings besides what he owes to his father and mother, "'and thee ought not to want to rule over me body and soul. "'And thee must make up thy mind as I'll not give way to thee "'where I've a right to do what I like. "'So let us have no more words about it.' "'Eh,' hey, said Lisbeth, not willing to show that she felt the real bearing of Adam's words, "'And who likes to see thee thy best clothes better nor thy mother? "'And when thee's got thy face washed, and clean as the smooth white pibble, "'and thy hair combs so nice, and thy eyes a-sparkling, "'what else is there as thy old mother should like to look at half so well? "'And thee shan't put on thy Sunday clothes when thee likes for me, "'and I'll ne'er plague thee no more about him. "'Well, well. "'Good-bye, mother,' said Adam, kissing her and hurrying away. "'He saw there was no other means of putting an end to the dialogue.' Lisbeth stood still on the spot, shading her eyes and looking after him till he was quite out of sight. She felt to the full all the meaning that had lain in Adam's words, and as she lost sight of him and turned back slowly into the house, she said aloud to herself, for it was her way to speak her thoughts aloud in the long days when her husband and sons were at their work, "'Hey, he'll be telling me as he's going to bring her home one of these days, and she'll be Mrs. Ormy, and I mun look on belike while she uses the blue-edged platters and breaks them mayhap. "'Though there's ne'er been one broke sin my old man and me brought him at the county fair. Twenty year come next to Whistentide. "'Hey,' she went on still louder, as she caught up her knitting from the table. "'But she'll ne'er knit the lad's stockings, nor foot him neither, while I live. "'And when I'm gone he'll be thinking as nobody'll ne'er fit his leg and foot as his old mother did. "'She'll know nothing a narrowing and healing, I'll warrant, "'and she'll make a long toe as he cannot get his boots on. "'That's what comes of marrying young wenches.' I were gone thirty, and the feyther too, afore we were married, and young enough too. She'll be a poor drachel by then she's thirty, a Marian a that un, afore her tea shall come. Adam walked so fast that he was at the yard gate before seven. Martin Poyser and the grandfather were not yet come in from the meadow. Everyone was in the meadow, even to the black and tan terrier. No one kept watch in the yard but the bulldog. And when Adam reached the house door, which stood wide open, he saw there was no one in the bright, clean house place. But he guessed where Mrs. Poyser and some one else would be, quite within hearing, so he knocked on the door and said in his strong voice, "'Mrs. Poyser within! Come in, Mr. Bede, come in!' Mrs. Poyser called out from the dairy. She always gave Adam this title when she received him in her own house. "'You may come into the dairy, if you will, for I cannot justly leave the cheese.' Adam walked into the dairy, where Mrs. Poyser and Nancy were crushing the first evening cheese. "'Why, you might think you are come to a dead house,' said Mrs. Poyser, as he stood in the open doorway. "'They're all in the meadow, but Martin's sure to be in afore long, for they're leaving the haycock to-night ready for carrying first thing to-morrow, 
I've been forced to have Nancy in, up account as Caddy must gather the red currants to-night. The fruit always ripens so contrary, just when every hand's wanted, and there's no trust in the children to gather it, for they put more into their own mouths nor into the basket. You might as well set the wasps to gather the fruit. Adam longed to say he would go into the garden till Mr. Poyser came in, but he was not quite courageous enough. So he said, I could be looking at your spinning wheel then and see what wants do into it. Perhaps it stands in the house where I can find it. No, I've put it away in the right-hand parlour, but let it be till I can fetch it and show it to you. I'd be glad now if you'd run into the garden and tell Hetty to send Totty in. The child'll run in if she's told, and I know Hetty's letting her eat too many currants. I'll be much obliged to you, Mr. Bede, if you'll go and send her in. And there's the York and Lancaster roses beautiful in the garden now. You like to see em. But you'd like a drink away first, perhaps. I know you're fond away, as most folks is when they hanna got to crush it out. Thank you, Mrs. Poyser, said Adam. A drink away's always a treat to me. I'd rather have it than beer any day. Ay, ay, said Mrs. Poyser, reaching a small white basin that stood on the shelf and dipping it into the whey tub. The smell of bread's sweet to everybody but the baker. The misser wines always say, Oh, Mrs. Poyser, I envy you your dairy, and I envy you your chickens, and what a beautiful thing a farmhouse is, to be sure. And I say, Yes, a farmhouse is a fine thing for them as look on, and don't know the lifting and the standing and the worritin of the inside as belongs to it. "'Why, Mrs. Poyser, you wouldn't like to live anywhere else but in a farmhouse so well as you manage it,' said Adam, taking the basin. "'And there can be nothing to look at pleasanter nor a fine milk cow, standing up to its knees in pasture, and the new milk frothing in the pail, and the fresh butter ready for market, and the calves and the poultry. Here's to your health, and may you always have strength to look after your own dairy and set a pattern to all the farmers' wives in the country.' Mrs. Poyser was not to be caught in the weakness of smiling at a compliment but a quiet complacency overspread her face like a stealing sunbeam, and gave a milder glance than usual to her blue-gray eyes, as she looked at Adam drinking the whey. Ah, I think I taste that whey now, with a flavor so delicate that one can hardly distinguish it from an odor, and with that soft, gliding warmth that fills one's imagination with a still, happy dreaminess. And the light music of the dropping whey is in my ears, mingling with the twittering of a bird outside the wire network window the window overlooking the garden, and shaded by tall gelder roses. "'Have a little more, Mr. Bede,' said Mrs. Poyser, as Adam set down the basin. "'No, thank you. I'll go into the garden now, and send in the little lass. "'I do, and tell her to come to her mother in the dairy.' Adam walked round by the rickyard, at present empty of ricks, to the little wooden gate leading into the garden, once the well-tended kitchen garden of a manor-house. Now, but for the handsome brick wall with stone coping that ran along one side of it, a true farmhouse garden, with hardy perennial flowers, unpruned fruit trees, and kitchen vegetables growing together in careless, half-neglected abundance. In that leafy, flowery, bushy time, to look for anyone in this garden was like playing at hide-and-seek. There were the tall hollyhocks beginning to flower and dazzle the eye, with their pink, white, and yellow. There were the syringias and gelder roses, all large and disorderly for want of trimming. There were leafy walls of scarlet beans and late peas. There was a row of bushy filberts in one direction, and in another a huge apple tree making a barren circle under its low-spreading boughs. But what signified a barren patch or two? The garden was so large. There was always a superfluity of broad beans. It took nine or ten of Adam's strides to get to the end of the uncut grass walk that ran by the side of them. And as for other vegetables, there was so much more room than was necessary for them, that in the rotation of crops a large flourishing bed of groundsel was of yearly occurrence on one spot or other. The very rose trees at which Adam stopped to pluck one looked as if they grew wild. They were all huddled together in bushy masses, now flaunting with wide open petals, almost all of them of the streaked pink and white kind which doubtless dated from the union of the houses of York and Lancaster. Adam was wise enough to choose a compact province rose that peeped out, half smothered by its flaunting scentless neighbors, and held it in his hand. He thought he should be more at ease holding something in his hand, as he walked on to the far end of the garden, where he remembered there was the largest row of currant trees, not far off from the great yew-tree arbor. But he had not gone many steps beyond the roses when he heard the shaking of a bough, and a boy's voice saying, "'Now then, Totty, hold out your penny, there's a duck.' The voice came from the boughs of a tall cherry tree, where Adam had no difficulty in discerning a small blue pinafored figure perched in a commodious position where the fruit was thickest. 
doubtless Toddy was below, behind this screen of peas. Yes, with her bonnet hanging down her back, and her fat face, dreadfully smeared with red juice, turned up towards the cherry tree, while she held her little round hole of a mouth, and her red-stained pinafore, to receive the promised downfall. I am sorry to say, more than half the cherries that fell were hard and yellow, instead of juicy and red, but Toddy spent no time in useless regrets, and she was already sucking the third juiciest when Adam said, "'There now, Toddy, you've got your cherries. Run into the house with them to mother. She wants you. She's in the dairy. Run in this minute, there's a good little girl.' He lifted her up in his strong arms and kissed her as he spoke, a ceremony which Toddy regarded as a tiresome interruption to cherry-eating, and when he set her down she trotted off quite silently towards the house, sucking her cherries as she went along. "'Tommy, my lad, take care you're not shot for a little thieving bird,' said Adam, as he walked on towards the currant trees. He could see there was a large basket at the end of the row. Hetty would not be far off, and Adam already felt as if she were looking at him. Yet when he turned the corner she was standing with her back towards him, and stooping to gather the low-hanging fruit. Strange that she had not heard him coming. Perhaps it was because she was making the leaves rustle. She started when she became conscious that someone was near— started so violently that she dropped the basin with the currants in it, and then, when she saw it was Adam, she turned from pale to deep red. That blush made his heart beat with a new happiness. Hetty had never blushed at seeing him before. "'I frightened you,' he said, with a delicious sense that it didn't signify what he said, since Hetty seemed to feel as much as he did. "'Let me pick the currants up.' That was soon done, for they had only fallen in a tangled mass on the grass plot and Adam, as he rose and gave her the basin again, looked straight into her eyes with the subdued tenderness that belongs to the first moments of hopeful love. Hetty did not turn away her eyes. Her blush had subsided, and she met his glance with a quiet sadness, which contented Adam because it was so unlike anything he had seen in her before. "'There's not many more currants to get,' she said. "'I shall soon have done now.' "'I'll help you,' said Adam." and he fetched a large basket, which was nearly full of currants, and set it close to them. Not a word more was spoken as they gathered the currants. Adam's heart was too full to speak, and he thought Hetty knew all that was in it. She was not indifferent to his presence after all. She had blushed when she saw him, and then there was that touch of sadness about her, which must surely mean love, since it was the opposite of her usual manner, which had often impressed him as indifference and he could glance at her continually as she bent over the fruit, while the level evening sunbeams stole through the thick apple-tree boughs, and rested on her round cheek and neck as if they too were in love with her. It was, to Adam, the time that a man can least forget in after-life, the time when he believes that the first woman he has ever loved betrays, by a slight something, a word, a tone, a glance, the quivering of a lip or an eyelid, that she is at least beginning to love him in return. The sign is so slight it is scarcely perceptible to the ear or eye. He could describe it to no one. It is a mere feather touch, yet it seems to have changed his whole being, to have merged an uneasy yearning into a delicious unconsciousness of everything but the present moment. So much of our early gladness vanishes utterly from our memory. We can never recall the joy with which we laid our heads on our mother's bosom, or rode on our father's back in childhood. Doubtless that joy is brought up into our nature— as the sunlight of long past mornings is wrought up in the soft mellowness of the apricot. But it is gone forever from our imagination, and we can only believe in the joy of childhood. But the first glad moment in our first love is a vision which returns to us to the last, and brings with it a thrill of feeling intense and special as the recurrent sensation of a sweet odor breathed in a far-off hour of happiness. It is a memory that gives a more exquisite touch to tenderness, that feeds the madness of jealousy and adds the last keenness to the agony of despair. Hetty bending over the red bunches, the level rays piercing the screen of apple-tree boughs, the length of bushy garden beyond, his own emotion as he looked at her and believed that she was thinking of him, and that there was no need for them to talk. Adam remembered it all to the last moment of his life. And Hetty? You know quite well that Adam was mistaken about her. Like many other men, he thought the signs of love for another were signs of love towards himself. When Adam was approaching unseen by her, she was absorbed, as usual, in thinking and wondering about Arthur's possible return. The sound of any man's footstep would have affected her just in the same way, 
she would have felt it might be Arthur before she had time to see, and the blood that forsook her cheek in the agitation of that momentary feeling would have rushed back again at the sight of any one else, just as much as at the sight of Adam. He was not wrong in thinking that a change had come over Hetty. The anxieties and fears of a first passion, with which she was trembling, had become stronger than vanity, had given her for the first time that sense of helpless dependence on another's feeling, which awakens the clinging, deprecating womanhood even in the shallowest girl that can ever experience it, and creates in her a sensibility to kindness which found her quite hard before. For the first time Hetty felt that there was something soothing to her in Adam's timid yet manly tenderness. She wanted to be treated lovingly. Oh, it was very hard to bear this blank of absence, silence, apparent indifference, after those moments of glowing love. She was not afraid that Adam would tease her with love-making and flattering speeches, like her other admirers. He had always been so reserved to her. She could enjoy without any fear the sense that this strong, brave man loved her, and was near her. It never entered into her mind that Adam was pitiable, too, that Adam, too, must suffer one day. Hetty, we know, was not the first woman that had behaved more gently to the man who loved her in vain, because she had herself begun to love another. It was a very old story, but Adam knew nothing about it, so he drank in the sweet delusion. "'That'll do,' said Hetty, after a little while. "'Aunt wants me to leave some on the trees. I'll take them in now.' "'It's very well I came to carry the basket,' said Adam, "'for it'd have been too heavy for your little arms.' "'No, I could have carried it with both hands.' "'Oh, I dare say,' said Adam, smiling, "'and been as long getting into the house as a little ant carrying a caterpillar. "'Have you ever seen those tiny fellows carrying things four times as big as themselves?' "'No.' said Hetty, indifferently, not caring to know the difficulties of aunt life. Oh, I used to watch em often when I was a lad. But now, you see, I can carry the basket with one arm, as if it was an empty nutshell, and give you the other arm to lean on. Won't you? Such big arms as mine were made for little arms like yours to lean on. Hetty smiled faintly and put her arm within his. Adam looked down at her, but her eyes were turned dreamily towards another corner of the garden. "'Have you ever been to Eagledale?' she said, as they walked slowly along. "'Yes,' said Adam, pleased to have her ask a question about himself. Ten years ago, when I was a lad, I went with father to see about some work there. It's a wonderful sight, rocks and caves such as you never saw in your life. I never had a right notion of rocks till I went there. "'How long did it take to get there?' "'Why, it took us the best part of two days walking.' But it's nothing of a day's journey for anybody as has got a first-rate nag. The captain would get there in nine or ten hours, I'll be bound. He's such a rider. And I shouldn't wonder if he's back again to-morrow. He's too active to rest long in that lonely place, all by himself. For there's nothing but a bit of a inn in that part where he's gone to fish. I wish he'd got the estate in his hands. That'd be the right thing for him, for it'd give him plenty to do. And he'd do it well, too, for all he's so young. He's got better notions of things than many a man twice his age. He spoke very handsome to me the other day about lending me money to set up a business. And if things came round that way, I'd rather be beholden to him nor to any man in the world. Poor Adam was led on to speak about Arthur, because he thought Hetty would be pleased to know that the young squire was so ready to befriend him. The fact entered into his future prospects, which he would like to seem promising in her eyes. And it was true that Hetty listened with an interest which brought a new light into her eyes and a half-smile upon her lips. "'How pretty the roses are now,' Adam continued, pausing to look at them. "'See, I stole the prettiest, but I didn't mean to keep it myself. I think these as are all pink and have got a finer sort of green leaves are prettier than the striped ones, don't you?' He set down the basket and took the rose from his buttonhole. "'It smells very sweet,' he said. "'Those striped ones have no smell.' "'Stick it in your frock, and then you can put it in water after. "'It'd be a pity to let it fade.' "'Hetty took the rose, smiling as she did so, "'at the pleasant thought that Arthur could so soon get back if he liked. "'There was a flash of hope and happiness in her mind, "'and with a sudden impulse of gaiety she did what she had very often done before, "'stuck the rose in her hair, a little above the left ear. "'The tender admiration in Adam's face was slightly shadowed by reluctant disapproval. Hetty's love of finery was just the thing that would most provoke his mother, 
and he himself disliked it as much as it was possible for him to dislike anything that belonged to her. Ah, he said, that's like the ladies in the pictures at the chase. They've mostly got flowers or feathers or gold things in their hair. But somehow I don't like to see em. They always put me in mind of the painted women outside the shows at Treadleson Fair. What can a woman have to set her off better than her own hair, when it curls so like yours? If a woman's young and pretty, I think you can see her good looks all the better for her being plain dressed. Why, Dinah Morris looks very nice, for all she wears such a plain cap and gown. It seems to me as a woman's face doesn't want flowers. It's almost like a flower itself. I'm sure yours is. Oh, very well, said Hetty, with a little playful pout, taking the rose out of her hair. I'll put one of Dinah's caps on when we go in, and you'll see if I look better in it. She left one behind, so I can take the pattern. Nay, nay, I don't want you to wear a Methodist cap like Dinah's. I dare say it's a very ugly cap, and I used to think when I saw her here as it was nonsense for her to dress different to other people. But I never rightly noticed her till she came to see Mother last week. And then I thought the cap seemed to fit her face somehow, as the acorn cup fits the acorn, and I shouldn't like to see her so well without it. But you've got another sort of face. I'd have you look just as you are now, without anything to interfere with your own looks. It's like when a man's singing a good tune. You don't want to hear bells tinkling and interfering with the sound. He took her arm and put it within his again, looking down on her fondly. He was afraid she should think he had lectured her, imagining, as we are apt to do, that she had perceived all the thoughts he had only half expressed. And the thing he dreaded most was lest any cloud should come over this evening's happiness. For the world he would not have spoken of his love to Hetty yet, till this commencing kindness towards him should have grown into unmistakable love. In his imagination he saw long years of his future life stretching before him, blessed with the right to call Hetty his own. He could be content with very little at present. So he took up the basket of currants once more, and they went on towards the house. The scene had quite changed in the half-hour that Adam had been in the garden. The yard was full of life now. Marty was letting the screaming geese through the gate, and wickedly provoking the gander by hissing at him. The granary door was groaning on its hinges as Alec shut it, after dealing out the corn. The horses were being led out to watering, amidst much barking of all the three dogs and many whoops from Tim the plowman, as if the heavy animals who held down their meek, intelligent heads and lifted their shaggy feet so deliberately were likely to rush wildly in every direction but the right. Every one was come back from the meadow, and when Hetty and Adam entered the house-place, Mr. Poyser was seated in the three-cornered chair, and the grandfather in the large armchair opposite, looking on with pleasant expectation while the supper was being laid on the oak table. Mrs. Poyser had laid the cloth herself, a cloth made of homespun linen, with a shining checkered pattern on it, and of an agreeable whitey-brown hue, such as all sensible housewives like to see. None of your bleached shop rag that would wear into holes in no time, but good homespun that would last for two generations. The cold veal, the fresh lettuces, and the stuffed chine might well look tempting to hungry men who had dined at half-past twelve o'clock. On the large deal table against the wall there were bright pewter plates and spoons and cans, ready for Alec and his companions. For the master and servants ate their supper not far off each other, which was all the pleasanter, because if a remark about tomorrow morning's work occurred to Mr. Poyser, Alec was at hand to hear it. "'Well, Adam, I'm glad to see ye,' said Mr. Poyser. "'What, ye've been helping Hetty to gather the currants, eh? Come, sit ye down, sit ye down.' Why, it's pretty near a three weeks since you had your supper with us, and the missus has got one of her rare stuffed chines. I'm glad you're come. Hetty, said Mrs. Poyser, as she looked into the basket of currants to see if the fruit was fine, run upstairs and send Molly down. She's putting Totty to bed, and I want her to draw the ale, for Nancy's busy yet at the dairy. You can see to the child. But whatever did you let her run away from you along with Tommy for, and stuff herself with fruit as she can't eat a bit of good victual? This was said in a lower tone than usual, while her husband was talking to Adam, for Mrs. Poyser was strict in adherence to her own rules of propriety, and she considered that a young girl was not to be treated sharply in the presence of a respectable man who was courting her. That would not be fair play. Every woman was young in her turn, and had her chances of matrimony, which it was a point of honour for other women not to spoil, just as one market woman who has sold her own eggs must not try to bulk another of a customer. Hetty made haste to run away upstairs, not easily finding an answer to her aunt's question, and Mrs. Poyser went out to see after Marty and Tommy and bring them into supper. 
Soon they were all seated, the two rosy lads, one on each side, by the pale mother, a place being left for Hetty between Adam and her uncle. Alec, too, was come in, and was seated in his far corner, eating cold broad beans out of a large dish with his pocket-knife, and finding a flavor in them which he would not have exchanged for the finest pineapple. "'What a time that girl is drawing the ale, to be sure,' said Mrs. Poyser, when she was dispensing her slices of stuffed chine. "'I think she sets the jug under and forgets to turn the tap, as there's nothing you can't believe of them wenches. They'll set the empty kettle of the fire, and then come an hour after to see if the water boils.' "'She's drawn for the men, too,' said Mr. Poyser. "'Thee shouldst had told her to bring our jug up first. "'Told her?' said Mrs. Poyser. "'Yes, I might spend all the wind in my body and take the bellows, too, "'if I was to tell them girls everything as their own sharpness want to tell them. "'Mr. Bede, will you take some vinegar with your lettuce? "'Aye, you're in the right knot. "'It spoils the flavour of the chine, am I thinking? "'It's poor eaten where the flavour of the meat lies of the cruets. "'There's folks as make bad butter and trust in to the salt to hide it.' Mrs. Poyser's attention was here diverted by the appearance of Molly, carrying a large jug, two small mugs, and four drinking cans, all full of ale or small beer, an interesting example of the prehensile power possessed by the human hand. Poor Molly's mouth was rather wider open than usual as she walked along with her eyes fixed on the double cluster of vessels in her hands, quite innocent of the expression in her mistress's eye. "'Molly, I never knew your equals!' "'to think o' your poor mother as is a widow, "'and I took you with as good as no character, "'and the times and times I've told you.' "'Molly had not seen the lightning, "'and the thunder shook her nerves the more "'for the want of that preparation. "'With a vague, alarmed sense "'that she must somehow comport herself differently, "'she hastened her step a little "'towards the far deal table, "'where she might set down her cans, "'caught her foot in her apron, "'which had become untied, "'and fell with a crash and a splash "'into a pool of beer.' whereupon a tittering explosion from Marty and Tommy, and a serious "'Ello!" from Mr. Poyser, who saw his draught of owl unpleasantly deferred. "'There you go,' resumed Mrs. Poyser, in a cutting tone, as she rose and went towards the cupboard, while Molly began dolefully to pick up the fragments of pottery. "'It's what I told you had come over and over again, and there's your month's wage gone and more to pay for that jug, as I've had of the house this ten year.' "'and nothing ever happened to it before, "'but the crockery you've broke sin here in the house you've been "'would make a parson swear. "'God forgive me for saying so. "'And if it had been a boiling wart out of the copper, "'it had been the same, "'and you'd have been scalded and very like lame for life, "'as there's no knowing but what you will be some day if you go on, "'for anybody would think you'd got the St. Vitus's dance "'to see the things you've throwed down. "'It's a pity but what the bits was stacked up for you to see, "'though it's neither seeing nor hearing as'll make much odds to you. "'Anybody would think you were a case-hardened.' Poor Molly's tears were dropping fast by this time, and in her desperation at the lively movement of the beer stream towards Alec's legs, she was converting her apron into a mop, while Mrs. Poyser, opening the cupboard, turned a blighting eye upon her. "'Ah,' she went on, "'you'll do no good with crying and making more wet to wipe up. It's all your own wilfulness, as I tell you, for there's nobody no call to break anything if they'll only go the right way to work.' "'but wooden folks had need to have wooden things to handle, "'and here must I take the brown and white jug "'as it's never been used three times this year, "'and go down in the cellar myself "'and belike catch my death and be laid up with inflammation.' "'Mrs. Poyser had turned round from the cupboard "'with the brown and white jug in her hand "'when she caught sight of something at the other end of the kitchen. "'Perhaps it was because she was already trembling and nervous "'that the apparition had so strong an effect on her. "'Perhaps jug-breaking, like other crimes, "'has a contagious influence.' However it was, she stared and started like a ghost-seer, and the precious brown and white jug fell to the ground, parting forever with its spout and handle. "'Did ever anybody see the like?' she said, with a suddenly lowered tone, after a moment's bewildered glance round the room. "'The jugs are bewitched, I think. It's them nasty glazed handles. They slip o'er the finger like a snail.' "'Why, thee's let thy own whip fly o' thy face,' said her husband, who had now joined in the laugh of the young ones. "'It's all very fine to look on and grin,' rejoined Mrs. Poyser. "'But there's times when the crockery seems alive "'and flies out of your hand like a bird. "'It's like the glass sometimes will crack as it stands. "'What is to be broke will be broke, "'for I never dropped a thing in my life for want of holding it, "'else I never should have kept the crockery all these years "'as I bought at my own wedding. "'And, Hetty, are you mad? "'Whatever do you mean by coming down in that way "'and making one think as there's a ghost walking in the house?' 
A new outbreak of laughter, while Mrs. Poyser was speaking, was caused, less by her sudden conversion to a fatalistic view of jug-breaking, than by that strange appearance of Hetty, which had startled her aunt. The little minx had found a black gown of her aunt's, and pinned it as close round her neck to look like Dinah's, had made her hair as flat as she could, and had tied on one of Dinah's high-crowned borderless neck caps. The thought of Dinah's pale grey face and mild grey eyes, which the sight of the gown and cap brought with it, made it a laughable surprise enough to see them replaced by Hetty's round, rosy cheeks and coquettish dark eyes. The boys got off their chairs and jumped round her, clapping their hands, and even Alec gave a low, ventral laugh as he looked up from his beans. Under cover of the noise, Mrs. Poyser went into the back kitchen to send Nancy into the cellar, with the great pewter measure, which had some chance of being free from bewitchment. "'Why, Hetty, lass, are ye turned Methodist?' said Mr. Poyser, with that comfortable, slow enjoyment of a laugh which one only sees in stout people. "'You must pull your face a deal longer before you'll do for one, must she, Adam? How come you put them things on, eh?' "'Adam said he liked Dinah's cap and gown better nor my clothes,' said Hetty, sitting down demurely. "'He says folks looks better in ugly clothes.' "'Nay, nay,' said Adam, looking at her admiringly. "'I only said they seemed to suit Dinah. "'But if I'd said you'd look pretty in em, "'I should have said nothing but what was true.' "'Why, thee thoughtest Teddy were a ghost, didn't sta? said Mr. Poyser, to his wife, who now came back and took her seat again. "'Thee looks as scared as scared.' "'It little signifies how I look,' said Mrs. Poyser. "'Looks o' men no jugs, nor laughin' neither, as I see.' "'Mr. Bede, I'm sorry you've to wait so long for your ale, but it's coming in a minute. "'Make yourself at home with the cold potatoes. I know you like em. "'Tommy, I'll send you to bed this minute if you don't give over laughing. "'What is there to laugh at, I should like to know? "'I'd sooner cry nor laugh at the sight of that poor thing's cap. "'And there's them as it'd be better if they could make theirselves like her in more ways nor put in on her cap. "'It little becomes anybody of this house to make fun of my sister's child, "'and her just gone away from us, as it went to my heart to part with her.' And I know one thing, as if trouble was to come, and I was to be laid up in my bed, and the children was to die, as there's no knowing but what they will, and the murrain was to come among the cattle again, and everything went to rack and ruin, I say we might be glad to get sight of Dinah's cap again, with her own face under it, border or no border, for she's one of them things as looks the brightest on a rainy day, and loves you the best when you're most in need of it. Mrs. Poyser, you perceive, was aware that nothing would be so likely to expel the comic as the terrible. Tommy, who was of a susceptible disposition, and very fond of his mother, and who had, besides, eaten so many cherries as to have his feelings less under command than usual, was so affected by the dreadful picture she had made of the possible future that he began to cry. And the good-natured father, indulgent to all weaknesses but those of negligent farmers, said to Hetty, "'You'd better take the things off again, my lass. It hurts your aunt to see em. Hetty went upstairs again, and the arrival of the ale made an agreeable diversion." for Adam had to give his opinion of the new tap, which could not be otherwise than complimentary to Mrs. Poyser, and then followed a discussion on the secrets of good brewing, the folly of stinginess in hopping, and the doubtful economy of a farmer's making his own malt. Mrs. Poyser had so many opportunities of expressing herself with weight on these subjects, that by the time supper was ended, the ale jug refilled, and Mr. Poyser's pipe alight, she was once more in high good humour, and ready, at Adam's request, to fetch the broken spinning-wheel for his inspection. "'Ah!' said Adam, looking at it carefully. "'Here's a nice bit of turnin' wanted. "'It's a pretty wheel. "'I must have it up at the turnin' shop in the village and do it there, "'for I've no convenience for turnin' at home. "'If you'll send it to Mr. Burge's shop of the morning, "'I'll get it done for you by Wednesday. "'I've been turnin' it over in my mind,' he continued, looking at Mr. Poyser, "'to make a bit more convenience at home for nice jobs of cabinet-makin'. I've always done a deal at such little things in odd hours, and they're profitable, for there's more workmanship nor material in em. I look for me and Seth to get a little business for ourselves in that way, for I know a man at Rossiter as'll take as many things as we should make, besides what we could get orders for round about. Mr. Poyser entered with interest into a project which seemed a step towards Adam becoming a master man, and Mrs. Poyser gave her approbation to the scheme of the movable kitchen cupboard, which was to be capable of containing grocery, pickles, crockery, and house linen in the utmost compactness without confusion. Hetty, once more in her own dress, with her neckerchief pushed a little backwards on this warm evening, was seated picking currants near the window, where Adam could see her quite well. And so the time passed pleasantly till Adam got up to go. He was pressed to come again soon, but not to stay longer, 
for at this busy time sensible people would not run the risk of being sleepy at five o'clock in the morning. "'I shall take a step farther,' said Adam, "'and go on to see Mr. Massey, for he wasn't at church yesterday, and I've not seen him for a week past. I've never hardly known him to miss church before.' Ay, said Mr. Poyser, we've heard nothing about him, for it's the boys' holidays now, so we can give you no account. But you'll never think of going there at this hour of the night, said Mrs. Poyser, folding up her knitting. Oh, Mr. Massey sits up late, said Adam, and the night school's not over yet. Some of the men don't come till late, they've got so far to walk, and Bartle himself's never in bed till it's gone eleven. I wouldn't have him to live with me, then, said Mrs. Poyser, a drop in candle grease about, as you're like to tumble down to the floor the first thing in the morning. Ay, eleven o'clock's late. It's late, said old Martin. I ne'er sat up so in my life. Not to say as it weren't a morrin, or a christening, or a wake, or the harvest supper. Eleven o'clock's late. Why, I sit up till after twelve often, said Adam, laughing. But it isn't to eat and drink extra, it's to work extra. Good night, Mrs. Poyser. Good night, Hetty. Hetty could only smile and not shake hands, for hers were dyed and damp with currant juice, but all the rest gave a hearty shake to the large palm that was held out to them, and said, "'Come again, come again!' "'Ay, think of that now,' said Mr. Poyser, when Adam was out on the causeway. "'Sitting up till past twelve to do extra work. You'll not find many men of six-and-twenty as'll do to put her the shafts with him. If you can catch Adam for a husband, Hetty, you'll ride in your own spring-car some day, I'll be your warrant.' Hetty was moving across the kitchen with the currants, so her uncle did not see the little toss of the head with which she answered him. To ride in a spring cart seemed a very miserable lot indeed to her now. End of chapter 20「Book 2, Chapter 21 of Adam Bede」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Simon Evers. Adam Bede by George Eliot. Book 2, Chapter 21. The Night School and the Schoolmaster. Bartle Masses was one of a few scattered houses on the edge of a common, which was divided by the road to Treddleston. Adam reached it in a quarter of an hour after leaving the hall farm, and when he had his hand on the door latch, he could see, through the curtainless window, that there were eight or nine heads bending over the desks, lighted by thin dips. When he entered, a reading lesson was going forward, and Bartle Massey merely nodded, leaving him to take his place where he pleased. He had not come for the sake of a lesson tonight, and his mind was too full of personal matters, too full of the last two hours he had passed in Hetty's presence, for him to amuse himself with a book till school was over. So he sat down in a corner and looked on with an absent mind. It was a sort of scene which Adam had beheld almost weekly for years. He knew by heart every arabesque flourish in the framed specimen of Bartle Massey's handwriting which hung over the schoolmaster's head by way of keeping a lofty ideal before the minds of his pupils. He knew the backs of all the books on the shelf running along the whitewashed wall above the pegs for the slates. He knew exactly how many grains were gone out of the ear of Indian corn that hung from one of the rafters. He had long ago exhausted the resources of his imagination in trying to think how the bunch of leathery seaweed had looked and grown in its native element. And, from the place where he sat, he could make nothing of the old map of England that hung against the opposite wall, for age had turned it of a fine yellow-brown, something like that of a well-seasoned meerschaum. The drama that was going on was almost as familiar as the scene. Nevertheless, habit had not made him indifferent to it, and even in his present self-absorbed mood, Adam felt a momentary stirring of the old fellow feeling, as he looked at the roughed men painfully holding pen or pencil with their cramped hands, or humbly labouring through their reading lesson. The reading class, now seated on the form in front of the schoolmaster's desk, consisted of the three most backward pupils. Adam would have known it only by seeing Bartle Massey's face as he looked over his spectacles, which he had shifted to the ridge of his nose, not requiring them for present purposes. The face wore its mildest expression. The grizzled bushy eyebrows had taken their more acute angle of compassionate kindness, and the mouth, habitually compressed with a pout of the lower lip, was relaxed 
so as to be ready to speak a helpful word or syllable in a moment. This gentle expression was the more interesting because the schoolmaster's nose, an irregular aquiline twisted a little on one side, had rather a formidable character, and his brow, moreover, had that peculiar tension which always impresses one as a sign of a keen, impatient temperament. The blue veins stood out like cords under the transparent yellow skin, and this intimidating brow was softened by no tendency to baldness, for the grey, bristly hair, cut down to about an inch in length, stood round it in as close ranks as ever. "'Nay, Bill, nay,' Bartle was saying in a kind tone, as he nodded to Adam. "'Begin that again, and then perhaps it'll come to you what D.R.Y. spells. It's the same lesson you read last week, you know.' Bill was a sturdy fellow, aged four and twenty, an excellent stone-sawyer, who could get as good wages as any man in the trade of his years but he found a reading lesson in words of one syllable a harder matter to deal with than the hardest to stone he had ever had to saw. The letters he complained were so uncommon alike there was no telling them one from another. The sawyer's business not being concerned with minute differences such as exist between a letter with its tail turned up and a letter with its tail turned down. But Bill had a firm determination that he would learn to read, founded chiefly on two reasons. First, that Tom Hazelow, his cousin, could read anything right off, whether it was print or writing, and Tom had sent him a letter from twenty miles off saying how he was prospering in the world and had got an overlooker's place. Secondly, that Sam Phillips, who soared with him, had learned to read when he was turned twenty, and what could be done by a little fellow like Sam Phillips, Bill considered, could be done by himself, seeing that he could pound Sam into wet clay if circumstances required it. So here he was, pointing his big finger towards three words at once, and turning his head on one side, that he might keep better hold with his eye of the one word which was to be discriminated out of the group. The amount of knowledge Bartle Massey must possess was something so dim and vast that Bill's imagination recoiled before it. He would hardly have ventured to deny that the schoolmaster might have something to do in bringing about the regular return of daylight and the changes in the weather. The man seated next to Bill was of a very different type. He was a Methodist brickmaker, who, after spending thirty years of his life in perfect satisfaction with his ignorance, had lately got religion, and along with it the desire to read the Bible. But with him, too, learning was a heavy business, and on his way out tonight he had offered as usual a special prayer for help, seeing that he had undertaken this hard task with a single eye to the nourishment of his soul that he might have a greater abundance of texts and hymns wherewith to banish evil memories and the temptations of old habit, or, in brief language, the devil. For the brickmaker had been a notorious poacher, and was suspected, though as though there was no good evidence against him, of being the man who had shot a neighbouring gamekeeper in the leg. However that might be, it is certain that shortly after the accident referred to, which was coincident with the arrival of an unawakening Methodist preacher at Treddleston, a great change had been observed in the brickmaker. And though he was still known in the neighbourhood by his old soubriquet of Brimstone, there was nothing he held in so much horror as any further transactions with that evil-smelling element. He was a broad-chested fellow, with a fervid temperament, which helped him better in imbibing religious ideas than in the dry process of acquiring the mere human knowledge of the alphabet. Indeed, he had been already a little shaken in his resolution by a brother Methodist, who assured him that the letter was a mere obstruction to the spirit, and expressed a fear that Brimstone was too eager for the knowledge that puffeth up. The third beginner was a much more promising pupil. He was a tall but thin and wiry man, nearly as old as Brimstone, with a very pale face and hands stained a deep blue. He was a dyer, who in the course of dipping homespun wool and old women's petticoats had got fired with the ambition to learn a great deal more about the strange secrets of colour. He had already a high reputation in the district for his dyes, and he was bent on discovering some method by which he could reduce the expense of crimsons and scarlets. The druggist at Treddleston had given him a notion that he might save himself a great deal of labour and expense if he could learn to read, 
and so he had begun to give his spare hours to the night school, resolving that this little chap should lose no time in coming to Mr. Massey's day school as soon as he was old enough. It was touching to see these three big men, with the marks of their hard labour about them, anxiously bending over the worn books and painfully making out, the grass is green, the sticks are dry, the corn is ripe. A very hard lesson to pass to after columns of single words all alike except in the first letter. It was almost as if three rough animals were making humble efforts to learn how they might become human. And it touched the tenderest fibre in Bartle Massey's nature, for such full-grown children as these were the only pupils for whom he had no severe epithets and no impatient tones. He was not gifted with an imperturbable temper, and on music nights it was apparent that patience could never be an easy virtue to him. But this evening, as he glances over his spectacles at Bill Downs, the sawyer, who is turning his head on one side with a desperate sense of blackness before the letters D. R. Y., his eyes shed their mildest and most encouraging light. After the reading class, two youths between sixteen and nineteen came up with the imaginary bills of parcels which they had been writing out on their slates and were now required to calculate off-hand, a test which they stood with such imperfect success that Bartle Massey, whose eyes had been glaring at them ominously through his spectacles for some minutes, at length burst out in a bitter, high-pitched tone, pausing between every sentence to rap the floor with a knobbed stick which rested between his legs. "'Now, you see, you don't do this thing a bit better than you did a fortnight ago, and I'll tell you what's the reason. You want to learn accounts. That's well and good. But you think all you need to do is learn accounts is to come to me and do sums for an hour or so, two or three times a week. And no sooner do you get your caps on and turn out of doors again than you sweep the whole thing clean out of your mind.' You go whistling about and take no more care what you're thinking of than if your heads were gutters for any rubbish to swill through that happened to be in the way. And if you get a good notion of them, it's pretty soon washed out again. You think knowledge is to be got cheap. You'll come and pay Bartle Massey sixpence a week, and he'll make you clever at figures without your taking any trouble. But knowledge isn't to be got with paying sixpence, let me tell you. If you're to know figures, you must turn them over in your heads and keep your thoughts fixed on them. There's so nothing you can't turn into a sum, for there's nothing but what's got number in it, even a fool. You may say to yourselves, I'm one fool and Jack's another. If my fool's head weighed four pound and Jack's three pound three ounces and three quarters, how many penny weights heavier would my head be than Jack's? A man that had got his head in learning figures would make some for himself and work them in his head. When he sat at his shoemaking, he counted his stitches by fives and then put a price on his stitches say half a farthing, and then see how much money he could get in an hour, and then ask himself how much money he'd get in a day at that rate, and then how much ten workmen would get working three or, or twenty or a hundred years at that rate, and all the while his needle would be going just as fast as if he left his head empty for the devil to dance in. But the long and the short of it is, I'll have nobody in my night school that doesn't strive to learn when he comes to learn as hard as if he was striving to get out of a dark hole into broad daylight. I'll send no man away because he's stupid, if Billy Taft, the idiot, wanted to learn anything, I'd not refuse to teach him. But I'll not throw away good knowledge on people who think they can get it by the six pennyworth, and carry it away with them as if they were an ounce of snuff. So never come to me again if you can't show that you've been working with your own heads instead of thinking that you can pay for mine to work for you. That's the last word I've got to say to you. With this final sentence, Bartle Massey gave a sharper rap than ever with his knobbed stick, and the discomfited lads got up to go with a sulky look. The upper pupils had happily only their writing books to show in various stages of progress from pothooks to round text, and mere pen strokes, however perverse, were less exasperating to Bartle than false arithmetic. He was a little more severe than usual on Jacob Story's Zeds, of which poor Jacob had written a page full, all with their tops turned the wrong way, with a puzzled sense that they were not right somehow. But he observed an apology that it was a letter you never wanted hardly, and he thought it had only been there to finish off the alphabet like, though Ampersand, and would have done as well for what he could see. At last the pupils had all taken their hats and said their good nights, and Adam, knowing his old master's habits, rose and said, 
"'Shall I put the candles out, Mr. Massey?' "'Yes, my boy, yes, all but this which I am carrying to the house, "'and just lock the outer door, now you are near it,' said Bartle, "'getting his stick in the fitting angle to help him in descending from his stool. "'He was no sooner on the ground that it became obvious why the stick was necessary. "'The left leg was much shorter than the right. "'But the schoolmaster was so active with his lameness "'that it was hardly thought of as a misfortune, "'and if you had seen him make his way along the schoolroom floor "'and up the step into his kitchen,' you would perhaps have understood why the naughty boy sometimes felt that his pace might be indefinitely quickened, and that he and his stick might overtake them even in their swiftest run. The moment he appeared at the kitchen door with a candle in his hand, a faint whimpering began in the chimney-corner, and a brown and tan-coloured bitch, of that wise-looking breed with short legs and long body, known to an unmechanical generation as turnspits, came creeping along the floor wagging her tail, and hesitating at every other step, as if her affections were painfully divided between the hamper in the chimney-corner and the master, whom she could not leave without a greeting. "'Well, Vixen, well then, how the bad is?' said the schoolmaster, making haste towards the chimney-corner, and holding the candle over the low humper, where two extremely blind puppies lifted up their heads towards the light from a nest of flannel and wool. "'Vixen,' could not even see her master look at them without painful excitements. She got into the hamper, and got out again the next moment, and behaved with true feminine folly, though looking all the while as wise as a dwarf, with a large old-fashioned head and body on the most abbreviated legs. "'Why, you've got a family, I see, Mr. Massey,' said Adam, smiling, as he came into the kitchen. "'How's that? I thought it was against the law here.' "'Law?' "'What's the use of law when a man's once such a fool as to let a woman into his house?' said Bartle, turning away from the hamper with some bitterness. He always called Vixen a woman, and seemed to have lost all consciousness that he was using a figure of speech. "'If I'd known Vixen was a woman, I never had held the boy from drowning her. But when I got her into my hand, I was forced to take her. And now you see what she's brought me to, the sly, hypocritical wench!' Bartle spoke these last words in a rasping tone of reproach, and looked at Vixen, who poked down her head and turned up her eyes towards him with a keen sense of opprobrium, and contrived to be brought to bed on a Sunday at church-time. I wish again and again I'd been a bloody-minded man, that I could have strangled the mother and the brats with one cord. "'I'm glad it was no worse a cause kept you from church,' said Adam. "'I was afraid you must be ill for the first time in your life.' "'and I was particularly sorry not to have you at church yesterday.' "'Ah, my boy, I know why, I know why,' said Art Bartle kindly, "'going up to Adam and raising his hand up to the shoulder "'that was almost on a level with his own head. "'You've had a rough bit of road to get over since I saw you, "'a rough bit of road. "'But I am hopes that there are better times coming for you. "'I've got some news to tell you. "'But I must get my supper first, for I'm hungry. "'I'm hungry. Sit down, sit down.' Bartle went into his little pantry, and brought out an excellent home-baked loaf, for it was one extravagance in these dear times to eat bread once a day instead of oat-cake, and he justified it by observing that when a schoolmaster wanted was brains, an oat-cake ran too much to bone instead of brains. Then came a piece of cheese and a quart jug with a crown of foam upon it. He placed them all on the round deal table which stood against his large armchair in the chimney-corner, with Vixen's hamper on one side of it, and a window-shelf with a few books piled up on it on the other. The table was as clean as if Vixen had been an excellent housewife in a chequered apron. So was the quarry floor, and the old carved oaken press, table, and chairs, which in these days would be bought at a high price in aristocratic houses, though in that period of spider-lengths and inlaid cupids, Bartle had got them for an old song, where as free from dust as things could be, at the end of a summer's day. "'Now then, my boy, draw up, draw up. We'll not talk about business till we've had our supper. No man can be wise on an empty stomach. But,' said Bartle, rising from his chair again, "'I must give Vixen her supper too, confound her, though she'll do nothing with it but nourish those unnecessary babbies. That's the way with these women. They've got no headpieces to nourish, and so their food all runs either to fat or to brats.' He brought out of the pantry a dish of scraps, 
which Vixen at once fixed her eyes on and jumped out of her hamper to lick up with the utmost dispatch. "'I've had my supper, Mr. Massey,' said Adam, "'so I'll look on while you eat yours. "'I've been at the Hall Farm, "'and they always have their supper betimes, you know. "'They don't keep your late hours.' "'I know little about their hours,' said Bartle dryly, "'cutting his bread and not shrinking from the crust. "'It's a house I seldom go into, "'though I'm fond of the boys, "'and Martin Poyser's a good fellow. "'There's too many women in the house for me. "'I hate the sound of women's voices. "'They're always either a buzz or a squeak. "'Always either a buzz or a squeak.' "'Mrs. Poyser keeps at the top of the talk like a fife. "'And as for the young lasses, I'd as soon look at water-grubs. "'I know what they'll turn to. Stinging gnats! Stinging gnats! "'Here, take some ale, my boy. It's been drawn for you. It's been drawn for you.' "'Nay, Mr. Massey,' said Adam, who took his old friend's whim more seriously than usual to-night. "'Don't be so hard on the creatures God has made to be companions for us.' A working man would be badly off without a wife to see to the house and the victual, and make things clean and comfortable. Nonsense! It's the silliest lie a sensible man like you ever believed to say a woman makes a house comfortable. It's a story got up because the women are there, and something must be found for them to do. I tell you, there isn't a thing under the sun that needs to be done at all but what a man could do better than a woman, unless it's bearing children, and they do that in a poor makeshift way. It had better be left to the men. Ah, it had better be left to the men. I tell you, a woman'll bake you a pie every week of her life, and never come to see that the hot of the oven the short of the time. I tell you, a woman'll make your porridge every day for twenty years, and never think of measuring the proportion between the meal and the milk. A little more or less, she'll think, doesn't signify. The porridge will be awkward now and then. If it's wrong, it's summit in the meal, or it's summit in the milk, or it's summit in the water. Look at me. I make my own bread, and there's no difference between one batch and another from year's end to year's end. But if I got any other women, woman beside Vixen in the house, I must pray to the Lord every baking to give me patience if the bread turned out heavy. And as for cleanliness, my house is cleaner than any other house on the common, though the half of them swarm with women. Will Baker's lad comes to help me in the morning, and we get as much cleaning done in one hour without any fuss as a woman would get done in three. "'and all the while be sending buckets of water off your ankles "'and let the fender and the fire iron stand in the middle of the floor "'half the day for you to break your shins against them. "'Don't tell me about God having made such peat creatures "'to be companions for us. "'I don't say but he might make Eve to be a companion to Adam in paradise. "'There was no cooking to be spoilt there, "'and no other women to cackle with and make mischief, "'though you see what mischief she did as soon as she'd had an opportunity.' "'But it's an impious, unscriptural opinion "'to say a woman's a blessing to a man now. "'You might as well say adders and wasps "'and foxes and wild beasts are a blessing, "'when they're only the evils that belong to this state of probation, "'which is lawful for a man to keep as clear of as he can in this life, "'hoping to get quit of them for ever in another. Hmm, "'Hoping to get quit of them for ever in another.' "'Bartle had become so excited and angry "'in the course of his invective "'that he had forgotten his supper.' and only used the knife for the purpose of wrapping the table with the haft. But towards the close the raps became so sharp and frequent and his voice so quarrelsome, the vixen felt it incumbent on her to jump out of the hamper and bark vaguely. "'Quiet, vixen!' snarled Bartle, turning round upon her. "'You're like the rest of the women, always putting in your word before you know why.' Vixen returned to her hamper again in humiliation, and her master continued his supper in a silence which Adam did not choose to interrupt. He knew the old man would be in a better humour when he'd had his supper and lighted his pipe. Adam was used to hear him talk in this way, but had never learned so much of Bartle's past life as to know whether his view of married comfort was founded on experience. On that point Bartle was mute, and it was even a secret where he had lived previous to the twenty years in which happily, for the peasants and artisans of this neighbourhood, he had been settled among them as their only schoolmaster. If anything like a question was ventured on this subject, Bartle always replied, "'Oh, I've seen many places. I've been a deal in the South.' And the Loamshire men would as soon have thought of asking for a particular town or village in Africa as in the South. "'Now then, my boy,' said Bartle at last, when he had poured out his second mug of ale and lighted his pipe, "'now then, we'll have a little talk. But tell me first, have you heard any particular news today? "'No,' said Adam. Not as I remember. 
Ah, that'll keep it close. They'll keep it close, I dare say. But I find it out by chance, and it's news that may concern you, Adam, else I'm a man that don't know a superficial square foot from a solid. Here Bartle gave a series of fierce and rapid puffs, looking earnestly the while at Adam. Your impatient, loquacious man has never any notion of keeping his pipe alight by gentle, measured puffs. He is always letting it go nearly out, and then punishing it for that negligence. At last he said, "'Satchel's got a paralytic stroke. I find it out from the lad they sent to Treadleston for the doctor before seven o'clock this morning. He's a good way beyond sixty, you know. It's much if he gets over it.' "'Well,' said Adam, "'I dare say there'd be more rejoicing than sorrow in the parish at his being laid up. He's been a selfish, tail-bearing, mischievous fellow. But after all, there's nobody he's done so much harm as as to the old squire.' "'Though it's the squire himself as is to blame, "'making a stupid fellow like that a sort of man of all work, "'just to save the expense of having a proper steward to look after the estate. "'And he's lost more by ill-management of the woods, I'll be bound, "'than to pay for two stewards. "'If he's laid on the shelf, "'it's to be hoped he'll make way for a better man. "'But I don't see how it's like to make any difference to me.' "'But I see it, but I see it,' said Bartle, "'and others besides me.' "'The captain's coming of age now. "'You know that as well as I do. "'And it's to be expected he'll have a little more voice in things. "'And I know, and you know too, "'what would be the captain's wish about the woods "'if there was a fair opportunity for making a change. "'He said in plenty of people's hearing "'that he'd make you manager of the woods tomorrow if he'd the power. "'Why, Carol, Mr. Owen's butler, "'heard him say so to the parson not many days ago. "'Carol looked in when we were smoking our pipes "'a Saturday night at Casson's, "'and he told us about it. "'And whenever anybody says a good word for you, "'the parson's ready to back it. "'That I'll answer for. "'It was pretty well talked over, I can tell you, at Casson's, "'and one and another had their fling at you. "'For if donkeys set to work to sing, "'you're pretty sure what the tune'll be.' "'Why, did they talk it all for poor Mr. Burge?' said Adam. "'Or wasn't he there a Saturday?' "'Oh, he went away before Carol came. "'And Casson... "'He's always for setting other folks right, you know. "'Would have it, Burge was the man to have the management of the woods. "'A substantial man,' says he, "'with pretty near sixty years' experience of timber. "'It'd be all very well for Adam Mead to act under him, "'but it isn't to be supposed the squire'd appoint a young fellow like Adam "'when there's his elders and betters at hand.' "'But I said, "'That's a pretty notion of yours, Catton. "'Why, Burge is the man to buy timber. "'Would you put the woods into his hands "'and let him make his own bargains?' "'I think you don't leave your customers to score their own drink, do you? "'And as for age, what that's worth depends on the quality of the liquor. "'It's pretty well known who's the backbone of Jonathan Burge's business.' "'I thank you for your good word, Mr. Massey,' said Adam. "'But for all that, Gasson was partly the right for once. "'There's not much likelihood like the old squire would ever consent to employ me. "'I offended him about two years ago, and he's never forgiven me.' "'Why, how was that? You never told me about it,' said Bartle. "'Oh, that's a bit of nonsense. "'I've made a frame for a scream for Miss Liddy. "'She's always making something with her worsted work, you know. "'And she'd given me particular orders about this screen, "'and there was as much talking and measuring as if we'd been planning a house. "'However, it was a nice bit of work, and I liked doing it for her. "'But, you know, these little frigging things take a deal of time.' I only worked at it in over hours, often late at night, and I had to go to Treadleston over and over again about little bits of brass nails and such gear, and I turned the little knobs on the legs and carved the open work after a pattern as nice as could be. And I was uncommon pleased with it when it was done. And when I took it home, Miss Liddy sent for me to bring it into her drawing room, so she might give me directions about fastening on the work. Very fine needlework, "'Jacob and Rachel are kissing one another among the sheep like a picture. "'And the old squire was sitting there, for he mostly sits with her. "'Well, she was mighty pleased with the screen, "'and then she wanted to know what pay she was to give me. "'I didn't speak at random. You know, it's not my way. "'I'd calculated pretty close, though I hadn't made out a bill, "'and I said, one pound thirty. "'That was paying for the materials and paying me, "'but none too much for my work.' "'The old squire looked up at this "'and peered in his way at the screen and said, 
One pound thirteen for a gimcrack like that, Lydia, my dear. If you must spend money on these things, why don't you get them at Rossiter instead of paying double price for clumsy work here? Such things are not work for a carpenter like Adam. Give him a guinea and no more. Well, Miss Lydia, I reckon, believed what he told her, and she's not over fond of parting with the money herself. Hmm, she's not a bad woman at bottom, but she's been brought up under his thumb. So she began fidgeting with her purse and turned as red as a ribbon. But I made a bow and said, "No, thank you, madam. I'll make you a present of the screen, if you please. I've charged the regular price for my work, and I know it's done well. And I know, begging his honour's pardon, that you couldn't get such a screen at Rossiter under two guineas. I'm willing to give you my work. It's been done in my own time, and nobody's got anything to do with it but me. But if I'm paid, I can't take a smaller price than I'd asked, because that'd be like saying I'd ask more than was just." With your leave, madam, I bid you good morning. I made my bow and went out before she'd time to say any more, for she stood with the purse in her hand, looking almost foolish. I didn't mean to be disrespectful, and I spoke to as polite as I could, but I can give in to no man if he wants to make it out as I'm trying to overreach him. And in the evening, the footman brought me the one pound thirteen wrapped in paper. But since then. I've seen pretty clear as the old squire can't abide me. Hmm, that's likely enough.、Hmm, that's likely enough," said Bartle meditatively. "The only way to bring him round would be to show him what was for his own interest, and that the captain may do. That the captain may do." "Nay, I don't know," said Adam. "The squire's cute enough, but it takes something else besides cuteness to make folks see what be their interest in the long run." It takes some conscience and belief in right and wrong. I see that pretty clear. He'd hardly ever bring round the old squire to believe he'd gain as much in a straightforward way as by tricks and turns. And besides, I've not much mind to work under him. I don't want to quarrel with any gentleman, more particularly an old gentleman turned eighty. And I know we couldn't agree long. If the captain was master of the estate, it'd be different. He's got a conscience and a will to do right. And I sooner work for him, nor for any man living. Well, well, my boy, if good luck knocks at your door, don't you put your head out at window and tell it to be gone about its business. That's all. You must learn to deal with odd and even in life as well as in figures. I tell you now, as I told you ten years ago, when you pommelled young Mike Coldsworth for wanting to pass a bad shilling before you knew whether it was in jest or earnest, you're over hasty and proud. And apt to set your teeth against folks that don't square to your notions. It's no harm for me to be a bit fiery and stiff-backed. I'm an old schoolmaster, and shall never want to get onto a higher perch. But where's the use of all the time I've spent in teaching you writing and mapping and mensuration, if you're not to get forward in the world and show folks there's some advantage to having a head on your shoulders instead of a turnip? Do you mean to go on turning up your nose at every opportunity because it's got a bit of a smell about it that nobody finds out but yourself? It's as foolish as that notion of yours that a wife is to make a working man comfortable. Stuff and nonsense! Stuff and nonsense! Leave that to fools that never got beyond a sum in simple addition. Simple addition enough. Add one fool to another fool, and in six years' time, six fools more. They're all of the same denomination. Big and little's nothing to do with the sum. During this rather heated exhortation to coolness and discretion, the pipe had gone out, and Bartle gave the climax to his speech by striking a light furiously. After which he puffed with fierce resolution, fixing his eye still on Adam, who was trying not to laugh. There's a good deal of sense in what you say, Mister Massey," Adam began as soon as he felt quite serious, as there always is. But you'll give in that it's no business of mine to be building on chances that may never happen. What I've got to do is to work as well as I can with the tools and materials I've got in my hands. If a good chance comes to me, I'll think of what you've been saying. But till then, I've got nothing to do but to trust in my own hands and my own headpiece. I'm turning over a little plan for Seth and me to go into the cabinet making a bit by ourselves, and win an extra pound or two in that way. <laughs> but it's getting late now. It'll be pretty near eleven before I'm at home, and Mother may happen to lie awake. She's more fidgety nor usual now, so I'll bid you good night. Well, well, we'll go to the gate with you. It's a fine night," said Bartle, taking up his stick. Vixen was at once on her legs, 
and without further words the three walked out into the starlight, by the side of Bartle's potato beds, to the little gate. "'Come to the music of Friday night, if you can, my boy,' said the old man, as he closed the gate after Adam and leaned against it. "'Aye, aye,' said Adam, striding along towards the streak of pale road. He was the only object moving on the wide common. The two grey donkeys, just visible in front of the gorse-bushes, stood as still as limestone images, as still as the grey thatched roof of the mud cottage a little farther on. Bartle kept his eye on the moving figure till it passed into the darkness, while Vixen, in a state of divided affection, had twice run back to the house to bestow a parenthetic lick on her puppies. "'Aye, aye,' muttered the schoolmaster, as Adam disappeared. "'There you go, stalking along, stalking along. But you wouldn't have been what you are if you hadn't had a bit of old lame Bartle inside you. The strongest calf must have something to suck at. There's plenty of these big lumbering fellows that never have known their ABC if it hadn't been for Bartle Massey.' "'Well, well, Vixen, you foolish wench, what is it? What is it? I must go in, must I? Aye, aye, I never have a will of my own any more. And those pups, what do you think I am to do with them, when they are twice as big as you? For I am pretty sure the father was that hulking bull terry of Will Baker's. Wasn't he now, eh, you sly hussy?' Here Vixen tucked her tail between her legs and ran forward into the house. Subjects are sometimes broached, which a well-bred female will ignore. "'But where's the use of talking to a woman with babbies?' continued Bartle. "'She's got no conscience, no conscience. It's all run to milk.' End of Book Two, Chapter Twenty One Recording by Simon Evers Chapter Twenty Two of Adam Bede this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tony Ashworth. Adam Bede by George Eliot. Chapter 22. Going to the Birthday Feast. The 30th of July was come, and it was one of those half-dozen warm days which sometimes occur in the middle of a rainy English summer. No rain had fallen for the last three or four days, and the weather was perfect for that time of the year. There was less dust than usual on the dark green hedgerows, and on the wild chamomile that starred the roadside, yet the grass was dry enough for the little children to roll on it, and there was no cloud but a long dash of light downy ripple, high, high up in the far-off blue sky. Perfect weather for an outdoor July merrymaking, yet surely not the best time of year to be born in. Nature seems to make a hot pause just then. All the loveliest flowers are gone. The sweet time of early growth and vague hopes is past, and yet the time of harvest and ingathering is not come, and we tremble at the possible storms that may ruin the precious fruit in the moment of its ripeness. The woods are all one dark monotonous green, the wagon-loads of hay no longer creep along the lanes, scattering their sweet-smelling fragments on the blackberry branches. The pastures are often a little tanned, yet the corn has not got its last splendour of red and gold. The lambs and calves have lost all traces of their innocent frisky prettiness, and have become stupid young sheep and cows. But it is a time of leisure on the farm, that pause between hay and corn harvest, and so the farmers and labourers in Hayslope and Broxton thought the captain did well to come of age just then, when they could give their undivided minds to the flavour of the great cask of ale which had been brewed the autumn after the heir was born, and was to be tapped on his twenty-first birthday. The heir had been merry with the ringing of church bells very early this morning, and every one had made haste to get through the needful work before twelve, when it would be time to think of getting ready to go to the chase. The midday sun was streaming into Hetty's bedchamber, and there was no blind to temper the heat with which it fell on her head as she looked at herself in the old specked glass. Still, that was the only glass she had in which she could see her neck and arms, for the small hanging glass she had fetched out of the next room, the room that had been Dinah's, would show her nothing below her little chin, 
and that beautiful bit of neck where the roundness of her cheek melted into another roundness shadowed by dark, delicate curls. And today she thought more than usual about her neck and arms, for at the dance this evening she was not to wear any neckerchief, and she had been busy yesterday with her spotted pink and white frock, that she might make the sleeves either long or short at will. She was dressed now just as she was to be in the evening, with a tucker made of real lace which her aunt had lent her for this unparalleled occasion, but with no ornaments besides. She had even taken out her small round earrings which she wore every day. But there was something more to be done, apparently, before she put on her neckerchief and long sleeves, which she was to wear in the daytime, for now she unlocked the drawer that held her private treasures. It is more than a month since we saw her unlock that drawer before, and now it holds new treasures, so much more precious than the old ones that these are thrust into the corner. Hetty would not care to put the large coloured glass earrings into her ears now, for see, she has got a beautiful pair of gold and pearls and garnet lying snugly in a pretty little box lined with white satin. Oh, the delight of taking out that little box and looking at the earrings! Do not reason about it, my philosophical reader, and say that Hetty, being very pretty, must have known that it did not signify whether she had on any ornaments or not, and that, moreover, to look at earrings which she could not possibly wear out of her bedroom could hardly be a satisfaction, the essence of vanity being a reference to the impressions produced on others. You will never understand women's natures if you are so excessively rational." Try rather to divest yourself of all your rational prejudices as much as if you were studying the psychology of a canary bird, and only watch the movements of this pretty round creature as she turns her head on one side with an unconscious smile at the earrings nestled in the little box. Ah, you think, it is for the sake of the person who has given them to her, and her thoughts are gone back now to the moment when they were put into her hands. No? else why should she have cared to have earrings rather than anything else? And I know that she had longed for earrings from among all the ornaments she could imagine. Little, little ears, Arthur had said, pretending to pinch them one evening, as Hetty sat beside him on the grass without her hat. I wish I had some pretty earrings, she said in a moment, almost before she knew what she was saying. The wish lay so close to her lips it would flutter past them at the slightest breath. And the next day, it was only last week, Arthur had ridden over to Rossiter on purpose to buy them. That little wish so naively uttered seemed to him the prettiest bit of childishness. He had never heard anything like it before, and he had wrapped the box up in a great many covers, that he might see Hetty unwrapping it with growing curiosity, till at last her eyes flashed back their new delight into his. No, she was not thinking most of the giver when she smiled at the earrings, for now she is taking them out of the box, not to press them to her lips, but to fasten them in her ears, only for one moment, to see how pretty they look, as she peeps at them in the glass against the wall, with first one position of the head and then another, like a listening bird. It is impossible to be wise on the subject of earrings as one looks at her, what should those delicate pearls and crystals be made for, if not for such ears? One cannot even find fault with the tiny round hole which they leave when they are taken out. Perhaps water nixies, and such lovely things without souls, have these little round holes in their ears by nature, ready to hang jewels in. And Hetty must be one of them. It is too painful to think that she is a woman with a woman's destiny before her, a woman spinning in young ignorance a light web of folly and vain hopes, which may one day close round her and press upon her, a rancorous poison garment changing all at once her fluttering trivial butterfly sensations into a life of deep human anguish. But she cannot keep in the earrings long, else she may make her uncle and aunt wait. She puts them quickly into the box again and shuts them up. Some day she will be able to wear any earrings she likes, and already she lives in an invisible world of brilliant costumes, shimmering gauze, soft satin, and velvet, such as the lady's maid at the chase has shown her in Miss Lydia's wardrobe. She feels the bracelets on her arms, and treads on a soft carpet in front of a tall mirror. But she has one thing in the drawer which she can venture to wear today, 
because she can hang it on the chain of dark brown berries which she has been used to wear on grand days, with a tiny flat scent bottle at the end of it tucked inside her frock, and she must put on her brown berries. Her neck would look so unfinished without it. Hetty was not quite as fond of the locket as of the earrings, though it was a handsome large locket with enamel flowers at the back and a beautiful gold border round the glass, which showed a light brown slightly waving lock forming a background for two little dark rings. She must keep it under her clothes, and no one would see it. But Hetty had another passion, only a little less strong than her love of finery, and that other passion made her like to wear the locket even hidden in her bosom. She would always have worn it if she had dared to encounter her aunt's questions about a ribbon round her neck. So now she slipped it on along her chain of dark brown berries and snapped the chain round her neck. It was not a very long chain, only allowing the locket to hang a little way below the edge of her frock. And now she had nothing to do but to put on her long sleeves, her new white gauze neckerchief, and her straw hat trimmed with white today instead of the pink. "'which had become rather faded under the July sun. "'That hat made the drop of bitterness in Hetty's cup today, "'for it was not quite new. "'Everybody would see that it was a little tanned against the white ribbon, "'and Mary Bird, she felt sure, would have a new hat or bonnet on. "'She looked for consolation at her fine white cotton stockings. "'They really were very nice indeed, "'and she had given almost all her spare money for them. Hetty's dream of the future could not make her insensible to triumph in the present. To be sure, Captain Donnithorne loved her so that he would never care about looking at other people, but then those other people didn't know how he loved her, and she was not satisfied to appear shabby and insignificant in their eyes even for a short space. The whole party was assembled in the house place when Hetty went down, all of course in their Sunday clothes and the bells had been ringing so this morning in honour of the captain's twenty-first birthday, and the work had all been got done so early that Marty and Tommy were not quite easy in their minds until their mother had assured them that going to church was not part of the day's festivities. Mr. Poyser had once suggested that the house should be shut up and left to take care of itself. For, said he, there's no danger of anybody's breaking in, everybody'll be at the chase, thieves and all. If we lock the house up, all the men can go. It's a day they want to see twice in their lives. But Mrs. Poyser answered with great decision. I never left the house to take care of itself since I was a missus, and I never will. There's been ill-looking tramps anew about the place this last week to carry off every ham and every spoon we got. And they all collogue together, them tramps, as it's a mercy they hanna come and poisoned the dogs and murdered us all in our beds afore we knowed. "'some Friday night when we'd got the money in the house to pay the men. "'And it's like enough the tramps know where we're going as well as we do our sends. "'For if old Harry wants any work done, you may be sure he'll find the means.' "'Nonsense about murdering us in our beds,' said Mr. Poyser. "'I've got a gun in our room, Hannah I, "'and these got ears as it's find it out if a mouse was gnawing the bacon. "'However, if thee wouldst na be easy, Alec can stay at home in the fore part of the day.' and Tim can come back towards five o'clock and let Alec have his turn. They may let Growler loose if anybody offers to do mischief, and there's Alec's dog, too, ready enough to set his tooth in a tramp if Alec gives him a wink. Mrs. Poyser accepted this compromise, but thought it advisable to bar and bolt to the utmost, and now, at the last moment before starting, Nancy the dairymaid was closing the shutters of the house-place, although the window, lying under the immediate observation of Alec and the dogs, might have been supposed the least likely to be selected for a burglarious attempt. The covered cart, without springs, was standing ready to carry the whole family except the men-servants. Mr. Poyser and the grandfather sat on the seat in front, and within there was room for all the women and children. The fuller the cart, the better, because then the jolting would not hurt so much and Nancy's broad person and thick arms were an excellent cushion to be pitched on. But Mr. Poyser drove at no more than a walking pace, that there might be as little risk of jolting as possible on this warm day, and there was time to exchange greetings and remarks with the foot-passengers who were going the same way, specking the paths between the green meadows and the golden cornfields with bits of movable bright colour, a scarlet waistcoat to match the poppies that nodded a little too thickly among the corn, 
or a dark blue neckerchief with ends flaunting across a brand new white smock frock. All Broxton and all Hayslope were to be at the chase, and make merry there in honour of the heir. And the old men and women, who had never been so far down this side of the hill for the last twenty years, were being brought from Broxton and Hayslope in one of the farmer's wagons, at Mr. Irwin's suggestion. The church bells had struck up again now, a last tune before the ringers came down the hill to have their share in the festival, and before the bells had finished, other music was heard approaching so that even old Brown, the sober horse that was drawing Mr. Poyser's cart, began to prick up his ears. It was the band of the Benefit Club, which had mustered in all its glory, that is to say, in bright blue scarfs and blue favours, and carrying its banner with the motto, Let Brotherly Love Continue, encircling a picture of a stone pit. The carts, of course, were not to enter the chase. Every one must get down at the lodges, and the vehicles must be sent back. "'Why, the chase is like a fair already,' said Mrs. Poyser, as she got down from the cart, and saw the group scattered under the great oaks, and the boys running about in the hot sunshine to survey the tall poles surmounted by the fluttering garments that were to be the prize of the successful climbers. "'I should have thought there was not so many people in the two parishes. Mercy on us! How hot it is out of the shade! Come here, Totty, else your little face will be burnt to a scratchin'. They might have cooked the dinners in that open space and saved the fires. I shall go to Mrs. Bess's room and sit down. Stop a bit, stop a bit, said Mr. Poyser. There's the wagon coming with the old folks in it. It'll be such a sight as won't come o'er again, to see em get down and walk along all together. You remember some on em in their prime, eh, father? Ay, ay, said old Martin, walking slowly under the shade of the lodge porch from which he could see the aged party descend. I remember Jacob Taft, walking fifty mile after the Scotch rebels, when they turned back from Stoniton. He felt himself quite a youngster, with a long life before him, as he saw the hayslope patriarch, Olfather Taft, descend from the wagon and walk towards him, in his brown nightcap, and leaning on his two sticks. "'Well, Mr. Taft,' shouted old Martin, at the utmost stretch of his voice, Although he knew the old man was stone deaf, he could not omit the propriety of a greeting. You're hearty yet. You can enjoy your send today for all your ninety and better. Your servant, Mesters, your servant, said Father Taft, in a treble tone, perceiving that he was in company. The aged group, under care of sons or daughters, themselves worn and grey, passed on along the least winding carriage road towards the house where a special table was prepared for them, while the poiser party wisely struck across the grass under the shade of the great trees, but not out of view of the house-front, with its sloping lawn and flower-beds, or of the pretty striped marquee at the edge of the lawn, standing at right angles with two larger marquees on each side of the open green space where the games were to be played. The house would have been nothing but a plain square mansion of Queen Anne's time, but for the remnant of an old abbey to which it was united at one end, in much the same way as one may sometimes see a new farmhouse rising high and prim at the end of older and lower farm offices. The fine old remnant stood a little backward and under the shadow of tall beeches, but the sun was now on the taller and more advanced front, the blinds were all down, and the house seemed asleep in the hot midday. It made Hetty quite sad to look at it. Arthur must be somewhere in the back rooms with the grand company, where he could not possibly know that she was come, and she should not see him for a long, long while, not till after dinner, when they said he was to come up and make a speech. But Hetty was wrong in part of her conjecture. No grand company was come except the Irwins, for whom the carriage had been sent early and Arthur was at that moment not in a back room, but walking with the rector into the broad stone cloisters of the old abbey, where the long tables were laid for all the cottage tenants and the farm servants. A very handsome young Briton he looked to-day, in high spirits and a bright blue frock-coat, the highest mode, his arm no longer in a sling. So open-looking and candid, too, but candid people have their secrets, and secrets leave no lines in young faces." "'Upon my word,' he said, as they entered the cool cloisters, 
I think the cottages have the best of it. These cloisters make a delightful dining-room on a hot day. That was capital advice of yours, Irwin, about the dinners, to let them be as orderly and comfortable as possible, and only for the tenants, especially as I had only a limited sum after all. For though my grandfather talked of a carte blanche, he couldn't make up his mind to trust me when it came to the point. Never mind. You'll give more pleasure in this quiet way, said Mr. Irwin. In this sort of thing people are constantly confounding liberality with riot and disorder. It sounds very grand to say that so many sheep and oxen were roasted whole, and everybody ate who liked to come, but in the end it generally happens that no one has had an enjoyable meal. If the people get a good dinner and a moderate quantity of ale in the middle of the day, they'll be able to enjoy the games as the day cools. You can't hinder some of them from getting too much towards evening, but drunkenness and darkness go better together than drunkenness and daylight. Well, I hope there won't be much of it. I've kept the Treddleston people away by having a feast for them in the town, and I've got Casson and Adam Bede and some other good fellows to look to the giving out of ale in the booths, and to take care things don't go too far. Come, let us go up above now and see the dinner tables for the large tenants. They went up the stone staircase, leading simply to the long gallery above the cloisters, a gallery where all the dusty, worthless old pictures had been banished for the last three generations, mouldy portraits of Queen Elizabeth and her ladies, General Monk with his eye knocked out, Daniel very much in the dark among the lions, and Julius Caesar on horseback with a high nose and laurel crown, holding his commentaries in his hand. "'What a capital thing it is that they saved this piece of the old abbey,' said Arthur. "'If I'm ever master here, I shall do up the gallery in first-rate style. "'We've got no room in the house a third as large as this. "'That second table is for the farmers' wives and children. "'Mrs. Best said it would be more comfortable for the mothers and children to be by themselves. "'I was determined to have the children and make a regular family thing of it. "'I shall be the old squire to those little lads and lasses some day.' and they'll tell their children what a much finer young fellow I was than my own son. There's a table for the women and children below as well. But you will see them all. You will come up with me after dinner, I hope. Yes, to be sure, said Mr. Irwin. I wouldn't miss your maiden speech to the tenantry. And there will be something else you'll like to hear, said Arthur. Let us go into the library, and I'll tell you all about it while my grandfather is in the drawing-room with the ladies. "'Something that will surprise you,' he continued as they sat down. "'My grandfather has come round after all.' "'What about Adam?' "'Yes, I should have ridden over to tell you about it, only I was so busy. "'You know I told you I had quite given up arguing the matter with him. "'I thought it was hopeless. "'But yesterday morning he asked me to come in here to him before I went out, "'and astonished me by saying that he had decided on all the new arrangements "'he should make in consequence of old Satchel being obliged to lay by work.' and that he intended to employ Adam in superintending the woods at a salary of a guinea a week and the use of a pony to be kept here. I believe the secret of it is, he saw from the first it would be a profitable plan, but he had some particular dislike of Adam to get over, and besides, the fact that I propose a thing is generally a reason with him for rejecting it. There is the most curious contradiction in my grandfather. I know he means to leave me all the money he has saved, and he is likely enough to have cut off poor Aunt Lydia, who has been a slave to him all her life, with only five hundred a year, for the sake of giving me all the more. And yet, I sometimes think he positively hates me, because I'm his heir. I believe if I were to break my neck, he would feel it the greatest misfortune that could befall him, and yet it seems a pleasure to him to make my life a series of petty annoyances. Ah, my boy! It is not only woman's love, that is, unloving love, as old Aeschylus calls it. There's plenty of unloving love in the world of a masculine kind. But tell me about Adam. Has he accepted the post? I don't see that it can be much more profitable than his present work, though, to be sure, it will leave him a good deal of time on his own hands. Well, I felt some doubt about it when I spoke to him, and he seemed to hesitate at first. His objection was that he thought he should not be able to satisfy my grandfather, but I begged him as a personal favour to me not to let any reason prevent him from accepting the place, if he really liked the employment and would not be giving up anything that was more profitable to him. 
and he assured me he should like it of all things. It would be a great step forward for him in business, and it would enable him to do what he had long wished to do, to give up working for Burge. He says he shall have plenty of time to superintend a little business of his own, which he and Seth will carry on, and will perhaps be able to enlarge by degrees. So he has agreed at last, and I have arranged that he shall dine with the large tenants to-day, and I mean to announce the appointment to them, and ask them to drink Adam's health. It's a little drama I've got up in honour of my friend Adam. He's a fine fellow, and I like the opportunity of letting people know that I think so. A drama in which friend Arthur piques himself on having a pretty part to play, said Mr. Irwin, smiling. But when he saw Arthur colour, he went on relentingly. My part, you know, is always that of the old fogey who sees nothing to admire in the young folks. I don't like to admit that I am proud of my pupil when he does graceful things. But I must play the amiable old gentleman for once, and second your toast in honour of Adam. Has your grandfather yielded on the other point too, and agreed to have a respectable man as steward? Oh, no, said Arthur, rising from his chair with an air of impatience, and walking along the room with his hands in his pockets. He's got some project or other about letting the chase farm, and bargaining for a supply of milk and butter for the house. But I ask no questions about it. It makes me too angry. I believe he means to do all the business himself, and have nothing in the shape of a steward. "'It's amazing what energy he has, though.' "'Well, we'll go to the ladies now,' said Mr. Irwin, rising too. "'I want to tell my mother what a splendid throne you've prepared for her under the marquee. "'Yes, and we must be going to luncheon too,' said Arthur. "'It must be two o'clock, for there is the gong beginning to sound for the tenants' dinners.'" End of chapter 22 Recording by Tony Ashworth Chapter Twenty Three of Adam Bede. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Adam Bede by George Eliot. Chapter Twenty Three. Dinner Time. When Adam heard that he was to dine upstairs with the large tenants, he felt rather uncomfortable at the idea of being exalted in this way above his mother and Seth, who were to dine in the cloisters below. But Mr. Mills, the butler, assured him that Captain Donathorne had given particular orders about it, and would be very angry if Adam was not there. Adam nodded and went up to Seth, who was standing a few yards off. "'Seth, lad,' he said, "'the captain has sent to say I'm to dine upstairs. "'He wishes it particular,' Mr. Mills says, "'so I suppose it'd be behaving ill for me not to go. "'But I don't like sitting up above thee and mother, "'as if I was better than my own flesh and blood. "'Thee not take it unkind, I hope.' "'Nay, nay, lad,' said Seth, "'thy honour's our honour, "'and if thee gets respect, thee'st won it by thy own deserts. "'The further I see thee above me the better, "'so long as thee feel'st like a brother to me.' "'It's because of thy being appointed over the woods, "'and it's nothing but what's right. "'That's a place of trust, and thee above a common workman now.' "'Aye,' said Adam, "'but nobody knows a word about it yet. "'I haven't given notice to Mr. Burge about leaving him, "'and I don't like to tell anybody else about it before he knows, "'for he'll be a good bit hurt, I doubt. "'People'll be wondering to see me there, "'and they'll like enough be guessing the reason and asking questions, "'for there's been so much talk up and down "'about my having the place this last three weeks.' "'Well, thee canst say thee wast ordered to come without being told the reason. "'That's the truth. "'And mother'll be fine and joyful about it. "'Let's go and tell her.' "'Adam was not the only guest invited to come upstairs on other grounds "'than the amount he contributed to the rent-roll. "'There were other people in the two parishes who derived dignity from their functions "'rather than from their pocket. "'And of these, Bartle Massey was one.' His lame walk was rather slower than usual on this warm day, so Adam lingered behind when the bell rang for dinner, that he might walk up with his old friend, for he was a little too shy to join the poiser party on this public occasion. Opportunities of getting to Hetty's side would be sure to turn up in the course of the day, and Adam contented himself with that, for he disliked any risk of being joked about Hetty. The big, outspoken, fearless man was very shy and diffident as to his love-making. "'Well, Mr. Massey,' said Adam, as Bartle came up, "'I'm going to dine upstairs with you to-day. The captain sent me orders.' 
Ah, said Bartle, pausing with one hand on his back. Then there's something in the wind. There's something in the wind. Have you heard anything about what the old squire means to do? Why, yes, said Adam. I'll tell you what I know, because I believe you can keep a still tongue in your head if you like, and I hope you'll not let drop a word till it's common talk, for I've particular reasons against its being known. Trust to me, my boy, trust to me. I've got no wife to worm it out of me and then run out and cackle it in everybody's hearing. If you trust a man, let him be a bachelor. Let him be a bachelor. Well, then, it was so far settled yesterday that I'm to take the management of the woods. The captain sent for me to offer it me when I was seeing to the poles and things here, and I've agreed to it. But if anybody asks any questions upstairs, just you take no notice, and turn the talk to something else, and I'll be obliged to you. Now, let us go on, for we're pretty nigh the last, I think. I know what to do, never fear, said Bartle, moving on. The news will be good sauce to my dinner. Aye, aye, my boy, you'll get on. I'll back you for an eye at measuring and a headpiece for figures against any man in this country, and you've had good teaching. You've had good teaching. When they got upstairs, the question which Arthur had left unsettled, as to who was to be president and who vice, was still under discussion, so that Adam's entrance passed without remark. It stands to sense, Mr. Casson was saying, as old Mr. Poyser, as is the oldest man in the room, should sit at top of the table. I wasn't butler fifteen year without learning the rights and the wrongs about dinner. Nay, nay, said old Martin, I'm gin up to my son. I'm no tenant now. Let my son take my place. The old folks ha had their turn. They mun make way for the young uns. I should ha thought the biggest tenant had the best right, more nor the oldest, said Luke Britton, who was not fond of the critical Mr. Poyser. There's Mr. Holdsworth has more land nor anybody else on the state. Well, said Mr. Poyser, suppose we say the man with the foulest land shall sit at top, then, whoever gets the honour, there'll be no envying on him. Eh, hey, here's Mr. Massey, said Mr. Craig, who, being a neutral in the dispute, had no interest but in conciliation. The schoolmaster ought to be able to tell you what's right. Who's to sit at top of the table, Mr. Massey? Why, the broadest man, said Bartle, and then he won't take up other folks' room, and the next broadest must sit at bottom. This happy mode of settling the dispute produced much laughter. A smaller joke would have sufficed, for that Mr. Casson, however, did not feel it compatible with his dignity and superior knowledge to join in the laugh until it turned out that he was fixed on as the second broadest man. Martin Poyser the Younger, as the broadest, was to be president, and Mr. Casson, as next broadest, was to be vice. Owing to this arrangement, Adam, being, of course, at the bottom of the table, fell under the immediate observation of Mr. Casson, who, too much occupied with the question of precedence, had not hitherto noticed his entrance. Mr. Casson, we have seen, considered Adam rather lifted up and peppery like. He thought the gentry made more fuss about this young carpenter than was necessary. They made no fuss about Mr. Casson, although he had been an excellent butler for fifteen years. Well, Mr. Bede, you're one of them as mounts Huppard's apace, he said, when Adam sat down. You've never dined here before, as I remember. No, Mr. Casson, said Adam, in his strong voice that could be heard along the table. I've never dined here before. But I come by Captain Donathorne's wish, and I hope it's not disagreeable to anybody here. Nay, nay, said several voices at once. We're glad you're come. Who's got anything to say again it? "'And you'll sing us over the hills and far away after dinner, won't ye?' said Mr. Chown. "'That's a song I'm uncommon fond on.' "'Pee!' said Mr. Craig. "'It's not to be named by sight of the Scotch tunes. "'I've never cared about singing myself. "'I've had something better to do. "'A man that's got the names and the nature of plants in his head "'isna likely to keep a hollow place to hold tunes in. "'But a second cousin of mine, a drovier, "'was a rare hand at remembering the Scotch tunes. "'He'd got nothing else to think on.' "'The Scotch tunes,' said Bartle Massey, contemptuously. "'I've heard enough of the Scotch tunes to last me while I live. "'They're fit for nothing but to frighten the birds with. "'That's to say, the English birds. "'For the Scotch birds may sing Scotch for what I know. "'Give the lads a bagpipe instead of a rattle, "'and I'll answer for it. The corn'll be safe.' "'Yes, there's folks as find pleasure in undervallying "'what they know little about,' said Mr. Craig. 
Why the Scotch tunes are just like a scolding, nagging woman, Bartle went on, without deigning to notice Mr. Craig's remark. They go on with the same thing over and over again, and never come to a reasonable end. Anybody'd think the Scotch tunes had always been asking a question of somebody as deaf as old Taft, and had never got an answer yet. Adam minded the less about sitting by Mr. Casson, because this position enabled him to see Hetty, who was not far off him at the next table. Hetty, however, had not even noticed his presence yet, for she was giving angry attention to Totty, who insisted on drawing up her feet on to the bench in antique fashion, and thereby threatened to make dusty marks on Hetty's pink and white frock. No sooner were the little fat legs pushed down than up they came again, for Totty's eyes were too busy in staring at the large dishes to see where the plum pudding was for her to retain any consciousness of her legs. Hetty got quite out of patience, and at last, with a frown and pout, and gathering tears, she said, Oh, dear aunt, I wish you'd speak to Totty. She keeps putting her legs up so and messing my frock. What's the matter with the child? She can never please you, said the mother. Let her come by the side of me, then. I can put up with her. Adam was looking at Hetty, and saw the frown and pout, and the dark eyes seeming to grow larger with pettish, half gathered tears. Quiet Mary Burge, who sat near enough to see that Hetty was cross, and that Adam's eyes were fixed on her, thought that so sensible a man as Adam must be reflecting on the small value of beauty in a woman whose temper was bad. Mary was a good girl, not given to indulge in evil feelings, but she said to herself that, since Hetty had a bad temper, it was better Adam should know it. And it was quite true that if Hetty had been plain, she would have looked very ugly and unamiable at that moment, and no one's moral judgment upon her would have been in the least beguiled. But really there was something quite charming in her pettishness. It looked so much more like innocent distress than ill humour, and the severe Adam felt no movement of disapprobation. He only felt a sort of amused pity, as if he had seen a kitten setting up its back, or a little bird with its feathers ruffled. He could not gather what was vexing her, but it was impossible to him to feel otherwise than that she was the prettiest thing in the world, and that if he could have his way, nothing should ever vex her any more. And presently, when Totty was gone, she caught his eye, and her face broke into one of its brightest smiles as she nodded to him. It was a bit of flirtation. She knew Mary Burge was looking at them, but the smile was like wine to Adam. End of chapter 23
as we're all a one mind about our young squire. We've pretty nigh all on us known you when you were a little un, and we've never known anything on you but what was good and honourable. You speak fair, and you act fair, and we're joyful when we look forward to your being our landlord, for we believe you mean to do right by everybody, and'll make no man's bread bitter to him if you can help it. That's what I mean, and that's what we all mean, and when a man said what he means, he'd better stop, for the ale'll be none the better for Stannon. And I'll not say how we like the ale yet, for we couldn't a well taste it till we'd drunk your health in it. But the dinner was good, and if there's anybody hasna enjoyed it, it must be the fault of his own inside. And as for the rector's company, it's well known as that's welcome to all the parish, wherever he may be, and I hope, and we all hope, as he'll live to see us old folks, and our children grown to men and women, and your honour a family man. I've no more to say as concerns the present time, and so we'll drink our young squire's health three times three. Hereupon a glorious shouting, a rapping, a jingling, a clattering, and a shouting, with plentiful de capo, pleasanter than a strain of sublimest music in the ears that receive such a tribute for the first time. Arthur had felt a twinge of conscience during Mr. Poyser's speech, but it was too feeble to nullify the pleasure he felt in being praised. Did he not deserve what was said of him, on the whole? If there was something in his conduct that Poyser wouldn't have liked if he had known it, why, no man's conduct will bear too close an inspection, and Poyser was not likely to know it. And after all, what had he done? Gone a little too far, perhaps, in flirtation, but another man in his place would have acted much worse, and no harm would come. No harm should come, for the next time he was alone with Hetty he would explain to her that she must not think seriously of him or of what had passed. It was necessary to Arthur, you perceive, to be satisfied with himself. Uncomfortable thoughts must be got rid of by good intentions for the future, which can be formed so rapidly that he had time to be uncomfortable and to become easy again before Mr. Poyser's slow speech was finished. And when it was time for him to speak, he was quite light-hearted. "'I thank you all, my good friends and neighbours,' Arthur said, "'for the good opinion of me, and the kind feelings towards me "'which Mr. Poyser has been expressing on your behalf and on his own. "'And it will always be my heartiest wish to deserve them. "'In the course of things we may expect that, if I live, "'I shall one day or other be your landlord. "'Indeed, it is on the ground of that expectation "'that my grandfather has wished me to celebrate this day "'and to come among you now.' and i look forward to this position not merely as one of power and pleasure for myself but as a means of benefiting my neighbours it hardly becomes so young a man as i am to talk much about farming to you who are most of you so much older and are men of experience still i have interested myself a good deal in such matters and learned as much about them as my opportunities have allowed and when the course of events shall place the estate in my hands it will be my first desire to afford my tenants all the encouragement a landlord can give them in improving their land and trying to bring about a better practice of husbandry it will be my wish to be looked on by all my deserving tenants as their best friend and nothing would make me so happy as to be able to respect every man on the estate and to be respected by him in turn it is not my place at present to enter into particulars i only meet your good hopes concerning me by telling you that my own hopes correspond to them that what you expect from me i desire to fulfil and i am quite of mr poyser's opinion that when a man has said what he means he had better stop but the pleasure i feel in having my own health drunk by you would not be perfect if we did not drink the health of my grandfather who has filled the place of both parents to me i will say no more until you have joined me in drinking his health on a day when he has wished me to appear among you as the future representative of his name and family perhaps there was no one present except mr irwine who thoroughly understood and approved arthur's graceful mode of proposing his grandfather's health the farmers thought the young squire knew well enough that they hated the old squire and mrs poyser said he'd better not have stirred a kettle of sour broth the bucolic mind does not readily apprehend the refinements of good taste, but the toast could not be rejected, and when it had been drunk, Arthur said, I thank you, both for my grandfather and myself, and now there is one more thing I wish to tell you, that you may share my pleasure about it, as I hope and believe you will. I think there can be no man here who is not a respect, and some of you, I am sure, have a very high regard for my friend Adam Bede. 
It is well known to every one in this neighborhood that there is no man whose word can be more depended on than his, that whatever he undertakes to do he does well, and is as careful for the interests of those who employ him as for his own. I am proud to say that I was very fond of Adam when I was a little boy, and I have never lost my old feeling for him. I think that shows that I know a good fellow when I find him. It has long been my wish that he should have the management of the woods on the estate, which happened to be very valuable, not only because I think so highly of his character, but because he has the knowledge and the skill which fit him for the place. And I'm happy to tell you that it is my grandfather's wish, too, and it is now settled that Adam shall manage the woods, a change which I am sure will be very much for the advantage of the estate, and I hope you will by and by join me in drinking his health and in wishing him all the prosperity in life that he deserves. But there is a still older friend of mine than Adam Bede present, and I need not tell you that it is Mr. Irwine. I am sure you will agree with me that we must drink to no other person's health until we have drunk his. I know you have all reason to love him, but no one of his parishioners has so much reason as I. Come, charge your glasses, and let us drink to our excellent rector three times three. This toast was drunk with all the enthusiasm that was wanting to the last, and it certainly was the most picturesque moment in the scene when Mr. Irwine got up to speak, and all the faces in the room were turned towards him. The superior refinement of his face was much more striking than that of Arthur's when seen in comparison with the people round them. Arthur's was a much commoner British face, and the splendor of his new-fashioned clothes was more akin to the young farmer's taste in costume than Mr. Irwine's powder and the well-brushed but well-worn black, which seemed to be his chosen suit for great occasions, for he had the mysterious secret of never wearing a new-looking coat. This is not the first time, by a great many, he said, that I have had to thank my parishioners for giving me tokens of their good will. But neighborly kindness is among those things that are the more precious the older they get. Indeed, our pleasant meeting to-day is a proof that when what is good comes of age and is likely to live, there is reason for rejoicing. And the relation between us and as clergymen and parishioners came of age two years ago, for it is three and twenty years since I first came among you, and I see some tall, fine-looking young men here, as well as some blooming young women, that were far from looking as pleasantly at me when I christened them, as I am happy to see them looking now. But I am sure you will not wonder when I say that among all those young men, the one in whom I have the strongest interest is my friend Mr. Arthur Donathorne, for whom you have just expressed your regard. I had the pleasure of being his tutor for several years, and have naturally had opportunities of knowing him intimately, which cannot have occurred to any one else who is present, and I have some pride as well as pleasure in assuring you that I share your high hopes concerning him, and your confidence in his possession of those qualities which will make him an excellent landlord when the time shall come for him to take that important position among you. We feel alike on most matters on which a man who's getting towards fifty can feel in common with a man of one and twenty, and he has just been expressing a feeling which I share very heartily, and I would not willingly omit the opportunity of saying so. That feeling is his value and respect for Adam Bede. People in a high station are, of course, more thought of and talked about, and have their virtues more praised than those whose lives are passed in humble everyday work. But every sensible man knows how necessary that humble everyday work is, and how important it is to us that it should be done well. And I agree with my friend, Mr. Arthur Donathorne, in feeling that when a man whose duty lies in that sort of work shows a character which would make him an example in any station, his merit should be acknowledged." He is one of those to whom honour is due, and his friends should delight to honour him. I know Adam Bede well. I know what he is as a workman, and what he has been as a son and brother, and I am saying the simplest truth when I say that I respect him as much as I respect any man living. But I am not speaking to you about a stranger. Some of you are his intimate friends, and I believe there is not one here who does not know enough of him to join heartily in drinking his health." As Mr. Irwine paused, Arthur jumped up, and filling his glass, said, A bumper to Adam Bede, and may he live to have sons as faithful and clever as himself. No hearer, not even Bartle Massey, was so delighted with this toast as Mr. Poyser. Tough work as his first speech had been, he would have started up to make another if he had not known the extreme irregularity of such a course. 
As it was, he found an outlet for his feeling in drinking his ale unusually fast and setting down his glass with a swing of his arm and a determined rap. If Jonathan Burge and a few others felt less comfortable on the occasion, they tried their best to look contented. And so the toast was drunk with a good will apparently unanimous. Adam was rather paler than usual when he got up to thank his friends. He was a good deal moved by this public tribute, very naturally, for he was in the presence of all his little world, and it was uniting to do him honour. But he felt no shyness about speaking, not being troubled with small vanity or lack of words. He looked neither awkward nor embarrassed, but stood in his usual firm, upright attitude, with his head thrown a little backward and his hands perfectly still, in that rough dignity which is peculiar to intelligent, honest, well-built workmen, who are never wondering what is their business in the world. "'I am quite taken by surprise,' he said. "'I didn't expect anything of this sort, for it's a good deal more than my wages.' "'But I have the more reason to be grateful to you, Captain, and to you, Mr. Irwine, "'and to all my friends here who have drunk my health and wished me well. "'It'd be nonsense for me to be saying I don't at all deserve the opinion you have of me. "'That'd be poor thanks to you, to say that you've known me all these years, "'and yet haven't sense enough to find out a great deal of the truth about me. "'You think, if I undertake to do a bit of work, I'll do it well, "'be my pay big or little, and that's true.' I'd be ashamed to stand before you here if it wasn't true. But it seems to me that's a man's plain duty, and nothing to be conceited about, and it's pretty clear to me as I've never done more than my duty. For let us do what we will, it's only making use of the spirit and the powers that have been given to us. And so this kindness of yours, I'm sure, is no debt you owe me, but a free gift, and as such I accept it, and am grateful." And as to this new employment I've taken in hand, I'll only say that I took it at Captain Donathorne's desire, and that I'll try to fulfill his expectations. I'd wish for no better lot than to work under him, and to know that while I was getting my own bread I was taking care of his interests. For I believe he's one of those gentlemen as wishes to do the right thing, and to leave the world a bit better than he found it, which it's my belief every man may do, whether he's simple or gentle, whether he sets a good bit of work going and finds the money, or whether he does the work with his own hands. There's no occasion for me to say any more about what I feel towards him. I hope to show it through the rest of my life in my actions. There were various opinions about Adam's speech. Some of the women whispered that he didn't show himself thankful enough and seemed to speak as proud as could be. But most of the men were of the opinion that nobody could speak more straightforward, and that Adam was as fine a chap as need be. While such observations were being buzzed about, mingled with wonderings as to what the old squire meant to do for a bailiff, and whether he was going to have a steward, the two gentlemen had risen, and were walking round to the table where the wives and children sat. There was none of the strong ale here, of course, but wine and dessert, sparkling gooseberry for the young ones, and some good sherry for the mothers. Mrs. Poyser was at the head of this table, and Toddy was now seated in her lap, bending her small nose deep down into a wine-glass in search of the nuts floating there. "'How do you do, Mrs. Poyser?' said Arthur. "'Weren't you pleased to hear your husband make such a good speech today? "'Oh, sir, the men are mostly so tongue-tied. You're forced partly to guess what they mean, as you do with the dumb creatures.' "'What? You think you could have made it better for him?' said Mr. Irwine, laughing. "'Well, sir, when I want to say anything, I can mostly find words to say it in, thank God. Not as I'm a-finding fault with my husband, for if he's a man of few words, what he says he'll stand to.' "'I'm sure I never saw a prettier party than this,' Arthur said, looking round at the apple-cheeked children. "'My aunt and the Miss Irwines will come up and see you presently. "'They were afraid of the noise of the toasts, but it would be a shame for them not to see you at table.' He walked on, speaking to the mothers and patting the children, while Mr. Irwine satisfied himself with standing still and nodding at a distance, that no one's attention might be disturbed from the young squire, the hero of the day. Arthur did not venture to stop near Hetty, but merely bowed to her as he passed along the opposite side. The foolish child felt her heart swelling with discontent, for what woman was ever satisfied with apparent neglect, even when she knows it to be the mask of love? Hetty thought this was going to be the most miserable day she had had for a long while. A moment of chill daylight and reality came across her dream. 
Arthur, who had seemed so near to her only a few hours before, was separated from her, as the hero of a great procession is separated from a small outsider in a crowd. End of chapter 24《The great dance was not to begin until eight o'clock, but for any lads and lasses who liked to dance on the shady grass before then, there was music always at hand. For was not the band of the Benefit Club capable of playing excellent jigs, reels, and hornpipes? And besides this, there was a grand band hired from Rossiter, who, with their wonderful wind instruments and puffed-out cheeks, were themselves a delightful show to the small boys and girls. To say nothing of Joshua Rand's fiddle, which, by an act of generous forethought, he had provided himself with, in case any one should be of sufficiently pure taste to prefer dancing to a solo on that instrument. Meantime, when the sun had moved off the great open space in front of the house, the games began. There were, of course, well soaked poles to be climbed by the boys and youths, races to be run by the old women, races to be run in sacks, heavy weights to be lifted by the strong men, and a long list of challenges to such ambitious attempts as that of walking as many yards as possible on one leg, feats in which it was generally remarked that Wiry Ben, being the lissomest, springest fellow in the country, was sure to be preeminent. To crown all, there was to be a donkey race, that sublimest of all races, conducted on the grand socialistic idea of everybody encouraging everybody else's donkey and the sorriest donkey winning. And soon after four o'clock, splendid old Mrs. Irwin, in her damask satin and jewels and black lace, was led out by Arthur, followed by the whole family party, to her raised seat under the striped marquee, where she was to give out the prizes to the victors. Staid formal Miss Lydia had requested to resign that queenly office to the royal old lady, and Arthur was pleased with this opportunity of gratifying his godmother's taste for stateliness. Old Mr. Donnithorne, the delicately clean, finely scented, withered old man, let out Miss Irwin with his air of punctilious acid politeness. Mr. Gawain brought Miss Lydia looking neutral and stiff in an elegant peach-blossom silk. And Mr. Irwin came, last, with his pale sister Anne. No other friend of the family, besides Mr. Gawain, was invited today. There was to be a grand dinner for the neighboring gentry on the morrow, but today all the forces were required for the entertainment of the tenants. There was a sunk fence in front of the marquee, dividing the lawn from the park, but a temporary bridge had been made for the passage of the victors, and the groups of people standing or seated here and there on benches stretched on each side of the open space from the white marquees up to the sunk fence. "'Upon my word, it's a pretty sight,' said the old lady in her deep voice when she was seated, and looked round on the bright scene with its dark green background. "'And it's the last fate day,' I'm likely to see, unless you make haste and get married, Arthur. But take care you get a charming bride, else I would rather die without seeing her. You're so terribly fastidious, Godmother, said Arthur. I'm afraid I should never satisfy you with my choice. Well, I won't forgive you if she's not handsome. I can't be put off with amiability, which is always the excuse people are making for the existence of plain people, and she must not be silly. That will never do, because you'll want managing, 
and a silly woman can't manage you. Who is that tall young man, Dauphin, with the mild face? There, standing without his hat, and taking such care of that tall old woman by the side of him. His mother, of course. I like to see that. What? Don't you know him, mother? asked Mr. Irwin. That is Seth Bede, Adam's brother, a Methodist, but a very good fellow. Poor Seth has looked rather downhearted of late. I thought it was because of his father's dying in that sad way. But Joshua Rand tells me he wanted to marry that sweet little Methodist preacher who was here about a month ago, and I suppose she refused him. Ah, I remember hearing about her. But there are no end of people here that I don't know, for they're grown up and altered so since I used to go about. "'What excellent sight you have,' said old Mr. Donathorne, who was holding a double glass up to his eyes, "'to see the expression of that young man's face so far off. "'His face is nothing but a pale, blurred spot to me, "'but I fancy I have the advantage of you when we come to look close. "'I can read small print without spectacles.' "'Ah, my dear sir, you began with being very near-sighted, "'and those near-sighted eyes always wear the best.' I want very strong spectacles to read with, but then I think my eyes get better and better for things at a distance. I suppose if I could live another fifty years, I should be blind to everything that wasn't out of other people's sight, like a man who stands at a well and sees nothing but the stars. See, said Arthur, the old women are ready to set out on their race now. Which do you bet on, Gwaine? The long-legged one, unless they're going to have several heats. "'and then the little wiry one may win.' "'There are the Poysers, mother, not far off on the right hand,' said Miss Irwin. "'Mrs. Poyser is looking at you. Do take notice of her.' "'To be sure I will,' said the old lady, giving a gracious bow to Mrs. Poyser. "'A woman who sends me such excellent cream cheese is not to be neglected. "'Bless me, what a fat child that is she is holding on her knee. "'But who is that pretty girl with dark eyes?' "'That is Hetty Sorrel,' said Miss Lydia Donathorne, "'Martin Poyser's niece, a very likely young person, and well-looking, too. "'My maid has taught her fine needlework, "'and she has mended some lace of mine very respectably indeed, very respectably. "'Why, she has lived with the Poysers six or seven years, mother. "'You must have seen her,' said Miss Irwin. "'No, I've never seen her, child, at least not as she is now,' said Mrs. Irwin. "'continuing to look at Hetty. "'Well, looking indeed. "'She's a perfect beauty. "'I've never seen anything so pretty since my young days. "'What a pity such beauty as that "'should be thrown away among the farmers "'when it's wanted so terribly "'among the good families without fortune. "'I dare say now she'll marry a man "'who would have thought her just as pretty "'if she had round eyes and red hair.' Arthur dared not turn his eyes towards Hetty while Mrs. Irwin was speaking of her. He feigned not to hear, and to be occupied with something on the opposite side. But he saw her plainly enough without looking, saw her in heightened beauty, because he heard her beauty praised. For other men's opinion, you know, was like a native climate to Arthur's feelings. It was the air on which they thrived the best, and grew strong. Yes, she was enough to turn any man's head, and any man in his place would have done and felt the same, and to give her up after all, as he was determined to do, would be an act that he should always look back upon with pride. No, mother, and Mr. Irwin, replying to her last words, I can't agree with you there. The common people are not quite so stupid as you imagine. The commonest man who has his ounce of sense and feeling is conscious of the difference between a lovely, delicate woman and a coarse one. Even a dog feels a difference in their presence. The man may be no better able than the dog to explain the influence the more refined beauty has on him, but he feels it. Bless me, Dauphin, what does an old bachelor like you know about it? Oh, that is one of the matters in which old bachelors are wiser than married men, because they have time for more general contemplation. Your fine critic of woman must never shackle his judgment by calling one woman his own. 
but as an example of what I was saying, that pretty Methodist preacher I mentioned just now told me that she had preached to the roughest miners and had never been treated with anything but the utmost respect and kindness by them. The reason is, though she doesn't know it, that there's so much tenderness, refinement, and purity about her. Such a woman as that brings with her airs from heaven that the coarsest fellow is not insensible to. "'Here's a delicate bit of womanhood or girlhood coming to receive a prize, I suppose,' said Mr. Gawain. "'She must be one of the racers in the sacks who had set off before we came.' "'The bit of womanhood was our old acquaintance Bessie Cranage, "'otherwise Chad's Bess, whose large red cheeks and blousy person "'had undergone an exaggeration of color, "'which, if she had happened to be a heavenly body, would have made her sublime.' Bessie, I am sorry to say, had taken to her earrings again since Dina's departure, and was otherwise decked out in such small finery as she could muster. Anyone who could have looked into poor Bessie's heart would have seen a striking resemblance between her little hopes and anxieties and Hetty's. The advantage, perhaps, would have been on Bessie's side in the matter of feeling. But then you'll see they were so very different outside. You would have been inclined to box Bessie's ears, and you would have longed to kiss Hetty. Bessie had been tempted to run the arduous race partly from mere hedonish gaiety, partly because of the prize. Someone had said there were to be cloaks and other nice clothes for prizes, and she approached the marquee, fanning herself with her handkerchief, but with exultation sparkling in her round eyes. "'Here is the prize for the first sack race,' said Miss Lydia, taking a large parcel from the table where the prizes were laid and giving it to Mrs. Irwin before Bessie came up. An excellent gogram gown and a piece of flannel. You didn't think the winner was to be so young, I suppose, aunt, said Arthur. Couldn't you find something else for this girl and save that grim-looking gown for one of the older women? I have bought nothing but what is useful and substantial, said Miss Lydia, "'adjusting her own lace. "'I should not think of encouraging a love of finery "'in young women of that class. "'I have a scarlet cloak, "'but that is for the old woman who wins.' "'This speech of Miss Lydia's "'produced rather a mocking expression "'in Mrs. Irwin's face "'as she looked at Arthur, "'while Bessie came up "'and dropped a series of curtsies. "'This is Bessie Cranage, mother,' "'said Mr. Irwin kindly. "'Chad Cranage's daughter.' "'You remember Chad Cranage, the blacksmith?' "'Yes, to be sure,' said Mrs. Irwin. "'Well, Bessie, here is your prize. "'Excellent warm things for winter. "'I'm sure you have had hard work to win them this warm day.' "'Betsy's lip fell as she saw the ugly, heavy gown, "'which felt so hot and disagreeable, too, on this July day, "'and was such a great ugly thing to carry.' She dropped her curtsies again without looking up, and with a growing tremulousness about the corners of her mouth, and then turned away. "'Poor girl,' said Arthur. "'I think she's disappointed. I wish it had been something more to her taste.' "'She's a bold-looking young person,' observed Miss Lydia. "'Not at all one I should like to encourage.' Arthur silently resolved that he would make Bessie a present of money before the day was over, that she might buy something more to her mind. But she, not aware of the consolation in store for her, turned out of the open space where she was visible from the marquee, and throwing down the odious bundle under a tree, began to cry, very much tittered at the while by the small boys. In this situation she was described by her discreet matronly cousin, who lost no time in coming up, having just given the baby into her husband's charge. "'What's the matter with ye?' said Bess the matron, taking up the bundle and examining it. "'Ye in sweltered your son, I reckon, running that fool's race. "'And here they ain't gin ye lots of good gogram and flannel, "'as should have been gin by good rights to them as had the sense to keep away from such foolery. "'Ye might spare me a bit of this gogram to make clothes for the lad. "'Ye were ne'er ill-natured, Bess. I ne'er said that on ye.' "'You may take it all for what I care,' said Bess, the maiden, with a pettish movement, beginning to wipe away her tears and recover herself. "'Well, I could do it, if—' 
Be ye want to get rid on it, said the disinterested cousin, walking quickly away with the bundle, lest Chad's niece should change her mind. But that bony-cheeked lass was blessed with an elasticity of spirits that secured her from any rankling grief, and by the time the grand climax of the donkey race came on, her disappointment was entirely lost in the delightful excitement of attempting to stimulate the last donkey by hisses while the boys applied the argument of sticks. But the strength of the donkey mind lies in adopting a course inversely as the arguments urged, which, well considered, requires as great a mental force as the direct sequence. And the present donkey proved the first-rate order of his intelligence by coming to a dead standstill just when the blows were thickest. Great was the shouting of the crowd, radiant the grinning of Bill Downs, the stone sawer and the fortunate rider of this superior beast, which stood calm and stiff-legged in the midst of its triumph. Arthur himself had provided the prizes for the men, and Bill was made happy with a splendid pocket-knife, supplied with blades and gimlets enough to make a man at home on a desert island. He had hardly returned from the marquee with the prize in his hand when it began to be understood that Wiry Ben proposed to amuse the company before the gentry went to dinner with an impromptu and gratuitous performance, namely a hornpipe, the main idea of which was doubtless borrowed. But this was to be developed by the dancer in so peculiar and complex a manner that no one could deny him the praise of originality. Wiry Ben's pride in his dancing, an accomplishment productive of great effect at the yearly wake, had needed only slightly elevating by an extra quantity of good ale to convince him that the gentry would be very much struck with his performance of his hornpipe. And he had been decidedly encouraged in this idea by Joshua Ron, who observed that it was nothing but right to do something to please the young squire, in return for what he had done for them. You will be the less surprised at this opinion in so grave a personage when you learn that Ben had requested Mr. Ron to accompany him on the fiddle, and Joshua felt quite sure that though there might not be much in the dancing, the music would make up for it. Adam Bede, who was present in one of the large marquees where the plan was being discussed, told Ben he had better not make a fool of himself, a remark which at once fixed Ben's determination. He was not going to let anything alone because Adam and Bede turned up his nose at it. "'What's this? What's this?' said old Mr. Donathorne. "'Is something you've arranged with Arthur? Here's the clerk coming with his fiddle and a smart fellow with a nosegay in his buttonhole.' "'No,' said Arthur. "'I know nothing about it. By Jove, he's going to dance. It's one of the carpenters. I forget his name at this moment.' "'It's Ben Carnage. Wiry Ben, they call him.' said Mr. Irwin. Rather a loose fish, I think. And, my dear, I see that fiddle scraping is too much for you. You're getting tired. Let me take you in now that you may rest till dinner. Miss Anne rose assentingly, and the good brother took her away, while Joshua's preliminary scrapings burst into the white cockade, from which he intended to pass to a variety of tunes by a series of transitions which his good ear really taught him to execute with some skill. It would have been an exasperating fact to him if he had known it that the general attention was too thoroughly absorbed by Ben's dancing for anyone to give much heed to the music. Have you ever seen a real English rustic perform a solo dance? Perhaps you have only seen a ballet rustic smiling like a merry countryman in crockery with graceful turns of the haunch and insinuating movements of the head. That is as much like the real thing as the bird waltz is like the song of birds. Wiry Ben never smiled. He looked as serious as a dancing monkey, as serious as if he had been an experimental philosopher ascertaining in his own person the amount of shaking and the varieties of angularity that could be given to the human limbs. To make amends for the abundant laughter in the striped marquee, Arthur clapped his hands continually and cried, Bravo! But Ben had one admirer whose eyes followed his movements with a fervid gravity that equaled his own. It was Martin Poyser, who was seated on a bench 
with Tommy between his legs. What dost think of that? he said to his wife. He goes as pat to the music as if he was made of clockwork. I used to be a pretty good un at dancing myself when I was lighter, but I could never a hit it just to the air like that. It's little matter what his limbs are, to my thinking, returned Mrs. Poyser. He's empty enough in the upper story, or he'd never come jigging on, stamping in that way like a mad grasshopper for the gentry to look at him. They're fit to die with laughing, I can see. Well, well, so much the better. It amuses them, said Mr. Poyser, who did not easily take an irritable view of things. But they're going away now to have their dinner, I reckon. Well, move about a bit, shall we, and see what Adam Bede's doing. He's got to look after the drinking and things. I doubt he hasn't had much fun. End of chapter 25 Recording by Father Ziley, Detroit, Michigan, December 2008 D-R-Z-E-I-L-E dot net Chapter 26 The Dance of Adam Bede This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Father Ziley of Detroit Adam Bede by George Eliot Chapter 26 of Book 3 The Dance Arthur had chosen the entrance hall for the ballroom, very wisely, for no other room could have been so airy, or would have had the advantage of the wide doors opening into the garden as well as a ready entrance into the other rooms. To be sure, a stone floor was not the pleasantest to dance on, but then most of the dancers had known what it was to enjoy a Christmas dance on kitchen quarries. It was one of those entrance halls which makes the surrounding rooms look like closets, with stucco angels, trumpets, and flower wreaths on the lofty ceiling, and great medallions of miscellaneous heroes on the walls, alternating with statues in niches. Just the sort of place to be ornamented well with green boughs, and Mr. Craig had been proud to show his taste and his hot house plants on the occasion. The broad steps of the stone staircase were covered with cushions to serve as seats for the children, who were to stay till half past nine with the servant maids to see the dancing, and as this dance was confined to the chief tenants, there was abundant room for everyone. The lights were charmingly disposed in colored paper lamps, high up among the green boughs, and the farmers' wives and daughters, as they peeped in, believed no scene could be more splendid. They knew now quite well in what sort of rooms the king and queen lived, and their thoughts glanced with some pity towards cousins and acquaintances who had not this fine opportunity of knowing how things went on in the great world. The lamps were already lit, though the sun had not long set, and there was that calm light out of the doors in which we seemed to see all objects more distinctly than in the broad day. It was a pretty scene outside the house. The farmers and their families were moving about the lawn, among the flowers and shrubs, or along the broad straight road leading from the east front, where a carpet of mossy grass spread on each side, studded here and there with a dark flat-bowed cedar, or a grand pyramidal fir sweeping the ground with its branches, all tipped with a fringe of paler green. The groups of cottagers in the park were gradually diminishing, the young ones being attracted towards the lights that were beginning to gleam from the windows of the gallery in the abbey, which was to be their dancing room, and some of the sober elder ones thinking it time to go home quietly. One of these was Lisbeth Bede, and Seth went with her, not from filial attention only, for his conscience would not let him join in dancing. It had been rather a melancholy day to Seth. Dinah had never been more constantly present with him than in this scene, where everything was so unlike her. He saw her all the more vividly after looking at the thoughtless faces and gay-colored dresses of the young women. Just as one feels the beauty and the greatness of a pictured Madonna, the more 
when it has been for a moment screened from us by a vulgar head in a bonnet. But this presence of Dinah in his mind only helped him to bear the better with his mother's mood, which had been becoming more and more querulous for the last hour. Poor Elizabeth was suffering from a strange conflict of feelings. Her joy and pride in the honor paid to her darling son, Adam, was beginning to be worsted in the conflict with the jealousy and fretfulness which had revived when Adam came to tell her that Captain Donnithorne desired him to join the dancers in the hall. Adam was getting more and more out of her reach. She wished all the old troubles back again, for then it mattered more to Adam what his mother said and did. "'Eh, it's fine talking of dancing,' she said, "'and thy father not a five week in his grave, "'and I wish I were there too, "'instead o' being left to take up merrier folks' room above ground.' "'Nay, don't look at it in that way, mother,' said Adam, "'who was determined to be gentle to her today. "'I don't mean to dance. "'I shall only look on, "'and since the captain wishes me to be there, It'd look as if I thought I knew better than him to say as I'd rather not stay, and thee knowest how he's behaved to me today. Eh, thee do as thee slickst, for the old mother's got no right to hinder thee. She's not but the old husk, and thee slipped away from her like the ripe nut. Well, mother, said Adam, I'll go and tell the captain as it hurts thy feelings for me to stay, and I'd rather go home upon that account. He won't take it ill, then, I dare say, and I'm willing. He said this with some effort, for he really longed to be near Hetty this evening. Nay, nay, I want to ha thee do that. The young squire'll be angered. Go and do what they tordered to do, and me and Seth'll go home. I know it's a grit honor for thee to be so looked on, and who's to be prouder on it nor thy mother? Hadn't a she the cumber o' rearin' thee and doin' for thee all these years? Well, good-bye then, mother. Good-bye, lad. Remember Jip when you get home," said Adam, turning away towards the gate of the pleasure grounds, where he hoped he might be able to join the poisers, for he had been so occupied throughout the afternoon that he had had no time to speak to Hetty. His eye soon detected a distant group, which he knew to be the right one. Returning to the house along the broad gravel road, and he hastened on to meet them. Why, Adam, I'm glad to get sight on you again," said Mister Poyser, who was carrying Totty on his arm. "You're going to have a bit of fun, I hope. Now your work's all done, and here's Hetty has promised no end of partners, and I've just been asking her if she'd agree to dance with you, and she says no. Well, I didn't think of dancing tonight," said Adam, already tempted to change his mind as he looked at Hetty. "Nonsense," said Mister Poyser. "Why, everybody's going to dance tonight, all but the old squire and Missus Irwin. Missus Best's been telling us as Miss Liddy and Miss Irwin will dance, and the young squire'll pick my wife for his first partner to open the ball. So she'll be forced to dance, though she's laid by ever since the Christmas before the little one was born." You canna for shame stand still, Adam, and you a fine young fellow and can dance as well as anybody. Nay, nay," said Missus Poyser. "It'd be unbecoming. I know the dancing's nonsense, but if you stick at everything because it's nonsense, you want to go far in this life. When your broth's ready made for you, you mun swallow the thickening, or else let the broth alone." Then, if Hetty'll dance with me," said Adam, yielding either to Missus Poyser's argument or to something else, "I'll dance whichever dance she's free." "I've got no partner for the fourth dance," said Hetty. "I'll dance that with you if you like." "Ah," said Mister Poyser, "but your mum dance the first dance, Adam, else it'll look particular. There's plenty of nice partners to pick and choose from, and it's hard for the gals when the men stand by and don't ask 'em." Adam felt the justice of Mister Poyser's observation. It would not do for him to dance with no one besides Hetty, and remembering that Jonathan Berg had some reason to feel hurt today, he resolved to ask Miss Mary to dance with him the first dance, if she had no other partner. "There's the big clock striking eight," said Mister Poyser. 
"'We must make haste in now, else the squire and the ladies will be in before us, and that wouldn't look well.' When they had entered the hall, and the three children under Molly's charge had been seated on the stairs, the folding doors of the drawing-room were thrown open, and Arthur entered in his regimentals, leading Mrs. Irwin to a carpet-covered dais ornamented with hothouse plants, where she and Miss Anne were to be seated with old Mr. Donathorne, that they might look on at the dancing, like the kings and queens in the plays. Arthur had put on his uniform to please the tenants, he said, who thought as much of his militia dignity as if it had been an elevation to the premiership. He had not the least objection to gratify them in that way. His uniform was very advantageous to his figure. The old squire, before sitting down, walked around the hall to greet the tenants and make polite speeches to the wives. He was always polite, but the farmers had found out, after long puzzling, that this polish was one of the signs of hardness. It was observed that he gave his most elaborate civility to Mrs. Poyser to-night, inquiring particularly about her health, recommending her to strengthen herself with cold water, as he did, and avoid all drugs. Mrs. Poyser curtsied and thanked him with great self-command. But when he had passed on, she whispered to her husband, "'I'll lay my life he's brewing some nasty turn against us. Old Harry doesn't wag his tail so for nothing.' Mr. Poyser had no time to answer, for now Arthur came up and said, "'Mrs. Poyser, I've come to request the favor of your hand for the first dance, and, Mr. Poyser, you must let me take you to my aunt, for she claims you as her partner.' The wife's pale cheek flushed with a nervous sense of unwanted honor, as Arthur led her to the top of the room. But Mr. Poyser, to whom an extra glass had restored his youthful confidence in his good looks and good dancing, walked along with them quite proudly, secretly flattering himself that Miss Lydia had never had a partner in her life who could lift her off the ground as he would. In order to balance the honors given to the two parishes, Miss Irwin danced with Luke Britton, the largest Broxton farmer, and Mr. Gawain let out Mrs. Britton. Mr. Irwin, after seating his sister Anne, had gone to the Abbey Gallery, as he had agreed with Arthur beforehand, to see how the merriment of the cottagers was prospering. Meanwhile, all the less distinguished couples had taken their places. Hetty was led out by the inevitable Mr. Craig, and Mary Berg by Adam. And now the music struck up, and the glorious country dance, best of all dances, began. Pity it was not a boarded floor. Then the rhythmic stamping of the thick shoes would have been better than any drums. That merry stamping, that gracious nodding of the head, that waving bestowal of the hand, where can we see them now? That simple dancing of well-covered matrons laying aside for an hour the cares of house and dairy, remembering but not affecting youth, not jealous but proud of the young maidens by their side, that holiday sprightliness of portly husbands paying little compliments to their wives, as if courting days were come again. Those lads and lasses, a little confused and awkward with their partners, having nothing to say, it would be a pleasant variety to see all that sometimes, instead of low dresses and large skirts, and scanning glances exploring costumes, and languid men in lacquered boots smiling with double meaning. There was but one thing to mar Martin Poyser's pleasure in this dance. It was that he was always in close contact with Luke Britton, that slovenly farmer. He thought of throwing a little glazed coldness into his eye and the crossing of hands. But then, as Miss Irwin was opposite to him, instead of the offensive Luke, he might freeze the wrong person. So he gave his face up to hilarity, unchilled by moral judgments. How Hetty's heart beat as Arthur approached her! He had hardly looked at her to-day. Now he must take her hand. Would he press it? Would he look at her? She thought she would cry if he gave her no sign of feeling. Now he was there. He had taken her hand. Yes, he was pressing it. Hetty turned pale as she looked up at him for an instant and met his eyes, before the dance carried him away. That pale look came upon Arthur like the beginning of a dull pain which clung to him, though he must dance and smile and joke all the same. 
Hetty would look so when he told her what he had to tell her, and he should never be able to bear it. He should be a fool and give way again. Hetty's look did not really mean so much as he thought. It was only the sign of a struggle between the desire for him to notice her and the dread lest she should betray the desire to others. But Hetty's face had a language that transcended her feelings. There are faces which nature charges with a meaning and a pathos not belonging to the single human soul that flutters beneath them, but speaking the joys and sorrows of foregone generations, eyes that tell of deep love which doubtless has been and is somewhere, but not paired with these eyes, perhaps paired with pale eyes that can say nothing, just as a national language may be instinct with poetry unfelt by the lips that use it. That look of Hetty's oppressed Arthur with a dread which yet had something of a terrible unconfessed delight in it, that she loved him too well. There was a hard task before him, for at that moment he felt he would have given up three years of his youth for the happiness of abandoning himself without remorse to his passion for Hetty. These were the incongruous thoughts in his mind as he led Mrs. Poyser, who was panting with fatigue, and secretly resolved that neither judge nor jury should force her to dance another dance, to take a quiet rest in the dining-room, where supper was laid out for the guests to come and take it as they chose. "'I've desired Hetty to remember as she's got to dance with you, sir,' said the good innocent woman, "'for she's so thoughtless she'd be like enough to go and engage herself for every dance. "'So I told her not to promise too many.' "'Thank you, Mrs. Poyser,' said Arthur, not without a twinge. "'Now sit down in this comfortable chair, "'and here is Mills ready to give you what you would like best.' "'He hurried away to seek another matronly partner, "'for due honour must be paid to the married women "'before he asked any of the young ones. "'And the country dances, and the stamping, "'and the gracious nodding, and the waving of the hands "'went on joyously.' At last the time had come for the fourth dance, longed for by the strong, grave Adam, as if he had been a delicate-handed youth of eighteen. For we are all very much alike when we are in our first love, and Adam had hardly ever touched Hetty's hand for more than a transient greeting, had never danced with her but once before. His eyes had followed her eagerly to-night in spite of himself, and had taken in deeper draughts of love. He thought she behaved so prettily, so quietly, she did not seem to be flirting at all. She smiled less than usual. There was almost a sweet sadness about her. God bless her, he said inwardly. I'd make her life a happy un if a strong arm to work for her and a heart to love her could do it. And then there stole over him delicious thoughts of coming home from work and drawing Hetty to his side and feeling her cheek softly pressed against his till he forgot where he was and the music and the tread of feet might have been the falling of rain and the roaring of the wind for what he knew. But now the third dance was ended and he might go up to her and claim her hand. She was at the far end of the hall, near the staircase, whispering with Molly, who had just given the sleeping Totty into her arms before running to fetch shawls and bonnets from the landing. Mrs. Poyser had taken the two boys away into the dining-room to give them some cake before they went home in the cart with Grandfather, and Molly was to follow as fast as possible. "'Let me hold her,' said Adam, as Molly turned upstairs. The children are so heavy when they're asleep. Hetty was glad of the relief, for to hold Trotty in her arms, standing, was not at all a pleasant variety to her. But this second transfer had the unfortunate effect of rousing Totty, who was not behind any child of her age, in peevishness at an unseasonable wakening. While Hetty was in the act of placing her in Adam's arms, and had not yet withdrawn her own, Totty opened her eyes, and forthwith fought out with her left fist at Adam's arm, and with her right caught at the string of brown beads round Hetty's neck, 
The locket leaped out from her frock, and the next moment the string was broken, and Hetty, helpless, saw beads and lockets scattered wide on the floor. "'My locket! My locket!' she said in a loud, frightened whisper to Adam. "'Never mind the beads!' Adam had already seen where the locket fell, for it had attracted his glance as it leaped out of her frock. It had fallen on the raised wooden dais where the band sat, not on the stone floor, and as Adam picked it up he saw the glass with the dark and light locks of hair under it. It had fallen that side upwards, so the glass was not broken. He turned it over in his hand and saw the enameled gold back. It isn't hurt, he said, as he held it towards Hetty, who was unable to take it because both her hands were occupied with Totty. Oh, it doesn't matter. I don't mind about it, said Hetty, who had been pale and was now red. No matter, said Adam gravely. You seem very frightened about it. I'll hold it till you're ready to take it, he added, quietly closing his hand over it, that she might not think he wanted to look at it again. By this time Molly had come with bonnet and shawl, and as soon as she had taken Toddy, Adam placed the locket in Hetty's hand. She took it with an air of indifference and put it in her pocket, in her heart vexed and angry with Adam because he had seen it, but determined now that she would show no more signs of agitation. See, she said, they're taking their places to dance. Let us go. Adam assented silently. A puzzled alarm had taken possession of him. Had Hetty a lover he didn't know of? For none of her relations, he was sure, would give her a locket like that, and none of her admirers with whom he was acquainted was in the position of an accepted lover, as the giver of that locket must be. Adam was lost in the utter impossibility of finding any person for his fears to alight on. He could only feel with a terrible pang that there was something in Hetty's life unknown to him, that while he had been rocking himself in the hope that she would come to love him, she was already loving another. The pleasure of the dance with Hetty was gone. His eyes, when they rested on her, had an uneasy questioning expression in them. He could think of nothing to say to her, and she too was out of temper and disinclined to speak. They were both glad when the dance was ended. Adam was determined to stay no longer. No one wanted him, and no one would notice if he slipped away. As soon as he got out of doors, he began to walk at his habitual rapid pace, hurrying along without knowing why, busy with the painful thought that the memory of this day, so full of honor and promise to him, was poisoned forever. Suddenly, when he was far on through the chase, he stopped, startled by a flash of reviving hope. After all, he might be a fool, making a great misery out of a trifle. Hetty, fond of finery as she was, might have bought the thing herself. It looked too expensive for that. It looked like the thing on white satin in the great jeweler's shop at Rossetir. But Adam had very imperfect notions of the value of such things, and he thought it could certainly not cost more than a guinea, Perhaps Hetty had as much as that in Christmas boxes, and there was no knowing, but she might have been childish enough to spend it in that way. She was such a young thing, and she couldn't help loving finery. But then why had she been so frightened about it at first, and changed color so, and afterwards pretended not to care? Oh, that was because she was ashamed of his seeing that she had such a smart thing. She was conscious that it was wrong for her to spend her money on it, and she knew that Adam disapproved of finery. It was a proof she cared about what he liked and disliked. She must have thought from his silence and gravity afterwards that he was very much displeased with her, that he was inclined to be harsh and severe towards her foibles. And as he walked on more quietly, chewing the cud of this new hope, his only uneasiness was that he had behaved in a way which might chill Hetty's feeling toward him. For this last view of the matter must be the true one. How could Hetty have an accepted lover quite unknown to him? She was never away from her uncle's house for more than a day. She could have no acquaintances that did not come there, and no intimacies unknown to her uncle and aunt. It would be folly to believe that the locket was given to her by a lover. 
The little ring of dark hair he felt sure was her own. He could form no guess about the light hair under it, for he had not seen it very distinctly. It might be a bit of her father's or mother's, who had died when she was a child, and she would naturally put a bit of her own along with it. And so Adam went to bed comforted, having woven for himself an ingenious web of probabilities, the surest screen a wise man can place between himself and the truth. His last waking thoughts melted into a dream that he was with Hetty again at the Hall Farm, and that he was asking her to forgive him for being so cold and silent. And while he was dreaming this, Arthur was leading Hetty to the dance, and saying to her in low, hurried tones, I shall be in the wood the day after tomorrow at seven. Come as early as you can. And Hetty's foolish joys and hopes, which had flown away for a little space, scared by a mere nothing, now all came fluttering back, unconscious of the real peril. She was happy for the first time this long day, and wished that dance would last for hours. Arthur wished it, too. It was the last weakness he meant to indulge in, and a man never lies with more delicious languor under the influence of a passion than when he has persuaded himself that he shall subdue it to-morrow. But Mrs. Poyser's wishes were quite the reverse of this for her mind was filled with dreary forebodings as to the retardation of tomorrow morning's cheese in consequence of these late hours. Now that Hetty had done her duty and danced one dance with the young squire, Mrs. Poyser must go out and see if the cart was come back to fetch them, for it was half-past ten o'clock, and notwithstanding a mild suggestion on his part that it would be bad manners for them to be the first to go, Mrs. Poyser was resolute on the point. "'Manners or no manners?' "'What going already, Mrs. Poyser?' said old Mr. Donnithorne, as she came to curtsy and take leave. "'I thought we should not part with any of our guests till eleven. Mrs. Irwin and I, who are elderly people, think of sitting out the dance till then.' "'Oh, your honour, it's all right and proper for gentlefolks to stay up by candlelight. They've got no cheese on their minds. We're late enough as it is.' "'and there's no letting the cows know "'as they mustn't want to be milked so early tomorrow morning. "'So if you'll please to excuse us, we'll take our leave.' "'Eh,' she said to her husband as they set off in the cart, "'I'd sooner have brewing the day and washing today together "'than one of these pleasuring days. "'There's no work so tiring as dangling about and staring "'and not rightly knowing what you're going to do next, and keeping your face in smiling order like a grocer a market day for fear people should have think you civil enough. And you've nothing to show for it when it's done, if it isn't a yellow face with eating things as disagree. Nay, nay, said Mr. Poyser, who was in his merriest mood, and felt that he had had a great day, a bit o' pleasuring's good for thee sometimes, and thee dance as well as any em, for I'll back thee against all the wives in the parish for a light foot and ankle, and it was a great honour for the young squire to ask thee first. I reckon it was because I sat at the head of the table and made the speech, and Hetty too. She never had such a partner before, a fine young gentleman in regimentals. It'll serve you to talk on, Hetty, when you're an old woman, how you danced with the young squire the day he come a age. End of chapter 26 of book 3, The Dance, Adam Bede, by George Eliot, recording by Father Ziley of Detroit, Michigan, drziley.net, d-r-z-e-i-l-e dot net. Chapter 27 of Adam Bede. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Adam Bede by George Eliot. Chapter 27 A Crisis. It was beyond the middle of August, nearly three weeks after the birthday feast. The reaping of the wheat had begun in our North Midland County of Loamshire, but the harvest was likely still to be retarded by the heavy rains which were causing inundations and much damage throughout the country. From this last trouble, the Broxton and Hayslope farmers, on their pleasant uplands and in their brook-watered valleys, had not suffered, 
and as I cannot pretend that they were such exceptional farmers as to love the general good better than their own, you will infer that they were not in very low spirits about the rapid rise in the price of bread, so long as there was hope of gathering in their own corn undamaged, and occasional days of sunshine and drying winds flattered this hope. The 18th of August was one of these days when the sunshine looked brighter in all eyes for the gloom that went before. Grand masses of cloud were hurried across the blue, and the great round hills behind the chase seemed alive with their flying shadows. The sun was hidden for a moment, and then shone out warm again like a recovered joy. The leaves, still green, were tossed off the hedgerow trees by the wind. Around the farmhouses there was a sound of clapping doors. The apples fell in the orchards, and the stray horses on the green sides of the lanes and on the common had their manes blown about their faces. And yet the wind seemed only part of the general gladness because the sun was shining. A merry day for the children, who ran and shouted to see if they could top the wind with their voices, and the grown-up people too were in good spirits, inclined to believe in yet finer days, when the wind had fallen. If only the corn were not ripe enough to be blown out of the husk and scattered as untimely seed. And yet a day on which a blighting sorrow may fall upon a man, for if it be true that nature at certain moments seems charged with a presentiment of one individual lot, must it not also be true that she seems unmindful and conscious of another? For there is no hour that has not its births of gladness and despair, no morning brightness that does not bring new sickness to desolation, as well as new forces to genius and love. There are so many of us, and our lots are so different. What wonder that nature's mood is often in harsh contrast with the great crisis of our lives. We are children of a large family, and must learn, as such children do, not to expect that our hurts will be made much of, to be content with little nurture and caressing, and help each other the more. It was a busy day with Adam, who of late had done almost double work, for he was continuing to act as foreman for Jonathan Birch, until some satisfactory person could be found to supply his piece, and Jonathan was slow to find that person. But he had done the extra work cheerfully, for his hopes were buoyant again about Hetty. Every time she had seen him since the birthday, she had seemed to make an effort to behave all the more kindly to him, that she might make him understand she had forgiven his silence and coldness during the dance. He had never mentioned the locket to her again, too happy that she smiled at him, still happier because he observed in her a more subdued air, something that he interpreted as the growth of womanly tenderness and seriousness. Ah, he thought, again and again, she's only seventeen. She'll be thoughtful enough after a while, and her aunt always says how clever she is at the work. She'll make a wife his mother will have no occasion to grumble at after all. To be sure, he had only seen her at home twice since the birthday, for one Sunday, when he was intending to go from church to the hall farm, Hetty had joined the party of upper servants from the chase and had gone home with them, almost as if she were inclined to encourage Mr. Craig. "'She's taking too much like it to them folks in the housekeeper's room,' Mrs. Poyser remarked. "'For my part, I was never over fond of gentlefolks as servants. They're mostly like the fine lady's fat dogs, neither good for barking nor butcher's meat, but only for show.' And another evening she was gone to Treddleston to buy some things— though to his great surprise, as he was returning home, he saw her at a distance getting over a stile quite out of the Treddleston Road. But when he hastened to her, she was very kind, and asked him to go in again when he had taken her to the yard gate. She had gone a little farther into the fields after coming from Treddleston, because she didn't want to go in, she said. It was so nice to be out of doors, and her aunt always made such a fuss about it if she wanted to go out. "'Oh, do come in with me,' she said, as he was going to shake hands with her at the gate, and he could not resist that. So he went in, and Mrs. Poyser was contented with only a slight remark on Hetty's being later than was expected, while Hetty, who had looked out of spirits when he met her, smiled and talked and waited on them all with unusual promptitude. That was the last time he had seen her, but he meant to make leisure for going to the farm tomorrow. Today, he knew, was her day for going to the chase to sew with the lady's maid, so he would get as much work done as possible this evening, that the next might be clear. One piece of work that Adam was superintending was some slight repairs at the chase farm, which had been hitherto occupied by Satchel as bailiff, but which it was now rumored that the old squire was going to let to a smart man in top boots, who had been seen to ride over it one day. Nothing but the desire to get a tenant could account for the squire's undertaking repairs, though the Saturday evening party at Mr. Casson's agreed over their pipes that no man in his senses would take the chase farm unless there was a bit more plowland laid to it. However that might be, the repairs were ordered to be executed with all dispatch, and Adam, acting for Mr. Burge, was carrying out the order with his usual energy. 
but today, having been occupied elsewhere, he had not been able to arrive at the chase farm till late in the afternoon, and he then discovered that some old roofing, which he had calculated on preserving, had given way. There was clearly no good to be done with this part of the building without pulling it all down, and Adam immediately saw in his mind a plan for building it up again, so as to make the most convenient of cowsheds and calf pens, with a hovel for implements, and all without any great expense for materials. So when the workmen were gone, he sat down, took out his pocket-book, and busied himself with sketching a plan, and making a specification of the expenses that he might show it to Birch the next morning, and set him on persuading the squire to consent. To make a good job of anything, however small, was always a pleasure to Adam, and he sat on a block with his book resting on a planning table whistling low every now and then and turning his head on one side with a just perceptible smile of gratification of pride too for if adam loved a bit of good work he loved also to think i did it and i believe the only people who are free from that weakness are those who have no work to call their own it was nearly seven before he had finished and put on his jacket again and on giving a last look round he observed that seth who had been working here to-day, had left his basket of tools behind him. "'Why, the lad's forgot his tools,' thought Adam. "'And he's got to work up at the shop to-morrow. There never was such a chap for wool-gathering. He'd leave his head behind him if it was loose. However, it's lucky I've seen him. I'll carry him home.' The buildings of the chase farm lay at one extremity of the chase, at about ten minutes' walking distance from the abbey. Adam had come thither on his pony, intending to ride to the stables, and put up his nag on his way home. At the stables he encountered Mr. Craig, who had come to look at the captain's new horse, on which he was to ride away the day after to-morrow, and Mr. Craig detained him to tell how all the servants were to collect at the gate of the courtyard to wish the young squire luck as he rode out, so that by the time Adam had got into the chase and was striding along with a basket of tools over his shoulder, the sun was on the point of setting, and was sending level crimson rays among the great trunks of the old oaks, and touching every bare patch of ground with a transient glory that made it look like a jewel dropped upon the grass. The wind had fallen now, and there was only enough breeze to stir the delicate stemmed leaves. Any one who had been sitting in the house all day would have been glad to walk now but Adam had been quite enough in the open air to wish to shorten his way home, and he bethought himself that he might do so by striking across the chase and going through the grove, where he had never been for years. He hurried on across the chase, stalking along the narrow paths between the fern, with Jip at his heels, not lingering to watch the magnificent changes of the light, hardly once thinking it, yet feeling its presence in a certain calm, happy awe which mingled itself with his busy working-day thoughts. How could he help feeling it? The very deer felt it, and were more timid. Presently Adam's thoughts recurred to what Mr. Craig had said about Arthur Donnerthorne, and pictured his going away, and the changes that might take place before he came back. Then they travelled back affectionately over the old scenes of boyish companionship, and dwelt on Arthur's good qualities, which Adam had a pride in, as we all have in the virtues of the superior who honours us. A nature like Adam's, with a great need of love and reverence in it, depends for so much of its happiness on what it can believe and feel about others, and he had no ideal world of dead heroes. He knew little of the life of men in the past. He must find the beings to whom he could cling with loving admiration among those who came within speech of him. These pleasant thoughts about Arthur brought a milder expression than usual into his keen rough face. Perhaps they were the reason why, when he opened the old green gate leading into the grove, he paused to pat Jip and say a kind word to him. After that pause, he strode on again along the broad winding path through the grove. What grand beaches! Adam delighted in a fine tree, of all things. As the fisherman's sight is keenest on the sea, so Adam's perceptions were more at home with trees than with other objects. He kept them in his memory, as a painter does, with all the flecks and knots in their bark, all the curves and angles of their boughs, and had often calculated the height and contents of a trunk to a nicety, as he stood looking at it. No wonder that, notwithstanding his desire to get on, he could not help pausing to look at a curious large beech which he had seen standing before him at a turning in the road, and convince himself that it was not two trees wedded together, but only one. For the rest of his life he remembered that moment when he was calmly examining the beach, as a man remembers his last glimpse of the home where his youth was passed, before the road turned, and he saw it no more. The beach stood at the last turning before the grove ended in an archway of boughs that let in the eastern light, and as Adam stepped away from the tree to continue his walk, his eyes fell on two figures about twenty yards before him. He remained as motionless as a statue, and turned almost as pale. 
the two figures were standing opposite to each other, with clasped hands about to part, and while they were bending to kiss, Jip, who had been running among the brushwood, came out, caught sight of them, and gave a sharp bark. They separated with a start, one hurried through the gate out of the grove, and the other, turning round, walked slowly with a sort of saunter towards Adam, who still stood transfixed and pale, clutching tighter the stick with which he held the basket of tools over his shoulder, and looking at the approaching figure with eyes in which amazement was fast turning to fierceness. Arthur Donnithorne looked flushed and excited. He had tried to make unpleasant feelings more bearable by drinking a little more wine than usual at dinner today, and was still enough under its flattering influence to think more lightly of this unwished-for rencontre with Adam than he would otherwise have done. After all, Adam was the best person who could have happened to see him and Hetty together. He was a sensible fellow, and would not babble about it to other people. Arthur felt confident that he could laugh the thing off and explain it away, and so he sauntered forward with elaborate carelessness his flushed face, his evening dress of fine cloth and fine linen, his hands half thrust into his waistcoat pockets, all shone upon by the strange evening light which the light clouds had caught up even to the zenith, and were now shedding down between the topmost branches above him. Adam was still motionless, looking at him as he came up. He understood it all now, the locket and everything else that had been doubtful to him. A terrible scorching light showed him the hidden letters that changed the meaning of the past, if he had moved a muscle, he must inevitably have sprung upon Arthur like a tiger, and in the conflicting motion that filled those long moments, he had told himself that he would not give loose to passion, he would only speak the right thing. He stood as if petrified by an unseen force, but the force was his own strong will. "'Well, Adam,' said Arthur, "'you have been looking at the fine old beeches, eh? They are not to be come near by the hatchet, though. This is a sacred grove.' I overtook pretty little Hetty Sorrel as I was coming to my den, the hermitage there. She ought not to come home this way so late, so I took care of her to the gate, and asked for a kiss for my pains. But I must get back now, for this road is confoundedly damp. Good night, Adam. I shall see you tomorrow, to say good-bye, you know. Arthur was too much preoccupied with the part he was playing himself to be thoroughly aware of the expression in Adam's face. He did not look directly at Adam, but glanced carelessly round at the trees, and then lifted up one foot to look at the sole of his boot. He cared to say no more. He had thrown quite dust enough into honest Adam's eyes, and as he spoke the last words, he walked on. "'Stop a bit, sir,' said Adam, in a hard peremptory voice, without turning round. "'I've got a word to say to you.' Arthur paused in surprise. Susceptible persons are more affected by a change of tone than by unexpected words, and Arthur had the susceptibility of a nature at once affectionate and vain. He was still more surprised when he saw that Adam had not moved, but stood with his back to him, as if summoning him to return. What did he mean? He was going to make a serious business of this affair. Arthur felt his temper rising. A patronizing disposition always has its meaner side, and in the confusion of his irritation and alarm, there entered the feeling that a man to whom he had shown so much favor as to Adam was not in a position to criticize his conduct. And yet he was dominated, as one who feels himself in the wrong always is by the man whose good opinion he cares for. In spite of pride and temper, there was as much deprecation as anger in his voice when he said, "'What do you mean, Adam?' "'I mean, sir,' answered Adam, in the same harsh voice, still without turning round, "'I mean, sir, that you don't deceive me by your light words. This is not the first time you've met Hetty Sorrel in this grove, and this is not the first time you've kissed her.' Arthur felt a startled uncertainty how far Adam was speaking from knowledge, and how far from mere inference.' and this uncertainty, which prevented him from contriving a prudent answer, heightened his irritation. He said in a harsh, sharp tone, "'Well, sir, what then?' "'Why, then, instead of acting like the upright, honorable man we've all believed you to be, you've been acting the part of a selfish, light-minded scoundrel. You know as well as I do what it's to lead to when a gentleman like you kisses and makes love to a young woman like Hetty, and gives her presents as she's frightened for other folks to see.' And I say it again, you're acting the part of a selfish, light-minded scoundrel, though it cuts me to the heart to say so, and I'd rather have lost my right hand. Let me tell you, Adam, said Arthur, bridling his growing anger and trying to recur to his careless tone, you're not only devilishly impertinent, but you're talking nonsense. Every pretty girl is not such a fool as you to suppose that when a gentleman admires her beauty and pays her a little attention, he must mean something particular. Every man likes to flirt with a pretty girl, and every pretty girl likes to be flirted with. The wider the distance between them, the less harm there is, for then she's not likely to deceive herself. 
I don't know what you mean by flirting, said Adam, but if you mean behaving to a woman as if you have loved her, and yet not loving her all the while, I say that's not the action of an honest man, and what isn't honest does come to harm. I'm not a fool, and you're not a fool, and you know better than what you're saying. You know it couldn't be made public as you've behaved to Hetty as you've done, without her losing her character and bringing shame and trouble on her and her relations. What if you meant nothing by your kissing and your presence? Other folks won't believe as you've meant nothing. And don't tell me about her not deceiving herself. I tell you as you've filled her mind so with the thought of you, and that'll mayhap poison her life. And she'd never love another man as it'd make her a good husband. Arthur had felt a sudden relief while Adam was speaking. He perceived that Adam had no positive knowledge of the past, and that there was no irrevocable damage done by this evening's unfortunate rencontre. Adam could still be deceived. The candid Arthur had brought himself into a position in which successful lying was his only hope. The hope allayed his anger a little. "'Well, Adam,' he said in a tone of friendly concession, "'you're perhaps right. Perhaps I've gone a little too far in taking notice of the pretty little thing and stealing a kiss now and then.' You're such a grave, steady fellow. You don't understand the temptation to such trifling. I'm sure I wouldn't bring any trouble or annoyance on her, and the good poisers on any account, if I could help it. But I think you look a little too seriously at it. You know I'm going away immediately, so I shan't make any more mistakes of the kind. But let us say good night. Arthur here turned round to walk on, and talk no more about the matter. The whole thing will soon be forgotten. No, by God! Adam burst out with rage that could be controlled no longer, throwing down the basket of tools and striding forward till he was right in front of Arthur. All his jealousy and sense of personal injury, which he had been hitherto trying to keep under, had leaped up and mastered him. What man of us, in the first moments of a sharp agony, could ever feel that the fellow man who has been the medium of inflicting it did not mean to hurt us? In our instinctive rebellion against pain, we are children again, and demand an act of will to wreak our vengeance on. Adam at this moment could only feel that he had been robbed of Hetty, robbed treacherously by the man in whom he had trusted, and he stood close in front of Arthur, with fierce eyes glaring at him, with pale lips and clenched hands, the hard tones in which he had hitherto been constraining himself to express no more than a just indignation, giving way to a deep agitated voice that seemed to shake him as he spoke. No, it'll not be soon forgot as you've come in between her and me, when she might have loved me. It'll not soon be forgot as you've robbed me of my happiness while I thought you was my best friend and a noble-minded man, as I was proud to work for. And you've been kissing her and meaning nothing, have you? And I've never kissed her in my life, but I'd have worked hard for years for the right to kiss her, and you make light of it. You think little of doing what may damage other folks, so as you get your bitter trifling, as it means nothing. I throw back your favors, for you're not the man I took you for. I'll never count you my friend any more. I'd rather you'd act as my enemy and fight me where I stand. It's all the amends you can make me. Poor Adam, possessed by rage that could find no other vent, began to throw off his coat and his cap, too blind with passion to notice the change that had taken place in Arthur while he was speaking. Arthur's lips were now as pale as Adam's. His heart was beating violently. The discovery that Adam loved Hetty was a shock which made him for the moment see himself in the light of Adam's indignation, and regard Adam's suffering as not merely a consequence, but an element of his error. The words of hatred and contempt, the first he had ever heard in his life, seemed like scorching missiles that were making ineffaceable scars on him. All screening self-excuse, which rarely falls quite away while others respect us, forsook him for an instant, and he stood face to face with the first great irrevocable evil he had ever committed. He was only twenty-one, and three months ago, nay, much later, he had thought proudly that no man should ever be able to reproach him justly. His first impulse, if there had been time for it, would perhaps have been to utter words of propitiation. But Adam had no sooner thrown off his coat and cap than he became aware that Arthur was standing pale and motionless, with his hands still thrust in his waistcoat pockets. What? he said. Won't you fight me like a man? You know I won't strike you while you stand so. Go away, Adam, said Arthur. I don't want to fight you. No, said Adam bitterly. You don't want to fight me? You think I'm a common man, as you can injure without answering for it. I never meant to injure you, said Arthur, with returning anger. I didn't know you loved her. But you've made her love you, said Adam. You're a double-faced man. I'll never believe a word you say again. Go away, I tell you, said Arthur angrily, or we shall both repent. No, said Adam with a convulsed voice. I swear I won't go away without fighting you. Do you want provoking any more? I tell you you're a coward and a scoundrel, and I despise you. The color had all rushed back to Arthur's face. In a moment his right hand was clenched, and dealt a blow like lightning, which sent Adam staggering backward. His blood was as thoroughly up as Adam's now, 
and the two men, forgetting the emotions that had gone before, fought with the instinctive fierceness of panthers in the deepening twilight darkened by the trees. The delicate-handed gentleman was a match for the workman in everything but strength, and Arthur's skill enabled him to protract the struggle for some long moments. But between unarmed men the battle is to the strong, where the strong is no blunder, and Arthur must sink under a well-planted blow of atoms as a steel rod is broken by an iron bar. The blow soon came, and Arthur fell, his head lying concealed in a tuft of fern, so that Adam could only discern his darkly clad body. He stood still in the dim light, waiting for Arthur to rise. The blow had been given now, towards which he had been straining all the force of nerve and muscle. And what was the good of it? What had he done by fighting? Only satisfied his own passion, only wrecked his own vengeance. He had not rescued Hetty, nor changed the past. There it was, just as it had been, and he sickened at the vanity of his own rage. But why did not Arthur rise? It was perfectly motionless, and the time seemed long to Adam. Good God, had the blow been too much for him? Adam shuddered at the thought of his own strength, as with the oncoming of this dread he knelt down by Arthur's side and lifted his head from among the fern. There was no sign of life. The eyes and teeth were set. The horror that rushed over Adam completely mastered him and forced upon him its own belief. He could feel nothing but that death was in Arthur's face, and that he was helpless before it. He made not a single movement, but not like an image of despair gazing at an image of death. End of chapter 17《Chapter 28 of Adam Bede》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Adam Bede by George Eliot Chapter 28 A Dilemma It was only a few minutes measured by the clock, though Adam always thought it had been a long while before he perceived a gleam of consciousness in Arthur's face and a slight shiver through his frame. The intense joy that flooded his soul brought back some of the old affection with it. "'Do you feel any pain, sir?' he said tenderly, loosening Arthur's cravat. Arthur turned his eyes on Adam with a vague stare which gave way to a slightly startled motion, as if from the shock of returning memory, but he only shivered again and said nothing. "'Do you feel any hurt, sir?' Adam said again, with a trembling in his voice. Arthur put his hand up to his waistcoat buttons, and when Adam had unbuttoned it, he took a longer breath. "'Lay my head down,' he said faintly, "'and get me some water if you can.' Adam laid the head down gently on the fern again, and emptying the tools out of the flag-basket, hurried through the trees to the edge of the grove bordering on the chase, where a brook ran below the bank. When he returned with his basket leaking, but still half full, Arthur looked at him with a more thoroughly reawakened consciousness. "'Can you drink a drop out of your hand, sir?' said Adam, kneeling down again to lift up Arthur's head. "'No,' said Arthur. "'Dip my cravat in and souse it on my head.' The water seemed to do him some good, for he presently raised himself a little higher, resting on Adam's arm. "'Do you feel any hurt inside, sir?' Adam asked again. "'No, no hurt,' said Arthur, still faintly. "'But rather done up. After a while, he said, "'I suppose I fainted away when you knocked me down.' "'Yes, sir, thank God,' said Adam. "'I thought it was worse.' "'What? You thought you'd done me for, eh? Come help me on my legs.' "'I feel terribly shaky and dizzy,' Arthur said, as he stood leaning on Adam's arm. "'That blow of yours must have come against me like a battering ram. I don't believe I can walk alone.' "'Lean on me, sir. I'll get you along,' said Adam. "'Or will you sit down a bit longer on my coat here?' and I'll prop you up. You'll perhaps be better in a minute or two. No, said Arthur. I'll go to the hermitage. I think I've got some brandy there. There's a short road to it a little farther on near the gate, if you'll just help me on. They walked slowly, with frequent pauses, but without speaking again. In both of them, the concentration in the present which had attended the first moments of Arthur's revival had now given way to a vivid recollection of the previous scene. It was nearly dark in the narrow path among the trees, but within the circle of fir trees round the hermitage there was room for the glowing moonlight to enter in at the windows. Their steps were noiseless on the thick carpet of fir needles, and the outward stillness seemed to heighten their inward consciousness as Arthur took the key out of his pocket and placed it in Adam's hand for him to open the door. 
Adam had not known before that Arthur had furnished the old hermitage and made it a retreat for himself, and it was a surprise to him when he opened the door to see a snug room with all the signs of frequent habitation. Arthur loosed Adam's arm and threw himself on the ottoman. "'You'll see my hunting bottle somewhere,' he said. "'A leather case with a bottle and glass in.' Adam was not long in finding the case. "'There's a very little brandy in it, sir,' he said, turning it downwards over the glass as he held it before the window. "'Hardly this little glassful.' "'Well, give me that,' said Arthur, with the peevishness of physical depression. When he had taken some sips, Adam said, "'Hadn't I better run to the house, sir, and get some more brandy? "'I can be there and back pretty soon. "'It'll be a stiff walk home for you if you don't have something to revive you.' "'Yes, go, but don't say I'm ill. "'Ask for my man Pym, and tell him to get it from Mills, "'and not to say I'm at the Hermitage. "'Get some water, too.' Adam was relieved to have an active task. Both of them were relieved to be apart from each other for a short time. But Adam's swift pace could not still the eager pain of thinking, of living again with concentrated suffering through the last wretched hour, and looking out from it over all the new sad future. Arthur lay still for some minutes after Adam was gone, but presently he rose feebly from the ottoman and peered about slowly in the broken moonlight, seeking something. It was a short bit of wax candle that stood amongst a confusion of writing and drawing materials. There was more searching for the means of lighting the candle, and when that was done, he went cautiously round the room, as if wishing to assure himself of the presence of absence of something. At last he had found a slight thing, which he put first in his pocket, and then, on a second thought, took out again and thrust deep down into a waste-paper basket. It was a woman's little pink silk neckerchief. He set the candle on the table and threw himself down on the ottoman again, exhausted with the effort. When Adam came back with his supplies, his entrance awoke Arthur from a doze. "'That's right,' Arthur said. "'I'm tremendously in want of some brandy vigor.' "'I'm glad to see you've got a light, sir,' said Adam. "'I've been thinking I'd better have asked for a lanthorn. "'No, no, the candle will last long enough. "'I shall soon be up to walking home now.' "'I can't go before I've seen you safe home, sir,' said Adam, hesitatingly. "'No, it will be better for you to stay. Sit down.' Adam sat down, and they remained opposite to each other in uneasy silence, while Arthur slowly drank brandy and water, with visibly renovating effect. He began to lie in a more voluntary position, and looked as if he were less overpowered by bodily sensations. Adam was keenly alive to these indications, and as his anxiety about Arthur's condition began to be allayed, he felt more of that impatience which every one knows who has had his just indignation suspended by the physical state of the culprit. Yet there was one thing on his mind to be done before he could occur to remonstrance. It was to confess what had been unjust in his own words. Perhaps he longed all the more to make this confession, that his indignation might be free again, and as he saw the signs of returning ease in Arthur, the words again and again came to his lips and went back, checked by the thought that it would be better to leave everything till tomorrow. As long as they were silent, they did not look at each other, and a foreboding came across Adam that if they began to speak as though they remembered the past, if they looked at each other with full recognition, they must take fire again. So they sat in silence till the bit of wax candle flickered low in the socket, the silence all the while becoming more irksome to Adam. Arthur had just poured out some more brandy and water, and he threw one arm behind his head and drew up one leg in an attitude of recovered ease, which was an irresistible temptation to Adam to speak what was on his mind. "'You begin to feel more yourself again, sir,' he said as the candle went out and they were half hidden from each other in the faint moonlight. "'Yes. I don't feel good for much. Very lazy and not inclined to move. But I'll go home when I've taken this doze.' There was a slight pause before Adam said, "'My temper got the better of me, and I said things as wasn't true. I'd no right to speak as if you'd known you was doing me an injury. You'd no grounds for knowing it. I've always kept what I felt for her as secret as I could.' He paused again before he went on. "'And perhaps I judged you too harsh. I'm apt to be harsh. And you may have acted out of thoughtlessness more than I should have believed it was possible for a man with a heart and a conscience.' We're not all put together alike, and we may misjudge one another. God knows it's all the joy I could have now to think the best of you. Arthur wanted to go home without saying any more. He was too painfully embarrassed in mind, as well as too weak in body, to wish for any further explanation tonight. 
and yet it was a relief to him that Adam reopened the subject in a way the least difficult for him to answer. Arthur was in the wretched position of an open, generous man who has committed an error which makes deception seem a necessity. The native impulse to give truth in return for truth, to meet trust with frank confession, must be suppressed, and duty was becoming a question of tactics. His deed was reacting upon him, was already governing him tyrannously, and forcing him into a course that jarred with his habitual feelings. The only aim that seemed admissible to him now was to deceive Adam to the utmost, to make Adam think better of him than he deserved. And when he heard the words of honest retraction, when he heard the sad appeal with which Adam had ended, he was obliged to rejoice in the remains of ignorant confidence it implied. He did not answer immediately, for he had to be judicious and not truthful. "'Say no more about our anger, Adam,' he said at last, very languidly, for the labor of speech was unwelcome to him. "'I forgive your momentary injustice. It was quite natural, with the exaggerated notions you had in your mind. We shall be none the worse friends in future, I hope, because we fought. You had the best of it, and that was as it should be, for I believe I have been most in the wrong of the two. Come, let us shake hands. Arthur held out his hand, but Adam sat still. "'I don't like to say no to that, sir,' he said. "'But I can't shake hands till it's clear what we mean by it. "'I was wrong when I spoke as if you'd done me an injury knowingly, "'but I wasn't wrong in what I said before about your behavior to Hetty. "'And I can't shake hands with you as if I held you my friend the same as ever "'till you've cleared that up better.' "'Arthur swallowed his pride and resentment as he drew back his hand. "'He was silent for some moments and then said, as indifferently as he could, I don't know what you mean by clearing up, Adam. I've told you already that you think too seriously of a little flirtation. But if you are right in supposing there is any danger in it, I'm going away on Saturday, and there will be an end of it. As for the pain it has given you, I'm heartily sorry for it. I can say no more. Adam said nothing, but rose from his chair and stood with his face towards one of the windows, as if looking at the blackness of the moonlit fir trees but he was in reality conscious of nothing but the conflict within him. It was of no use now, his resolution not to speak till tomorrow. He must speak there and then, but it was several minutes before he turned round and stepped nearer to Arthur, standing and looking down on him as he lay. "'It'll be better for me to speak plain,' he said, with evident effort. "'Though it's hard work. You see, sir, this isn't a trifle to me, whatever it may be to you. I'm none of the men as can go making love first to one woman.' and then to another, and don't think it much odds whichever my take. What I feel for Hetty's a different sort of love, such as I believe nobody can know much about, but dumb as feel it, and God as has given it to him. She's more nor everything else to me, all but my conscience and my good name. And if it's true what you've been saying all along, and if it's only been trifling and flirting as you call it, as I'll be put an end to by your going away, why then I'd wait and hope her heart had turned to me after all. I'm loath to think you'd speak false to me, and I'll believe your word, however things may look. "'You would be wronging Hetty more than me not to believe it,' said Arthur, almost violently, starting up from the ottoman and moving away. But he threw himself into a chair again directly, saying more feebly, "'You seem to forget that, in suspecting me, you are casting imputations upon her.' "'Nay, sir,' Adam said in a calmer voice, as if he were half relieved." for he was too straightforward to make a distinction between a direct falsehood and an indirect one. Nay, sir, things don't lie level between Hetty and you. You're acting with your eyes open, whatever you may do. But how do you know what's been in her mind? She's all but a child, as any man with a conscience in him ought to feel bound to take care on. And whatever you may think, I know you've disturbed her mind. I know she's been fixing her heart on you, for there's a many things clear to me now as I didn't understand before. But you seem to make light of what she may feel. You don't think of that. Good God, Adam, let me alone, Arthur burst out impetuously. I feel it enough without your worrying me. He was aware of his indiscretion as soon as the words had escaped him. Well, then, if you feel it, Adam rejoined eagerly, if you feel as you may have put false notions into her mind, and made her believe as you loved her, when all the while you meant nothing, I have this demand to make of you. I'm not speaking for myself, but for her. I ask you to undeceive her before you go away. You aren't going away for ever, and if you leave her behind with a notion in her head of your feelings about her the same as she feels about you, she'll be hankering after you, and the mischief may get worse. 
It may be a smart to her now, but it'll save her pain at the end. I ask you to write a letter. You may trust my seeing as she gets it. Tell her the truth, and take blame to yourself for behaving as you've no right to do to a young woman who isn't your equal. I speak plain, sir, but I can't speak any other way. There's nobody can take care of Hetty in this thing but me. I can do what I think needful in the matter, said Arthur, more and more irritated by mingled distress and perplexity, without giving promises to you. I shall take what measures I think proper. No, said Adam, in an abrupt, decided tone. That won't do. I must know what ground I'm treading on. I must be safe as you've put an end to what ought never to have been begun. I don't forget what's owing to you as a gentleman, but in this thing we're man and man, and I can't give up. There was no answer for some moments. Then Arthur said, I'll see you tomorrow. I can bear no more now. I'm ill. He rose as he spoke, and reached his cap as if intending to go. You won't see her again, Adam exclaimed, with a flash of recurring anger and suspicion, moving towards the door and placing his back against it. Either tell me she can never be my wife, tell me you've been lying, or else promise me what I've said. Adam, uttering this alternative, stood like a terrible fate before Arthur, who had moved forward a step or two, and now stopped, faint, shaken, sick in mind and body. It seemed long to both of them, that inward struggle of Arthur's, before he said feebly, I promise, let me go. Adam moved away from the door and opened it, but when Arthur reached the step, he stopped again and leaned against the doorpost. You're not well enough to walk alone, sir, said Adam. Take my arm again. Arthur made no answer, and presently walked on, Adam following. But after a few steps, he stood still again, and said coldly, I believe I must trouble you. It's getting late now, and there may be an alarm set up about me at home. Adam gave his arm, and they walked on without uttering a word, till they came where the basket and the tools lay. I must pick up the tools, sir, Adam said. They're my brothers. I doubt they'll be rusted, if you'll please to wait a minute. Arthur stood still without speaking, and no other word passed between them till they were at the side entrance, where he hoped to get in without being seen by anyone. He said then, Thank you. I needn't trouble you any further. What time will it be convenient for me to see you tomorrow, sir? said Adam. You may send me word that you're here at five o'clock, said Arthur. Not before. Good night, sir, said Adam. But he heard no reply. Arthur had turned into the house. End of chapter 28「If the perplexed are only weary enough. But at seven he rang his bell and astonished Pym by declaring he was going to get up and must have breakfast brought to him at eight. And see that my mare is saddled at half past eight, and tell my grandfather when he's down that I'm better this morning and am gone for a ride. He had been awake an hour and could rest in bed no longer. In bed our yesterdays are too oppressive. If a man can only get up Though it be but to whistle or to smoke, he has a present which offers some resistance to the past, sensations which assert themselves against tyrannous memories. And if there were such a thing as taking averages of feeling, it would certainly be found that in the hunting and shooting seasons, regret, self-reproach and mortified pride weigh lighter on country gentlemen than in late spring and summer. Arthur felt he should be more of a man on horseback. Even the presence of Pym, waiting on him with the usual deference, was a reassurance to him after the scenes of yesterday. For, with Arthur's sensitiveness to opinion, the loss of Adam's respect was a shock to his self-contentment which suffused his imagination with the sense he had sunk in all eyes, as a sudden shock of fear from some real peril makes a nervous woman afraid even to step 
because all her perceptions are suffused with a sense of danger. Arthur's, as you know, was a loving nature. Deeds of kindness were as easy to him as a bad habit. They were the common issue of his weakness and good qualities, of his egoism and his sympathy. He didn't like to witness pain, and he liked to have grateful eyes beaming on him as the giver of pleasure. When he was a lad of seven, he one day kicked down an old gardener's pitch of broth from no motive but a kicking impulse, not reflecting that it was the old man's dinner. But on learning that sad fact, he took his favourite pencil case and a silver-hafted knife out of his pocket and offered them as compensation. He had been the same Arthur ever since, trying to make all offences forgotten in benefits. If there were any bitterness in his nature, it could only show itself against the man who refused to be conciliated by him. And perhaps the time was come for some of that bitterness to rise. At the first moment Arthur had felt pure distress and self-reproach at discovering that Adam's happiness was involved in his relation to Hetty. If there had been a possibility of making Adam tenfold amends, if deeds of gift or other deeds could have restored Adam's contentment and regard for him as a benefactor, Arthur would not only have executed them without hesitation, but would have felt bound all the more closely to Adam, and would never have been weary of making retribution. But Adam could receive no amends, his suffering could not be cancelled, his respect and affection could not be recovered by any prompt deeds of atonement. He stood like an immovable obstacle against which no pressure could avail, an embodiment of what Arthur most shrank from believing in, the irrevocableness of his own wrongdoing. The words of scorn, the refusal to shake hands, the mastery asserted over him in their last conversation in the hermitage, above all the sense of having been knocked down, to which a man does not very well reconcile himself, even under the most heroic circumstances, pressed on him with a galling pain which was stronger than compunction. Arthur would so gladly have persuaded himself that he had done no harm, and if no one had told him to the contrary, he could have persuaded himself so much better. Nemesis can seldom forge a sword for herself out of our consciences, out of the suffering we feel in the suffering we may have caused. There is rarely metal enough there to make an effective weapon. Our moral sense learns the manners of good society and smiles when others smile. But when some rude person gives rough names to our actions, she is apt to take part against us. And so it was with Arthur. Adam's judgment of him, Adam's grating words, disturbed his self-soothing arguments. Not that Arthur had been at ease before Adam's discovery. Struggles and resolves had transformed themselves into compunction and anxiety. He was distressed for Hetty's sake, and distressed for his own, that he must leave her behind. He had always, both in making and breaking resolutions, looked beyond his passion, and seen that it must speedily end in separation. But his nature was too ardent and tender for him not to suffer at this parting. And on Hetty's account he was filled with uneasiness. He had found out the dream in which she was living, that she was to be a lady in silks and satins, and when he had first talked to her about his going away, she had asked him tremblingly to let her go with him and be married. It was his painful knowledge of this which had given the most exasperating sting to Adam's reproaches. He had said no word with the purpose of deceiving her. Her vision was all spun by her own childish fancy. But he was obliged to confess to himself that it was spun half out of his own actions. And to increase the mischief, on this last evening he had not dared to hint the truth to Hetty. He had been obliged to soothe her with tender, hopeful words lest he should throw her into violent distress. He felt the situation acutely, felt the sorrow of the dear thing in the present, and thought with a darker anxiety of the tenacity which her feelings might have in the future. There was one sharp point which pressed against him, every other he could evade by hopeful self-persuasion. The whole thing had been secret. The poisons had not the shadow of a suspicion. No one except Adam knew anything of what had passed. No one else was likely to know. For Adam had impressed on Hetty that it would be fatal to betray, by word or look, that there had been the least intimacy between them. And Adam, who knew half their secret, 
would rather help them keep it than betray it. It was an unfortunate business altogether, but there was no use in making it worse than it was by imaginary exaggerations and forebodings of evil that might never come. The temporary sadness for Hetty was the worst consequence. He resolutely turned away his eyes from any bad consequence that was not demonstratively inevitable. But, but Hetty might have had the trouble in some other way, if not in this. And perhaps hereafter he might be able to do a great deal for her, and make up for all the tears she would shed about him. She would owe the advantage of his care for her in future years to the sorrow she had incurred now. So good comes out of evil, such is the beautiful arrangement of things. Are you inclined to ask whether this can be the same Arthur, who, two months ago, had that freshness of feeling, that delicate honour which shrinks from wounding, even the sentiment, and does not contemplate any more positive offences as possible for it, who thought his own self-respect was a higher tribunal than any external opinion? The same, I assure you, only under different conditions. Our deeds determine us as much as we determine our deeds, and until we know what has been or will be the peculiar combination of outward with inward facts which constitutes a man's critical actions, it will be better not to think ourselves wise about his character. There is a terrible coercion in our deeds, which may first turn the honest man into a deceiver, and then reconcile him to the change, for this reason, that the second wrong presents itself to him in the guise of the only practicable right. The action which before commission had been seen with that blended common sense and fresh untarnished feeling which is the healthy eye of the soul, is looked at afterwards with the lens of apologetic ingenuity, through which all things that men call beautiful and ugly are seen to be made up of textures very much alike. Europe adjusts itself to the fait accompli, and so does an individual character, till the placid adjustment is disturbed by a convulsive retribution. No man can escape this vitiating effect of an offence against his own sentiment of right, and the effect was the stronger in Arthur because of that very need of self-respect, which, while his conscience was still at ease, was one of his best safeguards. Self-accusation was too painful to him. He could not face it. He must persuade himself that he had not been very much to blame. He began even to pity himself for the necessity he was under of deceiving Adam. It was a course so opposed to the honesty of his own nature. But then it was the only right thing to do. Well, whatever had been amiss in him, he was miserable enough in consequence. Miserable about Hetty, miserable about this letter he had promised to write, and it seemed at one moment to be a gross barbarity, at the other perhaps the greatest kindness he could do to her. And across all this reflection would dart every now and then a sudden impulse of passionate defiance towards all consequences. He would carry Hetty away, and all other considerations might go to... In this state of mind the four walls of his room made an intolerable prison to him. They seemed to hem in and press down upon him all the crowd of contradictory thoughts and conflicting feelings, some of which would fly away in the open air. He had only an hour or two to make up his mind in, and he must get clear and calm. Once on Meg's back, in the fresh air of that fine morning, he would be more master of the situation. The pretty creature arched her bay neck in the sunshine, and poured the gravel, and trembled with pleasure when her master stroked her nose, and patted her, and talked to her even in a more caressing tone than usual. He loved her the better, because she knew nothing of his secrets. But Meg was quite as well acquainted with her master's mental state as many others of her sex with mental condition of that nice young gentleman towards whom their hearts are in a state of fluttering expectation. Arthur cantered for five miles beyond the chase, till he was at the foot of a hill where there were no hedges or trees to hem in the road. Then he threw the bridle on Meg's neck and prepared to make up his mind. Hetty knew that their meeting yesterday must be the last before Arthur went away. There was no possibility of their contriving another without exciting suspicion, and she was like a frightened child, unable to think of anything, only able to cry at the mention of parting, 
and then put her face up to have the tears kissed away. He could do nothing but comfort her, and lull her into dreaming on. A letter would be a dreadfully abrupt way of awakening her. Yet there was truth in what Adam said, that would save her from a lengthened delusion which might be worse than a sharp immediate pain, and was the only way of satisfying Adam, who must be satisfied, for more reasons than one. If he could have seen her again, but that was impossible, there was such a thorny hedge of hindrances between them, and an imprudence would be fatal. And yet, if he could see her again, what good would it do? Only cause him to suffer more from the sight of her distress and the remembrance of it. Away from him she was surrounded by all the motives to self-control. A sudden dread here fell like a shadow across his imagination, the dread lest she should do something violent in her grief, and close upon that dread came another, which deepened the shadow. But he shook them off with the force of youth and hope. What was the ground for painting the future in that dark way? It was just as likely to be reverse. Arthur told himself he did not deserve that things should turn out badly. He had never meant beforehand to do anything his conscience disapproved. He had been led on by circumstances. There was a sort of implicit confidence in him that he was really such a good fellow at bottom, Providence would not treat him harshly. At all events, he couldn't help what would come now. All he could do was to take what seemed the best course at the present moment. And he persuaded himself that that course was to make the way open between Adam and Hetty. Her heart might really turn to Adam, as he said, after a while, and in that case there would have been no great harm done, since it was still Adam's ardent wish to make her his wife. To be sure, Adam was deceived, deceived in a way that Arthur would have resented as a deep wrong if it had been practised on himself. That was a reflection that marred the consoling prospect. Arthur's cheeks even burned in mingled shame and irritation at the thought. But what could a man do in such dilemma? He was bound in honour to say no word that could injure Hetty. His first duty was to guard her. He would never have told or acted a lie on his own account. Good God, what a miserable fool he was to have brought himself into such a dilemma. And yet, if ever man had excuses, he had. Pity that consequences are determined not by excuses, but by actions. Well, the letter must be written. It was the only means that promised the solution of the difficulty. The tears came into Arthur's eyes as he thought of Hetty reading it, but it would be almost as hard for him to write it. He was not doing anything easy to himself, and this last thought helped him to arrive at a conclusion. He could never deliberately have taken a step which inflicted pain on another and left himself at ease. Even a moment of jealousy at the thought of giving up Hetty to Adam went to convince him that he was making a sacrifice. When once he had come to this conclusion, he turned Meg round and set off home in a canter. The letter should be written the first thing, and the rest of the day would be filled with other business. He should have no time to look behind him. Happily, Irwine and Gawain were coming to dinner, and by twelve o'clock the next day he should have left the chase miles behind him. There was some security in this constant occupation against an uncontrollable impulse seizing on him to rush to Hetty and thrust into her hands some mad proposition that would undo everything. Faster and faster went the sensitive Meg, at every slight sign from her rider, till the canter had passed into a swift gallop. "'I thought they said the master was took ill last night,' said sour old John, the groom, at dinner-time in the servants' hall. "'He's been riding fit to split the mare in two this forenoon.' "'That's happened one of the symptoms, John,' said the facetious coachman. "'Then I wish he would let blood for it, that's all,' said John grimly. Adam had been early at the chase to know how Arthur was, and had been relieved from all anxiety about the effects of his blow by learning that he was gone out for a ride.' At five o'clock he was punctually there again, and sent up word of his arrival. In a few minutes Pym came down with a letter in his hand and gave it to Adam, saying that the captain was too busy to see him, and had written everything he had to say. The letter was directed to Adam, but he went out of doors again before opening it. It contained a sealed enclosure directed to Hetty. On the inside of the cover Adam read, in the enclosed letter I have written everything you wish. 
I leave it to you to decide whether you'll be doing best to deliver it to Hetty or to return it to me. Ask yourself once more whether you are not taking a measure which may pain her more than mere silence. There is no need for us seeing each other again now. We shall meet with better feelings some months hence. A.D. Perhaps he's in the right not to see me, thought Adam. It's no use meeting to say more hard words, and it's no use meeting to shake hands and say we're friends again. We're not friends, and it's better not to pretend it. I know forgiveness is a man's duty, but to my thinking that can only mean as you're given up all thoughts of taking revenge. It can never mean as though you're to have your old feelings back again, for that's not possible. He's not the same man to me, and I can't feel the same toward him. God help me, I don't know whether I feel the same towards anybody. I seem as if I'd been measuring my work from a false line, and got it all to measure over again. But the question about delivering the letter to Hetty soon absorbed Adam's thoughts. Arthur had procured some relief to himself by throwing the decision on Adam with a warning. And Adam, who was not given to hesitation, hesitated here. He determined to feel his way, to ascertain as well as he could what was Hetty's state of mind before he decided on delivering the letter. End of chapter 29